All right, everybody, welcome to Theory Underground, to the two-day live stream marathon event. This is being called a launch event because in a sort of sense, Theory Underground, the website, the virtual side, never had a launch. So if you are in the chat, if this is coming through at all, please let us know. We had to restart the router getting started here. Um, but this... This will hopefully be just as valuable to people joining in the future as people joining right now. Maybe even more so for people in the future because they will be able to speed past the parts that they find less interesting, right? Or for people who are listening at work, I know someone like Sean is working at FedEx or Mikey is driving uh, a distance route today with his truck. And we'll be talking more about his job and its obstruction of what he should be doing a little bit later when Todd McGowan joins us. But right now, I'm just saying that people joining by headphones who are working, uh, that you're not the number one constituency here. Not just any old regular working class people. I mean, we keep regular working class people close to heart, but specifically people who are trying to cultivate their intellects as, uh, as they are being uh, worked, to, uh, worked thin, stretched thin between the... The, the inflation, the, the longer days, the, the lower pay, the, the rising insecurity with jobs, everything like that. We think that the most important thing is... All right, I think we're back. Sorry, everybody. It dropped for a second there. But basically, we're trying to make everything accessible. And we believe that people need to make things accessible, not just to anybody who's uh, a you know a bystander, but specifically to people who are trying as hard as they can to cultivate themselves. And so for the next few years, um, Theory Underground's main thing is just working with those closest to us. And uh, I will be talking about everything that you've missed, everything that everybody's missed if you have either one, never heard of Theory Underground before, or two, you were someone who was involved with Theory Plebe or some of my past projects and you're, you're not really in the know with Theory Underground. You don't even know where to start. This is where to start. So thank you for sh being here today and uh, welcome to the folks who are here in the Zoom call. Everybody in the Zoom call, you can go ahead and like uh, unmute yourselves and show yourselves here. And uh, after, well actually, because Brian has to go to work in just a second, we're going to start off with Brian. Brian, are you there? I am here. All right, Brian, how are you doing? Yeah. I'm good. I'm, uh, yeah, like, like you said, I'm literally just on my way to work. I get a proctor some standardized tests today. I'm super stoked. Oh, my God, yes. Perfect. JK. <clears throat> um, so... Yeah. Oh, it looks like you don't have your camera on, so I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off, and we'll just go cameraless for a minute here. Um, what is go? Yeah, yeah I'm in so a car. It doesn't make sense to have a camera. No, for sure. Um, so what I'm going to do – is Brian coming through, everybody? Everybody in the chat, say hi to Brian if, you, if you're able to hear Brian. Hi, Brian. Marilyn's here. Hi. Hi, Marilyn. All right. I for one want to see your car. <laughs> it's it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool car. All right. Let's let's just say a couple of things there, there. Brian. Brian, uh, you, you how long do you have? See my roof if I turn it on. I'm just kidding. How long do you have? Sorry, what? How long do you have? Uh, ten minutes. Okay. So to everybody, 10. to everybody joining now and in the future, Brian Weeks and I have been involved with reading philosophy for over seven years, I think. And uh, I'm going to let him introduce himself and say a few things about the first course that we taught together. But basically, the first course was the idea of the university where we, in basically six weeks' time, read Carl Jaspers or Jaspers' uh, The Idea of the University, which is a positive critique of existing academic institutions written at the end of World War II when the Third Reich was overthrown. And uh, basically, he addressed this book to someone who was supposed to be responsible for rebuilding the university system. And so we thought that I thought that that would be perfect for two things. One, for kind of giving people a sense that like we're not 
underground journalists. We're not underground rhetoricians. We're not underground politicians. We're not part of any of the existing things that currently are out there. This is a course site in essence, meaning that in a sense, we're doing something that the university is also doing, but we're doing it in a different way. Why are we doing it? And why aren't we just at the university? Well, part of the reason is because of the kinds of conversations that I have with Anne, the kinds of conversations that I have with Brian, Elton, and others who are currently in the call and joining later today. But Brian, do you want to take a moment to just introduce yourself and then say, yeah, what, how did, what did you think about the idea of university course? Yeah, uh, well, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Brian Weeks. I'm here in uh, southern Idaho, beautiful, rainy southern Idaho today. Um, yeah, as Dave said, uh, we've spent the past number of years reading philosophy together um, outside of any institutional structure. Um, we've read Heidegger, Derrida, um, and I can't remember everything at this point, Levinas, uh, I guess mostly in the 20th century. Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I think he and I are both kind of in this place where, you know, I've got a master's degree in education. I'm an alternative high school teacher. Um, I think there has been a really important place for um, the university in my life. But one of the reasons we wanted to do read the idea of the university, engage with it was because we we're equally dissatisfied. Um, it was not really... Um, striking the nerve one would hope um and I, i'm really glad that we ended up reading that text and taking our time with it and i think it helps to kind of like it opened up a space to really think about what theory underground is for me um and getting to know everyone in the course and we're kind of in the process of reading through everyone's final project papers um seeing the sort of different ideas people have um, just gives you an idea of what people want that the university isn't capable of um, fulfilling um, because it has its other sort of structural obligations to various um, other institutions to uh, the corporate side, to the state. Um, it's funding streams that uh, a small underground organization doesn't have. Um, for me, it's been really fun we talked about it in our last meeting was I got trained really well to write good academic papers, um, especially as a graduate student. Um, and this, you know, I've thought of sort of the final product for the idea of the university course more as uh, an artistic endeavor, like it's half artistic, half creative, but in the way I think about how to structure it, what I want to do and how I want to say what I want to say, I don't feel bound to, um, the same obligations of uh, essay format. And that's that's been a really cool thing for me. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. And then, Dave, I'll let you jump back in. Yeah, really, uh, yours is actually the only one that I had the time so far to go over. But it was probably my favorite so far. I mean, <laughs> it I'm was my favorite. I'm glad to hear it because I'm really, really not satisfied with this state it's in but i want to you know before i start revising i want to hear what's working which we'll talk about next week yeah no i i i, I know you took a more you said it, it took a lot of courage for you to write this way i think it was the right choice it's uh it's more narrative poetic it was poetic it's an aphoristic not narrative um so much and the upcoming volume, Underground Theory Volume 1, uh, is going to be a mixture of pretty intense academic writing, you know, heavily sourced kind of writing, stuff that might have been intended for some other journal, uh, an academic journal, but for whatever reason, the person who wrote it decided they weren't actually going for a career in academia, so they're going to do something else with that writing, or... They're recycling it because they didn't like the fact that publishing it where they did, it got no eyeballs from people who are reading it for its own sake, as opposed to, you know, the accumulation and performance of social and cultural capital. And so, you know, that kind of craving for genuine engagement is one of the big things that leads us all here. And as far as the idea university goes, I just thought it was like the best 
like basis to get started. But the fact is, is there are a lot of books that you and I have talked about and they ain't that, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of in the same, uh, same sort of field because critical pedagogy and any kind of education theory is part of this field. But I wanted to start things on a positive note. Like we dedicated this to the president at Boise State University, our, our mater, however you say. And, um, Alma mater. Alma mater. Is that how you say it? Alma. Yeah. Alma mater? Okay. Yeah. Well, we dedicated it to the president at Boise State. And then she was like, she was like, I love theory. I've been studying it my whole life. And I was like, what the fuck? Okay. Well, and I hope that there will be room for like a dialogue there going forward. That's cool. I didn't know she had gotten back to you on that. I knew she emailed you back, but I didn't know she had said that. Yeah. she Yeah. She even has a couple of published books, I think. That's cool. Maybe I'll check them out and then uh, we'll become coffee buddies or something. I hope so. The reason I was under the impression that she's not kind of from that background was because I understood that like in her speeches to graduates, it's all focused on now you're going to be able to make millions of dollars. Yeah, you know, like I think that's one of the things I'm wrestling with is I think through Jaspers and everything is there really are just – limitations you can't have that role and not do that you know what i mean or like you know i don't know how well known it is but like president obama when he was young like it was either before law school or after law school like he locked himself in a room and read philosophy for years that's kind of how he talks about it you know but once you're in the oval office you, you you can't continue to like think that expansively And so, like, as I've been thinking about what role, like, Theory Underground will never have that limitation that the university (laughs) has. And and so, like Jasper says, like, the university will constantly be the hub of research because it brings all the disciplines together. But it will also be a sort of uh, have its own limitation factors on how deep each discipline can go in certain directions. And so that's that sort of balance between the formal institution and then the sort of outside agitating underground, non-connected organizations, I think is probably a really important one that we underplay a lot of times. Perfect. Look, I know you got to go to work, so I just want to ask you two questions before you go. Um, What are a couple of books you really hope we can continue in this line of thought in the future? first of all. And second of all, what would you say to people who are thinking about signing up for it after the fact, taking it on demand, but without a cohort? What do I think about that? Yeah, what would you tell a person? What would you tell them? Or what would I say to them? Right. Um, Okay, so on the first one, yeah, I am kind of in my mind already in the process of developing a more rigorous course that would have multiple texts. And I think two that it must include on top of the idea of the university are uh, Ivan Illich's Deschooling Society and Giorgio Agamben's The Highest Poverty. Um, There are a number of others I can, that are shorter that those are the shorter ones. Um, So anybody who wants to kind of find some greater context around all of this, I'd, I'd start there. Um, that's where I go back to. And for anybody who's taking the course in the future, um, I think it was said in the very first meeting when you get access to the videos, if you are to write anything, like you're not going to have a group of people automatically in the chat forum responding to it. But if you reach out via email, you're probably going to get some feedback if you want to do the final project, right? That's part of the thing. Um, that's what's being offered. And if it's two years from now, you say, hey, I just did all this course online and I wrote this. Can I get somebody to give me some feedback? It, I have a feeling you're going to get that right. Um, so take advantage of the, you know, the course you're buying access to more than just videos. Um, you know, where things are going to be exactly in two years, it's impossible to say exactly what that looks like. But 
you'll find somebody and reach out to people you know, right? I think it's about building that community around bringing ideas together. So before you, uh, well, actually, that's your answer to both questions, isn't it? So, yeah, I have the idea of university up on screen here, everybody. And as you can see, only nine people are enrolled, but that's just the first cohort. Um, and one of those people signed up for it after the fact. Shout out to you, Eddie. Um, look, if you sign up for it after the fact, I, I, your, my time and energy is going to especially go to making it better for you because I want to make these more useful for people who binge stuff on demand than just for cohorts. Cohorts are special to me uh, because obviously those are the people, it's like we're a team and we're making it for the first time. But I always have in mind future people, specifically people like myself who might be listening on earbuds from Amazon warehouses or driving it for, uh, driving a FedEx. So like if you're working your butt off and you wanna binge uh, a bunch of course content, we're trying to make that, make this perfect for you. And right now it's not where I want it. I wanna have like test your knowledge quizzes and exams, right? Like I wanna eventually incorporate stuff like that. But what I really need is help doing that part. And so, you know, if you, the you know, one thing that you can do is like in exchange, instead of paying for the course, you try to, you know, you, you, you take, if you are an educator, you have an, you have a, you have a, you have experience in education and you know how to build quizzes and stuff like that, then you watch these lectures and you start to build that stuff out. If anybody's interested in doing that, but they can't really pay for it themselves. Okay. Hit me up. I definitely, we could, we could do a swap. Uh, but otherwise, I'll just do it in a fit of inspiration or obsession uh, in the near future, probably when some people sign up for it after the fact. And then the last thing I want to say about taking these courses on demand, and we will talk a little bit more about this going forward, is I've, I've added a new feature uh, on the website for people who sign up to support, um, to support this effort. As I'm clicking here on the, on the screen, you can see um, it's the very top tab of the website has shop and you can put, if you hover over it, there's two options, support this effort and scholarship. The scholarship is for people who can't afford anything. Um, the support this effort is for people who can't afford it and really want to see us succeed. So there's obviously a few different ways that you can support from there. The number one of them being the $50 monthly patron. Uh, we currently have five I think a few of those might not have renewed. I'm not sure. I haven't actually looked, but um, the new feature, uh, the new benefit that is being announced today is that if you are in the $50 tier, uh, then you can get access to past courses. You will get automatically entered into all past courses um, with one caveat, and that is that there will be a time limit on how long you have to actually take these because I don't want people who've got a lot of time and you know dispersed energy feeling pulled between a lot of different things to sign up thinking this is a great idea and then because they're there available on demand take it for granted and forget about it no it's like become a patron get access to all the courses for three months right like that's kind of the idea I don't know how I can enforce it but that's the idea, and I hope that that will be a sort of incentive to really drive you. But if you actually achieve that within those first three months, then you'll be in the community. You'll be in the forum with the people who've already finished it. You'll be able to read their final projects. You'll be able to read their weekly reflections. And when you post your weekly reflections or final project, as, as Brian was saying, even after the fact, you'll be set. They will be able to uh, respond to you. And... Like he said, who knows if it'll be around in two years. But here's the thing. Real recognition, genuine recognition, can only be something that's available in a precarious reality that has being unto death structuring it. Okay? It's not, there's no such thing as a big other. Right? There's only actual people who are interested in reading your thoughts. So... You really need to take advantage of it while it's there and don't fall for the internet illusion or the academic institution illusion that, oh yeah, recognition from the big other that can be signed off on and verified in some court, you know, but with some uh, 
degree or other form of certification that's always there. I can always pursue that. No, 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 no. If you want people who've sacrificed everything and, 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 and when I say everything, I mean every day, every week, every month, the stuff that is not immediate to family and, and, and putting a roof over our head is going to study. I don't know where else you're going to find the kind of potential recognition that is currently available, but not, not reliably available in the near or distant future. We could die. Anything could happen. I could get sued out of existence. Um, there's also, there's just too many things. So maybe I'll have children and realize I'm, I, there's more important things for me. I'm moving on. But for right now, I'm giving everything I have to this. I know Brian has a kid and is still giving so much to this, which by the way, I don't know how you do it, Brian. Brian's gone by the way. Oh, he dipped. Oh, yeah. he's, he said, got to head out. See you all later. Have a good one in the chat. Okay. Well, bye Brian. Um, I don't know how you do it. Um, but with that said, the idea of the university was just the first course and the second course, um, that yeah, has happened giving so much to this, which by the way, I don't know how you do it, Brian. The fuck? Why am I hearing myself? Brian's gone by the way. Oh, he dipped. Sort of the oh, he's, he said, got to head out. See you all later. Have a good one in the chat. Okay. Well, bye Brian. Um, I don't know how you do it. Um, I get it. Okay, the video is playing automatically on the site. Okay, so yeah, I guess I'll say a thing about that really quick. There is a landing page for this event, theory-underground.com forward slash launch has the poster for both days as well as uh, links for the current video and then the one tomorrow as well as additional information about that. We also might have a guest, a special guest before our first guest today. Daniel Tut is going to be joining us um, in basically an hour, and uh, we might get a visit from Nina Power. Speaking of de-schooling society by Ivan Illich, Nina Power actually has taught courses on that work, and so we really hope that she'll be able to get in here. Uh, Marilyn, if you would like to say anything before you go back to work, uh, we would love to, to hear your reflections on courses so far. I'd like to prioritize people who pop in here who have to get back to work. But if you're already going back to work, no worries. I am a little bit late for a meeting, but sure. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I started in academia. Um, you know, that was sort of a career path I veered off of, ended up in a temporary job that became a permanent job. So I've been trying throughout the years to like continue to learn and read and, um, you know, write and do all these things. And um, what I've found with Theory Underground is it's like an awesome community to learn together and, um, you know, really go deep into a work. Um, taking Mikey's course um, on Zizek and it's awesome. <laughs> so much fun. And I just really love, um, you know, having that community to uh, bounce ideas off of and, um, you know, learn. It, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. So, but I do have to run. Okay. Happy launch. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for stopping by. You can also, you're welcome to join anytime. And to everybody else, um, the people who do have an invitation to the Zoom call, um, if you're watching this back or while it's still occurring, I just want you to all know that you're welcome to always join and be in the background of the Zoom call. And what I mean by being in the background is um, I hope that if you have a computer in front of you, you'll actually be in the live chat and engage with the live chat and then relay important information. Uh, Nance, are you there right now? Can you uh, appear? Yeah. Appear, Nance. Uh, I think. What the heck is going on now? Okay. How's it going, What's happening? Um, it's I'm about good. To, it's going well. Uh, we're about to talk to Elton here, and then we're going to talk to Anne because they're both also co-instructors. But uh, I just wanted to touch base. How's it going in the live chat? Is there anything I need to know about? No, we uh, were asking some questions, but you addressed them as far as future access to the courses. Sweet. I've just made you a managing moderator for the chat. Um, I made Anne 
a moderator before. Adam, you're also a moderator. Basically, everybody who's in the Zoomed call side, if you've got eyes on chat, you're a moderator so you can ban the trolls. Anglo pessimism, is that what your shirt says? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, I'm going to do a test here to see if, if, uh, if in the chat to see if Nightbot is currently supported. I don't think it's supported right now. I, I tried to set it up yesterday. Oh, <gasps> we do. We have Nightbot in the chat. So we can add to this over the next couple of days. I want to make it so that all links are available on demand. All you'll have to do is do, use an exclamation point and uh, put the command in. I think you can actually do a thing where you do exclamation point commands and it will give you a list of all existing commands and then you can sit there and play with that. But with that said, um, thanks Nance. I'm gonna bring you back in a minute um, once, once we've talked to Elton because I think he might have to go in a little bit. So Elton, if you can appear, psh, psh, appear. Um, how's it going, man? Good morning. It's going good. Um, just at a coffee shop, so you may hear some other people in the background, but hopefully they're not too loud. No, no, that'll be totally fine. If they, if they, if if I'm on a rant, you can always mute yourself while I'm doing it, but then unmute yourself when you're talking because I think that Zoom will prioritize your voice over theirs in the background. But yeah, um, so. let's yeah. talk about the course that we both just finished. Uh, and that and we didn't finish it because the, the saying always overflows the said, as, as Emmanuel Levinas says uh, in Totality and Infinity. To, th what does that mean? It means that you, awesome. discourse is moving, right? Yeah. But this is only a way of people yeah. getting a basis in the conversation. And the conversation is pro the professional managerial class, consciousness and ideology. Um, so why do you think it was important? I, mean, I you know, I have my own reasons, but I'm curious what you might think, Elton. Why do you think it might be might have been an, an important thing to lead off with at Theory Underground? So, I mean, I think so uh, talking about the PMC, so the professional managerial class, and we read a bunch of different sources coming from different perspectives, um, in, you know, including Thomas Frank and James um, Bernhardt and um, Barbara Ehrenreich and uh, Catherine Liu. And I know there was a couple more <laughs> in there. But, did you say um, James Bernhardt? Was... What did you say? James Burnham. Oh, Burnham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said it right. Okay. Okay. Maybe I said it wrong, but <laughs> thank you. No, it's perfect. Um, it's perfect. And then, um, Sorry, yeah, know. so why it's important to me is... You know, I think like, you know, just for example, like when I did go to college and get my degree, it was very much a, a process that, you know, I recognize now is kind of like um, incorporating me into the PMC and um, disseminating the PMC values to me and I think talking about the PMC and giving that kind of perspective um, brings some, you know, consciousness. I guess that was the na name of the class, um, some PMC consciousness, which is important, you know, first of all, because like, um, you know, like when I went through that process, it, it was actually kind of alienating, like where, you know, I, I didn't even kind of like, I couldn't even relate with, you know, a lot of the people that I had like grown up with, for example. And I think by um, having some awareness, then it, it can be um, something where education is not something that's like converting you into an elitist, but it's something that you can use as a tool, you know, like um, to improve yourself and act in your community and build community but not in a way that's you know essentially like making sure that you get what you need and then and and the uh you know capacity to um look down upon everybody else right so from your position and i think you said this in our conversation with Catherine lou when she joined and we got to interview her and then she on the private side, met students from this cohort. Um, I think that you were saying um, 
your approach to the PMC is primarily an interest in understanding like how prejudice function. It, you said it's almost just like people who haven't thought about being white, you know, people who haven't thought about being PMC. For you, you are more interested in this kind of, it no. seems like, it's almost like identity politics. Like it's, okay. it's, you, you kind of think about it like a, like a form of identity politics. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly what I'm saying, but I mean, it's, it's one of those things where um, PMC um, can be like, and, I, and let me put it this way, is that, um, I, <laughs> I apologize. Um, when you are PMC, it ends up becoming easy. I think maybe a better way to say it is just kind of like, it's easy to look to identity politics and use that as your kind of like tool for, um, you know, doing good in the world. Um, but like as we talked about in the class, part of what the PMC is about in order to, um, establish itself as a you know like it's not quite a ruling class but but it has some social clout it actually is overtly trying to um avoid class consciousness um and yes. so then yeah the the identity politics ends up being like um a, a justice struggle that the pmc can focus on and do good in the world, but then, you know, essentially, like, really um, causes harm to the working class, um, specifically in, in a way that um, allows the PMC to hold on to the power and, and prestige that it does have. Excellent. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I, I forgot to introduce you, and I'm going to try to get better about that oh, yeah. throughout the day. But basically, everybody, Elton LK has two podcasts. One is called Working Class Intelligentsia. It is about Gromsky. The other is called Class, and it is uh, through the DSA. Um, he is my liberal left, progressive leftist friend, and one of the only ones I have remaining at this point. Um, I have a few. But you're you're the main one, and uh, and what I mean by that is that, I mean, of course, I have normie, liberal and progressive and 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 leftist kinds of friends. Like they're just that's just kind of their predisposition. They're not into theory and philosophy. They're not thinking about this deeply. Uh, they just they just kind of live it, and that's okay. Um, I also have, you know, Trump family members, and I, you know, I've got whatever. I don't whatever. I like people despite their politics. Right. If, if all a person has going for them is their politics, I don't like them. I don't want to talk to them. I will try to avoid them as best I can. Um, but you you had a lot more going on than just, uh, say, a normie uh, who's like a Democrat or, or might be involved with the DSA. In that, you do think about things philosophically, theoretically, critically, and you like to foster dialogue and discourse with people who are not of your ideological bent or commitments and so you are also the lead organizer and founder of the dead parrot philosophical society in boise idaho we met like what seven eight years ago seven six i don't know would it have been 2016 does that yeah, sound right i think Something so like that yeah, yeah I, I brought a speaker to talk about sustainable agriculture, Joel Salatin, to Boise State. And that's how you found me, which is really funny because I'm studying philosophy. You studied philosophy and almost became a professor. And then you decided to do this dead parrot thing instead while working a regular job. Um, and so, you know, I just always appreciated that you're trying to make education freely available. And uh, I guess the... The, the question about identity politics, uh, it, 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 if, if, if this is a matter of consciousness raising, if, if PMC consciousness matters, um, then it almost becomes a kind of identity politics itself. And some people do engage in it like, oh, well, I don't care what your opinion is because you're PMC. Oh, you're just PMC. Fuck you, you're PMC. Uh, so it becomes a slur in that case. 
but also like if, if this more nuanced approach could still easily be assimilatable into the identity politics mode. But I also think that it's a, it's kind of like the the id pull response to id pull to end id pull and move people into thinking about class in a more rigorous way, right? And so I want to. I think we have like five more minutes, six more minutes here before I want to bring on Anne, and we're going to talk about um, these courses. Um, but before before I do that, uh, I wanted to like, I want to make. My big thing is that the PMC, identity politics, and standpoint epistemology, the most frustrating tendencies with the DSA or with the Democrats today, but really with social change circles everywhere, whether that's in nonprofits, in government, or not, um, the, the most frustrating tendencies for a working class person coming from the blue collar and going into the university, the, the biggest, or, or into social change spaces, the biggest frustration repeatedly is I think all of these things are just downstream species of a greater genus that I'm calling discursive Taylorism. And so uh, I want to, I want to make sense of what I just said, uh, but by, by, by quilting it after you explain Taylorism and its relevance to the PMC for people who may have never really thought about it in this connection, because in your first lecture, and by the way, everybody up on the screen, you look at the Theory Underground channel on YouTube, you'll see professional managerial class and ideology. The playlist is the second playlist currently featured. And you're able to listen to all of the lectures as well as the exegetical readings from that entire course for free. I've already got people binging it at work. And so that's really good to know because every time this term comes up in the discourse, people don't read the essential readings. They don't get a basis in this theoretically. They just get a couple of tweets that summarize something and then they form opinions about it, which is pretty much the internet today. But if you want to see this lecture that he's about to reference, go to the very beginning. Uh, this the, the playlist is currently newest to oldest video. So just go to the very bottom and uh, start with first lectures, how progressives invented the PMC to save capitalism and divide the working class. Um, Elton, I'm gonna step away to get more coffee, but I'll be listening on my headphones. Could you maybe let everybody know what they need to know about Taylorism? You bet. So um, at the, you know, the end of the 19th century in America, um, capitalism really started to um, take off in a way that it had never before. So you've got like the Rockefellers and um, JP Morgan and, and those that were bringing in so much wealth, but the class conflict between the working class and the capitalist class was also coming to a fevered pitch. And the violence between the two classes was um, becoming very you know, visible the capitalist class uh, on some level, you know, consciously or not, uh, began looking for other approaches other than Pinkerton's just to, you know, shut down the worker strikes and that kind of stuff. And, um, you, you know, essentially there, there was this class, the PMC, that had, had been around for a long time, but they um, started looking to you know find ways to bring harmony between the capitalist class and the workers to bring up the workers but also to um you know bring some stability to society and taylorism is refer referencing uh taylor in particular this guy who you know was part of this professional managerial class that um was essentially just an engineer applying engineering to factory work or whatever kind of work and trying to um, rethink um, how product production occurred and um, he even you know referred to it as scientific so he's trying he's developing a science around process improvements and the reason why this is important is because he he believed that it was, you know, the the thing that would bring that class harmony, that it would not only um, 
give the workers the ability to, um, you know, um, get more done, make more money um, because they were being more productive, um, but then also make the capitalists happier. And um, it didn't require the violence. Instead, what it required was um, de-skilling of the work, making it um, something where the capitalist, the business owner, had some level of control about how work was done, who had the skills, and um, and then of course, you know, making sure that maximum productivity was occurring. This is important because the workers um, may have brought their own skills to the workplace and because they had those skills, it meant that they could tell the boss, you know, like um, how much how much productivity could occur. It gave them some leverage over um, what their job looked like and it um, it meant that the boss had to like depend upon them for that expertise. So Taylor came along, came up with some way of scientifically measuring, and I, you know, I should say in quotes, scientifically measuring um, productivity. I think he had good intentions and that kind of stuff. But the but the what ended up happening was um, it took that um, craft that skill away from the worker, put it into the hands of the, the PMC to mm -hmm. control how production occurred. And that just being like, you know, essentially like an important foundation on what the 20th century looked like, which was that extraction of skilled labor from the working class um, throughout the economy and, um, you know, and thus, you know, the world we live in today where there's, there's more conflict between the working class and the PMC than there is between the working class and the capitalists. 100%. How's that? That's perfect. Yeah. And so basically in the principles of scientific management, as well as important pieces like W.E.B. Du Bois' more conservative younger years when he wrote The Talented Tenth, which can be found in The Souls of Black Folk. It's, it was written separately, but it's included in that text today. Um, you, what you see is the professional managerial class calling for itself to become a distinct class. So you said it, it already existed, but I would say it only existed in sort of proto form right? It was like 2% of the population before it became like 25% in a lot of cases. And so the yeah. PMC revolutionizing uh, the, the way that businessmen relate to the university, the way that the state relates to the university. And instead of calling in Pinkertons to break up unions, as Barbara Ehrenreich says in the seminal, the professional manager in class essay, um, she she says in, in the same you know instead of calling in Pinkertons to break up the working class or the union, um, instead we're going to create uh, some 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 mediators, uh, a mediator class that will have a self consciousness of having this paternalistic role as well as a sense of meritocracy. Oh, I've earned it through college. I've earned this leadership position. I've earned a uh, three hundred thousand dollar per year salary. Um, and you, because you didn't do good at school, your job is to nod along, smile, follow my lead. And if you don't, then you're just a filthy deplorable. And that's the end of the story. And so obviously the, 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 that being, being the, the general underlying message, as Thomas Frank shows, of the Democratic Party, especially since the 70s, mm -hmm. um, fosters a lot of working class antagonism that is objective it's objective material antagonism. It's not created by populists. It's fed on by populists. And so what we have today is the left PMC blaming populism for creating what is actually an, an objective antagonism that they have become so uh, 
uh, ignorant of, right? Willfully, woefully ignorant of their role and function in the reproduction of this class society. So they get to virtue hoard with their relative freed up time and energy, as well as like higher skill sets and monopolized skills that come by way of specialized education. And uh, this is this 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 monopolization feature is what I'm getting to when I talk about discursive Taylorism because we don't care about professionals in engineering. We don't care about professionals in 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 you know heart surgeons need to be professionals. Um, the point you know th the point is not to be anti-professional and in any potential future society there will be management positions. The point is an attitude and a mindset regarding meritocracy, regarding uh, uh, sort of a condescension for uh, the working class, and most importantly, this uh, it's this monopolization of a set of skills and then thinking, because I am a specialist who's monopolized a set of skills, um, it's my role to tell everyone else how it's going to be and then to gatekeep, right? And so... That's fine when it's professions that we all rely on that actually create our world. But when it's the ideological enforcers, the ideological police, the educators, the media journalists, what the, the, the people who step in to serve as actual priests or as uh, secular priests, the point is, is uh, no, no, I... Uh, this is discursive Taylorism, and it's not necessary. Discursive Taylorism has to do with taking every fucking thing that we can talk about, that we can think about, that is relevant to our cultural lives, and monopolizing that and putting it into special little categories and saying, well, certain people are able to talk about that, but you're not. And so obviously, in the, in the lecture where I brought in Dr. Adolf Reed Jr., I said, well, I can get in trouble for this because I'm talking about something as a white person. I'm talking about the black PMC. I'm not supposed to talk about this. Dr. Adolf Reed Jr. is a good, he, he, he provides a good case for why this sort of maintenance of and monopolization of these ascriptive hierarchies and arguments over which ones are just or unjust on the basis of prejudice obfuscates and renders invisible, naturalizes those ascriptive hierarchies that aren't based in prejudice, right? Um, and so the, the book, The Problem with Diversity, focuses on those kinds of inequality that are not based in prejudice, such as someone who got laid off because of Reagan's policies. Someone who got laid off, went bankrupt, family was poor, dealt with a lot of uh, misery and the family was torn apart because a job was sent overseas or because uh, the union was busted and the factory was shut down. Um, that, that person is not represented by the Democratic Party anymore. And if they are, then it's, you know, it's, it's tokenization, it's speech, it's words only, right? And so discursive Taylorism is, is probably the main thing that I think underground theorists have to be against. And so that's why I had to be front and center. Is there anything you want to say in close to people who have not taken this course, who might be taking this course in the future? Um, I basically just, I think it was a great process, you know, as being um, involved in this, you know, as a teacher, I've learned a lot as well. Um, I think that there's a lot of content there that is like way beyond what the PMC discourse is online. Um, it, it, it's when PMC gets brought up in almost all instances, I find that people are just being really dismissive, like, oh, that was obnoxious um, when, you know, everybody was talking about that in, in 2019 or something like that. But um, I think that this course is talking about um, you know, really like kind of reassessing what happened in the 20th century and how did we get here today in a way that um, basically I think we need to be talking about. And I even feel like somewhat... Um, resentful that it took this long before um, I stumbled upon this kind of uh, yeah. discourse that there really is a lot there and it, that conversation has been going it just hasn't been talked about in the education I got at, at university or of course not in the mainstream
All right, and I better get going. But thanks so much uh, thanks for joining, everybody. Elton. Yep. Thanks so much for joining. Take care. Um, you too. And then, Anne, if you can reveal yourself, and as you do so, I will just say that the thing I left out is that, you know, there is the more progressive approach to the PMC and understanding that, like, uh, well, it's a matter of prejudice and ignorance, and we have to develop our consciousness of it, and, and, and that developing our consciousness of it undermines the worst tendencies of identity politics itself, right? But there's also a Marxist reason why it's important for anyone who's influenced by thinking about radical transformation of society and wanting to make a break with capitalism, this PMC thing, discursive Taylorism, it's the number one way in which Marxism was undermined within the Soviet Union, as well as in the States and uh, with, with organizing before the rise of the new left. And the rise of the new left was in a sense, halfway conscious of the problem. But with that said, welcome, Anne, how you doing? I'm good. I'm happy to be here. It's great to have to you. everyone. Just so everybody knows, um, Anne and I have been together for four and a half years. We are engaged, um, and the the ad the ad the ad that I will be playing, <laughs> I'll be playing an advertisement throughout the marathon live stream, and I just want everyone to know, we didn't put ourselves in there with like the, the, the reference to the wedding with like, well, that wasn't premeditated. It was kind of after the fact. Um, I just wanted to say that because the fact is I don't want to constantly quilt Anne as the partner. Um, Anne is a thinker in her own right. She's got a lot that she's working on. And uh, so basically what I wanted to give you an opportunity to do, Anne, is to talk about instruct being one of the co-instructors of the idea of university and being a student in the professional managerial class consciousness and ideology courses. Um, and basically just in a few minutes, talk about, talk about that. Like, how was that? Uh, what was the experience of, of teaching your first theory underground course and of being a student in your first theory undergrad course? Yeah. Um, teaching the kind of first course on the theory underground website was really awesome experience, I think, because I had just come from teaching a course at the university last spring. And so I really got to kind of see the difference and see ways that I could still do the same thing, like kind of the lectures that I like to give, use resources in the same way, but then just having a base of students who were there for the content, who wanted to engage and ask questions and really think about what I was saying rather than like the experience at the university where maybe in your class of 25 you have like three people total who are engaged and so it was like you took all the engaged people and concentrated them <laughs> into one class and so that was just really cool in itself um it was amazing too to see how many new people we were able to bring in because obviously I knew you and I knew Brian before starting this um and Nance was kind of like just getting into the community but we were like we had a pretty big a pretty good cohort for that first run of the idea of the university course and everyone was just had such great ideas to contribute everyone was active and participating in the course and in the forum as well and so it was really Cool to also kind of see the online aspect of a course be utilized to its fullest potential because same thing contrasting that with the university you have websites like blackboard or something like that and when students are required to engage on the forum it's very superficial it's all like mandatory and so yeah it was just kind of a a difference and at the same time that i'm it was you know working through the idea of the university course and working on my own lectures and just reading Jasper's, like just reading that book. I want to force every college student to read it. And I know that's impossible. And I actually kind of mention it in my final project for this course of why the way that the current university exists would never have us reading something on the level of Jasper's. But even just doing that course, it had my brain working like, oh, if I were to teach a college course again, this is what I do. This is what I would do. Like this, I'd make students read this book. And so it was just an overall like 
as someone who is still kind of building her teaching abilities and who's excited about the prospect of teaching again, it was a really good place to like workshop and get ideas and work with an exciting group of people. And so I, I think it was like for a first course, kind of figuring out deadlines and what to require and what not to require and how to structure everything. I think it was really good kind of first experiment to get our footing at Theory Underground. I know that David was like helpful for you. We kind of oh yeah tried and experimented with some things. And then as far as being a student for the next course, the PMC course, that was also a really good experience getting to use the forum as the student and even like in the classes and the lectures since the pmc course was a little bit more like lecture based than the idea of the university course we still had lectures but there was a lot more time to like engage uh as a group in the zoom call and then in the pmc course it was really just dave and elton lecturing so that was just cool in its own right to be like oh i'm cooking dinner and listening to like this wonderful lecture on Barbara Ehrenreich's essay and, and kind of the development of the PMC. So on the one hand, that's, I think, something that Theory Underground is offering that no one else is. It's like, you just have the option to listen to a course while you're doing your regular stuff or going on a walk or cooking dinner or playing Tetris or doing art or whatever. Like, you know, rather than just listening to music or listening to some podcast or like I think Dave said earlier, listening to someone else talk about theory and philosophy and, and books and articles. It's just like, oh, I'm just listening to like a really high quality lecture with people who have done the reading and done the work while I'm like doing my chores. And so that was really cool. And then to use the forum as a student to get your thoughts out and get feedback. And also you brought Catherine Liu on for us students to kind of bounce some of our ideas for our final projects off of and she was she's really cool so that was also awesome i think that's something else that theory underground is able to offer is i mean already you have like you bring on so many like big names kind of within the academic sphere just in this live stream call i know that alenka zupan spoiler alert everyone alenka zupanchik's gonna show up for some session of the what is sex course? And Martin Heidegger is actually going to be there for the being in time course. So, <laughs> uh, um, but I think because a lot of these academics and thinkers and journalists are also like tired of the mainstream, tired of academia, they're so ready. Like I've just been really surprised to see every day. Dave's like, oh, I'm talking to this person on the email right now. They're going to do this. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's like really cool. Like, all these people I think care about or support the idea of the theory underground and want to be involved in some way, whether it's showing up for a lecture interview, contributing something to the theory, underground theory volume one, like not other spaces aren't bringing on these, these thinkers and these journalists like firsthand. So that was really exciting to meet Catherine Liu. I know we had uh, one person uh, recently who had participated in one of the courses and they were kind of worried about some of our takes when it comes to uh, stuff we've said in the past, um, specifically in defense of Slavoj Žižek. Um, and th this person was basically like, look, I, I, I get the PMC thing, but also I have a career. I have to, I have a public image. I have to maintain it. I'm not sure if I want to be affiliated with Theory Underground because I never know what what takes you're going to be dropping or what you might be defending or who you might be associating with. And the fact is, you're not the only people doing radical stuff. You're not the only people doing like cool like indie journals. You're not the only people doing blah 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 blah. This whole thing of like you're not, you're not, you're not. And here's the thing: I would just say, if other people were doing it, I wouldn't be doing it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't feel the need to build it. So. If you can't tell the difference, then it's probably not for you. If This is not for people who already feel like they belong in existing things. And we're not trying to create a place where people will comfortably feel like they belong. Because ultimately, this is kind of like, I'm inviting you into my living room and we're doing some underground shit. So it's like, it's never going to be anyone's thing except for my thing, Anne's thing. Like, we're, we're getting married. This is like our thing. 
And it's primarily my obsession from over the last 10 years culminating in something. And that's why I always say friends and fellow travelers is because you don't belong here. You belong on your own intellectual journey. And the goal is to see many things like this pop up over time. Um, but as far as like people I genuinely consider fellow travelers, they're going to be people who have a basis in the subject matters and they will be able to demonstrate that they have a basis in the subject matters because just because we're going underground doesn't mean we lower the standards. We go underground because the standards have been lowered and now we're looking for real discourse. And so we have people participating um, and contributing to theory underground, underground Theory Volume 1 that are big names. We're not going to announce any of those names today, but we've got some big names involved. They are renegade PMCs. They are renegade academics. Mm -hmm. They are not people who can publish in a lot of mainstream theory things. And they're people who are too problematic for most existing um, radical journals, the ones that think that you have to have the correct takes on everything. And so, no, we're, we're human and we're not these overproduced you know, uh, uh, focus group, workshopped kinds of identities that are on a treadmill towards a social and cultural capital for its own sake or for, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we, we've got our livelihoods to look after, but we're not trying to make it dependent on those institutions, which is why we have a little bit more freedom. So, um, and, uh, is there anything else you want to say on that as far as like, Anything? Yeah, because uh, I want to. Yeah. We've got about uh, seven more minutes, and we're going to bring on Nance and Adam so they can talk about the current courses that they're involved with. And then later today, we will talk about the upcoming courses. Um, but yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think something that, you know, reading Carl Jasper's The Idea of the University was important for in thinking about theory underground because the idea of the university is a positive critique of the university. And so I imagine that it is something that we are aspiring towards here at the Theory Underground because what Jasper's kind of lays out what a university should look like is not present in the modern university. And some of those things include academic freedom and a place for like real dialogue and, and even disagreement um, or, you know, two things that he said, like, that's really important in a in a university and currently with you know the way that act like modern activism is going is speakers are being shut down they are being at this point in time in the last couple weeks months like physically assaulted um just for ideas just for saying things you know whether or not you as an individual agree with something or not like that's your prerogative but we have to not be afraid of ideas anymore. And so I think, like, I feel like the precedent that's being set here at Theory Underground is like, yeah, obviously we're not going to tolerate, like, bigotry, racism, what, like, whatever. Like, you leave that shit out of here. It's 2023, you know? But we really don't see a whole lot of, like, true bigotry in any of this discourse in general. I think the discourse has just become so like hypersensitive and everything is seen as violent that like people are scared to talk. They're scared to say anything. I feel it in my own like kind of spheres and people who I've worked with before in local theater and fellow friends. I'm like, I can't say or post anything that is like remotely in disagreement with this one thing based in my own reasons or whatever, because I'll get called a Nazi or whatever. And so with that being said, I think that the like precedent that has been set in the theory underground is no, like let's explore these ideas. We're gonna say things that maybe go against, you know, the, the current like social discourse that maybe someone somewhere finds offensive but words are not violent, especially when we're not even like next to each other. It's literally online. Like we can't be violent in this space with our words um, because we're not in the same room. <laughs> so, so I think, yeah, like if you're so concerned with, you know, oh, this idea that Theory Underground is doing or, oh, you're teaching Heidegger and Heidegger was a Nazi and maybe we shouldn't, like respectfully, fuck off. And I say that like, 
there are institutions for you out there. If you really just need this like academic, like safe space, like go find it. It exists. We are trying to be like a different kind of safe space in the, in the sense that like, say what you've got to say. We're not going to immediately judge you. This is a really good space for, for working out ideas, for struggling with texts, for being, being wrong. Like my, oh my gosh, in the way that the current university system is, or not the, just the university, but like school in general with, with grades and like this pressure to got to get the highest grade, to go to the best school, to get the best career. You really just feel like I have to be perfect all the time. I can't be seen, you know, making mistakes on essays. My, my first draft has to be a perfect draft. And I think that's something we're trying to like deconstruct here at the Theory Underground and no, use the forum to work out ideas and, and do these exegetical readings and really try to like figure it out. And so you're kind of like publicly flailing in a sense, like, like you're publicly thinking though, the flailing is in the thinking and that only makes you stronger. And so I'm like excited and scared to embark on reading being in time. Like we were, you and I read Gender Trouble a few years ago together and that's the hardest text I've ever yeah. read. I no, I was not assigned like anything remotely difficult in the university. Like maybe the hardest thing was like Aristotle. Um, but that, yeah, it's just a space for being wrong sometimes or even being offensive sometimes because we're all just in this journey of like thinking together and, and figuring out our own thoughts, not only on text, but like on what's going on in the culture. I think that's like, Obviously, you know, you can read your, all the important parts of reading, like read first, then write, then connect it to other things. Um, but it's still like these texts help you think about what's going on culturally with like everything. And yeah, like if you're just scared of everything, if you think words and ideas are violent, again, like respectfully fuck off, like just go do something else. We're not hurting you. Stay out of it. That's that's my spiel. <laughs> and I would just add to it to say that I am totally okay with the idea that words are violent, that they you can be harmed by them. I know people going around spreading false rumors about us has caused us harm in a real sense, actually undermining our future. So words in that sense, words that are deceitful, words that are self-serving and vengeful, well, it can be harmful. Um, we're not talking about that kind of words, but first, but also I would just want to say if, for instance, reading Dr. Adolph Reed Jr. challenges you and then you actually feel harmed by it, then I would say there is the potential that it's a kind of harm, but it's the kind of harm that you do to your body when you work out. It's the kind of harm that Fight Club is doing, except it's intellectual. And I believe in intellectual Fight Club. Not, not debate for debate's own sake, but challenging ourselves and our presuppositions and reading the most challenging uh, thinkers from the history of philosophy who are the most outside of our wheelhouses. Yeah, that's 100% where we're coming from. Nance and Adam, can you turn on your cameras to join myself and Anne? We've got uh, like uh, five to six minutes left. I want you each to just talk about the courses you've taken so far and what you think about those, as well as anything that you want to touch on from the chat. Who wants to go first? Nance is first. Nance. <laughs> MVP. All right. Hola. Um, first in the chat, shout out Andrew Flores. I don't know if he's still there. And then uh, Andrew Parsons was talking about how took him a while to kind of see how this works together and why it makes sense and how it is in fact the case. And I'm, I'm on the same boat. Like it, it was only a few months ago. I was like, oh, I don't want to hear about the PMC. I don't care. Um, and going through the idea of the university and the PMC course together really kind of made me realize I was already like focused on why the PMC sucks in the first place. I just didn't call it that. Like I was like, Oh, those are stupid rad libs or neoliberal bullshit. Like, like it is that structural critique. It's just called the PMC and it's become a boogeyman word. Um, so yeah, I'm in the same boat, Andrew Parsons. 
Um, and going through those courses, I think has really given me the opportunity to uh, give a shit again and like think it's worth thinking about this stuff. Because I think I got to a point where I was burnt out and I was just like, whatever, everything sucks, fuck it. Um, but I do see a lot of utility here engaging with other people who actually give a shit um, and not caring about social games and profiles and numbers and all the stuff that I don't really do in the first place. So it's it's really cool over here and I like it. It's been great having you, Nance. Uh, what's up? I'm Adam. So uh, well, the reason I even came to this to this, I don't know what you call fight club, intellectual fight club here, uh, is, uh, I would say thanks to Gabriel Rockhill, uh, stirring <laughs> shit with Zizek and then the young Zizekians, uh, assembling. And, uh, I came across, you know, theory underground basically through that and saw that y'all had a Zizek course. So I jumped in because I've been trying to read this stuff to myself for the past couple of years. And, you know, I mean, I read a lot of books, but this is it's not the easiest kind of subject matter to tackle by yourself. No background with Lacan, no background with Hegel, any of that. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, I, I feel like I feel like equipped to start reading Hegel thanks to this course because I've finally got some vocabulary, and a lot of that has to do with my interactions with the people in this course, who span the the gamut of like you know day work you know day labor at, at in warehouses to people that have been working in academia for the last decade and change and each of those interactions i've had with all this these different kinds of people i would never be able to have these kinds of interactions but obviously by myself but on the internet uh even if i were to go into to a college setting i'm always going to be around the same like homogenous group and i'm the kind of person who really just can't stand being in that kind of a room so honestly, up until coming across Theory Underground, I really didn't think there was going to be a place for me ever anywhere to be able to discuss anything intellectual. Uh, my friend group is all working class. And, uh, you know, the most common expression is you think too, you think too much, you're overthinking. And, you know, there's only so much of that that, that you can take in your life. Um, so it's it's just amazing to be able to be in this kind of a uh, group where it's 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 weirdly reminiscent of roller derby where we have this kind of un, unwritten first rule of derby is just don't be a douchebag everything past that is fine just don't be a douchebag express yourself in the way you need to be be mindful of the space don't shit in the pool but we're not here to be influencers and we're not here developing our social cachet uh, we're not here to increase our paycheck uh, we're here to get you know tits deep in theory and i love that and i love the the come as you are kind of thing and that's especially useful for me because well i come fucking weird you know so <laughs> and i mean that in every sense of the word yeah yeah you you you, you you've kind of told me a little bit about that and anybody who makes a, a reference to roller derby you know you know it but, um, you know, speaking of don't be a douchebag, like, look, we slip up sometimes. I, I, I like I apologize to Adam recently for kind of snapping at him at the end of a lecture because it, it was not his fault at all. He was suggesting he was suggesting to continue after I was like, I cannot continue. I was like at my wits end. And uh, and then when I when I was like, I'm sorry, man. And then he was like, don't apologize. It's not a big deal. And then he basically said that, you know, I, I agreed after the fact or whatever. It's like, no, no, no. But the point wasn't the point, right? The point was that I was being a douchebag, right? So like it's – I'd broken the the rule, which is just don't be a douchebag. But like I think that my – what I was – where I was coming from mattered and I, what I was saying mattered. And I wasn't sorry for what I was saying. I was just sorry for how I said it, right? But, you know, I just, that's just a general thing and we all do it. We all, well, probably do it. I mean, especially people who don't fit into academic environments, right? 
like uh, I know Adam hates memes, but I'm just gonna go ahead and show this meme anyway. Uh, Theory Underground, the Instagram has a lot of memes uh, that are all original. Almost all of them are original. Like I, I make my own formats, and so in that sense, I consider myself, uh, uh, I don't know, like cutting edge on the meme frontier, I suppose, because I found a lot of formats that were brand new. <laughs> and Adam's like, I like I don't to consider care. myself somewhat of a memeologist. Adam's like, I don't care about your fucking memes. But look, I, I'm just kidding. Look, I'm going to play it though because the, the, the caption is what too many years of faculty and administration meetings followed by sensitivity workshops does to a person who just wanted to study and teach philosophy. Now, you won't have it on your screen here, guys, but it's just it's Biden uh, having a conversation like on the news or whatever with Jill Biden. But here we go. I'm going to push play. So would you like to say a couple words? <laughs> Am I supposed to speak now or is, yes. is Karen supposed to speak? I don't know. I don't want to get in trouble here. Oh, it's me. Okay. Well. And so the basic point is, is that's what too many meetings and, and sensitivity workshops does to a person, to your spirit. And so if you feel comfortable in those institutional environments where there's a lot of that, have at it. Leave us alone. We're gonna we're gonna be uncouth sometimes. Anne has her hand up. I kind of want to say something in that regard. As I've kind of deemed myself like one of the token women of the theory underground. I know that obviously Marilyn was here earlier. She's been involved in the for they know not what they do course and just like a general like supporter of everything that you've done. Dave Nikki is also involved in the for they know not what they do. So there are like in this group of mostly guys, a few women. But I just wanted to say kind of on the like, yeah, this is a, you know, a safe space, if you will. It's like, this stuff is just going to, in general, attract more men. Like, Lacanian analysis will kind of say, men are the obsessives, women tend to be a little bit more focused on like relationships. And so, I think the like, oh, don't be a douchebag, but there is kind of this like bro -y nature. It's still like a very, it's like different because it is like a very welcoming space because everyone's just here to think about ideas. And I think if you are like not male identifying, you just have to understand that like, that is the philosophy sphere. That is, that is just what it is right now. Like just fucking deal with it. Um, so I don't know where I was going with that. I, ha I had more to say, I think, but just that, yeah, like sometimes I hear Dave like talking to Mikey or Nick or Andrew and they're like yelling at each other, like snapping at each other. And then like five minutes later, they're like, oh, we're fine. And I think that's just like a guy thing. And so that is just to say, yeah, this space can like, maybe you're in, if you're, if you are like a woman or some other gender identifying person and like don't be intimidated by the fact that this the just the general like philosophy and theory spaces are a bit more like male dominated because everyone in this community is like here for ideas and like genuinely welcoming to everyone i've always felt like welcome and included in like the spaces as like an equal and yeah this lineup you've got like a bunch of cool women coming on and so but there is like a yeah, it's kind of more of like a broy space at times. Yeah, yeah. and we're not going to try to fix that, but we do welcome mm -hmm. women who like to participate in such spaces. The last thing I want to say before we turn over to the ad is that there is an ad that I am rolling between every segment. And so I'm going to start it right now. We're going to have a conversation in the background with Daniel Tut, and then we will be on to talk about leisure, Nietzsche's OTM, Daniel Tut's next book, and... Time Energy. We'll be right back after this. And now a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house 
by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important, yet neglected, for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 tier is too much, consider donating towards Meals and Gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The Gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the U.S., where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events, not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being and Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory, a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at Tier 3, you also get access to the Recovery Group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? One of the most succinct and cutting edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know everybody, don't stress the capitalization, I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in Time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video. 
or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, people tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah. And seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye. Alright everybody, welcome to Theory Underground. I am your host, David McCarricker, and today we are joined by Daniel Tut. How's it going, Daniel? It's going great. Thanks so much for having me on. This is exciting. Yeah, it's a well, I mean, it's I, I kind of am really happy that you are the first guest in a two-day lineup of a lot of really big names and significant fellow travelers and colleagues and collaborators. Um, because we've never had a conversation before on a stream, much less really like by voice, except for like little snippets of voice chat, like through Messenger. That's right. Yeah. You know, you, you kind of have a presence on the channel already because we played one of your voice messages that you sent us for the young Zizekian mm -hmm. defense of Slavoj. And, uh, but the reason I wanted to bring you on for this specifically, it's a conversation we've been thinking about and we've been talking about having for a while because... You were on the Cave Way channel, which uh, became the Vanishing Mediators. That's their new name. Yep. With, uh, was it Andrew and Nick, both? Yep. That's right. For sure. And I think that in that conversation, you, you ended up both talking about, you all talked about time, energy, and leisure a little bit. And I remember like pulling my hair out over here, like, Andrew, Nick, you guys are reading my book. You got to defend it. It's not the same thing as leisure. It's related. It's related. Uh -huh. It's related. But it's not the exact same thing. Um, the two are complementary. And in the early days, when I first started reading, up on the, I mean, when I, when this became an obsession for me, I was thinking of it in terms of leisure. But once it became a technical concept, the, part of the technical nature of the concept is meant to compensate for how people tend to think about time and energy. And mm. part of the issue is how people think about time and energy 
in a capitalist world where they've both been commodified in their own ways, but specifically in the form of labor power, right? And so creating, cre uh, you know, Foucault, you're f probably familiar with the pardon, discipline, and punishment on the, the, the bells, right? With the discipline of the working class, like train, it takes something to train a person to become the kind of person who can be at a lot of different places on time and perform a lot of dumb tasks, right? Mm. And so this, this uh, will, I want to get more into time energy, but first I want to talk about leisure as you've approached it through Nietzsche with your upcoming work. The last thing I'll say is yeah. you are the author of Psychoanalysis and the Politics of the Family, The Crisis of Initiation, and the upcoming book is How to Read Like a Parasite, What the Left Needs to Know About Nietzsche, which I read a section of, which is on Nietzsche and Odium. Can we talk about Odium? Yeah, definitely. Again, really grateful to be on. Um, long time, long time coming. Uh, yes. So, you know, I think a couple things should be noted about the politics of leisure time, and then we can get to the philosophical questions that underpin the problem of leisure, the problem of time, and its distinction, in your view, with energy, which is, I think is a super important distinction. Um, I'm a Marxist philosopher, so, you know, I was trained actually by Zizek. I got hooked with Zizek because the first annual um, Zizek Studies conference, I submitted a paper, went with some of my comrades, and the paper actually won first place. I got to know Slavoj through that experience, nice. decided to study with him, and really just went full into Zizek um, mode. <laughs> And then um, ended up doing my PhD actually with Alain Badiou at the EGS. And it was a very enriching experience. Um, it was at a moment uh, right before Occupy Wall Street, right um, as the Arab Spring was happening. So it was a moment where the left was burgeoning into something possibly militant, right? And so that's kind of my origin in the, you know, considering that you're a young Zizekian and, and how important Slavoj's work is for you. I just wanted to start with that, mm -hmm. how important it is for me too. And over time, I have looked at Marxism, Marxist, Marxism and philosophy slightly differently. I have um, begun to kind of break a bit with my, not necessarily with Zizek's work per se, but I have broken with the wider field of, of post-Marxism, right? that kind of post May 68 fusion of continental philosophy with Marxist thought, I have found after a lot of the defeats of the left that we've experienced in our time, I have felt that theoretically, a lot of that post Marxist thought has been super problematic. Mm. And one of the main ways that it's been super problematic in my view is the complete dismissal of the category of the working class as a as a kind of mm, um, a, a category in which we th rethink what the proletariat is today what we think revolutionary agency is today so that's one amongst many others um interest so 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 a big philosopher for me is Georg Lukács and I've been involved I'm a co-editor of an upcoming journal on a period of Lukács's work his later period um, in a in a really neglected work called the destruction of reason, where I sort of, where what I find there is a kind of philosophical foundation for a critique of postmodern or post-Marxist thinking. Now, um, I wrote a book on the family, um, in part to open up a dialogue with the left. I am somebody who believes in dialogue on the left, um, so I was interested in having a dialogue with family abolition people with people that might be ultra leftists, people that might actually be of the left, but not of the Marxist left, right? And that was actually a really interesting experience. The book's been out for, it's been out for over a year, done a lot of programs and events with, with people. And I've learned a lot about that. We could talk about that in the future. But, you know, my Nietzsche work was sparked from reading Lukács, as well as reading a bunch of other kind of lesser known thinkers because Nietzsche was the sort of muse of the 68 philosophers and he's right. the muse of postmodernism philosophically the foundation of postmodernism is Nietzscheanism right 
So I was thinking to myself, like, actually, what? And of course, as a backstory, when I was young, Nietzsche was my first, like, he's the first one that brought me in. He could, you could say it was like my conversionary, before I was even a Marxist, my conversion to the life of the mind was through Nietzsche. Mm. So my book is a kind of grand revisitation of what Nietzscheanism is at its core. And what I'm putting forward is an argument that Nietzscheanism is a very sophisticated political philosophy, which has at times latched on to left philosophy, mainly Marxist philosophy, in ways that I claim are very deleterious to the class struggle and deleterious to Marxism. And that right. we need a complete reappraisal of how we read Nietzsche. So that's a bit of my background. Now let's talk about uh, leisure time, free time, the importance of that. Well, yeah. philosophically, going back to the Greeks and even Roman thought, the name that's uh, given is otium, which is an interesting concept. It's usually um, broadly defined as leisure time, but it's not exactly leisure time, in fact. What otium refers to is a, is a type of um, active, it's, it's almost a combination of what we call theory and practice. It's not pure detached theory, and nor is it a kind of overly activist form of free time, etc. It's it's a if you like a kind of perfect balance between the two, and it has a negative dialectical pole, which is called negotium, which is the kind of negation of otium. Now, in society, and Aristotle recognized this, Plato recognizes this. It's almost the back background of the backbone, rather, of philosophy, which is society actually must be constructed in such a way where you have a class of people. Um, this can be a feudal society. This can be a slave society. It can also be a capitalist society mm -hmm. in which otium is deprived, right? And therefore, their desires are actually thought qualitatively without the need for otium. They can experience leisure, but that leisure must be put in the service of their primary function in society, which is to be a laborer, right? Mm -hmm. So if they have leisure, it's only thought within the confines of their wider social function as a laborer, right? And therefore, um, philosophers will recognize the necessity to maintain a stratification of social rank social classes rank is probably a better term for it than classes we can talk about that distinction later now this form of otium uh, is important because philosophers uh, have recognized it as providing a certain subjective function which is the back the dna the backbone of culture w when a society is deprived of a class of people who are granted access to otium, culture diminishes and culture uh, suffers. So a big theme of postmodernism, of sort of the changes to the economy after the Second World War, and even a big theme going starting in the sort of modern industrial revolution of modern capitalism from the 1830s to the present, has been basically a crisis over free time which is also a crisis over the division of labor, a crisis over the division between um, mental and manual labor, and a crisis over the status of the intellectual worker, right? So philo modern philosophy is actually, can be thought of in this milieu of a profound crisis over, over otium, and therefore a profound crisis over culture. I mean, you mentioned Foucault earlier, but Foucault's definition of the disciplinary society is actually the control of work time, right? In a sense, Foucault, as a Nietzschean, recognizes that the disciplinary society uh, it abolishes this clear capacity for a class of otium seekers. 
in some sense, right? right? And so it becomes a crisis over the democratization, in some sense, of who, who has access to otium and who doesn't, right? And this is why Nietzsche um, can be thought of, and here I'll, I'll get to Nietzsche now, if it's, if it's okay with you, um, as, some, as a philosopher who understands when and before, sees... before before we get into sorry like this is a perfect point for me to ask because I'm kind of confused so you're saying that uh, the the is it that there's a, a concern that odium being made available to the masses undermines the ability to have culture because it undermines the ability for a leisure class to exist like an aristocratic it, class to kind of go enjoy symphonies and and read like the Iliad or something like that uh, it, 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 that's right. Okay, that's just exactly right. It's a, it, it, otium has an outcome, which is an active form of applied leisure time that is pro, that produces. What does it produce? Nietzsche says it produces distinction. Therefore, it produces difference. Nietzsche is a great philosopher of difference. Right. He's an aristocratic philosopher, but his aristocratism is not a nostalgic aristocratism. It's aristocratism of the future. It's an aristocratism that's trying to um, sort of up, make an account of the changing democratic revolutions from below in the form of the suffrage movement, in the form of socialism, in the form of the demand for more rights, in the continuation of Jacobinism that was open in the French Revolution. Nietzsche saw all of those plebeian movements right nietzsche called the french revolution the modern slave revolt mm -hmm. right those unruly demands for the masses threaten for him the uh, delicate balance that otium produces in society which is a balance of distinction right a balance of distinction right that's the aristocratism that's the obsession that nietzsche has with the maintenance of rank order now, the right. irony, and this is the, the careful irony of Nietzscheanism, especially on the left, is that left-wing philosophers will basically argue that he's right about this necessity of rank, in some sense. Right. And um, that, that, to me, opens up a, a sort of under-acknowledged dialogue that we need to have with Nietzsche and the left, is this question, not of hierarchy, not necessarily of hierarchy, but of this kind of necessity that culture be generated on the backs of a class, of a working class, who must qualitatively have a different habitus, have a different worldview in which they are trained to not desire otium. This drives us to the revolutionary power of the working class possessing a desire or, in your language, time, energy. In my language, otium. Nietzsche saw that as a grave threat. If the working class developed such a desire, which is why Nietzsche's politics were meant to um, destroy proletarian intellectuals, working class intellectuals. Working class intellectuals, in a sense, can be defined as thinkers who are seeking to further the desire that they have in an outlaw sense cultivated for the secret the secrets of otium which structurally should have been opposed should have been prohibited to them in nietzsche's view if culture is concocted in a successful way the working class will not desire otium right. because you see the problem was in modern industrial capitalism you have surplus labor what Nietzsche called extra work, which has to be done, which is degrading work, right? And this m means that you need to think carefully about how to satiate the class of people who are going to do that extra work. How is that going to be done? This yeah, actually is the it. backbone of a number of in, sort of perennial, perennially relevant questions, right? And I think that what it shows is that the expansion of a desire for otium amongst the working class represents 
a profound revolutionary threat to the delicate balance of the class system. That's my contention. That's my contention. And I will say it's refreshing that one of the most popular books on socialism in our time is called This Life by Martin Hagland. I don't know if you've read it. I love that book. Yes. You're aware of it? It's I, I read like the first couple chapters in the introduction. Uh, well, I listened to the to it while I was at Amazon last year, and it's it was enough for me to realize I'm going to start over from the beginning. I need to bring him on my channel. I have to tie him into my yeah. my future work because it's basically the theology of time energy, right? Um, you, that's that's an interesting way to say it. He takes a more Kierkegaardian approach. And suggests, I mean, you know, Kierkegaard had, I mean, if we, if we take a step back, when we talk about the theology of time energy, one of the sort of wayward um, dangers that the church fathers recognize in the history of Christianity is idleness. There's a sin on idleness mm. because it leads to sloth, Right. In other words, there's a profound danger that comes with idle free time. Idle free time becomes a question for Kierkegaard, acedia, this kind of spiritual sin. To What does that mean, though? In a sense, what it means is that it is a sin to inhabit a directionless form of, of leisure. Hmm? And you can think here of the figure even of the bohemian. Not necessarily the working class intellectual. I would make a strong distinction there because the working class intellectual is doing something different. Mm. Working class intellectual is dialectically opposing with a clearest conception of power, otium as a class imposition of power. Right. The bohemian intellectual, rather, is trying to find something spiritually liberating in the idleness of the use of their free time without a necessary end of a contestation over the class powers question. You see that distinction? That's a great I think that's very significant. That's fantastic. You see my point? Yes. And um, someone like Kierkegaard, who has very little class analysis in his philosophy, which I think is a, de- a problem of Kierkegaard. For sure. Um, is not going to be uh, useful for our shared interest, Dave, which I think is going back to this question of a working class emancipation. Right. Right. And you talk a lot in your writing about how normies, sometimes one way to understand normies is like, you know, you you say like they don't really, they don't get it, right? They don't get that philosophy and speculative thought can be a way of life, right? That it can be something that's transformative, not merely in a spiritual sense, but something more than that. And so I thought like a big provocation of your work and time energy is sort of the, oh, let's put it like this, the underlying question is sort of the question of desire. How do we it is. replicate the desire for uh, the inculcation of a love of speculative thought, of thinking, of theory, in this more transformative way, especially amongst the working class? Well, I don't know with, if that's a fair one, way to summarize it, but you can you can with respond. One, uh, for sure, with one caveat. You basically nailed it. The, the one caveat is that I'm on I'm 100% on board with the basic spirit of Nagel's Kill All Normies, which is really laid out in the last few pages that nobody ever seems to get to, which is just that the whole point, the quilts, the entire book, is that that politics has tended to prioritize transgression and the margins, and we need to actually prioritize regular working class normie people who don't get it. And uh, she was speaking to the left at the time, and she gave up on that, I think, and I think, you know, I don't blame her one bit for having given up on it uh, for a lot of reasons. But the, I mean, for me, it's just, it's not that, oh, normies need to get radicalized by the idea of time energy so that they all want to read great books. I do, th- I think that they need to know that that's going on and have access to it, right? I'm going to read a passage from the Grundrisse here in a second. It's my favorite passage. But the... The point is that they could if they wanted to, right? And so the, but the main thing is like, you know, people want time energy to play the violin. People want time energy to run a sustainable garden. 
People want time energy to be parents. There's a lot of reasons to want time energy. And my thing is that working class intellectuals need to keep in mind, no, not, not, every, not, everyone, not everyone in our lives or, or our workplaces gives a shit about philosophy and they might never. And in the future, hopefully more people will, but it'll, never be, it'll probably never be like mainstreamed in that sense, right? But, but the, the passage I want to read from the Grundrisse here is a, par a parenthetical um, from when he's citing somebody else, actually. And it's just something that he takes for granted that he never really expounds on in his mature work, but that he does basically get to the heart of in his estranged labor piece. He says, over the somewhat longer term, specifically during the upward phase of the economic cycle, however, both wages and profits may show an absolute increase at the same time. And during such periods, the worker may either take the risk of accumulating a small fund of savings for the next crisis, or may broaden the sphere of his consumption to take a small part in higher, even cultural satisfactions. For instance, agitation for his own interests, newspaper subscriptions, attending lectures, educating his children, developing his tastes, etc., constituting the worker's only share of civilization which distinguishes him from the slave. Right? So during, yeah. the, during capitalism's yeah. boom moments, during the boom moments, you can either save it up and be, be, try to become petty bourgeois, small business owner, and, or you can spend it on actually uh, attending lectures, which are somewhat expensive if you're not a senior citizen in most cities. Mm -hmm. Right? And now, this is a big question in, in Marx, which you see in a famous passage that Marx once wrote that where in one of the rare speculations that Marx makes about what a communist society might entail. You'll remember he says it would entail the kind of flexible moving in and out of uh, non-fixed positions, right? So you can choose sort of uh, a sense of like fishing in the morning, being a critic in the afternoon. Right maybe doing some labor after that, etc. So it's like this kind of uh, more fluid conception of against the Nietzschean point around the insistence of a more stratified sense of rank order, right? That to me is an underthought domain of Marxism. I mean, in a sense, it's a blessing that Marx keeps open the question of communism and the future as what I would consider almost like a kind of provocation to revolution as freedom, but without a blueprint for the right. future society beyond that, added to which, of course, Marx remains a steadfast critic of utopianism at the same time, which is, I think, um, means that Marxism is distinguished through not so much its codified bureaucratic plan for what a communist society will be, but rather through the dialectical understanding of, of what Marx calls dictatorship of proletariats, right? right. That's the end that Marx is, is, is seeking to arrive at, which is what? Which is, which is basically the achievements of bourgeois democracy, like Lenin said, Proletarian democracy will be 1,000 times more democratic than bourgeois democracy, right? So it's not some anarchist pure abolition of kind of a pure dynamite to the state. It's, it's rather a, a, a more careful sublation of the unmet demands that exist amongst the working class, which bourgeois democracy has always refused, constitutively refused, uh, to implement. In that, in that way, um, I don't think we really have to think, and this is this kind of goes back to my formation. I was, I was, my formation was actually in this post-Marxist, ultra-leftist formation, which was very much a fusion of kind of anarchist ideals and Marxist ideals. And so I think for a while I did really think that Marxism was a kind of post-apocalyptic, out of pure destruction kind of thing. Whereas now... And, and from that, by the way, of course, there's a huge allergy to things like electoralism. And right, I was right, a huge right. follower of Alain Badiou. And in Alain Badiou's philosophy, he puts forward a systematic uh, critique of all forms of representation. Right. So in, if you're a Badiouian, you really um, have a hard time, 
even thinking about contesting power at the within institutions. It's a very anti-institutional philosophy, actually. Um, I've kind of moved away from that. You know what I'm saying? I, so, so I'm not. I'm not. I'm super much on board with the building of a socialist workers' party. This is my main. But I don't want to get too far afield right, from right. Our, our topic. But that's well, what you reminded me of when you read that passage. You know what right. I'm saying? Which is Marx thoughts communist society as allowing for a freer movement around this question of otium. Now, I think the conservative response to Marxism would say that if you don't have a society in which, because what does otium uh, produce? It produces distinction. It produces difference. It produces rank. Therefore, it produces a kind of homeostasis right. in, in the social right. order. Without it, you have no culture and you have a, a basically chaotic culture in some sense. So the question I think would be, maybe we could say even in our present world, where we have this ultra-liberalist hysteria amongst the managerial class, right? Um, and of course, we see this even in the movie Tar, right? Which is a, a movie about about the the loss of Otium. Or rather, it's a movie about the crisis of Otium, Tar? if you've seen that film, right? Because she represents somebody from a period of time in which the distinctions of high culture had a certain efficacy mm -hmm. for which they no longer do. Right. Right. So we are witnessing the breakdown in the efficacy of distinctions based on otium, which I think as Marxists, it would behoove us to actually recognize that in that disintegration, despite all of its ultra liberal chaos and so on, there's still something possibly emancipatory about that because those distinctions do need to be brought down. Because why? Because they rely on this Nietzschean point I mentioned earlier, which is this uh, underclass must adjust itself, in a sense, to not desiring otium. You know so, what I'm saying? And I, so, and I wonder what you all think about that. So the we are in a crisis of it. We I are. strongly disagree. <laughs> hold hold. Okay. Welcome, Nina. One, one, one moment, everybody. I want to make a quick little announcement about a quick change of plans. Basically, the plan was to have a conversation about odium and time energy for 45 minutes, and then we're going to go to Q&A. Um, but Nina Power has been trying to figure out where she could fit into this thing for the last couple of days, and then she found she was originally going to be here for kind of the tail end of the launch portion, um, but she kind of was only able to join now because she was involved with the podcast. And the conversation I'm hoping that we can have here in the next 20 minutes is one that I actually have in, like, in my dreams. So the fact that it's actually happening is really exciting because you both are thinkers about the family. I want to wrap this up by saying, the, wrap up the previous portion by just saying that, um, you know, your reference to Lenin and the fact that Lenin relied on like a very strict sense of Taylorism and that was necessary for war communism, but I think that the, the odium piece for the masses gets lost in the sauce, perhaps. That I would like to bookmark as hopefully something that we can talk about, Daniel, in the future, because I'd like to bring you back where we can go more in depth. Also, time energy, I've not, we, it's not been defined, it's not been expanded on. The quick version of it is that it is large, repeatable blocks of energy-infused time. I never put it so succinctly in Waypoint, but that's how it's come about because the whole point of time energy is that it's what happens before that's fragmented into where all you have is energy without time uh, to repeat things or time without energy in the evenings or weekends because you're exhausted from work, which tears apart families, which tears, about, par, tears apart communities. And the segue here is to say, that you're both thinkers of the family. Nina Power is one of the editors at Compact, but is also um, uh, the author of a couple of books, One Dimensional Woman and, and What Do Men Want? But more importantly, and what people are not aware of usually, I think, is that she was uh, the editor for a, a work that's currently on the screen, if you're watching on the live chat side, called Why Work? Arguments for the Leisure Society. And basically what you did was you pulled together a lot of um, essays on the topic and then you wrote like the, 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 the preface, right? I'm wondering if you would like to say a little bit about your background, what you've been up to, kind of just introduce yourself and um, if you disagree with Daniel, how do you <laughs> disagree with him and 
Do you disagree with your original uh, contribution to this work, or has that been found fundamental for how you've developed? Mm -hmm. No, sure. Um, yeah, sorry for that rather abrupt um, interruption there. And I don't want to um, take away from Daniel's time because obviously this was his slot. So please, uh, if, if this was inappropriate, then Daniel, please carry on. <laughs> um, uh, but I think I think we, you know, I was listening to Daniel, so I was, I, you know, I didn't just jump in. I was actually listening to to most of Daniel's talk as well. And we have actually spoken in the past, but Daniel will not release the video <laughs> for reasons uh, uh, of his own. Uh, well, he's, but, he uh, already he already said it. He already said it. He's trying to court an audience of people who are on the left primarily, and that involves. He's in dialogue with these family abolitionist types that you and I, I don't think, even want to communicate with at all. So he's sort of a bridge here. No, I mean, like, honestly, my position uh, is a sort of strategic plural liberalism, which is I'll speak to anybody, right? Like, and I think that's that's the nature of dialogue and that's the nature of philosophy. And I found that leaving the academy was actually a better way of doing that. And I think one of the, you know, just to say about the kind of format of the the, the, the thing that you're setting up, you know, what we're seeing is this kind of breaking out into these kind of um, para-academic, post-academic uh, worlds, you know, which relate very much to what Daniel was saying about OTM and about access to culture and information and dialogues and discussions. I mean, you know, if you, like I'm obviously a huge fan of Ivan Illich, and when he talks very early on about how we get people to um, speak in networks or to find each other in order to learn skills and, to you know, these, these forms of... Um, uh, communication. I mean, you now literally can find the eight people in the world who want to talk about Ivan Illich's 1982 book on gender, right? Like, there's something kind of incredible about this um, possibility. And it's nothing to do with money. It's nothing to do with, uh, you know, it, of course, there's a question of time. Of course, there's a question of energy. Um, but, you know, there is a process of negotiation where you can have all of these sort of things. And, you know, maybe someone in Mexico can't, can't pay or can pay $10, but someone else who's like a I don't know, startup person can pay you $1,500, right? So you can have all these sliding scale things and nothing goes to an institution, right? And of course, there are like downsides to these things. You know, we can talk about, um, you know, certification and like, you know, obviously, but but that whole institutional thing has collapsed as well, I think, you know, and I think we're kind of living through the collapse of um, higher education on a mass scale. Um, so what you have is a kind of release of otium to some, you know, to use this word, and I agree, it's a very powerful word. And I think um, this is well, whether we're talking about free time or free free um, e exploration of polyvalence, you know, which is Marx's uh, description of communism and the German ideology um, precisely. Uh, the fact that our polyvalent, all of our polyvalent capacities, um, we're not even individuals under capitalism, right? Like because we're right. not social, we're not yet social individuals. We're we're kind of completely limited and restricted. Um, so I think there is a kind of um, a, a opportunity to think to rethink both OTM and aristocracy. Right? I would say, for example, that everyone is an aristocrat. I think it's it's less about defending a kind of collective working class culture, which also was itself pedagogical. So, I mean, the amount of what? autodidacticism among people who were working for fucking 18 hours a day is insane, right? right? But it's, you know, so, so there, there's that whole, and, you know, and Ronciere is basically dedicated his life to talking about this. E.P. Thompson talks about this too. There's great historical work um, on this. But I think, you know, in a kind of post-academic or para-academic world, there is this actually a possibility. And so many people I've met have been self-educated, self-taught, you know, perhaps through, at Tara is also about this. You know, she watches the Leonard Bernstein video. She's working class, right? she that's her access to high culture and i agree it's about distinction and differentiation but i would say that the mainstream culture the culture we currently live in is completely homogenizing it it's it is all about the elimination of difference whether we're talking about sexual difference whether we're talking about um difference in i don't know age or positive difference in terms of like where we come from you know we have a global homogenizing culture which is absolutely radically opposed to difference in fact and that's that's the yeah. kind of maybe point of disagreement um in, maybe it's a terminological um question um now, with daniel but th thank you nina now i know that you're going to be able to hang out a little bit longer than daniel because he's got to go off on a family vacation so if, speaking of the family i do want you both to talk about family odium and your politics both of you but um I just want to say, like, this wasn't planned, and um, I, I do want Daniel to be able to kind of say his piece, 
um, <laughs> yeah, before, yeah, yeah. He, before he's too. out sure. of here. Yeah, sure. no, 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 no. Look, but but it's all but good. but it's in all your good. O- in your OTM in in the piece I read the excerpt from your upcoming book here, Daniel. Yes. you mentioned yes. Sloterdijk as one of the or Sloterdijk as one of the uh, Nietzscheans, contemporary Nietzscheans, who is for this verticality and distinction. And I would say mm-hmm. that his defense of verticality in "You Must Change Your Life" is actually very formative for me. And as a working mm. class person, I would say. I am against working class emancipation unless we can maintain distinction and verticality because what I want is to have a good social democrat sort of base camp but everyone should yeah. have everyone should have after 20 hours a week the rest of their free time to be able to climb whatever mountains they want and if you want to be the number one player of world war World Warcraft or, or, or Tetris or or the sustainable garden person or if you want to be the best theorist in the world become the best but you have the resources to become yeah. best right like and so do you agree I or like disagree that. no i like that i think i think a couple things we can address the sure the past that nina and i share we can address that in a moment but let's let's stick to the this rich theoretical conversation that we're having which i think is very valuable i agree that the crisis of contemporary middle class power and ideology within institutional life is eroding these distinctions of difference which come from a prior form. The, uh, the question there always, though, I mean, we see this with Philip Reef in his book on Freud and um, his book on the therapeutic, right? Is when did this really um, instantiate itself in our culture, right? Was it, was it this kind of general consumer era post-war stuck feature with the rise of the middle strata, the rise of the new class, which they used to be called today, we call them the PMC. Is this, are they the kind of bone of contention that has disrupted this old order? So there's that question about the periodization. There's the other question from a working class socialist point of view that I wonder is, are we nostalgic for resurrecting something that was? I think there's a reactionary danger. We can define what that might be. Um, to any politics of nostalgia, in part because capitalism always prevents a politics of nostalgia from ever working. So it becomes, therefore, a politics of frustration and of impossibility. When what you did you say? Nostalgia. Marxism is a politics. So Marxism. I would avoid Marxism. That, and I think Marxism. Nina and I have actually talked about that. Before Marxism is a in our politics. Prior conversation. What I think Nietzsche is a thinker you, who's what interesting. What did you say? What did you say that? Oh, sorry. Is, sorry. Am I coming through. Sorry. sorry, I was muted for a second, but I just wanted to interject and say. Marxism is a politics of nostalgia. It misses a time when there was a working, it misses a time when there were working class institutions that came about on their own without activists coming from colleges to say uh, you need to organize. uh, I don't, I don't, I don't agree. I think that, uh, are there working, no, 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 are there working class libraries? Are there working class libraries today? Are there working class libraries or kitchens, houses? Of the left and some iterations as we know it today, they paint Marxism, a, a Marxism that cares about the centrality of working class, what I call worldview building Marxism, right. which, of course, all of the post 70s people that Nina used to study with a Jew and Laclau and all of the post Marxists, they do. They are anti working class Marxists. They are. That's a fact. We are in a very unique generational moment after 2008 based on a collective experience that we've witnessed with the crisis of capitalism to reject the abandonment of working class centrality in Marxist study. That's what I was saying at the beginning. I don't know if Nina Power agrees with me on that. So that's something that we may have a solidarity with. Let me say something though now that for sure Nina, I did interview Nina about um, her affiliation with Compact and to put my cards on the table, Dave and Nina, I am concerned about Compact. Why? It is an, a magazine that partners with strong conservative elements. And we're in a moment of such ideological incoherence that I just worry, and this is a huge conversation, we don't need to get into it. That was one thing that I wanted to interview Nina about. Now, because of Nina's um, experience with the trans community, which hasn't gone well, if we're honest, they asked me not to publish the interview. So I listened to them and I, and I did and I honored their, their preference. We can talk about that. Which, in which trans, that, which, that was the background, Dave. Which trans and, community? Um, okay, which trans so, community? Look, 
I don't believe in no platform and I don't believe in gatekeeping. At the same time, um, I made a decision because I was of the mind that my book on the family, well, I made a strategic partnership decision there, right? And um, it's not that I necessarily regret it. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that like, perhaps there's another time in which Nina and I can have a future conversation in which this can be revealed publicly. Because again, I'm less interested in Nina's relationship to the trans issues. I think that's somebody else can have that conversation. But I'm more interested in the pitfalls, possible pitfalls of the Compact Magazine moment, which I see a lot of contradictions and it does it does worry me a bit. That's all all I wanted to say about that. But please respond. So yeah, but my my position here for the last uh, couple of years has been um, one of most of my remaining friends still being leftists, but that them being my friends, knowing that I am in no way, shape, or form interested in courting an audience that is overly concerned with the image of communities inculcated by institutions within government and in the nonprofit sector that pose themselves as representatives of marginalized groups through identity politics. And really what the more important thing there, which was talk, I was talking about earlier on stream, is discursive Taylorism. Making areas of discourse monopolized and only spe uh, specific specialists are going to be able to speak about those issues, which is a genocide of voice, is a genocide of thinking, is a genocide of any kind of actual robust, diverse, uh, politics and so uh, all I would say is that I'm, uh, I'm I see some some stuff from Compact where I'm like what the hell but I also see shit like that from Jacobin and I know for some people they're like oh that sort of Fichtean dialectics of synthesis between opposing oh, no 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 I prefer to see something productive come from contradiction but it's not going to be synthesized it's going to mm -hmm. be irreducible in some cases so anyway I appreciate that you're both yeah, you know, I'm, I'm willing I'm, I mean, to have I'll, a conversation in the future. My philosophy few is to remain within the left, to maintain my principles. Um, I may not succeed. I mean, this we're we're in a very ideologically incoherent world. We're all experimenting to some extent, if we're honest, right? Right. However, I'm also guided by some principles of solidarity, and I have to make decisions at certain points. I respect a lot of what Nina has done. I don't know enough about the trans dynamics to make a judgment on that. Um, so this this is this is just the background, Dave, about what that happened. And For, it's okay that Nina's here right now. I'm not worried or anything like that. I'm excited to see what she has to say about this because I do think the crisis of our present needs to be historicized. And from a Marxist point of view, I don't know how much Nina is committed to Marxism anymore. Um, I know that she was. Um, and I would actually like to hear, you know, how that, because Nina, the, the tradition you were affiliated with was at times ultra anti-workerist Marxism, right? It's ultra, ultra leftism in a way, right? Um, you were affiliated with all of the, the far left currents. I mean, ultra I left is pretty much just means to you now. Aren't, aren't, aren't ultra leftists just the people who have real principles and get killed by people like Stalin when, no, in no, case no. of a... No, no, no. Ultra leftism can be defined as a um, refusal of any concept of mediation with institutions, with um, representative blocks. Okay. They tend to be anti-electoral. They tend to be opposed to unionism. And Lenin said one of their downsides is that they conceive of Marxism in a kind of paradoxically idealist way because they're so opposed to mediations, in a sense. So they tend to be insurrectionary. They tend to see the proletariat as a kind of lumpen proletariat force. They send, you know, they tend to, um, up, and a big thing is they tend to, especially after the Second World War, um, marginalize any possible revolutionary agency amongst the traditional working class. And that's one thing that I personally have become weary of. I don't, yeah, I don't trust sure. Marxists like that anymore. Good. I don't know now, about Nina Power, but I, I don't. One, I'm kind of beyond that now. 
your your you know dis, your your interest in the destruction of reason and Lukács and all this is also something I like to have future conversations with because I don't like uh, a lot of what Lukács is doing there. I think it's it's such a it, I, but I don't want to say why because that opens a can of worms. I just like that to be a promise to more conversation. As Emmanuel Levinas says, the saying will always overflow the said. So I hope that this is an opening, a gateway to yeah, future let's do stuff. It. But yeah, let's do if, it. I know you were kind no, of setting I, yeah. you were you were you were setting up a door to turn this back over to Nina, and I hate to yank it away from sure. you, Nina, but for one second, yeah. your your cards have been put into question, your position, what you're doing. But I want uh, Daniel, I want you to be able to say something about your self at the subject of enunciation here, right? Um, what what it, not not just oh you're on the left and you're committed to some principles on the left and you're a Marxist. I'm more interested institutionally. Um, there are people that you are affiliated with that make it so that yeah, if you want to hold the responsibilities that you currently have within the institutions that you have, then you kind of have to play your cards delicately and carefully and strategically. And I I think we can all be somewhat sympathetic to people who aren't trying to burn bridges and, and go homeless in the next like year. Okay, but. How much of that is on the academic side and how much of that is on the zero books side? And how, what is your responsibilities at zero books? For instance, when someone like Christine Louis de Soli does not get republished after the change and her video has been buried and hidden, what, whose responsibility is that? Are there, is there a committee? Mm -hmm. Is there a board that you serve? Are these things that you just haven't gotten oh, around sure. to and you're basically steering no, the no, ship? No, I can answer, I can answer that question, no. Yeah. The the um, interview that I did with Nina Power was about Compact Magazine. Nothing to do with Zero Books at all. I actually have a friendly relationship with Zero. They've merged with Repeater Books. My Nietzsche book is going to be with Repeater Books. I respect Tarek Godard, their founder, a close friend of Mark Fisher's. He's a very intelligent person. He really knows what he's doing. and um, And I believe in him. Um, it, I, I avoid drama as much as I can because I think that what I'm trying to do is, is promote public thinking and so I, don't, I can't get weighed down with any of that. I have no formal relationship to Zero Books other than they allow me to post some of my interviews and discussions on their channel. That's it. I did not know that. No, nothing other than that. Nothing other than that. Thank I'm you. completely independent. I, I have recently that. joined Class Unity, by the way. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, For, yes. I'm very interested in them. Just started out, but it's a new socialist effort which is um, actively breaking from DSA. It's a factor of the at, DSA. At point, we have to a say uh, the DSA question of reform, and I love my friends at Marxist Unity Group. Mug, bless their hearts. I don't think they're going to succeed, though, based on my assessment. So I do feel that the DSA is a middle class captured thing and we need to find a way towards the creation of a socialist party. We can talk about that later. For sure. But no, 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 nothing like that, my friend. Uh, the reason I didn't publish an interview was just because comrades in the trans community and Nina knows that wherever she goes, unfortunately, there's this swarm of people that follow her in that regard. And so for the reason of honoring their connection and also not wanting to get into something for which I don't have the, the knowledge to really respond adequately, mainly to the trans de debate, I decided to hold the interview. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, Nina. I don't intend for it to. Hopefully you can see the kind of complexity of what I'm dealing with. Um, you know, Again, my main interest was just to understand and probe into what Compact Magazine is about at this moment, not from a hysterical standpoint. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm writing a book on Nietzsche. I think con I, I, I just wrote an article on Philip Reef. I think conservatives, conservative thought, reactionary thought, right? It needs to be worked with. I'm, I'm not, would never be of the position to say, but I, but anyways, you know, there's other concerns with Compact, which we could possibly get into here with our limited sure. remaining time. I hope that answers your question, Dave. I would, I would like to instead um, bring it back to time, energy, and odium. And if Nina wants to say something, go ahead and say something. Sure. But I would prefer, if you both are open to it, I could be the mediator between a conversation in the future where we actually talk about 
compact and because I want to defend nostalgia in a lot of ways. Um, but I, I'm open to a dialogue there and I'm interested in seeing what you would be able to say if you had more time. But for right now, let's just bring it back around to the family. Let's do it. Time, energy, odium. Nina, welcome sure. back. Yeah, we can talk about the family too. Um, okay, yeah, sure. I mean, just, just really quickly though, to respond to a couple of things that Daniel said. I mean, our conversation was about much more than Compact Magazine, if you recall. We spoke about theoretical matters. It was quite actually a long conversation and I thought actually quite a good one, um, to be honest. And so I don't think, um, I don't know, I think it's a kind of mischaracterization um, of what we talked about. and. You know, and I think the the way you're framing uh, the discussion of sex and gender as if it's primarily about uh, transgenderism is also inaccurate. And this is part of the politics of the whole discussion. I mean, you know, in reality, what happened is we had a conversation, you recorded it, and then you uh, blocked a video or you decided not to put up a video of you speaking to a woman. I mean, this is actually reality, right? Um, you know, for political reasons, you know, you decided it was better to appease a group of people who's, who maybe their tactics you don't approve of, but you're worried about their uh, response. You're worried also about being denounced by association because this is one of the major tactics of the day, which is guilt by association, because sure. some people are not allowed to be spoken to, you know, <laughs> and I guess that's something I oppose. And so, you know, very quickly on compact, I think we are deliberately heterodox. And we also platform people who have been deplatformed or unplatformed or ostracized or unfriended or whatever um, because they've spoken out of turn on some issue. And those issues are getting increasingly smaller. And when you talk about the left, you know, I'm economically left. I'm interested in redistribution. I'm interested in, uh, you know, a critique of political economy. The reason I actually got cancelled in 2018 is because I was a member of, of the Labour Party, right? If you want to talk about representational po representative politics, you know, I was not an ultra leftist in practice. You know, the fact that I was writing about anti work ideas, also from the second wave feminist movement. I mean, I was, you know, this is also my commitment is to uh, various autonomous feminist positions, right? That's where my anti work position comes from, actually. Um, you know, and we are all thinking about automation, we're all thinking about modernity, we're all thinking about time and, you know, energy right. to, to use um, your language. And, you know, so I, I look, I agree with this point about honesty. Like, I think we are all in a, a, a complicated intellectual and theoretical and political and practical position. And I, that's probably always the case. Right. And there's always going to be these friend enemy distinctions in every political movement. You know, the moment anyone opens their mouth and tries to make a claim about politics, you know, they're on one side or the other. And I'm interested in a, a, a way of talking to people that goes beyond these um, now, I think, historically anomalous separations between left and right. I think there are many aspects of the left um, historically, which are to do with, um, let's say, socially conservative uh, desire to preserve things like the family um, a, a, against the incursions of moder modernity. And I think the real conversation is perhaps about how we conceive of modernity, actually. I think this is one of the major um, aspects, you know, and this goes back to the point about nostalgia. It, you know, not everything, not not everything in the past, not everything our ancestors thought was was wrong because it was in the the past and they didn't have iPhones. You know what I mean? Like there's a there's a fucking stupid modernism on the contemporary left, which bears no relation to historical left thought at all, including Marx, um, for that matter. And I think, you know, the idea that we have to accept as a package a whole host of things, which most of which or a lot of which uh, just simply isn't true and also mitigates against the civil rights and the and the actually gains that women, for example, have achieved through history in a genuinely progressive sense, right? And we're supposed to kind of give up on those in the name of some kind of really quite artificial um, program, um, which is deeply capitalist, deeply individualistic, and deeply consumerist, right? I'm opposed to that, right? I regard myself as a leftist. I still do, but an economic leftist, right? And in the sense that I think we need more materialist analytic critique of political economy. We need to understand the, how labor is being distributed. We need to understand how time is distributed, where profits are going and so on, right? And it's a method, it's a methodology. It's not an affiliation that is based on a friend enemy distinction, which after all is Schmidt's idea, you know, and I'm not a Schmidtian either. And right. I think we everybody has their reasons for their positions and we have to listen to people who have a you know, according to the increasingly narrow and hysterical and fanatical left, people who apparently have 
reprehensible views that they must lose their jobs and lose their right. friends for holding. You know, I'm completely I, against this form of ostracism. Can I just interject that that's also my concern with the liberal left progressive PMC getting radicalized into something kind of Marxist in this day and age. The, the terror for me is what if they actually succeeded at gaining a monopoly on the state and economy? See, my, 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 uh, first for me, for many years, for probably six years of my Bernie activism and my time as a student radical and all of this, the goal was that that would be the case. But as I saw people being deplatformed, as I saw the violence, as I saw the discursive Taylorism and the genocide of voice, right, which are like, I'm writing about this right now, it's seeing that made me realize, yeah, no, if the, if the left PMC gains a monopoly on the economy, which means over all of our time and energy and how we comport ourselves in the world, which means where we work, when we work, for how long we work, if that happens and it has this, this self-righteous, Taylorist uh, approach to discourse where, no, you don't deserve to have a roof over your head. You don't deserve to have a good job. You don't deserve. That's the biggest fear for me. So, and, and I think people say, oh, we can't have fear motivating our politics. Fear motivates everybody's politics, whatever. For me, my anti-politics comes from my fundamental distrust of the people you're trying to appease here, Daniel. Uh, let's talk about it. So I, I, I don't think that the vo the cohort of people who are for family abolition have any um, capacity to seize the reins of the state or to, they, they provide, I think, a different ideological function in an era in which institutions like the Democratic Party actually thrive off of chaos, thrive off of the chaos of civil society, thrive off of the false perception of like racial civil war in America, for example, which is absolutely um, uh, fictional. It's a fictional notion. Um, it's a kind of displacement of antagonisms. This is a big theme that uh, that comes up in my Nietzsche book, which is this kind of nominalizing tendency of liberal progressive liberal liberalism is meant to cover over antagonisms that are born from the class struggle. So. When I'm interested, when I say I'm interested in Lukács and a more rationalist orientation, that I feel is something that's needed right now at a moment in which the possibility for the family is now a bourgeois luxury. The possibility of the family is a middle class luxury. Even members of the middle class are struggling to achieve it. What that's actually producing is not family abolition in some idealist realm of social policy. That will never happen. What it's actually producing is the opposite of that, is producing a greater desire that is blocked and prevented amongst the working class. And this is this is shown in a lot of surveys. So I actually want to be clear that I was trying to start a dialogue with family abolitionists in part to clarify their positions, both to themselves and to the public. Because when I think about what family abolition is, I think it only makes sense when we couch it within a clear class conception, going back to, and Marx was not pro-family abolition in some abstract universal sense by any means. He wrote that gesture at the moment of a revolutionary upsurge of the Communist Manifesto. There are other times in Marx's life where he's talking about how if the proletariat working class doesn't have the strength to desire otium, he wouldn't use that term, but I think we can, then it's not going to be able to fight. If the proletariat desires the family and is not able to produce it, that's going to create a strain of a turn to the right amongst, you see my point? So I'm in the middle of this quagmire um, trying to negotiate things on those basis. I'm not trying to seek some sort of cheap artificial solidarity with a small portion of the left like that. No, I was trying to sort of spark a dialogue with them. I don't, I don't, I think that actually... All of these terms need to be like historically concretized in our present. So I don't want to be mischaracterized. I don't want my position to be mischaracterized no, no, as anti-family or something like that. I, I do think that, yeah, go ahead. I actually thought you were, 
more on the side of the anti-family until I did read your no. introduction. No. no, I read your introduction and then I, I realized, okay, no, he's not just anti. Then I thought, well, he's trying too hard to talk to these people. But, but I just want to well, say that, goes, that, that it goes was, back, that it goes was back to a dialogue on conversion. I mean, one of the big things that I've realized, and this comes up in my Nietzsche book as well, is that, uh, you know, slaughter dykes, you must change your life. Yeah. Hmm? And I know Nina has written a nice review of Slaughter Dyke. Oh. Uh, he's a good thinker to, to work with. Uh, we live in a world of a kind of cheap conversions. Very few people actually have profound political conversions. That's actually what I want to reintroduce. Because I think that class consciousness, if you actually study the ethnographies and the anthropological research and the sociological research on the working class, there's hardly any working class consciousness that's militant or radical today. We therefore need not some liberal hyperactivism amongst the working class to steer them back into the NGO thing. I think actually we need like thoughtful interventions to help people see class power for what it is. Because I think America, especially America, even beyond, has perfected this kind of muting of working class experience. And we're at a moment of a very early stage where that's starting to crumble, right? So the fact that the family is blocked to the working class is actually gonna militate the working class. It could go different ways, it could go towards DeSantis and Trump. It could. We need to create a better alternative to that. You see my point? So I, I, uh, I don't know. I don't wanna be mischaracterized here, guys. I just really, uh, I'm not no, saying no, that no. my yeah, you, I don't, I don't parade think... the dialogue with family abolitionists was successful. I'm not saying it was successful. It's ongoing. I'm not willing to close it down. I'm willing to have a dialogue with Nina Power. Or we're <laughs> having it right now. It's all good. You, you don't know? have to use my surname. I mean, it's fine. I like saying your full name. Sorry, Nina. Sorry. No, it's with, okay. I'll say Nina. My bad. It's, it's, but, Nina, uh, it's Nina Power versus Labor Power. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, actually, it just means poor in Irish. It's hilarious. It's a very silly name. Um, it means my ancestors were too shit to even get jobs. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, on the fa can I just say something about the family point and work and, and these questions? They, they are very, very interesting, right? And the family abolition thing, obviously, in many ways comes out of thinkers like Shulamith Firestone, who was a kind of renegade in the second wave, you know, and, and, and this kind of idea. And I, I wrote about her years ago, but it, it's part of this kind of pro, like a technophilic solution let's say to the natural asymmetry of the sexes right like you know oh we can uh we can uh remove this this burden and this suffering and this work or uh, you know which which obviously um is in some of the autonomous feminists and is taken up by people like sophie lewis and the family abolitionists and as if to say that pregnancy and all of those things are a form of labor and we can understand it in in this way right and that it is a kind of um uh, can be understood not only economically in terms of like wages for housework and all those sorts of things, but um, but as a kind of uh, as a form of uh, as a form of work that women perform, um, and that we can use things like IVF and surrogacy, even though I've, I'm radically opposed to surrogacy uh, for various reasons, and I think the uh, you know the left often uh, the contemporary left, whatever we want to call it often abandons moral questions or or is very uncomfortable around moral questions because it thinks that morality is either bourgeois or that morality will be sorted out so at some point after the revolution. Uh, meanwhile, um, we have not only forms of exploitation and oppression, which do require, I would say, moral courage to address and acknowledge, um, but also in their dif differentiation, right? So I, I'm i very opposed to, uh, I, I, how, how to put it, like, techno fixes um, for uh, natural questions, right? So if, if we're talking about human reproduction, every single human being today is uh, the product of a, of a man or a woman, right? In some uh, sense, even if uh, one of those parents is dead, even if uh, one of the parents was, uh, you know, uh, their, sp their sperm removed and they know the person doesn't know their father. I mean, this is also a question for psychoanalysis, by the way. Uh, psychoanalysis do no longer exists or no longer exists in any meaningful uh, sense in relation to its own history if we eliminate or erode 
uh, sexual difference and if we eliminate or erode the relationship of the child to the parents. Right. And I think we are potentially ushering in an era of, of new uh, untold horrors and monstrosities under the guise of seemingly uh, lovely things like choice and, you know, freedom mm -hmm. and reproductive mm -hmm. like potentiality, you know, and, and it's not, I think, reactionary or conservative or right wing or fascist or anything like that to be concerned about that and it's it's actually really a theoretical question at the level of do we save these disciplines do we think that psychoanalysis still has something to tell us uh for example or do we think that second wave feminism still had a point um and also the critiques of firestone do we think how does technology relate to being a man or a woman you know we're still right. fundamentally the same kind of creatures as our ancestors were you know despite our fantasies um, that we're somehow post-human or, you know, and, and so this question modernity, again, to go back to this, it's like, you know, which bits, why, when, and how, and where, like, <laughs> you know, and, and right. how do we politically code these things? Because it seems to me a lot of what the parts of the contemporary left are proposing are completely in hoc to capitalist uh, ideology of the individual, of choice, of, you know, various technologies, um, you know, they're not uh, on the side of working class people at all. You know, if you think about who the surrogates really are, like surrogates are poor women in poorer parts of the world who are having their wombs rented out for like small amounts of money so that, you know, childless couples in the West can have children, quote unquote. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's reality. So I guess no, I, I, I want I, to I want to just, just want say to one one point one point of order here, Daniel, because I want you to get your 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 time is that uh, I got about fifteen minutes, but go ahead. Oh, that's amazing! So first of all, uh, we've got uh, Ashley Frowley, who does a lot of research on the family, joining tomorrow mm -hmm. to kick off the, mm -hmm. tomorrow's conversation. Um, you're both invited to the after party. Just look at the schedule. You, you're able to come back then. And we might schedule something special as a kind of follow-up later this week. Just let me know if, what your availabilities are. Um, okay. And then the, the last thing to the point of order is that Adam and Nance in the live chat here have been uh, keeping an eye on the live chat while listening to what's going on here. And so they will have questions for you both. Um, and we're going to start with Daniel. And Daniel, I really don't want you to think that we're going to just mischaracterize you in your in your absence once you go off on vacation with your family. I want you to know that I won't allow anyone in the chat or anyone else just to dunk on you in your absence. I'm not for that at all. Um, but I do. I want you to just say your piece. Nina, say one response to that, and then we'll get to take a couple questions from Nance and Adam, sure. starting with Daniel because you only have 15 minutes. <clears throat> so let's go. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think that a big thing the new left put forward was a theory of the of the commune of the family as a kind of alternative structure of kind of a, a, a implicit critique of the of the hierarchies and the deleterious effects of hierarchies of patriarchal family that come from the bourgeois family and um <clears throat> i actually do critique the the commune at the same time that i try to differentiate a kind of bourgeois or middle class experimentation in the commune, really relying a lot on Ellen Wills's firsthand experience with the failure of new left communes, which which we should be honest, were very much a failure. What I'm seeing in my conversations with a lot of family abolitionists today is a much more um, abstractly militant sense. So, for example, there's a desire for the eradication entirely of the of the structure of the father which is something that I'm deeply opposed to if you read my work. Um, I think that Lacan actually has a quite uh, uh, sound conception of the modern status of the father as itself already post-patriarchal, right? So I think that there's a, there's a misnomer about the way that the authority of the father actually functions that Lacan helps us to clarify. So that's something that I have um, introduced in his notion of the name of the father, which I get into, which I do think that the notion of the name of the father should not be construed as a rigidly conservative doctrine of the strong preservation of sexual difference. That's a whole other conversation that we can have there. Um, I don't think that psychoanalysis is structurally or necessarily conservative on the question of sexual difference. Um, I don't I don't know, Nina, how you would 
parse that question, but I, I certainly think that um, in theory, um, left psychoanalytic thinkers, even, even Wilhelm Reich, um, more contemporary left psychoanalytic things like Patricia Garavici and her work actually do open up um, a lot of very useful reflections about um, gender anormativity and things of that, which we can we can discuss. But I think in general, my position on all of this is that um, I don't think that family abolitionists have a strong connection to like the ruling class as a sort of ideology. I'm not really worried about that. Um, I think that it is much more a question of clarifying in the realm of theory what we actually mean by that tradition. Do we have any commitment to it? Should we have any commitment to it? And so that was my gesture, which is just to sort of open up a dialogue. Um, and I've had a chance to to do that in some cases, but because of the strained status of our public sphere today, it's been super difficult to actually have these conversations. Um, so that's what I would say in response to what Nina uh, recently said, but I think Nina actually hasn't answered my earlier question, which I do want to invite you to do, if it's okay, which is, yeah, like you were affiliated with a lot of far left communist uh, theor theoretical lineages. And I do think that you didn't give me a compelling account as to how you shifted away from those, or if there was a meaningful shift for you from those. Because I've made a bit of a shift, which I've tried to articulate on this stream, like how I've shifted a little bit. You know, focus more on working class, focus more on Lukács, focus more on the rationalist tradition, a more of a critic of postmodernist philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. But I was sort of curious how that shift worked for Nina. Sure. I mean, I think like as with everybody's life, there is like on the one hand, like a theoretical set of interests, which I've tried to say included like second wave feminism, anti-work ideas in particular. Also, Badu, like you say, I mean, I was interested in like, I don't know, 10 different things. I mean, I've written like, I don't know, 50 essays on like or whatever. I mean, you know, and sometimes there's a kind of eclecticism in that, you know, I, I you know, I'm very uh, motivated to try to understand what is happening, how best to conceptualize it. You know, I was thinking maybe, okay, maybe we hand over uh, our thinking of uh, infinity to maths or, you know, maybe that's one way, you know, we can overcome the romantic lineage, you know, <laughs> thanks to Reggie, whatever. You know, in, in my late twenties, I was thinking about this a lot. And, um, you know, I I, I suppose, uh, you know, there was a kind of, um, a uh, crisis point for me in that 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 merged the my political act activism as it were which was tied up with the uh, free education you know which is something i'm very committed to like we already talked about pedagogy and post you know power academics and you know because that was my political uh um i don't know uh, awakening or something like this you know i was very very mobilized by the student movement 2009 2010 uh, in the UK, we lost that battle. Um, you know, I was then very involved in defending people in court and and supporting Alfie in particular, who was almost killed by the police and then was on trial for four years. You know, and I, there were lots of things then going on, right, like around 2013, 2014, that I wasn't really totally uh, aware of. I didn't really kind of understand. Um, and this was like maybe we could talk about the, um, I don't know, like a kind of a, a neo uh, civil rights seeming movements around identity um, in particular that that to my mind were like kind of baffling because I knew that we were opposed, we were criticizing the state we were criticizing the courts we were criticizing the police and all of these forms of like authoritarianism and also um, the way in which the state divides people up you know, and we were working with people who have been victims of police violence, as well as thinking about immigration, asylum and, and so on. And then suddenly there was this kind of shift, it seemed to me, or, or maybe it was already going on, to um, questions that were not really uh, led by economic matters uh, or about uh, an understanding of uh, the national whole or the global picture but rather were this kind of um, 
I don't know, like symptom of something else. And um, I, you know, I t- tried to try to tie it to your question of 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 Lacan and, and responsibility and authority in the name of the father. I mean, I agree with this, right? I've written at length um, a few pieces about, I think we, after um, Juliet Flower McCannell's work on the regime of the brother, you know, that actually we do, we, we live in a post-patriarchal age that is characterized actually by a flattening of the sexes in terms of like a Republican sibling rivalry. You know, that, that there is what's happened is also a collapse of the relationship between men and women, however you want to conceive it. Right. And and whatever you think about patriarchy, whatever you think about these things, we no longer live in that era like this. These are not, cap, you know, capitalist subjects. You know, people talk about patriarchy, but they're not actually referring to patriarchy because the real dimension of patriarchy, which is historically important, is not authority. It's not oppression. It's responsibility. Right. And what we have is an era of like complete abandonment of responsibility. Right. And that's one of the crucial questions. And this goes for class analysis. This goes for political organizing. You know, we've all become post 60s liberal hedonistic Reichian subjects, in fact, mobilized by our desire, because desire is the most important thing after all. Right. And we've got to follow our desire, you know, and this has created a society which is functionally chaotic. Right. Where nobody wants to say the party's over, guys you know, clear up. <laughs> you see what I mean? I do. I mean, I agree with the general thesis. And I mean, I think someone like Lash is somebody that I've tried to reintroduce as a dignified thinker for American left socialism. And to part of what I'm interested in is sort of getting these conversations out of the culture war polemics that that declarify them and that mystify the real stakes, right? So that we can actually start to discuss things like the Oedipus complex and how it actually fits within, like, because there is a sense in which people will try to convince you that we're post Oedipal. And I couldn't disagree with that more. I mean, it kind of goes back to this question about the philosophical clarity of how theory meets the real world, right? So I, But I think with that, Nina and I would probably disagree about perhaps the value of left wing psychoanalysis once we once we push down into that, perhaps. But I think we would agree that. um, I mean, yes, I do follow Philip Reef's suggestion that we live in Wilhelm Reich's uh, universe in some sense And, and Reich. Reich ended his project in a way that was quite um, quite telling as to this this organ accumulation, this kind of new age uh, sense. It was almost like a kind of bad Nietzschean will to power, right? And um, perhaps that's what he was all about all along, right? Perhaps it was naive to think um, that communist society will give us a world this is what he thought right in his lectures to the soviet union that communist society will kill the oedipus complex because the oedipus complex is just a bourgeois thing i don't think that's actually true and i actually think that lacan proves that is not the case even in his later work where he's making observations um he's refining what that means but i think that yes these sunk features of rivalry are a useful way to think about social and political conflict. Because in a sense, uh, the Oedipus complex never really leaves the political field. And if that's true, politics becomes centrally about questions of unconscious rivalry. Not yeah, so much. And the, and the economic yeah. system basically creates this too. You know, men and women yeah, are yeah. basically interchangeable economic units, right? Everybody knows this, right? There's nothing to differentiate us if you want to talk about distinction from a certain perspective. You know, I mean, maybe, sorry, just to flip around a tiny bit, just to like be really, really clear on my, you know, political trajectory because I didn't quite sort of finish saying like, you know, so what so what happened in like 2018 was like the Labour Party of which I was a member, you know, like I'm saying, I joined because of Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> um, you know, uh, started holding all of these interrogations of of women, female members of the party who wanted to have discussions about the proposed changes to the Gender Recognition Act. And it wasn't even the content of those of those um, of the policy 
that bothered me at first. It was the fact that these women were being interrogated and ostracized and deplatformed and kicked out of the party for even raising questions. And from the standpoint of a democratic system, ostensibly or nominally, of course, we know the limitations of thinking in this way, particularly when we understand how state violence works, is is to say, like, for God's sake, really, you're going to you shut these women up for asking a fucking question about a policy? Like, come on. So I was really I just appalled, really, at this kind of like, I don't know how to put it. It was kind of like Stasi or well, you know, all of these trite ways we talk about politics but there was an aspect of it which was so sadistic um and yeah, so unnecessary yeah. um and that set the tone unfortunately for the this discussion for years and it, we're still seeing it like, you it know this is, is. A, a discussion that touches on the deeper inner parts of people in this kind of brutal way and people are manifesting all kinds of violence um linguistically and socially politically and physically over this question of what we you know whether we I don't know how we are to stand, understand what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what sex is, what, you know, it's, it's created havoc. Look, there's a psychoanalytic reading to be done on the last, like, five years um, in order to, to come to terms with it because, it, you know, something has gone very badly wrong. <laughs> um, and I, right from that moment, and I, all I wanted to do was for people to be able to have a conversation about it and for people to express from all positions their feelings you know i tried to recreate encounter groups do you remember these this is a big thing in the 70s where you bring people together like black and white men and women people who had right. opposing views right or you know or wanted to basically give people like an unsafe space i mean the same space within bounds right no violence no threats of violence but people could say whatever they wanted right like in a way to draw out these kind of prejudices or unconscious feelings, things that you're not allowed to say. And we live in a completely restricted, increasingly restricted, censorious, self-censoring, Foucault was right. You know, that's how you control people. You get them too afraid to, to even think. <laughs> um, and we, we tried to do this. We tried to do this at R.D. Lang's Institute in London. You know, anyone can come. Let's talk about these things, you know. And of course, it ended in uh, disagreement. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. one of the big things that, yeah, one of the big things I write about in my book on the family is um, new, what I call a new paternalism. And I try to historically periodize that um, in the arc, which I think is a very materialist analysis and way to do so, of, fi of financialization, right? So financialization has created mechanisms that actually pervert this Freudian Oedipal drama. But at the same time, they've the structure of the family after the sexual revolution in the new left has kind of deprived us of the old stable forms of of paternal figures to passageway out of this so it's kind of a it's kind of a um a very perverse paternalism yeah. uh which which we see on college campuses we see in the it's a paternalism that has in many ways become inverted as a way of a kind of hyper individualist form of thinking even things like liberation it perverts the possibility of collective liberation um somebody actually recently told me that you can't really call it a paternalism because the ideology is post paternal right so to even suggest to bring back a centrality of like the function in a structural sense of of parents is is perceived as reactionary i don't think that it has to be though i, no. I think that that's a misnomer um it, to 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 even conceive of that i know that everyone on this stream would probably agree with that right but there are a lot of people on the left that don't agree with that so how are it, we going to talk to them how are we going to work through that dynamic is it is it is a question for me well this is why next year once mikey's main work gets published here we're going to have a time of really diving into Baudrillard because his, he's got a reading of Baudrillard, an interpretation of Baudrillard, a history of Baudrillard that you're not going to be familiar with, that no one's familiar with. It's radical and outside of anybody's wheelhouse, and it's important, and I can't really talk about it because I'm sworn to secrecy, but I would just say, like, at the very superficial level that you would be familiar with, simulation and simulacra, right? There is, this is the world of this digital media and Things like gender and paternalism 
and anything that we that may have somehow existed in some way is now simulated and people take those simulations to be the things themselves whether we ever had access to those things themselves whether those were ever real whether those have been retroactively projected onto the past yeah, but not, they don't do so unconsciously that's the whole point which is why the freudian proposition remains pertinent right it's not lacan, done unconscious lacan will create a whole sophisticated theory of this as well um and when he has this um this the non-duped air nina may be familiar with the non-duped air but it's this kind of um um society to come that he sort of prophesizes in which people no longer fall in love with their unconscious because they've been told not to believe in it so in a sense post lacanian psychoanalysis has been about how we create a new love for our unconscious and that's actually what therapy psychoanalytic therapy does it's a kind of way to demonstrate that that we are unconscious that we are driven by the unconscious because lacan recognized and this goes back to the financialization piece that the forces material forces of our society of what he called the capitalist discourse actually erode the efficacy of the unconscious in some sense so i would even say that there's actually a spiritual dimension to this to this um of belief why do you think slavoj is so interested in the category of belief in our time it has to do with this erosion in my in my view uh, which you see in the later Lacan all over the place. Why does Lacan talk about religion so much? Because of this. Because he thought capitalism was killing psychoanalysis and that religion might replace it. He literally thought that, right? Um, I don't know where we're at with religion these days, but psychoanalysis yeah. is coming back. <laughs> for sure. So or is religion. <laughs> so is religion. Well, religion has been coming back for a while. I feel like it's kind of going ebbing. But I so, mean, I always refer like Walter Benjamin's fragment on capitalism as religion as the party that never ends. You know, I mean, I think he gets it right. You know, it's like the it's the, the religion without with without dream without mercy. You know, like you can't you can't sleep, but you can't dream either. You know, it's like it's like the three a.m. eternal, <laughs> as KLF put it. Right. You know, I, it's like you, <laughs> that's what it's like. They, well, that's an essay actually about Nietzsche's eternal return. Oh, yeah. Four. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but you know there's, there's no day of rest right you don't even get the sunday off anymore you know <laughs> no. yeah that brings us back to the leisure question right which yeah. is a, a big a big worry which is that maybe maybe we could say in a speculative sense there's a kind of correlation between this um of a lack of a of a belief in the unconscious to to a collapse in the desire for leisure because mm -hmm. we no longer have the coordinates we're sort of disoriented fundamentally about the desire for otium which goes back i think to our original point of like the politics of leisure is a politics of a different type of desire it's not a wilhelm reich desire mm -hmm. yeah i would say you the, know what i'm saying that, that the, nina just mentioned this kind the, of like the pure liberation thing the slightly different the, than that the important Point. This is this is my pr self promotional little. I don't moment. know if that makes sense to you. Mm. Hello, hello, am I coming through? Mm. Okay, so basically, I, I we're about to turn it over to the question and answers with uh, everybody, and I really just hope we can continue the conversation in the future. Uh, Adam and Nance are about to turn on their cameras here, but I just got to say, as a sort of a quilting point for the whole conversation, that for me, it's the the time energy theory. Part of why it matters, it doesn't just come out of reading early Marx, right? It doesn't just come out of, like, my time doing Bernie activism or whatever. It comes from being functionally illiterate prior to college, having worked for a decade in the workforce, um, and then discovering concepts, right? And that was transformative for me. And maybe not everybody needs it in the way that I needed it. Um, and some people need other things, like to be to be able to play and practice on the the piano or the violin. There's a lot of you know to be multilingual. There's a lot of different things that a person mountains somebody might climb from base camp if we actually had a base camp secured that provided time energy. But the the reason time energy is important as a concept, as a technical concept, it's not just speaking to a phenomenon that I believe is a an existential structure of our being in the world, which it is. Uh, it, you know, it, obviously, it, with my thesis, it comes out of 
critiquing Marx and Heidegger with one another imminently. Um, but the, the main point is just like when you're talking to a working class person, working class, look, some of them get it. I want leisure time. Some of them get it. There's things that they already want to do, right? But leisure is not inherently attractive to everybody in the working class. Time energy is. And it's intuitive enough that even without the conceptual distinctions and stipulations that are developed in Waypoint and my next book, uh, Time Energy, that's coming, um, it, it's intuitive enough that they basically know what they're talking about, right? Time energy is time and energy. Of course, st stipulating it's important, and it's not just repeatable blocks of energy-infused time, it, which is the opposite of time without energy, right? It's or energy without repeatable time. Um, but more importantly, like putting it in those terms makes people realize why Adam Smith's vision for public libraries and public education isn't going to be able to fulfill uh, or, or deliver on, on the promise. The promise was workers are going to be able to educate themselves at the libraries and, and universities on their free time. But, that's, but this is a way of looking at all time as equal. One of the good things that Byung-Chul Han has done with his The Scent of Time is talk about the fundamental difference between point time, which is what we have in capitalism, and this, more, this kind of time that's more communal and repeatable. He says ritual. And so um, I, just, I wanted to kind of bring it all back around to that to just say, uh, I believe that the technical term matters and that people I've I've tried to make this book freely available to everybody it's right here on the screen if you just go to theory hyphen underground.com forward slash waypoint um, it's all the chapters are there for free and you can also listen to it I read it aloud so you can listen to it from work and uh, it just matters to me that people who are fellow travelers are able to get a basis in the conversation because for the next five years, I'm not trying to have a general conversation with the masses. I'm not trying to have a niche conversation with academics. I'm trying to have a conversation with people who kind of get it. And what I can say about you both is that I really appreciate you for being here as long as you both have because I, I think that you, bo you both do kind of get it because I think our shared co common referent point not the audiences that we try to speak to, but the values that we care about. It, it, I think that there's enough overlap here that it's worth it that, it, that the contradictions are worth fleshing out. So thank you. Adam and Nance can now turn on their cameras and microphones. And if you both have things you want to add to what I just said, you can incorporate it into your answers. But we're going to prioritize uh, Daniel Tut for the next like seven minutes. So any questions uh, for the both of you? Daniel, you do them first because I know you got to go. And then Nina, you'll have about the same amount of time before we bring Christine Louis de Soli on. Yeah, I mean, I've also got to go in like five minutes as well, but... Um, oh, shit. I'll try and be back another time. But anyway, like, let's hand over to Daniel. So yeah, let's... I mean, I'm happy that Nina came on. There's been, you know, obviously drama that we discussed before about the interview that I did with her. This has been a rich conversation. Um, you know, I think that Part of the downside of the hysteria of our current moment is that richer conversations get prevented from being even had. So uh, you you ambushed me, Dave, but it, it worked Some out. Just... It's all good. I'm not I'm not upset or anything like that. It actually um, probably was for the best. So just uh, do I have any? Or is your is your question? Do I have any questions for Nina, no, Nance. or do I have no, any Nance. questions about time energy? What exactly? No, uh, Nance is going to ask the questions. He's going to be relaying questions oh, yeah. from chat oh, yeah. go, because go, go, he's go. one of the moderators. Please. I would Sorry. just say uh, the ambush, it was not intentional. Um, it, it, the, that, she was originally coming on for the prior portion, for the, for the launch party portion. But I do appreciate This is like an answer to prayer almost, you know. So anyway, Nance, what's up? So it looks like we, we did have a, a pressing question from Lou, Lewis for mm -hmm. Daniel. Um, how to actualize this revolutionary threat within the confines of failed initiation and how to conceive the sacred core of the family in our confrontation with the ruling class. Mm. In my book, I put forward a theory of what I call subjects of counter initiation, which are sort of a, a way for me to think along a Marxist class uh, mode of analysis, especially, um, Thinking new. One thing I'm interested in is 
moving, I think that the uh, category of the lumpen proletariat has materially changed in recent times since 2008. And no longer is it only to be thought as a kind of, um, it's, it's, to, be, to be precise, it's, it's, it's a sunk feature with, uh, within and across the existing working class. And so um, within that, I was trying to put forward the idea of what does it mean for subjects who um, basically have a more socialized version of the family. If, if neoliberalism, in a sense, for working class and lumpen, and I, I'm interested in lumpen, of course, from my own personal experience, because I see my own family as composed of both working and lumpen elements, which you may sympathize with and resonate with, Dave, I don't know. Um, uh, what does it uh, uh, <laughs> I've got mixed feelings about the idolization of the Lumpen proletariat, but, you know, I'm part of it, so yeah, fucking sure. Well, I think it needs to be redefined is, is the point I'm trying to arrive at. Um, but basically, in essence, what does it mean for folks that come, come into a kind of stunted Oedipal process? And what does, what does this crisis of adulthood, this crisis of um, having the capacity to see our subjective life from the stages of um, concrete stages of development, if that's blocked to you, the question of my book is, is there anything possibly revolutionary about subjects that share that um, deprivation, that share that deprivation of initiation? And I say that Lacan argued that Oedipus is basically a theory of initiation. And so when Lacan says that our age is marked, that age that I mentioned before, that we're moving into, he says it's marked by a complete crisis over initiation. It doesn't mean that in some mystical, um, cryptic, or religious sense. He means it as a crisis over Oedipus itself. Right? So it actually it, goes back to the family. That's what I argue. And um, Nina said she's got to take off. Nina in the chat said she's taking off. So everyone say bye. Uh, bye, Nina. Okay. Thank you for coming by. Bye. I didn't want to interrupt Daniel again, but thank you for being <laughs> such a good sport, Daniel. Um, I appreciate and respect your time and, and for being able to cope with this, like, you know, <laughs> interpolation or whatever you want to call it. And sure. thank you, Dave, for the, the last minute invite and, uh, you know, respect to you all. And uh, bye. Bye. Bye, Nina. So okay. yeah, I got to bounce in a moment too, but basically, um, you know, my, my sense is that, uh, you'd have to read the book to see, but, but, but I try to show that, uh, if working class struggle doesn't organize well with lump, with its own lumpenizing potentials, um, which we also have to understand psychoanalytically, um, that like we, that psychoanalysis allows us to see how lumpenization poses a danger to solidarity, cross-class solidarity, which is not a problem of the PMC, which which we're usually focused on. It's a different problem. So I, I try to get at that. I don't have any immediate solutions to that, but that's just sort of what Luis is kind of referring to. Um, but I, I don't have any immediate solutions at this time. Or rather, if I did, it would take me a long time to elaborate them, unfortunately, Dave. Have you read that uh, that conversation with the Maoists when Foucault was kind of post Maoist, it was in the it was called uh, what is it? Power knowledge, the the anthology. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I yes, I, I have read that. Yes, I think it's a really good example of one of the really big powerful ways that the working class get, uh, divides its own self from the mm. Lupin proletariat in. Uh, it, it kind of outside of any thought of the the PMC, right? Mm. Right. It's obviously you've got elements that want to become petty bourgeois. You got elements that want to become PMC. You got elements that are just happy being workers. But the the part Foucault's focusing on is the way the judicial system reinforces the sense of oh I'm a good worker as opposed to yeah. you you don't deserve a real secure job because you've been bad. Mm. Yeah. Is that kind of what you're talking about, or do you go in a no, different what direction I'm, what here? No, what I'm talking about is that it foments a capacity for an unconscious paternalism amongst the lumpen working class. So, like, basically, if the paternal function is deprived to the working class, 
then they're going to seek its replacement in institutions. And that means that we need a new literacy for how to combat institutional paternalism. Because what's revolutionary about Freud's theory of Oedipus for the left is that Freud says we can overcome institutional Oedipal hangups and dependencies. Like say you're raised in a conservative family and all you know is a kind of weird patriotism, which you never, let's say you never get the 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 opportunity to question or challenge it. That's a kind of, oh, that's an Oedipal hangup. So psychoanalysis is revolutionary in that sense because it allows you to break from institutional um, dependencies. It's all, it's a, it's a theory of dependency theory. I got right? you. And so the lumpen proletariat is more prone. They're more sensitive to needing that social paternalism because they've been deprived of it in their own family. That's what I was trying to theorize, gotcha. if that makes sense. Well, reading the introduction and watching your conversation with the vanishing mediators was enough for me to realize that you're more complicated of a thinker than my initial misgivings. And I really do appreciate you being here. And the last, I wanna, I'm going to let you say your final closing bit, but I just want to say something yeah. for the Nina Power people out there, right? And that is that um, this is a space by and for renegade academics and working class intellectuals, autodidacts, burnouts, etc. But we also work with people who aren't renegades in like a strict sense. Like, you know, Norman Finkelstein is a good example of a, like a straight up like renegade PMC. But you know, we got lots of people who work with your underground who are just, just professors and, you know, they might have somewhat, you know, some kinds of insecurity that they're dealing with on tenure track. Uh, they might deal with a lot of the, the kinds of burnout and anxiety talked about in, on bullshit jobs because of the increases of academic busy work in the, in the neoliberalization of the university and all of this stuff that we talk about. But I just want to say, like, I have had three conversations censored after the fact in the last two and a half years where I brought leftists on. Um, and these were leftists who already knew that I was sort of like, oh, untouchable in various ways. And then they still worked, you know, they still came on for a good faith conversation. But then they ended up saying something that they regretted after the fact. And they asked me to take down the stream or to edit something yeah. out of the stream. And here's the thing. I hate it in the moment, but I also understand the situation that you're in. And those decisions are not, I'm not better than you because I'm not making those decisions. And it's, it, it, I'm not more courageous because I'm not in those yeah. in environments. And not, none of us are. And so you got to survive and you got to do what you got to do. And so I just think, you know, uh, I just appreciate you for being able to uh, yeah, hold, I appreciate the, hold the no, line here. Good. I mean, I'm, I'm um, happy to be on and I haven't regretted anything that has happened. And I thought it was, it was interesting, dynamic and, uh, probably good that it caught everybody off guard a little bit so it was it was probably i, I, I want to come back on i do have to bounce because my my ride's about to leave cool peace out have a great stream thank you all so much thank you bye take care nance anything else you want to touch on from chat before we roll the psa we did have some lively back and forth um around nostalgia and nostalgia for lost futures and uh nostalgia for a past that never existed um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's already what it is. Um, but yeah, it was a great conversation, great back and forth. Cool. Uh, and have you read Mikey's Lacan's concept of the phallus post? Once again, that's another one that in bits and pieces, never all the way through. Um, Adam and I are actually going to team up to do a co-reading of that soon. For real? You're going to do an exegetical reading of it? Well, we're going to try. That would be really cool. I, I, I'm going to make an achievement on the, the site for people who have done X amount of exegetical readings of The Dangerous Maybe specifically. And there will be a special like badge for people who've done them all. Obviously, that's a tall order, but it's one of my own goals because – I think people like think I'm arbitrarily putting Mikey in the position of subject supposed to know, treating him like he's my theory teacher. Look, he's only my theory teacher on specific matters. There's a lot of things that I'm into where he's like it's the other way around. Um, I just I, I before building back a platform after like I decided not to not do theory plea really 
um, I wanted to change the dynamic and not always have myself in the position of, oh, I've got it figured out and I'm a representative here, I'm an influencer. Instead being like, no, I'm, I'm a student for life and the people I bring on, I, I bring them on to learn from just as often as I might contradict them or anything. But like when I contradict them, it's so that I can get clarification. Like when I challenged Daniel Tut on Marxism romanticizing a specific phase of the workers' movement, um, that's not um, that's not spiteful. That's not meant to take him down a notch. That's meant to be some real food to think over and work through. And he'll send me resources Terry. And, to tarry with the negative, to work through the contradictions. Not not for synthesis, but for just learning, really. So anyway, but with all that said, the Dangerous Maybe blog is one that I stand heavily. And Mikey is uh, Michael Downs, the inst uh, the instructor of the For They Don't Know What They Do course. Also, if you go to the Theory uh, Underground uh, YouTube channel, you can scroll down and there's two playlists, Zizek 101, Lacan 101. If you want to do it chronologically, start with Lacan, then go to Zizek because that's the order that they were recorded in. If you want the uncut versions of these, just become a $50 per month subscriber or fill out the, the financial aid scholarship in the PSA I'm about to roll. But the main thing is, I, I Mikey is a working class intellectual in the truest sense. He works in a warehouse. He's not able to join us today because he has to drive a truck, which is why when Todd McGowan joins, uh, we're mainly talking about Mikey and time energy and the, the fact that it's bullshit that Mikey's life conditions have made it so that he's not freed up to do the work that he needs to do, hmm. which is sharing concepts for working class people. Um, he spent like 17 years studying philosophy six hours a day before he was forced into blue collar work. And now that he's been in blue collar work, it's like he's, he just got to the point where he was ready to write his major work and then he got forced into blue collar work. And that's good in a dialectical sense. It's going to make it that, that work something different than it would have been. Um, and if you want to know about his work, his job, then you got to go read his article called uh, Jouissance, wage labor and Jouissance, why the left needs Zizek to understand workers. Um, this is a powerful piece that will be featured prominently in the forthcoming Underground Theory Volume 1 uh, uh, volume. But the, the reason I have Lacan's concept of the phallus up on the screen here is because I don't want to talk about gender with someone who doesn't have this as a basis. Right when when Judith Butler uses the concept of the phallus in Gender Trouble, she actually leaves leaves out one of the registers, and she doesn't really think with this concept. She's just using it in a sort of in this kind of way that a lot of academics will. And so, I don't want to have a conversation with you about gender or sex unless you've read this. And then, of course, if you really want to go down that rabbit hole and kind of get away from reactionary tendencies or from naive progressivism, which kind of creates those reactionary tendencies, then you need to take the what is sex course. And uh, so Lacan's concept of the phallus combined with the what is sex course, I think, are probably two of the most important things for really having a basis. I don't, need, I don't care if you agree with me in the future once you've done those things, but I, but I want to have a basis for productive disagreement, and we ain't going to have that unless you've read and reread and reread this piece that I'm pointing to on the screen, which is Lacan's concept of the phallus by the dangerous maybe. In it, it is long, but he exhaustively wrings out every example he can to make this concept the most accessible and intuitive that you will think with. And it's important because it has to do with everything in our lives. And I, I do believe that the case is made in this post. And so it's foundational. Definitely read it when you get the chance. Or you can sit here and click the button to listen to it. Uh, you just have to sign in, I guess. But with that, anything to say before we turn it over to the PSA? Perfect. All right, everybody. We'll be back shortly with Christine Louis de Soli. Dr. Christine Louis de Soli. Two PhDs. One in the humanities, one in the biological sciences to talk about identity politics left and right. Okay. See you all soon. Bye-bye. And now a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. 
What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important yet neglected for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 tier is too much, consider donating towards meals and gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the U.S., where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events, not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground.com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being in Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at tier three, you also get access to the recovery group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMT Early Bird YT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? one of the most succinct and cutting edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code what is sex early bird YT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, 
being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, people tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah. And seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye. All right, everybody, um, I'm back now, and I'm just going to talk for a second. Um, basically, uh, Christine has some issues here with the, um, the on the technical side, and so we've been trying to get that figured out here for the last couple of minutes, so thank you for hanging tight. How's it going, chat? How many people are here? And how long have you been here? Everyone in the chat, let me know how long you've been here, if you've been in and out, if you've watched the whole thing so far, if you have gone back and fast-forwarded to catch up, or if you're just tuning in really quickly from work. Are you, vi are you playing video games? Oh, we can hear you now. 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 We've got you now. We got you now. Yeah, we got you now. We got you. You're we're, you're <laughs> you you are with us. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? All 
All right, Christine, I've just I've muted you for a moment just while you get that figured out, and I will proceed to talk just for a moment with everybody in the chat. So while she gets her um, audio figured out so that she's able to hear me, um, you can't hear me? Oh, you couldn't hear uh, Christine. That's okay. Yeah, I, I will unmute the desktop side once she's back, and then we will kick this off properly. So once, you're, once you can hear me properly, Christine, go ahead and unmute yourself, and then we'll get this thing kicked off here. But I did mute you, uh, so you'll just have to look at the bottom left corner and click on that thing. I can hear you now. How are you doing? All right, uh, will this make it better? Am I louder now? Is this? Oh, perfect. Okay then. So um, I'm about to change the title of the stream and uh, officially introduce you, but while I'm getting set up with that, how are you doing? Bis little bit hectic, yeah, for sure. Well, you know, it's a it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure as always. Um, let me let me just God damn it, where's my studio? Where's the studio? Uh oh here it is. Okay. Perfect. I just have to change the title of the stream. To to because right now it says Daniel Tut and Nina Power. Were you able to catch any of that so far? For sure, for sure. Ah, uh, perfect. No, 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 you're far from an idiot, but I get what you mean. Um, now, before, well, I guess I think we're basically ready to roll here, so um, let me let me change the title, let's change the thing, blah, blah, blah. All right, everybody, <clears throat> three, two, one. All right, everybody, welcome to Theory Underground. I'm your host, David McCarricker, and today, uh, for this portion of the two-day live stream marathon for the course site launch, we have a very special guest indeed. Uh, please put your uh, virtual imaginative hands together for Dr. Christine Louis de Soli. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's um, really good to have you. A bit nervous. <laughs> a bit nervous. Well, uh, the, 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 the best compliment I've ever received, maybe, was the one you gave me after I had you on last time, where you said that you were nervous, but I got you talking, and then you forgot that you were nervous, and then you had a good time. So um, no pressure. Uh -huh. But um, let's see. So that was back in the Theory Plebe days. Now this is the Theory Underground days. And so there's been changes for me, and there's been changes for you as well. Because in a sense, you've written one book. It was published with zero books, and it was called... Transcending Racial Divisions, Will You Stand By Me? And uh, mm -hmm. that's what I had originally interviewed you on. And I understand you've in some ways grown away from that text. And so I'll be interested to hear a little bit about that. I'll be interested to really nail down left versus right identity politics and why you're against both and what you basically think real politics is. But before we get into all of that stuff, I guess, do, would you like to say anything else as a form of introduction for the people who are joining who may have never heard you before? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote the book and um, I also uh, finished my PhD, I think, uh, after. And uh, now I'm, um, I basically, I, I, my aim um, is to be able to understand um, how to build um, a humanist and universalist politics. That's, that's my uh, aim. So I am uh, uh, trying to research and to write and put um, ideas um, in writing because it's also help. Uh, but the, my eating aim is, uh, as an activist, I suppose, is to build politics 
uh, around uni universalism and uh, humanism. So uh, pushing the idea of human beings being important uh, in changing the world and uh, the idea of universalism. So that's the reason why I have a strong um, opposition to identity politics because universalism is, um, you cannot be a universalist and support identity politics. Um, and uh, I, I could discuss later on about uh, the difference between identity and identity politics, because I'm not against people having identities. I'm against uh, the use of, of identities or social identities uh, in, the, in the form of politics, in, in the political realm. So that's the reason why I, I, I try uh, during the book and uh, later on in the thesis try to understand why is it that I think identity politics is not politics. What's more, what's more important in politics that you don't find in identity politics? And uh, for example, uh, I, I uh, am I talking too much? No, no, no. This is perfect. You're doing okay. great. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, for me, I agree with. Um, uh, Anna Arendt, uh, when she said that you cannot discuss, you cannot think about politics without thinking about freedom. And of course, there is different uh, type of freedom and different understanding of freedom. But for me, politics is a, is a, a human activity where human beings trying to find um, a way to organize society in a way that will be good for the common good or the at least the majority of the individuals. So you have different uh, theory, different ideology. But you're trying to build the world for human beings, or for your community. And when you have today, for me, it's it's not politics, it's more of a managerial uh, uh, activity where you discuss how many taxes you should pay, or how much uh, food, or how much television you should watch. So it's all about uh, managing a society that you have today. Uh, and for me, it's nothing to do with politics. And uh, when we have identity politics, what you also have, I think I'm moving in different places, but um, I'm getting excited and I'm moving all over the place. But for me, identity politics is, is a way of um, going away from politics, not looking at how we can organize a, a better world for all, but uh, how we can fight for the interests of a particular uh, identity in a group. So it could be a woman, or it could be a black woman, or it could be gay, it could be trans, it could be a British or uh, or black British or French British uh, or, or you know uh, Asian British, but it's always about different identities, a very specific identity, and fighting for the interests of this specific identity. So the notions of fighting for a, a, a better society or better world for all, it's gone. The idea of common good is gone. It's all about um, interest. Critical question then, just to play devil's advocate, because I think I know the answer, but I want to set you up to be the one talking here. So don't worry, I'll interject if I feel like I can help, but mainly uh, your talking is the goal. Um, but the you know the little devil's advocate thing is, well, what about intersectionality? Doesn't intersectionality put back together all of those identities into one big group that can then fight for justice for all? I have a problem with inter intersectionality. Uh, uh, it's because intersectionality has uh, no concepts, actually, for me, of universalism. What what they are arguing basically is that as a black woman, for example, um, you know, as no, I'm I'm being identified as a black woman, and so I should think about the uh, the oppressions as a black and the oppression as a woman. And if I was gay, it would be also the oppressions of a gay. And then you put them together and you're saying, my identity is uh, in cross between the oppression of this and the oppression of this identity. And so basically it's kind of a, there is something good, about, something real about intersectionality because it's describing what some individuals are, um, are living. You know, if, if you're a black or if you're a black woman, as a woman, you have something that is different than if you're a man in, in sense of, um, equal right, uh, but uh, it's just describing, but it has no sense of let's let's fight for a world um, away from identity. It's just basically put different identity and say, how can we make identity as black, uh, goes with identity as a woman and go with identity as a British and go with identity as a, you know, as a professor, you know, and it kind of is as a block. For me, it's very, it's, it's very anti-human in, in a way, because it's basically saying different fixed identity, you put them together and see how it goes well together. And it's, there is no sense of, as an, as 
human beings as individuals with different identity, we can have a, a common purpose and a common future and common aim. There is no sense of that. And that's, but, but I think that's, for me, that's a big problem for that. Yeah, I've found that to be incredibly off-putting, right? Because uh, it's just like, yeah, if you're, if you're, identity doesn't fit into the given ones, then your only role is to listen, support, quote unquote, be a good ally, which means following the right representatives of whatever it, whatever supposed community, which is usually just some PMC grouping on Twitter, right? Or, or, or whoever's like popular on TikTok today. And people say, oh, well, that's just democratic. That's not democratic. That's just that's, I'm sorry, the, the attention economy doesn't put forth our best. And so I do, I, uh, I'm very alienated by all of that. And so, you know, my years of organizing uh, with Bernie or as well as like doing, you know, being a student and teacher in the university system, um, it just became more and more apparent that this is a genuine um, issue. And it seemed like you know, like every time you you know you talk about it or reference some author maybe who's got some criticism, everyone's like, oh well, that's white. That's a white person. That's just whiteness. And even I know that like the the answer would be your critique of say the Kimberly Crenshaw approach, the Robin D'Angelo approach, the Kimber Max Kendi approach, the Tony Hesey Coates approach. Your critique of it will get re response. One of the responses will just be like, well, you've internalized whiteness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you have you ever had someone tell you that to your face though, in real life? Oh, yeah, oh yeah. I mean, uh, I had a lot of um, a lot a lot of labeling and a lot of insult um, from both uh, face to face or online, uh, both on, on 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 different sides. So uh, on the side of black, in the sense of you're not black, uh, you're just kind of have an internalized whiteness and you are not you're not basically a coconut this is the one of the um insult that you get to as a black person and then you have the other side where basically if i argue because i'm also uh challenging anti-racism i mean challenging racism sorry so if i discuss anti-racism then i have the other side and say well it's because you're black that's why you have this point of view so it's basically the point is that it's it's not only it's it's a problem with identity when people are this arguing that identity is important, what they are doing at the moment in, in today's society is that identities are fixed identities. They they're putting people into very fixed um, boxes. It, there is even people talk about this is a fluid identity. In fact, when they are trying to define the identity, they don't make it fluid. They make it very uh, uh, fixed, very um, very straight, very hermetic. And if you and if you go away from this idea of what is this identity, then you become a non a non sorry non black a non woman or a non gay just because you have a different point of view. And when you think about identity, it's a bit like race a race so racist identity also. But it's what they are saying is that if you have a certain identity, you have to have the culture, and the morality and the politics of that specific identity. So when I said I'm not against identity, it said uh, as such. When identity is used uh, in politics, it becomes very strictly fixed. And in fact, they are not identities in the sense they are classification. Uh, are you part of this uh, category? Are you uh, part of this category? If you have the right, opi right opinions, you, you can be a member. If you have the wrong opinions, you're not a member anymore. So a black person could be what they're calling a white supremacist. It's not irrational to call a black person white supremacist because what they are saying is that if you're even if you're black as biology black, what they call it biology black, you have the wrong opinion. So no, you can no longer be part of the black identity. You become a white supremacist. You become an you have lost your identity, uh, and these identities are always fixed and always defined by what I call gatekeepers. So there's a, a groups of individuals in society who are very powerful today. And that's one of the things that I'm really challenging is that those gatekeepers of identity, because politics is only about identity politics, the get, gatekeepers of identities are very powerful because they are the one who's saying to you and to everybody else, who is a woman? Who is a black? Who is British? Who is French? Who is a, a professor? Who is working class? Who is middle class? So they are the ones who are basically fixing their identities, and that 
if you're an, a member of the identity, then you can fight for the interest of this identity. So as a professor, you can fight for the interest of the professor. But if you're not a professor, you are not the you don't have the right identity to open your mouth about professor's interests. If you are not black, if you don't have the proper black identity, you cannot talk about black identity. If you're not a woman, for example, if, if you're not considered a woman because you're trans, for example, you cannot talk about woman interests because you're just trans. And you see how, uh, right. uh, um, uh, basically for me, it's a mental prison. Uh, that mental we are prison. basically pushing ourselves into mental prison. It's a mental prison, and it seems to also undermine diversity in a more robust sense. Because I, I don't, did you see that conversation between uh, Judith Butler, Simon Critchley, and Cornell West when they all three were in dialogue with G Glenn Greenwald? No, no. no At one point. You know, because they talk about identity politics, and at one point Judith Butler says, you know, well, it, what kind of difference would it have made if we had some black women in this conversation? And then, like, Glenn Greenwald's response was like, yeah, so we could have Candace Owens in the conversation, or we could have... Kimberly Crenshaw, and he starts saying what it would he he starts saying like the specific kinds of identities that are going to be represented or rec or even asked to join the conversation are obviously going to be heavily determined by the kinds of people who prioritize this kind of representational politics. And I mean, Candace Owens is actually a good example of it. She uses the fact that she's black to be this spokesperson on the right in the same way that someone like. Uh, Kimber Max Candy, you know, uses his blackness as his, that's his, that's his rite of passage, that's his, that's his authentic, you know, certification into speaking for this group. And anyway, I just thought, you know, it, the basic point was like, uh, Glenn Greenwald goes into it and he says, what about, you know, a working class black woman? What about, uh, you know, a, what, what about a black woman who would disagree with like you? And, and it, I felt like, yeah, Butler was a little slippery and just kind of avoided really engaging with this point. But, you know, to that point, have you been invited since the publication of your book or before, since you've kind of become a, a, a public voice on these matters, have you been invited into any institutional spaces to add diversity uh, from the theoretical standpoint to these spaces where they only want to hear from black women? No. Uh, well, I mean, maybe, but you know those kind of things that um, being invited just because you're a black woman, people usually don't say it openly. Uh, I mean, some of the people will say it openly, but most people will not say, well, because it's kind of an insult. So, you know, we invite you just because you're a black woman. I mean, <laughs> I'm most likely going to send them flying uh, if somebody is saying that to me. Uh, and um, my position at the moment is also a little bit particular. The book um, was received uh, uh, by certain groups of people because it has, um, it, like I said, I, I, like, like you said, I move a little bit. The, the book was a little bit um, liberal and I move uh, further away from liberal um, uh, politics. Uh, so, and uh, the more um, radical, because I'm calling myself radical, uh, the more radical I become, uh, the less, uh, um, uh, the less I can represent a black woman's point of view. And, and there is a lot of, uh, for example, when to talk about uh, black politics in, uh, in America, there is a few people who are not what we call a progressive, or, or right, but they're not heard. The ones who are black anti-capitalists, for example, are not known. So you have the black progressive like Candy uh, as in the forefront, and then uh, the black conservative has supposedly the two uh, opposition. Uh, anybody who has what I call radical left, I mean, really radicals, uh, are not heard. They uh, disappeared from the conversation because you had a progressive or a conservative. 
And for me, I'm neither progressive nor a conservative. That's the reason why, for example, when I talk about anti-racism to some people, uh, I like uh, going to groups where I know the consensus would be against me. I'm a bit a little bit of a masochist, I suppose. Uh, but I like the challenge of uh, going to places where the point of view will be really against me. And uh, the way that they um, kind of uh, reacting is that so just by mentioning anti-racism, I must be a progressive. Uh, and then right. if you go to the progressive, if I mention that I don't support black identity, then I must be a conservative. Right. And so um, there is, a, for me, it's another problem of politics that there is a very uh, strong uh, restrictions in the framework of the political discussion. So it's very, I mean, for example, what I like about Ken and Malik is that it's going, it's not a progressive and it's not a conservative. And and you can hear him, uh, Ken and Malik is an author in um, public intellectual in Britain. It's somebody Kevin that, uh, Malik. Uh, I, I don't hear you anymore. Hello? Oh, yeah, I hear you. Kevin Malik, is that what you're saying? Yeah, Kenan Kenan Malik. Kenan Malik. He he he, he published just one a book recently. Is a uh, uh, um, not so black and white. The history of race. Uh, what's his name? Um, what is the? By Hearst Publishers. Yeah, not so black and white. A history of race, from white supremacy to identity politics. God. He's very damn. good. Okay, I'll pull that up on the screen here so people are able to see it. Um, have you had, had a con good. have you have you, are you in dialogue with him? Well, my politics is quite similar to his. Uh, I mean, he had he wrote a book uh, I think in the late eighties or nineties, nothing nineties, uh, the meaning um, the meaning of race, and that was uh, eye opening. That was um, and since since that day I follow him. Um, so, but for him, he's a left. He's a left. And he has to try struggle to be able to put his point of view away from uh, a conservative, what people call the left, huh? uh, conservative and a progressive. So he's in between. And uh, for me, he's pretty much the same. Um, but those, his, his book has been well received, so uh, maybe his voice will be heard. So he's, for example, uh, challenging multiculturalism in the past, uh, but at the same time, he's also a challenge. He's arguing that diversity and, and migration, migration is a good thing. So. Uh, you, you see that there is a very uh, in the discussions on in, in politics in racism, it's the discussion is very restricted, um, right? And it's very hard to be able to put a voice that is different than the mainstream liberal and the mainstream uh, conservative. So it sounds like you're using this distinction between. Uh, liberal and left to say that there's a left that is universalist, humanist, and emancipatory that is not liberal, and that liberal and conservative as the two-party status quo duopolies in the developed world currently exist, in, you know, um, you accept neither of these sides. Now, I know that you've also read uh, at least the first few articles on the Benedict Cryptofash, anti-leftist Marx, uh, or whatever it's called, uh, where he, you know, makes the case for a Marx against the, the the term left versus right, and I had Chris Catrone on my channel last year back in the theory plebe days um, to talk about this debate because they actually exchanged articles about this in the Platypus Review, um, and basically, I th the 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 standpoint you're ascribing to. Uh, uh, Malik here sounds like the the and you're saying that you have similar politics. It sounds like the one that Catrone fundamentally has, as opposed to the one that Cryptofash is advocating, which is, I mean, he says that there's no di there's no substantial difference between left and uh, liberal because the leftist academics and activists still function to reify this idea that the liberals are the more, pro more progressive side of this duopoly, that's where they speak to, that's the audience they assume, that's the, the, the pool from which they recruit. And so even a group that's like revolutionary Marxists, like the IMT in Canada, 500 strong at their conferences, all of them like they're not liberal, they still assume kind of liberal progressives are in, in the college system are going to be their recruit, their recruitment pool 
for the continued existence of their institutions. I'm wondering if you, like what, what, what how, how has your thinking kind of, in, in being critical of liberalism, um, how, has, how has your thinking developed in regards to this word left? I am, I have, um, <laughs> I am one of the um, individuals who, uh, who is quite um, you can, uh, sympathetic to um, uh, uh, Benedict Kryptofash um, uh, position. Um, I have to say that I, 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 I avoid too much of this discussion because I think we can just, I mean, I've been in, in discussing politics for so many years and the discussions about what the left is, uh, what is uh, the good left, the bad left, uh, the not so good left, the fascist left, and the, it's just for me, I found it um, uh, unproductive. I think that it's, it's more productive to put, to develop ideas that you think is left than just kind of say, well, the left is not very good and, and this, this left is better. But I, I am um, very sympathetic to uh, uh, Benedict's Cryptofan, Cryptofash uh, position because I think that most of the what we think is left, especially in America, I'm sorry to say, but most of the um, uh, people that we think is left are liberal, liberal left. They base their politics on uh, a liberal liberal viewpoint, uh, liberal values and liberal principles. And so um, even if they call themselves radical, uh, the, the, because they are uh, lefty, the, they are... Um, Politics, uh, uh, it becomes what uh, um, um, crypto crypto fascists are arguing, the other side of the conservative. So they are left and the right, uh, or to be what he calls two sides of the same uh, politics. They are bourgeois politics. And in a way, when you look at the left, a lot of the left, for example, have completely, especially today, lost these notions of social transformation or human freedom. So they will uh, even even if the radical left they will say well we want to uh, uh, attack uh, capitalism so other they will go and said we don't like capitalism because it's terrible things you know uh, all very very moralistic you know we don't we want people to be happy and uh, to have more food it it's, it becomes a, a kind of I'm a do-gooder and you are not kind of things uh, so that's why I'm anti-capitalism because I'm a, do, a nice person. Or, or, or the other people will say, well, you know, there is no uh, more important things today is to fight for better wages and uh, um, uh, better housing. And then there becomes what I call reformist, reformist left. So that politics is really much on the short term. Let's go and improve uh, the life of uh, workers within capitalism. And there is no notions of uh, any more of challenging and, and, and opposing and making a society that is different, completely different than capitalism. So they are liberal. And in fact, the anti-racism that you have today, they call it liberal, but the anti-racism today, I don't say politics, is liberal uh, anti-racism. It's based on this idea of uh, liberal egalitarian. This is that, liberal anti-racism. That, that right there, I think, and it gets to the heart of my reason for also saying, yeah, I would prefer to dis kind of disengage from semantic or gatekeepy type quibbles over words. But the idea of like, well, let's just develop a better left instead of having an argument about who's properly left or whatever. Um, and I, I understand you're saying that we can't just do that. But for, I think the the, the danger in, in defining left, like, a, a, you know, what, what you think is going to be a movement of the future on the terms of being anti-liberal is that most people I have encountered over 10 years of organizing who hate liberalism tend to hate the best aspects of liberalism while throwing out, uh, while, while celebrating the, while celebrating the worst aspects of anti-liberalism from the 20th century. And now, I, does that does that inherently make sense, or would you like me to kind of unpack it? Um, to be anti-liberal, I mean, you have different type of anti-liberalism. So that's for me. That's because if you're saying anti anti-liberalism, people will, will should ask, what do you mean by that? Uh, right. So you like you said, yes, some people will be anti-liberalism because I would say for, democracy is not a good thing. 
uh, why do you want free speech? Because uh, it is, you know, we are a capitalist society and free speech will be uh, only the powerful have free speech. So those kind of, there is this anti-liberalism or you have the anti-liberalism anti -liberalism of the right who's arguing that at the end of the day, we want to have a uh, um, uh, community where the enlightened basically are, are fighting and are controlling so that we can fight for the common good. So you, you can have different type of anti-liberalism. So uh, to, to just say you're anti-liberal, is, is, it has nothing. Uh, for me, it's... I am anti-liberal and not anti-liberal. I am challenging and, and, and I'm, I'm thinking that liberalism or liberal uh, uh, way of understanding the world, it's not enough um, uh, if you think that the best uh, 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 future for humanity is to be able to uh, socially transform from a capitalist society to a society that um, is based more on a human uh, need and human freedom. That, for me, it's... I'm, I'm basing my point of view on the on the notions already that I think that we can do better than we have today. So I believe that humanity can do better, and I and believe that humanity can change society. Today we have the ability to change society for our own uh, benefits, for our, our own needs. Uh, whether that uh, what instead of having a society that is based on uh, uh, capital, uh, on the regulation of capital and the labor. So I have already this. Uh, idea that we are, um, uh, humanity has developed enough that we have the possibility and ability to change consciously a society that we have today to something that can be better. And then I'm thinking, what are those politics that allow me to do that? And if you have a politics who's telling me that we are all individuals, for example, and that we are just, uh, the society is completely forgotten, then you don't even have a sense of the capitalist social order because you're just taking it over. You're just like talking about individuals, you know, we are individuals in, um, like, it's like, you know, little balls. We're all together and then we work together and then we, we separate. And I don't think society, if you, if you think individual, individual like uh, liberal, you're forgetting the social order itself, society itself, that you need to change. Uh, so for me, it's that there is liberal ideas that are in fact a barrier to any uh, notions of social transformation or any notions of human emancipation or human development that I'm challenging. So I'm not against free speech, for example. Okay. But for me, I, I, I definitely against this idea that somehow free speech used to be there and then we don't have free speech today. I'm sorry to say free speech didn't exist before. It has never existed. Because you cannot have you cannot have free speech in a society where you have a dominated, dominating sorry dominated uh, class and dominating class. Right. The dominating class will not give you the uh, the possibility to say what you want because you want to keep. You know you want to keep the status quo. So right. black, this is a gay people outside norms never had free speech. Free speech is an ideal. It's, right. it's based on the notion that we can have our own point of view. But to to say that, you know, free speech was bad, uh, good before and now we don't have free speech, I think it's really a way of, I think I'm going all over the place, but it's really for me. So I, I, I can support the free speech um, uh, as a liberal principle, but I will not, for example, support a free speech campaign just based on free speech, because I think it gives really the wrong uh, notions of what the world is about today. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is not all over the place. I think you're you're actually very concise and on point. You're only all over the place for people whose attention spans are less than a tweet, which obviously is very, I mean, TikTok is less than a tweet. So in a sense, like, yeah, people have to develop their attention spans and people can't say, oh, we need to listen to other people uh, if they only want to have other people in sound bites because real thinking is syllogistic. It follows a train of thought. And I think I'm on board with this train ride so far. I hope everybody in the chat is. I have had the privilege of conversations with Christine on and off air uh, in the past. And so if you are confused about any of this, then maybe you know I'm taking for granted certain things that I forgot that I know. And uh, so do ask in the chat as well as I just want to say that you know in about a half hour, we're going to open this thing up to Q&A. Uh, where we actually bring in those con those questions that come up over the next half hour in the chat because Nance, as well as maybe other moderators, 
Um, they're on the Zoom call with us, but they're also in the live stream chat. That way I don't have to read everything and neither do you. We can just focus on this conversation. But uh, with all that said, I kind of wanted to draw in a quote that will kind of quilt things because earlier I had said what people call identity politics, what people call standpoint epistemology, what people call the PMC, like these things that are driving people crazy are the direct result of a structural change that took place in the 20th century it started with Taylorism in the professions like engineering, doctors, lawyers, which made sense, but specifically developed into what I call discursive Taylorism. And uh, this, you know, it, it comes as a response to the successes of labor organizing towards the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century to the point where Woodrow Wilson, who was president of Princeton University in 1909, uh, told uh, the, the New York City School Teachers Association, we want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a very much larger class of necessity in every society to forego the privileges of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific manual tasks. This is the call for not just the Taylorism over work that eradicates uh, inefficiencies and allows skill monopolization for a subsection of a working class that we call the PMC. No, this is, more importantly, the creation of this idea that everybody has their own lane and they need to stay in their own lane and follow the enlightened leaders, like you were saying, which is also popular on the left as well with anti-populism today. Um, and I, 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 Just because I even say those words now, I have to clarify what I mean. Because people are so anti-populist that if you have a problem with anti-populism, then people think that you're pro-populist, right? Be but the point is, is that since Trump, the liberal progressive elite they have been blaming the people who get duped by populism or by the kinds of populists who don't put forward real solutions, blaming those people at, or you know the, the people who supposedly brainwash them instead of trying to think, well, might there be a real class antagonism, an objective class antagonism that is being appealed to by populists and that if the left or whatever and any, any, any movement can't learn how to speak to the disenfranchised and, uh, well, there's not going to be any solution in the near future, right? The only people who will really want change from every fiber of their being are always going to be the truck drivers, right? Like they're always going to be the people who are looked down on by the the left PMC. So um, th does, does, this, does this track for you? And it, like, is this, is this part of the issue for you? Are you do you consider your anti-liberalism to be a, a, ver a, a version of populism? Or is it something else? How would, you, how would you describe what your position is in respect to this debate over populism? Let's put it this way. Um, uh, for the last... Um for last year, uh, I've been uh, thinking and writing a lot about democracy, and I've been having quite a few arguments. And for me, democracy is a very good uh, example of showing who really uh, uh, are populist, or who really support ordinary people. I mean, uh, working class or, or poor people, or you can call it the majority. For me, it's the majority. To ask somebody, ask people, who will agree with having real democracy? And what I mean by real democracy is that the rule by the people. Imagine the rule by the people, the uneducated, the educated, what? And most left and right, even if they argue they support democracy, what they are saying is that they support democracy that it is today in the uh, uh, liberal democracy. I in a, a, a democracy where people, most of the people, do not have a, a voice. I mean, you can see that, in, for example, in France. Uh, those democracy, liberal democracy, people do not rule. Putting a cross on the paper every few years, uh, um, we don't put a cross anymore, but you know, putting a cross on the paper every few years to vote for a representative is not a democracy. It's not ruled by the people. So when you're trying to discuss 
why is it that you do not want to support the real rule by the people, i.e. the uneducated, imagine the uneducated people, then you can see why, where, in fact, even the populists are not really populists. They are not really supporting other people because I can't imagine that somehow other people, the cleaner, you know, my uh, I, my background is working class, so the cleaners in some of my family could have a say in how to rule uh, uh, France or how to rule, because that's what it means, it's the rule by the people. It means that the people have a say in the governments, governance of their own society. And this is very unpopular. And for me, it means that the anti uh, um, the the content for people, for normal people, for ordinary people, is very strong from left to right. But they will argue that they are populists, they support the working class. But when it comes down to it, they, they have content and they mistrust the people. They mistrust their ability to be able to make a decision for their own world, for their own life. Uh, so I, 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 I these are things about, for me, it's not about populism, for me, it's about democracy. That's why I always push this idea of democracy as the rule of the people. And what I like also, it's, uh, what's the name? Ellen Meskin, I put that recently in on Facebook, Ellen Meskin Wood, basically showing that the, the notion of democracy that we use today is not democracy in a, that it was uh, um, um, uh, developed in the past in, uh, in, um, in antiquity. The notion of democracy has been able to be uh, um, argued and supported because it became, in a way, um, a safe world. Mm. So you are the, the separation between the social and economic power and the political power allow the meaning of democracy to change. So it's no longer the rule by the people. And when you say to people the rule by the people, people say, oh, how could you, how could a cleaner have a right. say about the nuclear power, for example, in, in France or in Germany? So they will say the rule of the people is just old democracy. And the notion of democracy today has been changed because of the way that capitalism is organized, where the social and economic power is separated from the political power. And you can talk about introducing people into the political discussion without them having any say and power into uh, controlling the way society is organized. Because at the end of the day, even if you vote every few min a few years, you do not have a say in what's happening to right. your country or your community. Right, so if you, for instance, you know, if we lived in a small city state like Athens and we were free men, because free men were the only ones who had this right, but you know, if we were engaged in democracy in that situation, um, we're not just talking about who should be representing who and who might maybe should be able to take more taxes for what or redistribution or whatever. No, we're also specifically, uh, part partially going to argue over fundamental transformations of the way we do things that aren't just matters of politics, but what you're saying are economics. At the time, and Hannah Arendt makes this point in The Human Condition, at the time, um, economics was just allocated to the household, right? Um, this, this vision of politics between public and private split um, is eradicated by social, what she calls socialization, which really what she means is nobody has their own means of subsistence. Nobody has their own economy. Everybody has to rely on a world economy. And so that undermines this public-private split from Athenian society. And I guess for me then the big question is like, how do we let, uh, how does democracy you know, by and for, of the people, uh, how, how does that do anything except get in the way of giant transformations of society? Because and I say it might get in the way is because, I mean, I'm just meeting people I know in my normal life, the things that they want, the things that they advocate for are not the kinds of grand rescaling of society, right? So it, it, would, be, it would be more this identity politics left or right. It would be more arguments over whether we should have bicycles in our cities or not, whether we should have cars in our cities or not. Like it's not, what about grand restructuring that can actually counter capital? And is democracy really up to the task for such a thing? 
there, there is different things. I mean, uh, for example, in a community, for example, in my village, uh, having discussion whether we should have the road uh, uh, done again, for me, it's not politics. It's, 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 um, it's a discussions about how to, like I said, manage manage our, a village and how to live together. Should we have uh, uh, all the houses, co uh, you know, the same color or, you know, those kind of things are everyday life uh, necessities, uh, basic uh, uh, needs. You know, this is uh, I'm, what, when I when I mentioned uh, democracy, it's about politics in the sense of uh, um, the directions that the society in general will take. Uh, and so um i'm not saying that when people are talking about representation for me it's it, it's a technical co uh, uh, discussion because they are saying well we are living in a big eco uh, society so we cannot all you know you cannot have billions seven billions of people who uh, you know put their hands up and said uh, what about my uh, my grandmother she needs a, a more you know a better car kind of this this is not what i'm talking about i'm saying the the, the notion that we can kind of, as a uh, humanity decide, or as a community decide the direction of our world, it's not happening. Whether you can do it as a representation, nobody said you have to be, a single person have to be in all meetings every day. What I'm saying is that you have a say. When you look at the liberal democracy, every single liberal democracy has in the laws uh, um, as laws and regulation that prevent the majority to have a say. And what they are always arguing is that somehow we don't want mob rule. So they decided that somehow if the masses has an uh, 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 opinion, they becomes mob rule. The majority will have the wrong opinion. And when we want to have restrictions on the uh, opinions of the majority, that for me shows the content of the ordinary people. And this is if this is put on every single liberal democracy, the world also the, the wait. What is what is put? Is that, what is put on every it, label of democracy? So America is not a democracy; it's a republic. In uh, in France, in Britain, uh, Britain is a mo uh, monarchy. But in in France, it's supposedly a republic and a democracy. Right. There will be rules and laws uh, uh, that allows um, the government or the state to to stop the majority. Uh, uh, point of view to go forward. Today, uh, a few days ago, uh, Macron used a law allowing him to force a law without the uh, discussions, uh, political discussions about the law. Uh, yesterday, not yesterday or two days ago, he became this things become law. The re pension reform is now law, and then he said, "Let's move on and with, let's have a discussion. Let's have discussion about something else." So there is, I don't know all the details of, of, of all the different constitutions and all different uh, li 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 democracy, but the introductions of democracy is always with this idea that somehow we need to have restrictions or regulations to allow, to stop any ideas of mob rule or mass, uh, uh, mass decision that are going to be in the wrong decision. Penal uh, uh, death penalty. If you ask most of the people, death penalty will be uh, uh, something that you support. Uh, the people will support, but right, death penalty right. is uh, been uh, um, 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 has been stopped in quite a few country, not because the people don't want it. It's because a minority has decided that the death penalty is not the right thing to do. I'm not supporting death penalty, huh? but what I'm saying is that it's not the majority's decisions anymore. It's the somehow the enlightened decision. But more importantly, it's the economic and social power that is always forgotten when you discuss a de a political democracy or formal democracy. The people who has the power to make decisions in this world are the social, the one who have the social and economic power. And that is hidden with the, the separation between the social, economic and the political power. So you can have the politicians but the people behind the politicians, the, the, the interest of the capitalists, for example, is not taken, at least it's hidden. So the people who has the power to decide what is happening is hidden behind this idea of political democracy. So the, let's put it this way. When, the, when you had a feudal society, the economic was the political, it was linked. Today, we have the economic, social, and the political formally. So informally you have formal you have democracy, 
despite the fact that you don't have democracy in the sense of you don't have the rule by the people, and the economic and social power are hidden. It's not seen as the one who's controlling and directing and governing society. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think the part that you're saying that stuck with me most as far as like laying to rest my fears is the too many meetings thing. I just, I think that that's one of the biggest problems of uh, direct democracy, anarchist kind of, you know, or, or you know, uh, syndicate socialism, you know, these various ideas of like, oh, everything's got to be workers' councils for this, a workers' council for that, a group representing this group and a group rec representing this group, like for this and for that. And it's like, I want to be left alone. I want a politics that leaves me alone. I, I don't like I, I I want yeah people can have their arguments over what a woman is people can have their arguments over bicycles versus cars people can have their arguments about all these things and ultimately that's a form of political organizing you wouldn't call it politics in its proper sense but it's a you know let people people need to figure these things out I my thing is that they need to figure those things out locally and those things should not be to the best of our uh, ability not you know, mandated from a centralized governing body that's going to eradicate cultural difference, right? I'm not, I'm not for a politics that's going to tell Amish people that they have to agree with their definition of a, you know, the 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 definition of a woman that they have. I, I look, I just, that's not politics in any sort of a future like sense. There's no, there's not a future there. People can have these arguments until the sun swallows us all. But in the meantime. Uh, automation is developing really fast. AI is developing really fast. Bioengineering is developing really fast. And we don't have the goods from it. Those are all privatized. And so, like, for me, it's like, I, 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 like, I, I think I really appreciate this. Oh, we, we wouldn't have to have meetings over everything. Yeah, because it seems like there needs to be a politic, like a big kid politics. Like, put on your big kid clothes it's real politics. This is about how we're going to deal with like moving into the future, harnessing AI, harnessing uh, uh, automation, um, and 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 doing drastic measures to change the structural conditions of of our life worlds. And instead, what we have is bicycles versus cars, veganism versus that's not politics. paleo. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not politics, and it's also what Catherine Liu calls virtue hoarding, right? Yeah, but that's that's the thing. So, what I'm trying to say, because people today politics means not anything. I mean, people have can have hours of the conversation discussing, like you said, whether I should have the bicycle, everybody should have bicycle, so everybody should have a car. For me, this is not politics. This is this is or oh, uh, uh, should should the uh, kids should have uh, uh, fries in their dinner, in their in their lunch box? I mean, seriously, how could we call that politics? But it is known as politics, and that and then when you hear that, people are, oh my God, who wants to be in politics when you have to have a discussion about uh, who should be, what should be in lunch box of a kid in school? I mean, uh, for me, I don't particularly care. Uh, uh, it's for me. It's not the most important conversation for me. Politics, and what, that's why I'm talking about democracy. It's not democracy in the sense of every single person should have a point of view on every single person in life. In me having a, uh, how should somebody in India uh, paint their houses? I mean, who, who cares? But let's think about uh, the the. I'm involved in politics because I think that we can have a world that is not around capital. Irrationality, irrationality of capital, but around human needs. But most importantly, it's human freedom in a sense of the ability for a humanity and individual to develop, to have a, a, a possibility for them to be able to become more human. And to become more human is not to have more food, but to be able to develop their mental and moral capacity, you know, doing what they want. This is what I want, you know, somebody is using art or whatever. So to be able to do things that uh, are human, to be able to do that, I cannot not be for democracy as the rule by the people. Because what I'm saying is that I want a world when people are considered people. 
when they have control over their own life, it does not mean they have me a control over uh, who should paint the house in India. It means that I have control over this uh, and and control of what society is building and what society is um, uh, discussions about human needs, for example. So uh, people have a control, a general control about the direction of their society. The day to day can be done. This is bureaucracy. This is man management. So the, the management of society can be done in a lot of different ways. You can discuss the management and bureaucracy in a society in a, once it's there. But for me, it's the notion that somehow humanity can together change society in a way that will allow human beings to go further than it is today. Capitalism allow uh, uh, society, uh, human beings to develop in a certain way. We can talk about identity, about the self. You know, in the, the self identity, it's not something that was eternal. It's very historical. Human, what it means to be human beings today in 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 our current capitalist society is very different than it was in the past two thousand right. years ago. We have, for me, we have developed we the meaning of human being, especially because we we go away more and more from nature. We understand natural worlds around us. And we be able to use the natural, around, uh, natural uh, world around us to, first of all, change the world, but also to change ourselves. So what it means to be human, for me, it can be developed and can be developed further, even further. We don't have to spend 20 years, 20 hours a day to look for food. No. This is not a human life. We can now uh, spend one hour, two hours for food to looking for basic needs and the rest think about think about ideas uh art uh enjoyment this is what i mean by develop developing human beings so we have further away from uh um the domination of nature you know the, the nature is dominating human beings but the further away we go from there and the more we develop socially the more become for me it becomes a different meaning of human humanity and I'm saying that today in society, that development is restricted by the irrationality of the way it's organized, the irrationality of capital. Because it's not about human needs, human development, it's about capital. That's perfect. The, the, that's, a perfect the that's a perfect tie-in to the quote that I brought up in the conversation with Daniel Tutt earlier, um, which I'm just going to reread because I'm assuming an audience of people who are not here for the entire conversation. I will be republishing this as a standalone video in the future. But basically, this is a passage from page... Uh, actually, let me just double check that this is correct. Um, there's... No, it's not... Yeah, it's from, two, from page 287 of the Penguin edition of the Grundrisse, when Marx is... He is in part quoting somebody else, but this is like crucial. He says, over the somewhat longer term, specifically during the upward phase of the economic cycle, what we call a boom period, right? He says, however, both wages and profits may show an absolute increase at the same time. And during such periods, the worker may either take the risk of accumulating a small fund of savings for the next crisis or may broaden the sphere of his consumption to take a small part in higher, even cultural satisfactions. For instance, agitation for his own interests, newspaper subscriptions, attending lectures, educating his children, developing his taste, etc., constituting the worker's only share of civilization which distinguishes him from the slave. This is for me like one of the most important elements of the critique of political economy that gets lost so easily, which is like the why do we care part. It's not because I'm a nice person, right? If I was a nice, you know, I, I can be nice. I can go, you know, give money to charities. I can, you know, uh, hang out and have conversations with homeless people. I can be nice. That's not, that doesn't have to be my politics, though. Um, politics is about us getting things that serve our interests, right? And obviously, universalist politics is like, well, what, sh what serves all of our interests? And the point here is if you want to have a life that is distinguished from that of the slave, then that means that you have the freedom, the time and energy to agitate for your interests, read, 
Really? It says newspaper subscriptions, but what do those matter if you can't even read? Um, attending lectures? Where, where are lectures that you can just attend today? You know, like Aristotle, Hegel, Lacan. They did public lectures that were not just within the university. They would do devoted lecture courses for paying students, but then they also did public lectures. Where are those today? Um, sometimes a university might put something on and bring some neoliberal spokesperson to say something, but my, my thing is that university professors should all be doing public lectures, but, but they're not, and they don't have freedom of speech. There's been a genocide of voice. There's been a complete breakdown in discourse. Everyone's functionally illiterate and too busy to be able to, to take advantage of these things if they did exist. And so that's in part the whole point of Theory Underground and what we're trying to do here. I've tried to set up a space where a person listening with earbuds at work or an ADHD gamer who's multitasking, checking stuff out, is able to, through the algorithm, eventually come to something that's more meat and potatoes that actually says, no, you have to do the readings yourself. And if, if you don't have the time and energy and attention span, we need to change the material conditions because what you desire when you're listening to intellectual content on podcasts is a human desire. It's a desire to do that yourself not just to listen to it, but to actually engage in this kind of discourse like we're having here. And so um, I, I, in a moment, I wanna turn it over to the Q&A portion and uh, we'll, we'll engage a little bit with the live chat. But um, before we get into all of that, I just, you know, I, I, I think that your project is the most important. I, 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 I love following the work that you do. I think you get like one like on Twitter sometimes, and it's usually me. Um, same with Facebook, you get a couple of interactions tops. Um, I think that it is a true sign of the breakdown of discourse and the genocide of voice that, and, and really the problems of, of uh, discursive Taylorism, that you aren't being flown out to universities to sit on panels to actually advocate for these positions um, and that all you do is underground shit as a result. Uh, I just want to say that people, people in positions, people in positions of uh, institutional authority need to, to remedy the situation. And, uh, and yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to your future work um, I understand. I think you're writing something for Underground Theory Volume One. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. And perfect. I, I, and, and I, I think all of this is kind of on a trajectory towards your your work that is on the way. So I think everyone should read your your work, Transcending Racial Divisions, which is a fundamental critique of racial thinking, and it goes really into the history and development of racial thinking. But um, I know that you kind of. You, you're like me with my first book. Uh, I don't know about this. I got to get something new out there. So for now, I just hope that everyone will like watch everything that you've done and engage with your work. And, uh, and, and yeah, I just thank you for coming on. Thank you for asking me to be here. It's, um, it's so I always enjoy discussing with you. Um, because we, we don't have, I mean, we, I agree with some of your things and you agree with me, but we don't have like the, the completely similar, so it's kind of um, stimulating. Yeah, you make me talk, <laughs> and, and I talk and talk and talk. <laughs> you say you say simulating or stimulating. You are uh, uh, discussing with you is simulating, stimulating. Oh, stimulating. We don't have okay. completely. We don't have completely simil similar point of view, and That's so right. your and your uh, conversation uh, stimulates me. It makes me um, kind of yeah think of why why you're saying that and uh, why is it that I'm not exactly uh, completely 100% so it's kind of stimulating conversation and that's Wonderful. what I, I think is important is to be stimulating intellectually and that's what you're talking about you for me you the fact that we have uh, human knowledge and most of people cannot have access to human knowledge that's for me is one of the because when I was a kid this idea is to be able to I had this idea that, you know, God is not God. Um, I mean, I was brought up as a Catholic, yeah? So uh, God is could exist and could be nice to if he's, he's dicks or not. It, for me, it wasn't important for me. Because for me, God would be, when I die, I have all knowledge of the world. For me, death would be nice if I had all knowledge. 
So the for me, human knowledge, uh, knowledge of the world, understanding the universe, understanding the it is the most important things that for human beings. And and the fact that even today, when we have all this technology, most of the people do not have access to the a small because we, we you know human beings are far from understanding the world, completely the world. But it, even the small amount of human knowledge that we have, most people do not have access to it. And for me, it's just sad. That's what pushes me to um, to carry on in politics and to carry on. The... But I'm not the only one who's isolated. There's a lot of people. The, for me, the the pessimistic uh, um, climate that we have today it's prevents people to think that. Uh, even my friends and my family, I, I would say, you know, it's, we can do something better. Oh no, you know, maybe we could have more taxes so that we can have better education. And I'm like, of oh, course, think big. Yeah. Let's think bigger. Yeah, way bigger. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. So, I guess uh, I had originally titled this talk. If I'm looking at the the poster here. Um, identity politics left and right. And I think I remember you saying something in a post one time where you were saying something like something, 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 right-wing identity politics, this and that, this and that. And I was thinking, does she just mean like people who organize on the basis of white supremacy? Like, is she talking about neo-fascists or is she talking about something else? And so I reached out and I asked and you clarified it and I found it enlightening. And so... As we switch over into a sort of Q and A session here, Nance, I don't know if you're still in the chat, but we're about we're about ready for it. Um, the my big question then, as a way of kind of quilting this whole conversation so far into one nice piece, maybe, is uh, what does this mean? Uh, identity politics, left and right. What is right wing identity politics to you? Uh, uh, I think the, the title was Identity Politics is Right Wing. Uh, I didn't choose the title. That was my first talk with uh, uh, Dr. Slane uh, when I, the book went out. And so he, uh, he, he invited me uh, to, to in interview me, basically. Hmm. And the title of that thing was uh, Identity Politics is Right Wing. And what uh, actually, it's a little bit too short a way of understanding, is that what, I'm, what I mean is that the, um, the start, the first, the uh, um, uh, the the birth of identity politics, uh, um, we, we, the identity politics start from right wing reactionary, so it's a reactionary uh, uh, right wing politics that started uh, uh, in fact pretty much um, after the Enlightenment, and the first um, identity politics is race. So people have decided that identity politics and and they uh, and it, I suppose for some people, it is very important to push this idea that identity politics is only left because then you can just say, oh, I'm against identity politics. And then you have some people say, oh, I'm against identity politics. But I think that the British should uh, uh, have a special value. And uh, we need to be able to, if you are British, you have to have a certain value. And that's for me, it's identity politics. You're using national identity, but you're still doing identity politics around the national identity. Or you're doing politics around sexual identity. Or you're doing identity politics around gender identity. But it's still ident identity politics. So for me, identity politics started first with race. And this idea that uh, somehow the, uh, your racial identity is telling you what your moral and mental and um, uh, politics should be. So identities, uh, identities is in the box. And that is determine your political opinions, the morality, your social position, race, and then you have gender, and sexual, and political, uh, and uh, po political is a bit it's a bit special because uh, a political identity could be identity or could be not identity, depending on how you say it. But so you can you could be a socialist as an identity, a socialist as having a particular point of view. But today, everything is around identity. So uh, even things like working class, working class, you could understand it in a Marxist way as understanding is a, a relationship um, uh, of productions um, in relationship, if that, um, in, in, in relation to the means of productions. Right. Um, or you could understand working class as a groups of people with a certain culture, certain value, certain way of life. 
that is working class as identity. And today, a lot of the people who discuss working class are discussing working class identity. That also why the reason why you will also he hear me discussing class politics is also becoming or it has become identity politics. Just using class instead of race or instead of sex, uh, sexual instead of gender. So identity politics started with race. It is rationally right, but. Uh, uh, when the uh, the left the, the left the social movements of the ordering people basically got destroyed, the left decided or started to use identity politics for themselves. So the left or the radical identity politics today is a new phenomenon because, for example, anti-racism. Uh, there was a lot of people who had anti-racist, were anti-racist, but with this notion that you had to change society to be able to challenge racism the radical uh, anti-racism. Of course, you had the anti -ra radical anti-racism, sorry, the, the anti-racism who argued that the black should be separated from the white because we are special and whatever, but you had the uh, uh, notions of anti-racism as uh, uh, um, you had to stop racism by changing society. That all these politics of universal, all these universalist politics, I call it universalist politics, this notion that we as human beings build together a better society is gone. So left moves into this identity politics, fight for black, fight for uh, women, fight for trans, fight for uh, British, fight for uh, immigrants. And so they're using identity, social identity, social position, and then fight for the interests of this particular group, interests of the migrants, interests of the British, interests of the women, trans, you know, black. This is very divisive. And he has ex absolutely ex no ex notions. Excellent, but I also think that there's a, another answer you've given to the question that cuts that cut to me in a way that I was like, oh my god, because you don't, I just don't normally think about it this way. Because yeah, people talk about like right wing identity politics also being like white supremacy or whatever, but like the the uh, the amazing thing that you said when I asked you that question was patriotism. Yes. Patriotism hit me like different because, um, you know, I just I come from a family where my parents are very patriotic. You know, they're immigrants, and so their citizenship is a very big deal to them. And uh, you know, I I have some sympathies there that go beyond the average uh, progressive standpoint. That's for sure. Um, but to think of that as identity politics was powerful because it's true. It instantly changed how I thought about it. It was like, wow, yeah, the, they advocate for, for everyone has to stand and put their hand over their heart and do the Pledge of Allegiance. They, they, well, that's not freedom of speech. You know, they advocate for, you know, they're against Colin Kaepernick taking the knee, you know, and, and it's like, what they thought that that's not his freedom. And, this this sense of patriotism that places the the national identity over almost everything else besides God and family, of course. Um, yeah, that's a that's identity politics, and it's one it's a form of identity politics that every candidate running for president plays. They always play this. I'm the real American. Check out my story. I've got a story that tells you what it is to be a real American. And they're all arguing over what it is to be a real American. But they, but if they don't argue that, if they don't have a strong sense of identity based around something in reference to that, they're not going to win. And I was like, oh, my God. So uh, that's that's been a sort of slow detonating um, – realization for me since you're, you initially brought it up? For me, identity politics, uh, the way I, dis I define it, identity politics, is using different type of social identities. And what I mean by social is the identities that it is in um, our social world. So political identity or national identity are also social identity. Lifestyle identity, I call it also social identity. And so the use of social identity in politics. And I know that some people say, oh, but if you're saying that, then you don't make any difference between left and right. But that's the point, is that some people want to make a difference between left and right and can argue that, yeah, the black, I mean, I have people telling me black identity is crap, but they support women's identity. 
I have no problem fighting for women's uh, identity, women's what it means to be a woman, and uh, uh, women can talk only about women. It's only women can talk about women's issue. I mean, this is stay in your lane. You you have to yeah. uh, stay in your lane of black identity, and somehow I should be against black identity because you know this is not good. Because if you're supporting black identity, you're against white. You know, this is uh, this anti-white. I'm being called on uh, racist simply because I'm against identity. Uh, so uh, a black identity, if I'm a good black, I should be against it uh, on the level of the anti, you know, the people calling myself anti-woke. They would say if I'm against black identity, this is a good. I'm a good black. But if I challenge a, a woman's identity or uh, uh, national identity, so British, French, American, then I'm a bad black. Mm -hmm. And all of them are the same. They are using an identity, a very specific identity, and an identity that becomes very fixed. And they're using this identity to fight for the interests of this particular identity group. What it means to be a real black, what it means to be a real British, what it means to be a real woman, what it means to be a real trans, what it means to be a real professor, what it means to be a real vegan. And then when right. you have, when you basically define those identities, then who can have the interest and who can fight for the interest of the real uh, vegan and who can find the interest of the real British? Who mm -hmm. can define it and who can fight for it and who can get the benefits of being a real British? And when, when, when you start talking about real British, it also means that the people who have the uh, membership of uh, being British may lose it because if they have the wrong point of view or the wrong way of life, then they are not British anymore or right. they are not black or they're not women or they're not, you know. Right. All of them are the same. So you have identity politics from left and right. And, and for me, in the beginning, I started to be uh, supposedly only anti-work. And I realized that identity politics, in, in fact, this is when I discussed rest, I realized that identity politics are coming from both the left and right. It started with race on the right, but identity politics are left and right. And that even those who argue against identity politics are in fact arguing against the identity politics that they do not support while promoting identity politics in the identities that support. So people will be against black identity, but they will support white identity, white identity. That's just the racist uh, white right. identity uh, in the sense of, you know, we don't want um, the uh, Brown Britain immigrants or here. America yeah. to become too white, because, uh, too, 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 sorry, non-white because, right. you know, this is, this is a very race, racist uh, things because you are looking at race only. So you have, so, you, you know, they will support, they will support one identity and, and, and for, some people, it is very important for them to say, oh, I'm not, I'm not doing identity politics. But when you analyze it, yes, they are doing identity politics. And they have the same inherent things. Define identity, stay in your lane, uh, and, and in fact, the interests of these particular groups. And like I said, I'm uh, into, uh, um, I think the important things for anybody who is left uh, uh, is to develop universalist politics. Not in the sense that we all live together, but in the notion that identity should not matter to create a world, a better world. That I can be solidaire to somebody who is Chinese, a gay, uh, who never speak, doesn't speak a French or French, English, French or English. I can still have solidarity with them, and I can still have a common purpose with them, and I don't have to have the shared identities to be able to have uh, uh, solidarity with those groups of people. Because it's it's about the aim, political aim that is important, not our identities. And so, the I, I want to like, I guess I I, I was going to turn it over to Q and A, but I, I I still have my own questions that I got to get in here, and I, for the people who've never met you before, who've never heard from you before, who've never read anything you've written, um, I I wanted to to touch on something related to your identity. Um, that maybe they don't know about. You, you were talking about your PhD days. Um, yeah, you left out the fact that you have two, though. And it's so funny because you brought up the, well, you realized, well, God must be absolute knowledge, must be knowing everything. And so, you know, that would be being God. Well, and then I, I was going to make a joke, like, of course, that's why you have two PhDs. That's what you aspired <laughs> to, right? 
And um, one, of, one of those is in biology, the other one is in the humanities. But then you also have this background as having been a communist activist for a long time. And then you mm-hmm. currently live in near Freiburg, Germany, where we met when, uh, last November. Um, and we went on a double date with our significant others. Um, the, but, you know, you have a distinct uh, French accent and yet, yet you've also lived in the United States for at least seven years, which was where you got your taste for how banana bread all of this politics stuff is today. And so mm-hmm. I, I wanted to kind of just ask you, you know, the, the, the quintessential PMC stand, standpoint epistemology question about your experience being uh, a French person in America for seven years versus your experience of being a French person in Germany for as long as you've been in Germany and in the, or in England. Yeah. How long were you there? Uh, 13 years. I lived how long in England. Re- and you've been in Germany how long? Uh, more than 13 years. No, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I lived more, I, I spent more of my life outside. Uh, only, only my childhood, basically. I left France and was 20, something like 20, 21. And uh, I'm not going to give my age, you know, I'm a woman. <laughs> I mean, I'm joking, but uh, I, I spent more of my life, I mean, you can calculate, I'm f- over 50. So I spent more of, most of my life abroad uh, than, in, um, than in France. So my, France is my country of um, uh, youth and uh, childhood. And then Britain, 13 years, uh, America, six, seven years, and uh, Germany, uh, since 2008, so um, calculate. Uh, I'm eight, too excited to calculate. Uh, eight, but, uh, uh, 12, like, is that 13, 14, something? 14, I yes, well, yeah, so something like 14 years. So, yeah. so, I, so I know that I, sep- uh, I, have, I have already calculated that I am longer in Germany than any other places. Uh, what's the difference uh, being in, in France, in America, in Germany? I mean, this is uh, life experience, personal experience, and it really depends of your stage in your life. I, I mean, I could say that in my life today, I enjoy the most Germany. But that's because I'm happily married and uh, I have my dog and I have my house and uh, and I'm doing things uh, that I enjoy. So thinking, um, uh, thinking of ideas, researching ideas. I mean, I, I, there is a lot of it which is very personal. So as a French I mean I mean the reason also because I I left America I didn't want to leave America uh, I mean uh, I, I left America uh, because of the work in science I, I was a scientist at the time and uh, uh, when you're a scientist as a French you need to have a visa so if you don't have a job you have to leave America uh, after you and then six years, six years, you have three years and three years visa. And after that, you have to. So it's, it was just a visa question So as a foreigner. So I live as a foreigner in a different country. And I mean, I don't know what you're asking me. Uh, a different time. What? I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, For instance, like, what is the difference between... Uh, so, so I... You felt when you were in the United States, I think I remember you saying this pressure to speak from the standpoint of a black woman. You felt like this pressure put on you in political spheres and you didn't like that. You didn't like it. And that's part of the reason you wanted to focus on the hard sciences at the time. And you were a communist. So you just had a bad taste with this liberal approach. Um, Is that correct, first of all? No, it's more like... um... It's, it's, it's too early, so the, 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 the pressure as black was both in England and in America. Okay. Uh, and, and actually, this is how I started with my book. I, I, was, um, I started with my book because, in a way, I was thinking that things are getting worse. Because uh, uh, as in France, England, in America, there was a pressure of, you're black. And, and so you have to have a certain uh, way of thinking, and that I was, and you couldn't talk about racism. I mean, when I was in England, in America, there was no way I would have talked about racism in my science uh, uh, science um, work because I know that I would be known as a troublemaker. Things have changed. Uh, first of all, because this 
issue of you being black with a certain point of view also come from the uh, not only from the right but from the left so the left is also that i reacted to it i started the book because i reacted to this idea that somehow people care about me so much that they're telling me what i should think so it, it came not only from the racist but also the non-racist the anti-racist asking me putting me in a box basically so the, uh, the this see. pressure of being a, a, a black person uh uh of being always defined myself as a black person uh, came from different uh, time uh, from different people. So in England, uh, in France, uh, uh, more racist. In America, I was more of a, living in the international um, settings because in science, and there was, um, when you work as a postdoc in science in America, at least in California, most of the postdocs are foreigners. So you will have uh, Chinese, Russian, European, all type of different European, Latin American, um, you know, uh, African. So you, the, the settings for, uh, as a postdoc in science was more international. So that was, discussion was a little bit different uh, in, in Germany, then became more of a setting of you know, as a black, then you should support black identity and that kind of thing. So it becomes, you know, there is a relationship between uh, what's happening politically. But it's what you're talking about, America, is when I started discussing black politics or, or, or anti-racism online with a lot of America, Americans, I've been insulted a lot because I was um, challenging black identity and blackness and... You've been insulted in a lot. You've been insulted a oh, lot yeah, because of you challenge it. Well, any when you are involved in identity, when you're involved in identity politics, so at least when you challenge identity politics, um, if you challenge these notions that you support, uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't support an identity. You're going to be insulted. So the the um, the the censorship or the the free speech. Uh, uh, discussion where people are saying well you know the trans are becoming very anti-free speech and that kind of thing it's happening in any other identity politics because the identity politics is it's about it's it's, it's about stay in your lane so yes. if i as a black person challenge black and black identity or this notion that somehow all blacks have the same opinion i'm going to be insulted if i do it as a woman which at the moment have been are you insulted because how can you just say that woman uh trans because i disagree with this i think you know I disagree with this idea that a trans cannot be a, a woman. So if you if you if you disagree with that, how can you not think that women should be just about reproductive sex, biological sex? Then you're also insulted. If if I challenge the French because it's my also uh, supposedly my identity, then I will be insulted. This is this is something that you have when you when you're involved in identity because this is you're challenging what supposedly the most important things that should we should support identities that somehow we have to look at the world through identities and if you challenge them then you're basically offending a groups of people this so the, those insults and those attacks are coming from different and given that i have um i'm quite happy to challenge both the left and the right on that uh, then i will be i will be receiving attacks from both the left and the right for sure right? and yeah, you you you're, you're you you are challenging patriotism at the same time that you're challenging the idea that the definition of women should be based on biology, right? And so yeah. that puts you in the you don't belong anywhere camp, right? Like that, which is good. You know, this is a place for people who don't belong anywhere, and you don't belong here either. No, nobody belongs anywhere in this world, <laughs> and I'm not going to sell people the illusion that they belong anywhere. But um, yeah, I this this thing this your position your your stuff that you say about trans activism today is really interesting and i just we just had on daniel tut and then nina power was able to join uh part way through that conversation that was not planned she was originally going to be on for a previous section but she was held mm -hmm. up and so um are you familiar with nina power mm -hmm. yeah and so she's basically come out pretty strongly against uh trans activism in the 21st i mean I, I guess I could say 21st century, really just like in the last five years, like the, the sort of boiling point it's reached because, I mean, for a lot of us, like we, we, we were like, yeah, of course, trans people should be able to use whatever bathrooms they want. Yeah, of course, people should be able to X, Y, and Z. And then eventually it gets to this point where it's like uh, people start falling off at various points with the activism. And 
your point about the activism is that that's the activism. That's not the definition of women. That's that's a that's an issue is that people are making arguing over definitions a gatekeeper function for this discursive Taylorism, for this stay in your lane shit. And so like the argument between anti-turf and turf like debates is is ultimately just more identity politics, even on the side of the and so for you, yeah, it sounds like you still stick your neck out into this this complicated area, but and you have your positions, but you also are kind of against what 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 is your position? I guess I, I should really just ask you to kind of expand on your position related to all of this because you I've I've had the benefit of seeing some of the stuff you've posted. Nobody in the chat is in that position, and so maybe you could just differentiate yourself from this sort of uh, Daniel Tut's position being he won't post a conversation had with Nina Power because the trans community wouldn't you know. Th- he listens to the trans community and the trans community says, don't do that. Um, as opposed to Nina Power's position, which is, no, I, I might disagree with like the definition of a woman, but I have the right to speak and I should be able to have my voice heard. What is your position uh, today vis-a-vis all of this, this discourse? Uh, my position, first, uh, I really uh, get annoyed with... Um with these notions that people are trying to say that somehow there is some identity gr- groups that are going to be more into uh, censorship than others. I think if my position, if I um, uh, challenge this idea that woman is just adult uh, female, I am being shut up too. So the trans can be as violent, the, sorry, the trans activist can be as violent as a feminist activist. Mm. Because when you're involved in politics, this is a vicious thing. If, if involving identity politics is about fighting for the interest, uh, uh, political interest, social interest, uh, and economic interest. Those fights are going to be very vicious. So the viciousness is in, is in, in turned into censorship. So the violence, uh, shut up, uh, stay in your land, you find it in every single identity politics. My point is with uh, trans and uh, feminists is that the discussion itself, for me, it doesn't interest me. Because uh, for, sorry, the discussions on how to define women, uh, in a way, it, it's identity politics. So two identity groups fighting to decide what is the meaning of women. And for me, as a person who interested in uh, challenging or uh, socially transforming capitalism, the discussions about identity and the definitions of an identity, it's not useful. Not only that, but being involved myself in identity politics goes against this notion of new universalism. Right. But at the same time, because for me, identity does not matter to be able to together as the interests of different human human beings, uh, so as not human beings as biology, but social beings, together our interest is to be able to challenge the society that it is today, to oppose it and to change it. So I don't uh, care whether you're uh, 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 a black or uh, Jews, Muslim, lesbian. It's the common interest that is important to change society that where workers, because this is what it means, uh, the the most of us don't don't own the means of production. So I want to change that. So so the fight between two identity groups doesn't interest me. At the same time, yes, I did get involved in it because. Uh, what I also found, uh, I don't support the trans activists in in the sense of you know you decide what you want and then uh, uh, you are you can be a woman and you can be doing that because you, you're right there is things called biological sex, but I also challenge uh, this this uh, very uh, for me loud uh, voice because as uh, as a woman I hear a lot of the women's voice, loud voice saying women's are basically it's all about biological sex and women are just adult female because basically you are saying that the definition of a woman the meaning of woman is biology and for me that is very going very much going far, uh, backwards because social right, right. Uh, categories are social categories they're not biological categories they are categories that are uh, um, uh, sorry not fixed uh, I was going to say they're not trans historical they're not are historical. Right. They are historical. They're socially and historically specific. Right. And the notions of women's has changed and will change. 
So I have no problems saying that a woman, a trans can be a woman, because the notions of what it means to be a woman has changed. And it's not necessarily on the, you know, you, do you have the right organs? So then you'll be a woman, because that's what the, the feminists at the moment are pushing. Adult female, somehow our social category should be related to biology. Biological sex saying male, female, so woman means uh, having the right, uh, you know, having the vagina, and then having the, can you say pedis, you know, online? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought it's a little bit of a, but, but anyway, you know, you have to have the, the right, and this is very anti-human. To, to define human beings through their biology is very anti-human. So I, I'm reacting to the, to the uh, uh, woman at the moment quite a lot on Facebook because I found it, uh, even if it, I support the the you know the the woman's equality so I, I i support the the right for abortion for example i'm a um i think women should have the right for abortion so uh, you know the, those kind of things i support the woman to have a education equal right basically you know that support that but to start to challenge the trans by arguing that women's uh, are all about biology i think it's very conservative uh politics and this is very damaging because you're basically trying to uh, define human beings or men and women with biology and women you, human beings are more than uh, biological bodies right or the, this is if this i believe is, biological then what's the point of changing society if we are just animals right i i think that there's a couple of sort of devil's advocate ideas that i would love to hear you kind of expand on uh related to this um, I would love to have a conversation, host a conversation between yourself and Nina, between yourself and Swol, who, Eamon, who engaged with you on Facebook about this very topic. Um, I, I hope Anne is going to be able to pop in here and ask a question related to all of this. But the fact is, is this is a can of worms. It's, it's, it could potentially go in every direction. It could take a long time uh, to bring it back around. And I have to just bring it back around right now to say Q&A time. Nance, are you here? Um, let's let's see if the chat has shared out. Hey, Nance, would you like to introduce yourself to Christine and then uh, mediate? I'll be right back. Going to run to the restroom, but I can hear on my headphones. So, awesome. Hello, it's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I, I saw you. I think a year a year ish ago um, on This Is Revolution podcast, and I've been a super fan since. Oh, okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm give all right now. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I hope not to disappoint you. <laughs> um, there was a question when you when you said like lo local management, local council meetings, um, and how that's management rather than government. Um, just to kind of drive that home, the difference between management and government. Um, does that rest on the fact that like it's we were bought into this myth of like the individual um, and our preferences and opinions matter in a political sense um, and politics that deal with the big existential issues has kind of fallen by the wayside because we're focused on interpersonal social games. Um, yes, because I, I think I can't remember where I read it some, somewhere. Somebody, I can't remember. I mean, I, I read ideas and um, and I don't remember, I'm not very good at remembering, remembering names. But uh, someone was saying that you cannot think of politics without philosophy. And that's the problem with uh, politics uh, today, is that uh, people think that you have philosophy and then you have politics. And so that's the reason why you can have uh, politics uh, management seen as politics, because it's you're basically saying that you don't think about the underlying meaning of uh, humanity and the underlying meaning of uh, the future and the world because that's what politics is about it's a it's, it's supposedly about it's about what it means wh what it means to be human also how can we have a better world how can we uh, how can we build our future it's, uh, uh, it's so it, there is always a lot of big questions philosophical questions and and your philosophical assumption beyond your political positions are very much there. Today, when you discuss 
uh, should we have higher taxes, taxes or not higher taxes? There is no philosophy beyond it. I mean, yes, there is some philosophy, but it's not a philosophical question. And so it's become very much of a management. Should we have 1% or 2%? I mean, this is, for me, it's so boring, very technical. I mean, I used to be a scientist, but come on, give me a break with these kind of technical things that you... Oh. And then you calculate, uh, you know, some people like technology, but, you know, it, philosophical discussions are the most important because they are the basis of political discussions, and that is gone. Uh, so we, and I think it's gone because we are, as individuals, we are, um, have lost the notions that we can do more. Uh, I, I think it's based on the pessimistic climate that individuals cannot do anything about the world. So they're going to, the, the, the reductions in the views, uh, I, I mean, when I, I, encounter, I encounter it all the time, when I, I try to say to people, just think about uh, what we could do, I mean, how can we change? I mean, except the people who are into science fiction. So if you're into, I love science fiction myself. If you're into science, science fiction, you imagine the world. But when you have two people to about the reality that the view is becoming, oh yes, but you know, should we have more cars? Because, you know, there is millions of cars. I mean, like, think about further than the number of cars on, on the planet. Think about what humanity should be doing in the future about planet or, you know, the greens are not too bad in, in a sense because some of them are very much into the future. Others are very much into the technique, but others are, have a vision. And this is, I, I don't know if I answer your question. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think for me, it, it kind of does rest on that, I guess, like a kind of solipsism where I'm powerless and so I'm going to pretend that I have all this power to control meaningless preferences. I want less sugar in my kids' drinks, but I also like I really don't want my kids to be shot, but I'm going to focus on nutrition in their school lunches. Food fascism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, is there anything else that we really want to bring in at this point or um, is this a good point to I think we are just about ready to close out here because we got to get ready for Chris Catron. And so <clears throat> unless there was something pressing from the chat that we absolutely must bring in now, I would like to say I think that there's a lot of rich potential for further dialogue here. Um, Christine, I, I really look forward to what you're writing um, and th that I'm, I'm excited that you're going to be one of the voices engaged in this in this ongoing conversation here. And I just, I, I, it really means the world to me that you were able to make the time on the launch event. And so thank you for being here. Is there anything you would like to say in close? Oh, when, you, when you're having these open uh, things to me, it's, <laughs> it's harder than if you have a specific question. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And I love to do the conversation. And I have more ideas. And... Um, uh, it's too your 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 <laughs> question is too open. What do you want to say? I love to carry um, on and discuss. It, yeah, how about this? Since this is not a journalism uh, uh, underground platform, which is pretty much all that we have from in in Renegade Media today is journalism shit. No, this is academic, and so uh, in a sense, it's 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 a theory based thing. And so, what I would like is maybe if you just said. Okay, so for anybody who's really curious in where you're coming from, but wants to come to their own conclusions, if you were teaching a course on this topic, or if you were just recommending them some top books to study thoroughly, um, what's a little syllabus, the first draft of a little syllabus off the top of your head, like three to five major works you think that everybody who's going to have, be a part of this conversation, you really wish that they would read these books. What, what would those be? I mean, I have some offer that I really like, but uh, um, it's more uh, uh, because of my political um, my political uh, um, position. Uh, first of all, I wanted to mention one of the one of the things. I mean, I really like what you're doing because, um, I, and I agree with you this uh, with this philosophical and uh, academic things, because one of the things that one I love philosophy. And, and for me, philosophy has always been, when I was a kid, I wanted to do philosophy, but, you know, as a um, working class, uh, especially 
a black working class uh, woman, there is no way I could have done philosophy because uh, it's like, how are you going to earn li your living by right, doing right, philosophy? Right. It's not as if you're going to become a professor, Christine, you know. And so then I wanted to become a, a doctor and um, uh, to work in the people in, in the world, third world. That's what I wanted to do, to be a doctor in the third world. Uh, but philosophy for me, it's, it's the important questions. And it's not the... Uh, uh, that if, the way that people see philosophy, you know, the people will see philosophy as if like empty questions uh, that goes nowhere. Right. And I always try to say to, to my, uh, you know, people around me, philosophy is about the big questions. It's about the important questions about our lives. This is the underlying uh, way of understanding the world. It is because I have certain philosophical position that I support one thing and not the others. And so we do have a philosophical assumptions, but if we don't think about them, then we're just kind of reducing our, 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 our mind and, and we go all over the place. Or we have in the wrong, we don't, you know, we don't think about position. So I was saying philosophy is very important and should be done by everybody. Because at the end of the day, this is life. This is human life. And important books, I mean, we talk about Kenan Malik as on the issue of race. Uh, I like uh, very much, uh, when it comes to politics, um, Ellen Meskenwood, I like her very much. Uh, you're talking about philosophy as philosophy, philosopher like Kant and you, and stuff like that, or anybody? Uh, I um, like, uh, what's, the name? Well, what's his name? Specifically, oh. specifically, yeah, on this identity politics, racial thinking, line of thought, specifically, <clears throat> Kevin Malick is the first reference. Kenny, Kenan, Kenan. Kenan. Ken, <clears throat> K-A-N-A-N. It's my uh, French Kenan. accent. Oh, okay. Kenan. Malik. Kenan, Kenan Malik. Malik. Yeah, is there, so uh, what would be the next two books uh, to read with him? Yeah. And also The Racecraft is also very good, huh? Uh, yeah, uh, Racecraft. It's a bit older. The Racecraft from Karen and uh, Barbara Fields, uh, yep. the two sisters. Uh, I saw a, a talk, uh, a old talk, ten years ago. Talk, and uh, she's, I mean, the point was the point she was making, and Kelly made the same. Racism uh, created race. It's not race created racism, but racism created race. This is the most one of the most important points, and this is also a very um, opposing point of view to a, all the liberal discussions on race. It is Absolutely. because. Uh, uh, people needed to have an explanation um, for the inequality in a world where equality is supposed to have happened, that uh, race becomes uh, a racism um, um, was the, uh, the discrimination between different groups. And then you have to ex explain why there was a difference between different groups, and you use race as an explanation. So if you have all blacks enslaved, you have to use the the notion of race, so it's because they are black, they are slave, uh, uh, for example, or because they are inferior, but it's because you had already the, the discrimination or the positions of the black people. And so you have racism first, and then you have race. This but you, a, uh, but the, there's also, and I think you even referenced this text in your book, uh, the, the Invention of the White Race, it, the, the, the policies that racialized slavery and gave different, so it, before slavery as racialized, everyone was just uh, an indentured servant. Everyone had attractive freedom. After Bacon's rebellion as a way of <clears throat> dividing the working class that had worked together, they rolled out mm -hmm. the white people can get their freedom faster than mulattoes and black people never get it. Um, and, that, and I think you actually say in your book that you don't like this language of invention. Um, no. But, but at the same time, though, uh, you can see how that's self-serving for the ruling class uh, to lean into racism um, and to racialize slavery, and that that is a, 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 a it historically does come after Bacon's Rebellion, which was a mass black and white collaboration. Yeah, but the, re the reason I don't like the invention is the invention world is because uh, invention has this kind of conscious things that, like, uh, groups of people sit down and say, "Oh, let's invite invent race." This is this does not happen. Okay. I, I, I very much agree with uh, uh, Kenan and uh, um, uh, uh, Fields and, and others. Uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, Michael, um, Michael, Michael. Um, he, he will come back. Uh, we'll come there back. is also some two American. Uh, 
uh, were very good. Uh, uh, so you, I, I was trying to hurry. Ah, yes, invention okay. is, 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 is as if it was like you thinking and you're developing. But it's because you have, in, you know, a enlightenment discussions was about equality. Of course, we know that there was no equality, but there is this notion that we can be equal. And then you, don't, you didn't have equality because the development of capitalism created new inequality. And how do you explain new inequality? How do you explain that a working class were poor, very poor, living in bad conditions, and black were slave? How do you explain that? So you have to look at inequality as natural and permanent. So if they are not uh, challenged by the new capitalist society, it means that they must, must be kind of permanent or there is an explanation permanent. And then you, uh, so the notions of racism, so this discrimination between different groups of people, is become uh, a notions of race, uh, a natural and permanent division between different groups of people. This is how, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's developed amongst the intellectuals, but it's not somebody said, oh, let's go and develop the notion of race so that we'll explain. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural intellectual development in, in relation to what's happening socially. How do you okay. explain inequality in a society that supposedly everybody was equal? That's perfect. And I guess we have to call it off now. So thank you so yes, much for joining. Much. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your night there in Germany. And thank you very much for inviting me and I enjoy it. And uh, talk to you soon, hopefully. Talk to you soon. Take care. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, everybody, um, we're going to be swapping out here to uh, to bring in Chris. But first, I'm going to roll the PSA. Also, I want you to notice that in the live uh, on the on the live side, there is a new little uh, what green kind of bluish aqua bar that says enter exclamation point TU tour fund in chat. If you do that. Then it will, and, and then you submit that in the chat, it will pop up a link. If you pop up that link and make a donation, it should show progress on this bar. I'm thinking it's not impossible to bring in some money for the tour this summer because um, we're going to need it. And uh, this is a hype event. This is like a sort of bringing people together, bringing everybody on board kind of event. So if you have something uh, that you've been looking to throw at something for fun, then this is the time to do it. Also, if this just means the world to you and you really want to see more of it, then definitely do it. If you want us to come to a city or town near you, definitely do it because um, the Theory Underground Tour is going to be as good as we have money to be able to do it. And I don't know how to say that, but we don't. We have a car. We don't even have a van. Um, so we're going to be bumming it pretty hard here. And uh, that's underground style. We don't give a fuck. We're going to do it anyway. So uh, anything that you can pay for to this helps. Um, and also, I hope it shows up. If you actually make a donation and it doesn't show up on this on this progress bar, I might have to delete it. So just let me know um, if you've donated and it doesn't work. But besides that, I'm ready to roll the credits. Peace out. And now, a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important yet neglected for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, Everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 tier is too much, consider donating towards meals and gasoline via Venmo or PayPal.
The gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the U.S., where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events, not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being and Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory, a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at Tier 3, you also get access to the Recovery Group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? One of the most succinct and cutting edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news! But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback 
or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, people tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah. And seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye. All right, everybody, and welcome back. Welcome to Theory Underground. I am the host, David McCarricker, and today we are joined by Chris Catrone. Welcome. Hi. How's Hello. it going? How are you? Good. Good. Um, well, okay, this is awkward. I'm calling it off. Um, no, just kidding. So... Everybody, look, Chris has been here before. I, I can't act like this is our first conversation. We've had multiple conversations at length, and sometimes uh, we've disagreed quite, quite, uh, quite a lot in the same sense mm -hmm. that Daniel Tutt is very over this post-Marxist, post-structuralist, kind of post-1968 France theory thing. Um, uh, and I'm obviously not, but I do believe that there are things that we need to learn from uh, our betters, from our elders, from people who've been in the, the, this milieu a lot longer than we have. And I might disagree with you today and, dis and agree with you in a year from now, in five years from now. In, and I don't know. I really couldn't say. But uh, for anybody who's not familiar with Chris, let me pull up on the screen here something. Chris, you won't be able to see it, but you don't need to. Don't worry about it. Basically, I'm just going to okay. show where people can access our past conversations, which are currently unlisted, which means that they're not being advertised to the general public. I plan on eventually re-releasing most Theory Plebe content uh, once it's been sort of rebranded. But if you scroll down on the main page, there is a playlist called Plebe Get Schooled. And if you click on that, there is a whole series here of various conversations that I've had with Nancy Fraser, with Dr. Ian Thompson, with uh, Peter Rollins, uh, with uh, Moore Thompson, with Andrew McLuhan, with Gerald Smith, uh, who's a sort of Trotskyist who lives in the in the Oakland area. You're probably familiar with who that is, right? Yep. Right, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, yeah. This is a th that's that video right there is four hours and forty seven minutes, and it's basically uh, five separate talks all put into one. Uh, U.S. political prisoners, um, black nationalism. Antifa in the United Front, Black Lives Matter, questions and answers. And basically, he's against all of the standard leftist positions on these things from a principled position. And I think it's totally worth listening to. 
Uh, this is where you'll also find the past conversations with Dr. Christine Luidi Soli. But where we really got together the first time, you and I, was to talk about the left is dead versus the left must be killed. Chris Cochrane, right. <laughs> yeah, you versus Benedict Cryptofash. Could you like? Right. Could you? And then, and then after that conversation, we had another one, which was like, what, why, and how Lenin plus Adorno. Um, yes. Like, how are you into Lenin and Adorno? And uh, the the then event that's where you said some controversial things about theory, and then we brought on McGowan to respond, and we right. still haven't had the great you know, conversation between you two that we hope to someday have, but uh, yeah. today today McGowan doesn't have the time. But look, people who may have watched all that might have forgotten, or we've got a lot of new people, and they just need to know. You are the founder and key organizer of Platypus Affiliated Society, whose motto is the left is dead, long live the left. The, the, the platypus idea is because... Angles had a meltdown at the idea that platypuses were real <laughs> because it didn't fit his evolutionary model. And then eventually he was humbled by reality. And your point is that Marxism can grow and adapt. And so the left can come back if it ever grows and adapts. And that you believe that there are essential elements and threads throughout every aspect of the left that have to be sublated uh, into some kind of a new uh, movement. And... Um, so with that said, that's my introduction to you, but I'd like you to say a few words of introduction yourself with what, what's been going on for you recently. I, I understand the convention just happened. How was the convention? And just what have you been up to? What's going on? Cool. Um, all right. So I'm no longer like the lead organizer of Platypus. Um, what? I passed that baton uh, some years ago now. And so I was, oh. um, you know, the kind of original kind of a pedagogue teacher, you know, it was mostly my students who started Platypus. Um, and then I, you know, had a kind of organizational leadership role uh, over the course of the first 10 years. Um, but in more recent years, I've uh, basically been able to step back from that. And the organization has been able to run itself and continue to grow, which is good, which is very grateful. Uh, you know, uh, development for me. Now, um, in terms of like my own background, so that was what I would say my millennial students getting me back involved in the left after I had taken quite a hiatus and so sojourn from the left uh, starting in the early 1990s. I wasn't completely detached from the left. I still was a little bit on the edges of like Adolf Reed's um, Labor Party project because he was an important teacher of mine. Um, and he was here in Chicago when I was here in Chicago as well. And so uh, I wasn't, you know, entirely absent from the left, but I definitely had stepped back from my earlier days in high school and college when I was very much involved in activism. Um, and so, you know, I've had a kind of a second life on the left and that's been through platypus okay you know and so uh you know platypus i mean i would say also the question of marxism you know that marxism is a historical artifact at this point and uh in the way that platypus the animal might in evolutionary terms be seen as like a living fossil you know meaning it's like a kind of ancient animal that continues to survive and that survives despite subsequent natural history, you know, and so that's why it's sort of between, you know, the the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals, right, right, um, you know, because it's it's ancient, and so Marxism's like that, and so uh, I do think that like a further development has to take place, but I also think that a history has to be remembered and recovered. And in a critical way, in other words, that the that the past can critique the present, right? That it's not just about sticking to an old tradition, but rather what does that old tradition have to say to the present in a critical way, rather than assuming that we've somehow made progress mm. over that history. In other words, there might be um, tasks that were recognized in the past that are still with us, you know, capitalism, overcoming capitalism. Right. Um, 
and that the consciousness of that might have been better in the past than it is today which doesn't mean that we just adopt that past consciousness but at the very least we keep that past original critical consciousness about capitalism and about politics and society keep that in mind in thinking about how we might move forward and not just accept the historical progress that has taken place in the last hundred years because maybe it hasn't been progress right, right? maybe we haven't really progressed in our consciousness of things um, so there's a you know a phrase from Adorno the theorist who tries to um, intervene in practical controversies nowadays finds to his embarrassment that everything he wants to say has been said already and better the first time around Right. <laughs> right. In right. other words, it's just, you know, how can we check ourselves? And, and again, not not take on board things that have transpired historically in the meantime, developments that have occurred um, that it may not have been good developments historically. Right. So, um, you know, that's really been what's driving platypus. Um, is that sense, and also the sense that the left as it exists today is also a relic of the past. Right. right, right. Of the seventies, <laughs> like like right. <clears throat> when I <clears throat> when I was coming out of my seven years of Bernie activism and uh, you know twenty twenty, it all crashed in twenty twenty, and I was on quarantine in Hawaii. And uh, I, 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 read that I finally read or I listened to Todd Gitlin's little book. I know, it's, I know that mm-hmm. like, people have all these problems with Gitlin for various reasons that to me miss the sure. basic point. That is he wrote, right. one of the, he wrote one of the most beautiful books about the 60s. You might disagree with his points, but he, he wrote a beautiful book that gives you a real sort of on the ground feel for what it was like in the 60s. And the, the part like – two thirds or three fourths into that book where he starts talking about the, the contradictions that people kept thinking would go away through some dialectical synthesis of revolution right. came to the fore and, and people were burning out and getting, getting called levers. And so I read about the burnout period at the same time that I was burning out. Right. And, and I realized, Oh my God, all these people who think that they're saying original things are just fucking echoing this moment, but at least it had a basis at the time. Like at least at the time, there was a reason to think that these forms of anti-imperialist struggle might have some kind of hope to them or something like that. But now people have this ahistorical presentist approach to things. And so for me, that was a really big factor was reading that. And so you were involved in politics though, in your, as you say, your student years, was that in the seventies? Eighties. So I'm not that old. Right. Okay. So in the 80s, I was active a bit in high school and then more so in college in the late 80s and early 90s. OK. Um, and so uh, it was definitely in the shadow of the new left. Uh, you know, that was there. And, and a lot of the, you know, the, the adult activists I encountered were veterans of the new left from the 60s and 70s. Um, and, you know, so I mentioned like Adolf, who I met later when I was in college. Um, but, you know, certainly at the demos at the gay community center in Manhattan, in Greenwich Village, you know, the older people were all veteran 60s and 70s activists. Uh, my professors in college were all veterans of the 60s and 70s new left activism. Um, one of my professors was the editor of the journal that had been started by the Students for a Democratic Society, the STS. It was called Radical America. It was still carrying on in the 80s, and she had taken it over uh, as editor. Um, So the 60s were very present. Um, You know, I met, I just happened to run into, I didn't really meet him, but I had an encounter with Murray Bookchin, the anarchist, who had written his famous criticism of new left, like Maoism, listen Marxist. Um, And, uh, you know, so it was just, it was there. In, in a very present way. That was still the case for the millennial left uh, when Platypus started. Um, you know, there was a new Students for a Democratic Society uh, that came out of the anti-war movement in the War on Terror era. 
and it had associated with it uh, what was called the MDS, the Movement for a Democratic Society, and those were the old original SDS people who were serving to uh, mentor the new SDS of the millennials. Um, and so I want to make a plug, if I can. Yeah, so I have please. a book that's coming out with Sublation. It's the first volume of two volumes of collected writings that I've done in the era of Platypus. And so the first volume is the more kind of current events and more politically, you know, commentary kind of volume, and that is The Death of the Millennial Left. Um, and, you know, basically charting through the war on terror, the Great Recession, Obama election, Occupy Wall Street, um, up into the Bernie Sanders era and the Trump era, of course. Um, and, you know, just in terms of that experience. Now, of course, getting involved as a mentor, as a teacher of the millennial left, I had hopes for the millennial left. And, uh, you know, I am kind of sad to have to pronounce the death of the millennial left, but I already did that in 2017. So it's like six years ago. It was, you know, with the way they responded to Trump and also just the DSA turn in general and the folding back into the Democratic Party. Um, now, what does that mean? It means that even though there was an authentic millennial left moment, it didn't try as much as the 60s did. The 60s did try. They tried to do something. Namely, they tried to renew the struggle for socialism. Um, now, I don't think that they that they did quite enough. And I think that they also did some things that were mistaken and kind of effort wasted in the wrong direction. But there mm -hmm. was an authentic moment. And, um, you know, when we think about the millennial left, the millennial left kind of inherits all that history. It, it inherits the new left. It also inherits the old left, the 30s left. It, it inherits the whole 20th century, you know, especially because anti-war activism recalled like Vietnam era stuff. Anti-racism recalls civil rights and black power activism. Um, Me Too, you know, recalls second wave feminism. But the Great Recession recalled the Great Depression, right? Um, and obviously the DSA, um, you know, does have a kind of progressive welfare state kind of politics to it um, that recalls the the welfare state that came out of the New Deal and also the Great Society in the 60s. So, you know, I'm struck by the fact that that's what socialism seems to mean. It seems to mean the welfare state. It seems to mean the identity politics that comes out of the 60s. And that has deeper roots, for sure. So I was watching you um, in, with Christine. And, um, but, you know, really the way we experience identity politics, even though it has much deeper roots, it's really very much affected by the way those things were formulated in the 60s and 70s. And that were totally institutionalized when I was a young person in the 80s and 90s. So when I was in high school, when I was in college, when I was around the left, all the things that we experience today from identity politics was there already back then. Like right. progressive stack. Do you know what progressive stack is? Yeah, this so, is where at the DSA know, at, at the DSA National Convention when to to it, when you're in line, you have to get back in line by orders yeah. of your privilege. And so if if yeah. you're a black woman, you have to get behind the black woman who's in the wheelchair. Yeah. Yes. That was there when I first went to the you know the gay community center in Greenwich Village with my friends from high school and we arrive and, you know, we're like white working class people from the suburbs. And so we're kind of out of place to begin with. Um, but, you know, we encounter progressive stack and it's like, what the hell is this? And the way it was done there wasn't so much a line. It was, you know, a youth meeting. It was, wasn't that many people. It was maybe 30 people, but it meant that, um, all the women, all the people of color have to speak before the men and the white people. Like I have to have an opportunity to speak. 
Um, and so it was, you know, to prevent white men from dominating the discussion, which I guess uh, sometimes happens. Um, but it was mostly, uh, you know, it was New York City. It was mostly people of color uh, at that meeting. Um, it was about 50-50 men and women, um, you know, young men, young women. Um, and so it was it was alienating because I felt like it prevented real conversation from happening, real discussion from happening, meaning, you know, it it, it prevented kind of dialogue. It just meant that people right. sort of made statements and sort of testified, you know, uh, to their personal experience, but there was no real interaction or engagement made possible by that progressive stack kind of, you know, it was very strange because, you know, I was there to like meet other gay people and, you know, and uh, connect with them at a variety of levels, but politically, you know, really like, you know, have them understand what I was about and understand what they were about. And that just couldn't happen because we were already slotted into these positions. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, even though the DSA claims to be against identity politics, of course, they can't be because they're Democrats. And that is the bread and butter of the Democratic Party. And so you can't you can't really go against that. Um, you can quibble with it. You can criticize it, but you can't actually oppose it. You know, so, so... it's 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 hard for me because, you know, I'm an, a middle aged older person now. And I feel like, wow, young people are just reliving my own youth and nothing's really progressed, right? In terms right. of like left culture, um, you know, and in some ways it's gotten worse. Right. It's, it's sad. Right. And so this is, this is a good segue into the sort of announcement that I wanted to make. And so really I could take the two conversations we've already had edit those down the way I did with the conversations with Mikey into, you know, 10 to 15 minute sections and then repost those uh, with, with specific topics. And, but I found out that, you know, that kind of editing work is more arduous and of an energy oh, yeah. suck than anything else that I do with all of the things that I do. I already wear too many hats. Right. right? And so, um, but more importantly, what I was doing before with the channel, you know, making educational content available for free or whatever, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it didn't have the power that a real course has for a person. When you, when you enroll in a course, there's something psychologically that happens with people where you got skin in the game and you, and you take it more seriously and then you're asking yourself as you go through it, am I getting something out of this? In a way that you don't when you're just passively viewing from YouTube. No offense, YouTubers. Um, or right. podcasters, for that matter. So the goal is to use these conversations as inroads to on-demand courses, courses that people can take after the fact. And so, um, look, Platypus Affiliated Society is one of the things that when I first found out about it, like I wanted to come be an intern for you. I think I might have even messaged you directly and was like, is there a way I can just come like help you? Uh, because... I want to see it succeed because of all of these pro the, what you're talking about this lack of historical consciousness is so detrimental in organizing spaces but also when organizers go into working spaces. And oh, so yeah. I asked you once uh, once once the course was kind of going with Mikey on Zizix for they don't know what they do and I was like this is going well this is a good uh, th I like this this dynamic of me being the representative of the student supposed to be confused after having done the reading and then asking uh -huh. you questions so that to, so that you can unpack things in a way for for workers who are at Amazon with earbuds in for for people who are driving right now you know uh -huh. and um, I, I said you know like one of my dreams would be to make the basic essentials of the platypus affiliated society syllabus that you've been teaching for the last like what 15 years to make that pretty much to make that a solid lecture series that people would be able to take with a live cohort, but that would be available after the fact for people who might want to join in the future. Um, and you, you're like, I'm down. Let's talk about it. And so, first of all, let me push my little train whistle. I haven't used it on the stream yet. Let's see if it works. 
Did you hear that? Are you able to? I did not hear it. You did but not. It may hear not it. be. It may not be on my system. Let me. Uh, it might not. But anyway, I played. I played a a train horn. So basically, Theory Underground is named underground in three ways. Theory Play went underground. Uh, it's named after the London Underground. It's right. also named after like underground movements and scenes. Um, and th- as many problems as I have with the aesthetic communities that form around such things, um, right. the, the, the need, I think, is for there to be uh, places of access to go from streaming content and, and podcast content into courses that then have on the other side of them like a, a social media function so that people can kind of keep engaging with people who've been in the conversation longer. And so that's the ultimate vision here. And even if it doesn't work out, I just think we would probably get so much from it. Um, and so you're the first real professor um, we're announcing as somebody who might do a collaboration with Theory Underground. And so for that, first of all, congratulations and thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it uh-huh. is an, it's an actual honor. And I use that word unironically. So... Mm-hmm. Let's talk about uh, basically what I wanted the rest of this conversation to be about is the syllabus itself. Folks, I've got it up on screen. The first syllabus is right here. And then the second syllabus, I'll be able to pull it up. There's two syllabuses. One is for the fall, autumn. The other one is for the, oh, that's not it. The the one for spring and summer, basically. Where Mm -hmm. is it? I'll have to find it. I have the link somewhere. Here we go. There we go. Mm-hmm. Win- this is the winter spring t- uh, a syllabus. It changes every year, but there's also things that stay the same. Is that right? Yeah, no, it, it pretty much stays the same. I mean, we've kind of honed it over the years, and it's been pretty stable for a number of years now. Um, you know, it's also modular, so we'd have to, you know, we're going to have to figure out, Dave, like how we're going to do it with Theory Underground, because it's really probably too much to do all of it. Right, it's um, it's like forty weeks or more, um, and so, it's you know, basically it's a kind of like, history of Marxism, around three figures, um, Marx, Lenin, and Adorno, mm-hmm. and then it's also involving uh, the predecessors of Marx's own thought in bourgeois philosophy or bourgeois revolutionary thought um you know which is a little bit different from like the enlightenment um so it's 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 sort of honed down to like more political writings by like kant and hegel and others um now we also do some weeks on the new left on the 60s but not representative of the new left so much as paths not taken a kind of critical new left Right, um, a kind of critical consciousness of the new left moment that represented uh, the new left's own unfulfilled potential, and so really around my own teachers like uh, Adolf Reed and Moish Postone, and and the Spartacist League, the Trotskyists that uh, kind of uh, formed around the '60s moment, around the civil rights era and the Vietnam War era. Um, and then some others, so uh, who you know are kind of classic uh, kind of Marxist commentators on that moment, like Juliet Mitchell. Mm. Um, and so there are just different different parts of it, and so we probably have to hone it down for our purposes here, right. um, you know, and and get to the essentials of it. So it's kind of like, what did Marx take for granted? We read that from like Adam Smith and, and others. Um, what did Lenin and others like Rosa Luxemburg and Trotsky take for granted in Marx? Like what are they? What are the works that they're citing the most? Like Marx's political writings um, for, their, for their vision and for their, you know, moment of, of like revolutionary kind of politics. Um, and then the Frankfurt School and the Frankfurt School's roots in um, Lukács and uh, Karl Korsch. Um, and so the Frankfurt School kind of not comprehensively, but, you know, Horkheimer, Benjamin, Dorno, 
um, you know, kind of centered around Adorno. So that's why I mentioned Marx, Lenin, and Adorno as like the central figures. They're not the exclusive figures, but they are the central figures um, because it poses a question, right? It poses a question of what Marxism was and um, and how how Marxism formulated itself originally in Marx's own moment in his own thinking, mm -hmm. and then how it was attempted to be followed by subsequent generations. Um, and then how its memory was, there was a struggle to preserve the memory of Marxism in the form of Trotskyism and the Frankfurt School, basically. And both of which were marginal and almost irrelevant and were seen uh, with some hostility from the established like mass political movement on the left. Right? So, like, it's like, I don't know. I when I studied Adorno, for example, um, Adorno was really hated. Right, um, like some respect was given to him, but a kind of grudging respect of someone that you hate. In which right? circles? Benjamin they liked, but they didn't. They they hated Adorno. Who's the they in this context? The, the left, and uh, that includes the academic left. Right. Um, so. You know, Adorno was a kind of ritual figure to denounce um, in an academic left context. Uh, you know, he was elitist, he was racist, he was this, he was that, in the same way that, like, Trotsky is a ritually denounced figure on the left, right? right? And, you know, which is, you know, peculiar and, and also says something about Marxism, that, you know, Marxism is not going to make you popular. Right. Marxism is no. not going to make you popular. Uh, which is ironic, considering the great kind of esteem that Marx has on the left, and you know, there's a lot of kind of ritual invocation and deference given to the to Marx. But then, when you get down to it, people don't really agree with Marx, right? And so, again, it's not about agreeing with Marx. It's about well, what was what was all that? Like Marx is one of the most like important political philosophers of all time. And Marxism as a political movement, like Lenin, is like, you know, the greatest revolutionary movement of all time, you know, and uh, for good or for ill, right? It's like, what is this thing? And so, you know, the fact that we live in a post-Marxist era in the shadow of Marxism, it would be nice to know what it was, right? So it's very much a primary text kind of reading list. It's trying to understand things in their own terms, trying to understand how these people actually thought, what they thought they were doing, mm -hmm. and how they thought about it, right? Sort of inhabit the mindset um, and consider it. In other words, it's not just a matter of like, you know, reproducing it or following it, but just confronting it, dealing with it, engaging with it, right? Th that's, um, because that's... that's that's the way I've learned, and that's the way I teach. So I've learned a lot from things I disagree with. I like I've learned a great deal from thinkers that I really disagree with. You know, I disagree with their approach. I disagree with what they're doing with their thinking. I disagree with their political objectives. You know, like I learned a lot from reading Heidegger. I learned a lot from reading like Carl Schmitt. I learned a lot from reading, uh, you know, Eduard Bernstein. Mm -hmm. You know, I've just, I've learned a lot from reading things that I, re you know, like Maoism. I have serious disagreements with Maoism. I learned a lot, nonetheless, from reading a lot of Maoism. And so it's not a matter of, like, only learning from what you think you agree with, because that's the other thing. You might think you agree with it, and you might sort of, you know, uh, indoctrinate yourself with it, but you might not actually agree with it when you scratch the surface, right? The agreement might be rather superficial. Mm. And so, you know, again, just, you know, thinking about it, and, you know, what is this about? What was this about? What, what might it mean now? You know, because it's not clear what Marxism means right now, actually. It's not clear. So again, the platypus, the puzzle, where does this, this fit into, you know, where we are historically now? Exactly. This is why, I mean, this is why I've, I've 
senior value. I, I'm not going to say I saw it in its totality or that I fully understand whatever, but I'm just saying like I can see some value in what you're doing and I think it's tremendous over and above almost anything being done by anyone online when it comes to like left media because uh, they all perform the function and role of the influencer as opposed to the educator. And so in a sense, I would say Platypus Affiliated Society has been doing underground theory in a, in the, in a sense for – a while. Yes. yes. Right. I mean, it's funny how, you know, I feel like a lot of what I learned on the left was in the form of things that were kind of underground classics or cult classics or like forbidden texts or something or like, you know, forgotten things in the used bookstore, you know, where it's like, what the hell is this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so it's kind of like, yeah, I used to also say that platypus, we, it was like the night thoughts of Marxism, right? So like, you know, a Marxist who's suffering from insomnia at two o'clock in the morning, what are the thoughts that are troubling them, mm. that are giving them nightmares, you know, like looking at it that way, rather than, you know, the kind of forthright clear light of day kind of positive aspect you know what what kind of troubling thoughts does this stuff give you what questions and problems does it raise because that's really for me the significance of marxism is that marxism raises problems that we have not solved no it raises questions that we do not have clear answers to Right. And the idea that we're still dealing with these problems, that we're still, you know, facing these questions and that, again, it's it's not like, you know, there's there's a whole realm of philosophy and political thinking out there that does raise all sorts of questions. But it's kind of like the ones that are the most troubling come out of this history of Marxism. You know, you know, like, what is socialism? What is capitalism? What is the state? What is democracy? You know, what are rights? Where do they come from? Like, just, like, really profound questions that, and also that are very much about the modern world. In other words, rather than, you know, some kind of ancient problems from Plato and Aristotle or, or from out, outside the Western tradition, um, but really, like, our world, like our recognizable modern capitalist world, what are we struggling with? Because we seem to be circling back around to the same kind of issues in a recurrent way, you know, in right, the last like, 200 years. It's one thing to say that there's, oh, everyone's stuck in old scripts and narratives, something I do say, but it's one thing to say that. It's another, and it's another to think, what are the conditions of possibility to make those old scripts and narratives something that, pe that makes people feel alive again or gives people a sense of purpose again. Um, it, it, you know, 1970s Idpol and 1920s Marxism wouldn't be uh, something that people are forming their entire online and real organizing identities around if there wasn't something to it. Right. Right. That's where, by the way, so how did I get like recruited back to the left, if you will, through Platypus. I just thought, okay, I'm a Marxist. Kind of, you know, like, it sort of, you know, I got touched by the dark genius of Marx and Marxism, and I can't really quite shake it. But really, young people were interested. And I was like, okay, right? Uh, meaning, you know, I teach it in the academic classroom. That's different because then it's like the history of ideas and it's kind of canonical and classic. And also, you know, insofar as there's demand, you know, my classes are always fully enrolled and so they keep renewing the classes, you know. Um, so it seems relevant on the curriculum. Um, you know, there's a demand for it. But it is more like, you know, institutionally canonized in a way. Whereas in the world, right, people are still reaching back to Marxism. And people on the left and on the right, by the way, even right-wing sure. people are like, yeah, what did Marx say about that again? Right? Like, it seems like these things are recalled 
out of our political and social reality. Right. You know, right. and that's where I feel like, okay, so long as people are reaching back for this stuff, then there's a real task to take it seriously and not do a kind of superficial hack job, not, not, not a memified kind of Marxism or something, or some kind of like degraded photocopy, you know? Um, but rather, you know, okay, what is it? You know, because again, there is this kind of fascination. People can't quite shake the specter of Marx, the specter mm -hmm. of Marxism. Like I said, left and right. You know, and you know, I think the right does a hack job, the left kind of does a hack job too, though, yeah. right? It's definitely reduced to a kind of you know, bowdlerized kind of set of precepts that have very little to do with what it actually was, you know, um, and you know, but again, I, I take for granted that people are authentically interested intellectually in a way that isn't just on the menu of cultural commodities that the society kind of regurgitates in the cycle of fashion, right? right? That there's more to it than that. And we need to be true to that as, as best we can. Right. And so one of the things that Steve Roberts said in the chat was, what to say about the platypus reading group's education? I'm 66, an ex coal miner leftist in the UK. What I would give to have had such an education available 40 years ago. Come on, guys. Find Marxism. And what I wanted to say is uh, I do want to kind of actually scroll down the syllabus on both sides. I know that like a lot of people okay. – a lot of people find syllabus day like the most boring day of college. But this isn't college. And you're only, <laughs> people are only right. here because they're curious to know what you actually say and what you actually teach and right. what you have right. – think about it, folks. If, if for anybody who's like kind of watching kind of – in a disinterested manner, I want you to really do a thought experiment for a moment where you're in a position of responsibility or relative special t special specialization, expertise, authority on a field that becomes politically relevant again. Yeah. And then people want you to teach it. And then you actually create an organization outside of the university to let it propagate across the United States and the rest of the world where it current, I mean, there's platypus groups all over the world now. And not only do you have like these national conventions and the, the, the monthly review that people add to and all of this stuff, but your, your, your eyes are on most of it, if not all of it. So that means that for almost 15 years here, you have been, um, mm -hmm. sort of the custodian of, of this and, and a lot of people can be critical. Oh, well, I don't like the article that you wrote or I don't like this one right. I don't like this opinion that you have. But that's because they care about influencers and takes. They don't care right. about teaching. And so right. I want to I want to think about platypus as an educational thing that's nonpartisan, non-sectarian and mm -hmm. and mainly just like I want you to kind of tell tell us about like what is it what is the sort of academic uh, response, like how are you treated? How do people perceive platypus? How do people perceive you? And and sort of what's the, tell us something, just some drama. I want to know kind of like what yeah, kinds the of drama. Yeah, controversy around platypus, right? Yeah. So I had a feeling it was going to be controversial when we started, because look, my teachers were controversial. Spartacus League was controversial. Adolf Reed was controversial. I mean, I know that, you know, he is someone that people show a lot of respect for. When I knew Adolf, when I was first reading him, he mm. was controversial, right? Still is. Like, not, he still is, but I'm talking like people did not give like token gestures of respect. Okay. Right? Instead, it was like he's a right winger, right? Uh, you know, because he criticized Jesse Jackson, mm. right? That made him into a right winger, right? I see. And so it's like, damn. So I kind of knew what we were in for to a certain extent, but also I thought, well, we'll just proceed in good faith. And again, we really started, you know, we, we had a reading group, but then we started as an organization and really became like a public group, if you will. 
Um, because we were posting these public fora discussions, um, panel discussions, which the left, I mean, this might strike people as very strange. The left doesn't really have conversations among themselves, right? Like each tendency, each intellectual kind of proceeds as if the others don't exist, right? It's, it's, it's crazy that way. And, you know, so anyway, we thought we could do a mix of like activist organizations, Marxist left organizations, but also other kinds of organizations like anarchists or even liberal organizations, academics, whether calling themselves Marxists or anarchists or just liberals or post-Marxists or what have you. We could sort of do this as a public activity, not debates so much as conversations, right? So not just like two perspectives, but like multiple perspectives. So ironically, what got us into trouble, what, what raised the controversy early on, was the usual left bullshit, which is that some people didn't like other people that we had invited to participate in the discussion, right? So they, they objected to who we were including, you know, because they wanted us to exclude the people that they would exclude. And it's like, no, the whole point of this is we're not going to exclude anybody, right? We're going to deal with the whole range of the self-identified left. Anyone who calls themselves a leftist, we're, you know, open to having part of the conversation. And, you know, not just in terms of the audience, certainly the audience, for sure, but, but more importantly, the speakers, right? So, you know, the whole... I mean, look, all this stuff like platforming and not platforming, this goes back to the 60s and 70s, if not to the 30s, mm -hmm. right? This whole thing, this whole repressive, exclusive leftism, right? Obviously, is just, you can't start there because the left is dead. Look, we're just, we're, we're, at, we're at ground zero here, right? With the millennials, right? So it's 2007, you know, people are in their early 20s my students and you know they're trying to build something up from the ground floor ground zero here you know baseline you know take nothing for granted all bets are off we can't assume any of the positions of the past because they all have led nowhere at this point in 2007 and you know we really were sincerely interested in what people had to say as speakers and also in conversation, meaning not just rehearsing their canned line, but really stimulating each other to think on their feet, to speak their mind, and interact. And again, the, the first controversy around Platypus really had to do with some speakers objecting to other speakers we had invited. Of course. And then, like, you must be up to no good because you're inviting so-and-so. And it's like, no, right? We're just not going to do that. We're not going to exclude a Is, priori. We really are not. And uh, like, in other words, everybody's equally problematic and everybody potentially has something worthwhile to contribute on the left, right? That, and that just, people didn't like that. They just didn't like that. And I have to say it shocked me a little bit. Because I was like, come on, man. I was like, be honest. You know, you guys in your 60s and 50s, and at that point, you know, maybe in their late 40s, I was like, you got to admit that we're back to square one here. And so you just can't keep this shit, you know, these entrenched oppositions. You just can't keep that going indefinitely. That's not helping anybody. You know, these are young people who want to know. Make your case, convince them talk about it right like just just try to teach the new generation but they were like oh you must be operating with an ulterior motive and i was like well okay here's our ulterior motive you're all dead politically you're all dead you know you you got nothing man unless you got something in which case come come give it come say it right otherwise you know? Yeah. And, Yo, and if you're going to be hostile, you're kind of proving how dead you are. Right. 
yeah, the, the more hostile and hysterical or whatever you are, the more it, you know, seems suspiciously useless. like, it seems like nothing's really going on there, is there? Yeah, you know? just useless, unproductive, just like you're not doing shit. You're proving the point, right? right. And, you know, I mean, it's funny. So it was, you know, it was about like, you know, we were in the anti-war movement moment. Of course, I was against the war on terror. Of course, I was against the U.S. invading and occupying Afghanistan and Iraq. Of course, I was against the Patriot Act and everything else. And of course, I was against the George W. Bush administration. But, you know, there were some people on the left who were like, well, let's think for a second what we're, what we're doing here. Like, yes, we're all against the war, but, you know, how do we think about these things, right? How do we, how do we orient ourselves around these things? And so there were criticisms of the anti-war movement, and we wanted to include those voices. So my, my non-historical memory here is just that, like, before, you know, at, when I was uh, not even a teenager yet, there were some real pushes in places like Seattle to be anti-imperialist, I think. You know, there was like a yeah. whole anti-globalization movement back before globalization sure. became a bad word uh, for progressives who think, oh, that's just Alex Jones, you know. Um, right. And then... No, the that, left. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, and then that kind of culminated in like a giant protest movement against the, the war in, in Afghanistan, going to Afghanistan in the first place. And... That Certainly all, for Iraq, though, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for Iraq, yeah. And that, that all of that protest amounted to very little. Um, and, right, and it then, didn't affect anything, but it did sort of establish, like, it, it like radicalized young people. Right. Right? It sort of, you know, activated them politically. They were engaged. They wanted to know. Yeah. And, you know... I mean, you know, so anti-imperialism, fine. I mean, that's like the first public discussion that we hosted was on the question of imperialism. What is it? Why should we be against it? And, you know, one of our one of our members at the time, an older guy who was a veteran of the 60s left, a former Maoist, said, why aren't, why aren't we calling the discussion, what is imperialism and why we should be against it? Why are you posing it as a question? Why are you posing, why aren't you posing it as you know, what is imperialism and why we should be against it rather than why should we be against it? And I was like, well, because let's just leave that question open. What is it and why should we be against it? Right. Which is not to say we shouldn't be against it. It's just to say, why should we be against it rather than positively? You know, imperialism, we know it's bad. It's like, OK, Sure, it's bad. It's the course. highest it's form of course. capitalism. Yeah, it's like ooh, highest form of capitalism. That must mean it's, but that doesn't really answer much, you know. And so doesn't. And everybody's anti-imperialist anyway. You ask any capitalist politician, "Are you an imperialist?" They would say no. Like right. George W. Bush would have said, "We are not imperialists. We're right. against imperialism." Well, Saddam Hussein like, is an imperialist, or whatever. You, you know, like. So it's just like a dirty word that everybody says is bad. And so, you know, but what does the left mean by it? You know, why are we against it? You know, maybe we're against it on the left for a different reason than the reason that Barack Obama might be against it. And how to be against it. You know, that's the... Right, and how to be against it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, because, I mean, that's right now the... What, like, who's really doing anything super focused on anti-imperialism right now except for like Richard Medhurst and Caleb Maupin like in, as far as like the the Oh you mean right now the you mean YouTube like the Ukraine war oh man yeah. I yeah. mean it's a mess isn't it because yeah. haven't we come like 360 180 I mean I don't know what we've done we've done some kind of like stunting here you know yeah. some kind of donuts with our muscle car you know I yeah. don't know what we, you know like yeah it's funny yeah, so the right are the now the anti-imperialists. And it's like, huh, well, what does that tell you? Yeah. You know, there's right-wing anti-imperialism. You know, the Nazis were against imperialism. Oh I mean, God. I hate to do that. You know, Godwin's law, everything goes to Nazism. But just think for a second. Right. This right. Well, a good example of... 
what it wasn't America First, like originally a conservative anti imperialist activist front like in the sixties or mm-hmm. earlier than that maybe. Like I, I think uh, th- there was an America First conservative group that was against the war, and so there's always been like that thread, you know, as far as but well, I mean in the thirties in the thirties there was oh, okay. a right wing opposition to getting involved in World War Two. Okay. There was a conservative critique of the Cold War. There was. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. Um, there was a paleoconservative opposition to the neocons in the in the later Cold War, in the second Cold War of the Reagan era. Um, you know, there is, right? And so, again, but again, just why not include people who call themselves right wing? Because the right doesn't want to make socialism, right? Right. Like the right doesn't want socialism. So, you know, the left and, you know, even liberals will say that they want, like, socialism, whatever that means, usually, like, welfare state or something. Um, But so, you know, generally speaking, the left, um, you know, agrees on a general direction of progress. Honestly, it seems like the, the the right is increasingly warm towards various welfare state things as long as it would prioritize Catholics or whatever, you know? It's like, <laughs> you got the... I, I, I don't... I'm not, I don't or maybe not even. Be... Maybe they just would be, like, a national kind of welfare state, like Americans of whatever religion or whatever, you know, that each... each <laughs> Pardon me. Each nation should take care of its citizens. You know, just very basic, kind right. of. You know, there is a there is a right that's like that, Sure. Well, in this, and they the, all give lip service to that. By the way, we shouldn't get transfixed by neoliberalism. Even the neoliberals, right? They thought that their policy was going to benefit everybody, right? At least potentially, right? So they just disagreed with the welfare state over how to better people's lives, right? They were like, "Well, the welfare state keeps people poor," which is true, which right. is true, mm-hmm. right? And so, again, it's kind of like, well, socialism in the sense of not just opposing capitalism because it's greed and it's this and that, um, you know, not just opposing capitalism in the name of altruism, but opposing capitalism in the sense of, you know, let's fundamentally change society. Okay. And so the left, you know, the left, um, not like the way in mainstream politics people call the Democrats the left. Right. You know, Democratic Party politicians, most of them will not say, I'm a leftist. Yeah. Right? And so the left. And that's what, you know, came into a new kind of public prominence in the millennial era. So the left was very marginal in most of, you know, my younger lifetime. But, you know, the left got more of a hearing, starting with the anti-war movement and subsequently through like the Great Recession and through like Occupy Wall Street. And obviously the culmination of that was the Sanders campaign. Right. right? And so for me, the, that was, it was, I I wasn't even politically paying attention at all. Um, in, in, I was just trying to party to make up for last time because I, as a kid, I, you know, didn't go to high school and I wasn't able to party. So I was just like that homeschool kid who was trying to catch up in the music scene and and party and uh, getting in trouble. And so uh, I was on tour with a band um, during some Occupy stuff going on, and I mm-hmm. had no idea. I had no idea what was going on. I, I just didn't really care. And we were in Seattle um, on this tour. I was just roadieing, and uh, we ended up staying at like an anarchist, like pad, you know, some filthy mm-hmm. place where everybody's crashing. What? Yeah, it was a squat basically, and uh, the I. Re- I I don't remember a single word uttered in any of the conversations had, but I remember being drunk and high and having really good conversations and being like, oh my God, this stuff's really interesting. And then I kind of didn't really pay attention to politics much after that. Uh, and and then went, later when I went to university, I read a little Marx and then like very soon after reading Marx and, you know, it really impacting me because um, it made sense of so much of my, my working class uh-huh. life. Um, there was the the Bernie campaign came along and I was like, oh my God, they're going to talk about the working class again. Cool. You know, <laughs> great. Yeah. 
Yeah, and That's you know, democratic story. socialism, <laughs> like the way Bernie identified himself. Um, and then the DSA getting on board with that. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, so again, like the controversy around platypus to me is like a kind of a, it's a symptom of the problem that our project was trying to address. Right. And so, you know, when, when the messenger has bad news, you won't, you, it's easier to kill the messenger than to deal with the problem. Right. right. And so right. that's the controversy around platypus. Now, you know, insofar as we raised our profile and established a kind of geographical presence, and also insofar as, you know, there was a kind of a lot of storm and drong, a lot of like um, wild changes in the, in the world going on, then I have felt the need to be provocative and sort of gird students against or young people against illusions that I knew were going to be on the way. And so, you know, again, the first controversy was the anti-war movement. Second controversy was around the Trump election, where basically, you know, I I knew that there was going to be a hysteric anti-Trumpism. And I knew that that was not going to be good for any potential socialist left. Um, and so I, you know, wrote Why Not Trump, and I kind of pushed it. And even though I was very careful to say some things and not say other things, still, right, it was like Red Brown Alliance, right? And so it was some right. kind of like madness. And I think that that, again, it's like, I, I guess, became a lightning rod in doing that for something more general, which is that the the kind of progressive liberal kind of quote unquote left, they are hostile to the so-called white working class in the United States. Mm -hmm. They are. And so, you know, at the very least they're suspicious, but generally they're hostile. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the democratic party is basically like, you know, unions should endorse Democrats and members of unions should follow the unions in endorsing the Democrats and voting for the Democrats. And that's in their best interest and just otherwise just shut up, right? Vote for the Democrats, but otherwise we don't want to hear, right? That, and, that, ar that article, you know? the article you're referencing is the very one that I was referencing when I said, Ooh, Katron wrote a controversial article. Ooh. Yeah, because it was just titled, Why Not Trump? And if I remember correctly, you, you're, it's very obvious if you're even if you read it a little bit charitably, it's like At obvious all. what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. If you get past the headline, if you get past the title, which yeah. many people don't, because they treat it as like, well, why not? Why not go to the movies? Right. Why not go to McDonald's? You know, it's like, no, no, like very literally. Why not Trump? Right? Can you can you kind of expand and, on on that for everybody here? Well, you know, basically. It's like anybody but Trump, you know, like Hillary, it doesn't matter. Anybody but Trump, right? John McCain instead of Trump. That's been the attitude, you know? yeah. Mitt Romney instead of Trump. Ted Cruz instead of Trump, maybe. I don't know, you know? Anybody but Trump. And I just thought, okay, um, this is something I'm familiar with. From having grown up in the 80s and maniacal anti anti Reaganism, but also from the earlier history of platypus anti Bushism, like George W. Bush was like a fascist, right? And he was a white supremacist. He was a Christian crusader. He wanted to kill all Muslims. Um, you know, under his administration, the military was being told that they were leading a Christian crusade to wipe out the Muslims of course not true um you know like just these these ridiculous perspectives on the left um really deranged and it's like deal with reality right and you know the reality is trump might be elected and it's not going to be the end of the world it's actually not going to be the end of the world like don't lose your mind 
don't use it as an excuse to lose your mind. And especially don't use it as an excuse to concede to the Democrats. So yeah, you were... That will be, the, were, end. That, that were, will be the end of any kind of leftism. It always is. You were, in a sense, uh, saying, hey, everybody, brace yourselves. Trump derangement syndrome is coming, and it's not going to lead to anything better. And here we have Biden, and it's the... I mean, talk about like the best example of how president matters a lot less than cabinet and how you can oh, be yeah. basically asleep at the wheel. You know, it's like... The the most interesting thing we saw from from Biden was his his uh, his evil dark empire speech, like where he's like, did you see that shit? Where like the the a little unintentionally though, right? And so what happened was they framed it wrong, meaning he was standing in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and it's actually lit with the three colors: red, white, and blue, but the central color is red, and they kind of cropped out the white and the blue so that it looked like yeah he was uh. arriving from the sith temple or something and <laughs> yeah it was like very bizarre and i was like fucking millennials are so incompetent <laughs> do you know how to compose an image can you pinch yourself can you wake up so so you were you were like, you were not no? convinced by you were not convinced by vosh's position that this was the coolest messaging sent by the Biden administration to date because it's a it's a single it's a it's a signal that they're not messing around and they're coming for Trump and they're going to Dark Brandon gonna, Dark Brandon Dark Brandon Yeah No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, it's just stupidity, foolishness. It was a mistake. Like the red backdrop, it was just a mistake. Right? I mean, I guess you could say it was a mistake that was let pass because unconsciously they, you know, the Biden staff wanted to be the dark Brandon, you know, like Sith executioners of the, the Trumpists, I guess, you know, but I'm just like, no, this is dumb, you know, especially because, you know, like Biden is funny. So, you know, Trump's presidency was pretty bad. It was. And, you know, it might be, might've been one of the worst presidencies of all time, perhaps. But then the Biden presidency is even worse. And, you know, and Trump's an intemperate, like, you know, loudmouth kind of asshole, you know. And then Biden also is, though. It's <laughs> yeah, funny. Yeah. You know, it's just funny. He's like the Democrats version of Trump. Yeah. He really is. <laughs> you know, and um, and it's just like. Wow. You know, because basically it's like the lid has been blown off and the whole polished Obama whatever is just gone. And we're just full on yellow journalism, you know, total tabloid headlines 24/7 nonstop. Like, okay, this is this is what we're going to be doing now. You know, it's everything. You know, it's Hunter Biden. Okay. You know, it's yeah. like it's like it's, it's the it's, most you know it's the uh you know uh Lolita Express Jeffrey Epstein how many times did Trump get on the Lolita Express right. you know it's just like it's just this is the world that that capitalist politics has led to and you know we can't really do anything about it right so we have to try to see what is going on and not be distracted by the noise I think that's a perfect pivot point here into Q&A session. We're doing the Ask Me Anything portion. Nance, if you – and also Adam, I see you there in the chat if you're going to want to hop in here and ask Catron how to homeschool your daughter or whatever. I, I saw him talking about something related to that in the chat. Um, you're going to be welcome to, uh, but I've got a rapid-fire question for you, Chris, and that is uh, which of these people is more controversial uh, who you have worked with at Platypus or who you – uh, and, or is there any of them that you haven't worked with? My, 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 my sense is that you've probably had all these people uh, involved with platypus events, but Grover Fur, Michael Parenti, Norman Finkelstein, Vivek Cheber, or Adolf Reed Jr. Who is the most controversial you've dealt with? It's 
a good question. I mean, obviously, um, controversial to whom, right? Yeah. Uh, controversial to me? Um, Grover Fur, of course, right? Because he's a Stalinist. Um, yeah, because, you know, he's basically like, yeah, the, the purge trials were correct. All the charges against Trotsky, he was actually guilty of. Right. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> you know? So that's what I would controvert, if you will. Right. Um, but, you know, um, obviously I have criticisms of all of the above. Mm -hmm. Right? I have serious differences with Vivek Chiver, politically, his perspective on things. Um, the general DSA, uh, both political and theoretical orientation. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe that would be you know most important controversy would be between me and Vivek Chipper. Um, you know, a debate, if you will, between me and Vivek Chipper would be more meaningful than a debate between me and Grover Fur. I think. I mean, it depends on for what purposes. Um, you know, because I'm not sure that like defending Trotskyism is the point in 2023 so much as defending Marxism and so I'd be interested in defending Marxism against like the Vivek Chibber kind of revision of it um, is your, who is else your, did you mention so those two stood out for me I'll, I'll come back to them in a second but on Vivek um, my question I guess so when I think of him I think what, what, he, what he's good for is like this he is the Indian man critical of post-colonial, primarily Indian uh, theory, right? Um, you know, so, I agree with him on that, generally. Right? Okay. I, mean, I generally agree with him on that, although a friend of mine, Sunit Singh, did write a critique of um, Vivek's critique of post-colonialism, even okay. though Sunit is also critical of post-colonialism. Basically, the idea was Vivek's criticism is not the right criticism. Okay. Yeah, it's an interesting, you know, but again, um, I think that I think that there is still a kind of rational kernel or point to Vivek's criticism. I don't think of Vivek primarily in that vein. I think of him as, um, you know, a theorist of what is the necessary socialist politics for our time. Okay. And so a subset of that involves the critique of post-colonialism. Okay. Right. Um, but really, I think that that critique of post-colonialism comes from his political perspective, meaning his intellectual critique of post-colonial theory is actually a political critique of uh, post-colonialism. It is. Um, as, as an abandonment of the struggle for socialism. In class politics, right. exactly. And yeah. so that's that's where I differ with Vivek about what is necessary for the struggle for socialism. And okay. not we don't disagree on everything by any means. We agree sure. on a lot, right? But we do disagree on some things that I think are important. Well, right. maybe maybe someday in my in my ideal future, I get to uh, uh, MC the that conversation with the two of I mean, you. it would be, you know, again, something that he would not be very friendly to. It would be over things that he thinks are irrelevant sectarian concerns like the dictatorship of the proletariat. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Um, you know, which, again, I would say, you know, that's the skeleton in the closet of Marxism. Right. And so you can't pretend it's not there. And you can't cede it to the sectarian Marxist organizations. You can't just say, oh, you know, Trotskyists and Maoists talk about that. We don't need to talk about that. Like, you know, we need to be, we need to get real politically. And it's like, well, you know, that was really Marxist perspective. And also, it's what the right thinks you're doing. Yeah. And so you got to deal with it. You got to deal with the meaning of it, and you got to deal as honestly as possible with it, and not sort of, you know, transmogrify it into whatever you want it to be, you know, not just redefine it, and and sort of dodge the real issue. So you know, I mean, it would, you know, it's one of these things. But I think that the DSA generally, I mean, I've t I've written about this. They do disagree with Marxism fundamentally. They do. And yeah. uh, they, at the same time, they also claim to be Marxist. 
and they seek to participate in a kind of monopolization of Marxism. They do, you know, they they kind of want to be uh, the definers of what Marxism is and isn't. At the same time that they disagree with it, and I think that's that's a dishonesty and it's a it's a problem. It's it an is. intellectual problem. It's a theoretical problem. And it bears on some political problems, right? Because right. I'm not just here to say we have to be politically Marxist. Because, again, what does that even mean? Well, for them, I think it just means it's their cop-out from actually having to organize and, and give a fuck about regular working people. And instead, they get to do this technocratic, elitist, PMC fucking... Uh, sure. Like, oh, sure. well, we represent the oppressed loop and proles... And we don't give a fuck about workers who don't agree with us. And that's the tendency. And so like that, I mean, obviously there are uh, a variety of splinters and factions within uh, that, oh, yeah. all, that are advocating for some something else. But, you know, that is the general tendency that they're fighting against. So, but I would also say that, you know, maybe in the future after I've read and reread your syllabus and I feel like I've finally come to a point where I'm based enough in this discourse that you've been in for so long. <laughs> right. Maybe maybe we can have this disagreement if I still disagree with you sure. at that point. But sure, right sure. now, right now I think it would basically be a waste of time because one of the things that I tell everybody is like, you want to be critical, why don't you read and reread stuff first? Right? Like if you want to be radical, that's what that would mean. And so we one of the uh, the new article I just put out called The Three Principles of Study uh, as a way of mm -hmm. life. Um, it, it's mm -hmm. about how reading and writing comes before real conversation. And if you skip reading or writing in a rigorous sense, then you aren't going to have real conversation. You're going to have mere talking, idle chatter, bullshit. And so yeah. I, 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 I want to be able to someday get to the point where we can have a, a worthwhile disagreement if I still disagree with you at that point. And I don't even know right. if I will until we do this, this course. So uh -huh. – um, the other names on the list, though, were uh, – so we already talked about Grover Fur and Vivek Chibber. The other names are Michael Parenti, Norman Finkelstein, and Adolf Reed Jr. Right. So Adolf is controversial, um, again, in ways that I think are more symptomatic of the problems on the left, um, although I would also have my disagreements with him. On other um, things. About what he would call Leninism or Trotskyism. Um, you know, because he's more in the kind of left communist council communist tradition in terms of his, you know, uh, you know what he believes in that that strand of Marxism, and uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I have disagreements there. Um, I kind of understand where he's coming from, and I'm sympathetic to you know his criticism of the existing Marxist Leninist left, um, but. But um, I think that uh, there's a potential problem there. And then we disagree also. In the meantime, he tends to be a kind of right social democrat. You know, he was a Bernie crowd for sure. Uh, he also, you know, interestingly, even though he disagreed with identity politics, he disagrees with identity politics. He still said that the Bernie voters in the primaries who did not turn out for Hillary were sexist. Are not voting for Hillary, and I'm like, how's that? Um, I did not know that he said that. Yeah. Oh no, he wrote a whole article about it. For real. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I think it was in the Progressive. Right. Because I wouldn't vote and, for I wouldn't vote for Hillary, and I wouldn't vote for Biden. And you know, Biden's a man, so. Not that it's you know not that it's terribly important who we vote for. It isn't because we're a small, tiny minority of people. But again, as a lesson in politics right as a lesson in politics the whole we have to stop the republicans at all cost i just feel like actually we need to uh proceed in such a way that it doesn't matter whether it's a republican or a democrat in office right the tasks remain the same the tasks are the same in a red state as in a blue state you know uh that the the idea that somehow things are better for us on the left in terms of doing what has to be done, organizing a socialist politics, that somehow it's better under the Democrats to do that than under the Republicans, we cannot concede that. Because then we will always be sacrificing 
what needs to be done in favor of prioritizing keeping the Democrats in power. Right. That will always be the case. Right. It will um, never change. You know. And I also, I mean, from, from my position, like what I advocate for is for people in representative and authoritative uh, or influencer positions, leadership positions as well within political organizations. Uh, ultimately, my, I, what I advocate for is you need to respect and honor the fact that you're not trusted by most people and you need to appeal to that and, <laughs> and, and base everything around that. And if you scapegoat people who don't trust you, if you scapegoat people who don't believe what you oh. think they should believe, then you are the primary problem because I don't want to live in the world where you have power. And so until I see a, a post-trust movement that doesn't gaslight, epistemologically gaslight, or social blackmail regular working people, uh, I think the number one thing is critique, interpretation, not fun, you know, not organize the working class. I, no, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in that until I see a change within whatever major organizations exist, like in, in their approach to these these matters. Because right, right now, right. it's like right now, right now, if the DSA were to take power for some reason, I would be against them. Right. Like I just I don't want it. I don't want to be in that world. Right. I would rather be in the world where Trump and Biden are ruining everything than a bunch of self-proclaimed socialists keep ruining everything. Yeah. But tell us that it's for our own good. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, for real. So so that's my beef with Adolf. And I think, you know, he's a little bit stuck in the Reagan era. You know, I think he abandoned the struggle for socialism when Reagan was elected in favor of fighting the right. And there, there's some point to that. There is some point to that, but I think no, not 40 years later. No, sorry, no. Um, and Michael Parenti, I, I'm not sure that he is terribly controversial to me. I mean, we would have some disagreements, but what, what's controversial about him? Remind me of what should be, what would be controversial about Michael Parenti? Well, you're kind of bringing this into like. For you, what's your beef with any of these people? My question is more along the lines. Oh, okay. I, Sorry. I am interested. I am interested in your in uh -huh. your in your takes, but I am also I'm saying as the person who has who has been associated with platforming some of these people, who do you yeah. catch the most flack for? Like I imagine it's probably Grover Fur, but it could be Parenti for just being very popular at defending the Soviet Union in a lot of ways, right? So I don't know. Oh, sure. Um, right. So, uh, no, we didn't get, I mean, who do we get flack for? You know, um, we get flack for other kinds of people. Like, um, you know, like Doug Henwood turned against Platypus because we invited Paul Berman, who was a critic of the anti-war movement. Um, you know, he also didn't like that we had the RCP USA, you know, um, the the kind of post Maoist, like kind of new left Maoist American organization, because he's like, well, they're a cult, and it's like, yeah, as opposed to what the Democrats are not a cult, you know, like, you know, like that's that's a lame, you know, and um, so we've, you know, and we've also because Platypus is in Germany, we got into trouble for kind of highlighting a very prominent tendency on the German left, the anti-Deutsch, um, you know, who we don't agree with, but, uh, or at least I don't agree with them, but they were an important phenomenon on the, on the German left and, and among young people on the German left. And so, you know, you can't just pretend again, the whole idea that we're going to pretend that the people we disagree with don't exist. Right. You know, or, 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 or the worst thing, the worst thing is to pretend that the people we don't agree with who have appeared on platforms 
are responsible for the regular working people who agree with them because those regular working people are just stupid dupes who get inseminated by ideas in this sort of Dawkin like sense of memes that oh, just yeah. come like right. they think they think that, that that it's a social contagion theory of ideas and that right. that that oh it's Joe Rogan's fault that people believe this and it's this person's fault that people believe that. And it's like oh my God that is that oh, yeah. is yeah, as if people wouldn't have been taking ivermectin if Joe Rogan hadn't said something about it. Right. Right? Right. And so, you know, so it, it look, the left is censorious, it is. And again, that's out of its weakness. That's out of its dead character. Um, you know, but it is censorious, right? And the mainstream quote unquote left, the Democrats are very censorious. Um, the far left is censorious. And again, I, I don't favor that kind of censoriousness at all. But I also think, you know, there's no justification for it. Like, really. Um, and, you know, again, what are we talking about? We're talking about kind of, you know, Christine was talking about this policing boundaries. Right? Gatekeeping. Right. Um, so it's it's really... You know, even though it's supposedly in service of a greater political mission, the real purpose of it and the real effect of it is much more on the internal life of the left itself. Right? It's not like the left, no platforming people, gets rid of whatever problem they think they represent. It just shuts down any, anything within the left. Right. And it's it's a kind of a just a bad culture. It's a bad vibe. Right. And it's 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 a culture of defeat. It's a culture of failure. It's, um, you know, like I said, it's a symptom. It's, and it's kind of like, you know, what what do we why do we have the censorious attitude? Um, nobody questions that. Right. And uh, and it's kind of like, you know, so I am like you know, uh, I do believe in debate, critique, conversation. Um, you know, I do believe in, you know, airing things out and not tabooing them, right. exposing things and not suppressing them. In other words, uh, I do believe that maybe the best way an idea is defeated is in exposing it like just allowing it voice like just you know um i do think that that's probably you know like intellectually that's a more honest approach but also politically it's probably more effective um, well, I've, I've seen you know, people i've seen like, people bring it who... to the light of day go ahead I've seen people who think that having Grover Fur on means that you're Stalinist sympathizers or whatever. And it's like, if you watch the panel, like at least the one that I watched, like Alizar yeah. was, Alizar was in the audience and got to ask, you know, lean it, you know, chew into him. Cause Alizar, he's someone I was involved with in a political organization in the past. And Alizar was like made it his life's mission to basically debunk Fur. And the fact is, it's like, these kinds of contradictions don't get to play out where people can see them uh, when it's all put beneath the rug. And, and what, what, what was what this whole stay in your lane thing that uh, Christine was talking about, I've been talking about as it's discursive Taylorism, right? Now, I like, I like Taylorism that can eliminate inefficiencies. I like Taylorism that can um, better uh, free up a time really like lower socially necessary time for creating things um but that obviously not when that's privatized the winds of it but the discursive taylorism though right like that is it, it is symptomatic it's not just symptomatic i think of the what left you mean being, like just disciplining when i say discursive taylorism i mean like discourse has been siloed into specific niches and then there are oh, special there are specialists who have monopolies on the skill sets for talking about those things. Usually those skill sets are I did good in school and I have the right identity. Right? And so identity politics is just discursive Taylorism. 
right? So it, like, it, I mean, it's it, like a model of like research efficiency, like uh, specialization. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. A symptom of a public education system that was erected to intentionally keep the working class divided and to de-skill most working people while hoarding skills and virtue for a subsection of mediators who are supposed to create class conciliation, right? Sure. I mean, I would say, because I know you had Daniel Tutt on earlier, and I know he's very anti-Nietzsche, but, you know, I will defend Nietzsche and uphold Nietzsche, you know, (laughs) that on the one hand, it is about that. It is about, like, um, making knowledge rarefied and inaccessible. On the other hand, I don't think that that's, like, it's conscious intention or purpose. I think the unconscious intention, if you will, or the, the, the real purpose has to do with, we don't know what this knowledge is for. We don't know what its, what its reason to exist is. So, you know, we don't know why we want to know what we want to know right That's, and yeah. you know there's a kind of a so there's a kind of an internal problem intellectually like why why are we doing this why do we want to know these things what is this knowledge production for what is this research for um and then there's also a kind of an institutional logic which is the expansion of education and the qualification of of educators and that you have to show that you are a knowledge producer in order to be able to be an educator, even though those are two very different things. Um, and so there's a funny way that higher education is now all justified on the basis of grad schooling, even though many people are never going to go to graduate school, right? And so the kind of liberal arts kind of education has been evacuated in favor of a kind of Everything is a kind of uh, professionalization and and a- along the model of the professional researcher. And that's why I raise Nietzsche, because Nietzsche is like, OK, the search for truth has become an end in itself. The search for knowledge, really, data, facts, has become an end in itself without anyone being able to ask, why do we need this or want this? And what is its overall purpose in society? And, you know, it's like a Lukács kind of means ends reversal. There's a kind of reification of knowledge where knowledge becomes an end in itself as opposed to a means to an end, right? And so I would say that there's that problem, which is maybe a deeper problem, um, you know, which is not, not that, that, that doesn't mean that I'm against knowledge for its own sake. I'm not, right? right? But when you think about the institutional imperatives, it's not like people are studying things whose purpose may not be clear, but that are authentically interesting things. It's right. more what you're talking about, a kind of ed- endless subspecialization, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, justified, yes, justified in terms of identity politics, in terms of like, yeah, people staying in their cultural silos, I suppose. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a weird phenomenon to observe because I, I actually think it's a kind of a more of a mysterious process, like how and why that took place. It's not like, okay, we're going to open higher education to the working class, but we're also going to exclude the working class from higher education. I don't think that it was intentional like that. I think it's played out that way, but I don't think that was, I think, you know, we live in a GI Bill higher education system expansion after World War II um, that we do have that, but also affected by the neoliberal era. Um, I, I think that and, the intentional yeah. aspect was in the 19... like between the ni- 1905 and 1925. Like that's the period of intentional, progressive engineering of of this 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 thing oh yeah you raised this did you raise this with christine woodrow wilson yeah saying we don't want to over educate the working class but you know i don't know that that prevailed in other words i do think the gi bill i think after world war ii i think it's different with like the fdr new deal kind of i think the intention there 
was a kind of you want a generally educated citizenry right there was a kind of a model of a liberal arts education that was going to be expanded to include the working class it's not um, quite that it's was, not quite that was like what they wanted at some level they wanted yeah. they weren't like oh this will prevent them from being manual laborers because the idea was that manual laborers still have to be citizens right and that was i mean i understand that just your average naive progressive at least has that going for yeah. them is that they do believe in education the thing is is that education has been gutted of almost any content right. and is this formalistic thing and so most of what's made available through these kinds of endeavors along with this lofty rhetoric of citizenship is really just like oh well my education was shit formalistic contentless bullshit and I, everyone else should be able to have access to that as well, well so that we can else, all be you know what else happened dave is that the boomer generation got a good education they did but then they became very cynical about it mm. and then they turned around and denied the people who came after them the education that they had received right they liquidated yeah. their own education and they called it western cultural imperialism they called it like patriarchy they called it heteronormativity like they just said all this stuff that we were educated in it's all shit it's bad it's worthless it's worse than worthless it's actually bad um nobody needs it and it's like well you had it and now you're going to deny it to us who come after you mm -hmm. and they they were successful and i will also say that my generation gen x are really completing the process like the utter cynicism towards things of intellectual worth and value yeah i'm a working class person which means that i didn't i don't have this ruling class cynicism about the cultural heritage because that heritage didn't belong to my family didn't belong mm -hmm. to me you know i had to fight my way to get access to it you know so it's all well and good for like rich kids to hate on the university and hate right. the museum I'm like the as a working class person this is the only place I can get it. I can only get it at the museum. I can I can only right. get art at the museum. I can only get education at the university. I can't get it from, you know, my parents' friends, you know, and their cultural networks. I can't I I can't get it at home. I can only get it in the public sphere. And their attitude was very cynical towards you know their own education and the institutions that provided that education and so they're just you know they're willing to burn it down because they had it and so you know they're denying it to the working class they are right but again like in this that's more like the psychodrama aspect of it yeah you know um i think institutionally that process has been more subtle and it has been about austerity and capitalism and streamlining, you know, cost cutting in one respect, but also allowing exorbitant costs in another respect, you know, and, and I just, you know, what I tell my students, because since you were talking about PC identity politics and mm -hmm. this kind of thing, you know, what are students really taught in college? What does a college degree mean? It doesn't mean what they're taught in their classes because nobody cares, right? What matters is that it helps you get a job. So it's a job market discrimination device. Right, right, right. And then what does an employer see when they see a college diploma? They see that you've jumped through some hoops, that you're capable of, like, disciplined task achievement. Right. But they also now know that you have been trained in PC multicultural identity politics and therefore you're less likely to cause a lawsuit for them as an employee. Litigation culture. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and that's why, you know, the schools are PC because the corporations are PC. Right, right. And the corporations have to be PC because for no reason, they don't care. They just don't want to deal with the lawsuits. Which right. is why Norman Finkelstein will never get a job anywhere ever again. <laughs> well, right. I mean, so basically it comes down to this. 
if the corporation or the institution, like the university, like trains its employees in like PC identity politics, then that means if anything happens, it's the employee's fault, not the company's fault. Right, right. Because the employee did its due diligence, it explained the rules to the employees, and if the employees break the rules, you can't sue us for that. Right. We'll fire the employee, but you can't sue us for that. You can't sue us for the, what the employee did because we told the employee what they were supposed to do. Exactly. And, and uh, you know, that goes that, to me as a college professor, right? Right. In other words, why do I have to sit through, like, sensitivity training videos or DEI, as they call it now, training videos, just so that they know that if I don't handle things the best possible way that they can say it's not their fault it's my fault as an employee right that's all and, that it's about and and right? that is that is why the the left to bread to uh the podcast to youtube influencer so that's social justice at all which like it's understood no, no. It, well, it, it's understood this doesn't help anybody in the real world this doesn't help people of color it doesn't really no. help like working class women it no. does not actually do anything right all that it does is immunize them against being accused of something and the the current split between the dirt bags and the the woke scolds the you know between thought slime and vosh between the serfs Mexi, like all these Canadian personalities who have kind of dominated the, the sphere after Bernie, they, their arguments are arguments about affect first, like how many swear words do you use? But ultimately their arguments are always about, is this firing justified? Should this person be fired? Should this person, it's never uh, firing people on the basis of this shit is a really stupid strategy. No, it's always, well, should we hate J.K. Rowling or not? Should we hate uh, Dave Chappelle or not? Should we? Ha it's always like it assumes that this this litigation culture, litigation averse culture, uh, is is right. It's that it's correct and that this is a way forward. You know, and litigation happy culture, right? Not only litigation averse, but litigation happy. Um, oh, fair enough. You know, it's just it's 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 a strange situation. So I think that the intellectual situation we find ourselves in has many different routes to it. Um, it's not like a master plan. It's just, this is how things tend to work out in a way that's convenient. Right? And, you know, it's an unfortunate circumstance. It really is. Because, again, I feel like as a teacher, I want to reproduce my own learning experience. You know, I want to reproduce my own education. Um, because, you know, I think it's valuable, you know, um, and so the fact that the institutions mitigate against it is really like so bad for me, you know, because it, it means that as one of my dissertation committee members said, he said, Chris, you're probably the last working class PhD student I'll ever have. <laughs> I you think know? that's a this is this is like right now where I should probably say okay, uh, Nance, if you're there, turn on your camera microphone. We're gonna check in on the chat. Uh, so welcome, welcome to the stream here, and we've got uh, basically ten minutes here to close out. And uh, okay, so we didn't go through the syllabus, but it's okay. You can you can link it and let the, people the, see the massive amount of reading. And anyway, we're gonna have to work on paring it down to some highlights we'll mm -hmm. pare it down and then have a syllabus day you know a proper uh -huh. one for now the syllabus was our disappearing mediator yeah uh -huh. <laughs> in the hegelian sense yeah so anyway welcome nance well, how's the chat going it looks like everybody's happy everybody's content to listen um and absorb rather than loft their own distractions um cool i think Personally, I think I always come back to almost like a strange pessimism. Um, mm. And it's not because I think you're only offering that, but I, that's where I, I think I find myself. Um, 
and I don't want to be there, and I, I don't think that's what you're offering. Right. I mean, it's, yeah, so pessimism, I mean, yeah, I'll admit the last few years have been hard. And, you know, personally, I've been a little bit in a downbeat place. But, but I can still be summoned to the things I care about and, you know, what I think is worthwhile. And so in that sense, I haven't, like, given up and I'm not pessimistic. But, you know, we're in a dire situation. You know, the world is not, not going in a good way. And there are these problems. I mean, I would just say, um, yeah, we have to be sober about that. We have to be kind of, um, at least at some level, you know. Now, I don't want it to be overwhelmingly that way, but I do want to, and I want to be true to the moment, too. I think that after, you know, a few years of Biden, after the midterm elections, I think that we can say, okay, you know, this progressive moment, right? The moment of now's our chance to like reverse neoliberalism, you know, help people out. Um, you know, cause I was, op I was open to that possibility. I'm not like against expanding the welfare state, you know, Medicare for all this kind of stuff, the Bernie program, you know, uh, free college tuition, uh, you know, forgive student debt. I'm not against these things, of course. I didn't think they were really going to happen, but I also was not against them. But it, you know, this is just not the way things are going, right? And in the meantime, some other problems have shown up, like the COVID restrictions and the crazy, crazy disciplining of the workforce between DEI and COVID. It's amazing. And, and of course, the um, we were talking about censorship. You know, like the internet ain't what it used to be. No, right? it's not. It ain't what it used to be. In, in my time, you know, I remember when I got my first like commercial email address in like 1995, and it's just not the same anymore, right? And now we are just being exploited mercilessly, you know, by these giant corporations. That's what the internet is. Right. And so, you know, just things are not great. And things are pretty dark. We talked about Dark Brandon. Like, I don't believe in Dark Brandon as, like, a thing. But he is. You know, the Biden administration is kind of dark. <laughs> yeah. On a variety of levels, you know. And and we're not going to get any better with Kamala Harris and, you know, Ron DeSantis. You know? Um, I mean, I don't know what to make of a second Trump presidency, which could happen. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know what that means. I don't know if people go more berserk. You know, I don't know. You know, so the left doesn't seem like, you know, if it doesn't sort of like step back and say, okay, right, what are we doing? If they just stay on this merry-go-round, it's a dark place. It is a dark place. I think that's a perfect place to end is that's uh that that unless yeah so like how about how about you say your goodbyes and then we'll uh we'll catch you <laughs> catch you on right now look here. forward to talking with you again in the future both privately and publicly mm -hmm. um you know uh again i'll make the plug for the the books that are coming out from sublation on the this millennial era so the first volume is about the history of the millennial left through like a chronicle of articles that i wrote along the way across like 16 years from 2006 to last year 2022 and the second book is going to be more actually more like the um the way i try to teach marxism so it's going to be essays that i wrote that are really about trying to open up the history of marxism think about the ideas there and and you know get down to the basics um and you know so that people can consider its value um, and so that's going to be volume two coming out later this year. That's called Marxism and Politics, Essays on Critical Theory and the Party. Perfect. You know? So it's going to be, um, that will be interesting. And, uh, you know, I would say, you know, for those int interested in Platypus, you know, we do have an open door policy with respect to the reading groups we organize and the campus chapters that we have and also um, articles to be published potentially in the Platypus Review. Um, so, uh, 
Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. Thanks a lot. You might be muted. Oop. Okay, thank you for stopping by. We really appreciate your support in this first year and we look forward to the syllabus conversation in the near future. Cool, cool. cool. All right, thanks. Take care. All right, peace. And now a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important yet neglected for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, Everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 tier is too much, consider donating towards meals and gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the U.S., where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events. Not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being in Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory, a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at Tier 3, you also get access to the Recovery Group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? One of the most succinct and cutting edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, 
you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code what is sex early bird YT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all? Much less tiered pricing. First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, People tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah, and seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye. I couldn't believe it when I saw that poster. Bold real art in Boise fucking Idaho? Are you kidding me? It was virtually an, an answer to an unspoken prayer, you know, it really was. And I just couldn't believe that somebody was interested in the things that I was interested in, that I had been interested in for years and had kind of given up on in, in futility. I'd labored in solitude for so long. I had no one to talk to about it, no one to bounce ideas off of. It, it just vastly accelerated my ability, to, I don't get too philosophical, to interrogate, to inquire, and to see connections between things. And so the 
theory underground that Dave is developing in this mission is, is trying to reach an audience of people who aren't just doing philosophy in a university setting. Why is there an advantage to doing philosophy outside of an academic right. setting? Well, the neat thing is that you can really drill down. You know, when you're in school, you, know, you don't you have to do 50 things, and you do them all partially. And uh, it's like you're digging a well. And you're digging very shallow wells. When you can drill down deep and take your time and really get into something, especially with a company of fellows that you get into the slipstream of, of a great philosopher and you just have to take the deep dive. Uh, but initially, a lot of these philosophers, they're speaking to a tradition, they're trying to resolve specific problems, and they just assume you know what those are, that you've had their life experience. So the first time you read read them, you're, you're just trying to get the lay of the land. And you may well uh, have some uh, insights. You may wrongly associate certain things you know with what they're saying. But uh, then you'll maybe like look at a secondary text. And now, oh, since you have something to bring to the table, all the lights start going off. And then when you read the philosopher the second time, you can read them more knowledgeably and so you're really you're looking for things you're better able to follow along uh, you're not left behind so much uh, the third reading though and it's these are for profound books I mean you don't have to read everything like this but for a, a profound text the third reading is where you've learned enough that you relate it to everything else you know that you begin to see the connectedness between what this philosopher is doing and the uh, the implicit, unstated um, situation that they were speaking to initially, you know something about that. And you see the connection between that and all sorts of other things. And you connect it to your life and the way you live and move through the world and the the way you see things and interact with people and you you are not just absorbing you're creating you're a co-creator when it's all said and done you just have to put it into your own words and there's a danger of reductionism there but when you put it into your own words and you're bringing all these different strands together it's really phenomenal and that's what the third reading does so a few years ago Dave, running you through the channel, had a Patreon going and right. discontinued accepting money from people. But since then, you have continued to make a donation monthly. And right. It's, it's obviously very meaningful to Dave, meaningful to me as well, being Dave's partner. Right. And so, why? Why, why do you do that, <laughs> essentially? Well, Dave brings people together. Whatever Dave is doing is valuable. And uh, my life was completely changed. And I'm grateful. I can't afford to give Dave 50 bucks a month, but I do because it brings me joy. Every, every time I get my social security, the first thing I do is send $50 to Dave. And uh, my heart sings. And it, it's a sense of gratitude. I don't feel obligated to do it. I want to do it. And I want to do whatever I can to help Dave do for other people what he did for me. Yeah, I want uh, that to continue. And it's uh, truly, I take great joy in it. It's the best $50 I spend a month. It really is. If you can plant a seed where uh, a handful of people meet each other and they can all have the experience that we've had, um, face to face with each other, that would be awesome.
We interrupt this conversation for a quick message from our sponsors. All of Theory Plebe's content has been demonetized and self-funded for over a year. Plebe and Mikey work in warehouses while using what little time with energy that remains to do what they love, Theory. Part of Plebe's goals for 2022 is to focus on getting Mikey freed from wage labor. To free his time-energy from its reduction to labor power. Why? Because Plebe has learned more from Mikey than almost any professor or book, and if Mikey can get his time energy, then he would be able to teach real online courses and publish video essays and that backlog of books he is always being obstructed from finishing. If you were unaware, Michael had a special kind of working living arrangement that made it possible for him to focus on nothing but the study of philosophy for six hours per day. Not just leisure reading, but struggling to articulate the hardest and most revolutionary concepts in the life of the mind. Mikey's standard was this, if he could not explain it to a guy on a bar stool at the pub, then he did not understand it. But by the time Michael was ready to begin making his wealth of knowledge accessible through courses and books, tragedy struck. Now he has to work full time and support his mother. That is why we must pound sign for E Mikey before we can free ourselves. Towards the end of this video, when Todd McGowan and Andrew of Master Signified Bodies both leave to go to bed, Michael Downs explains why Deleuze is an absolute genius. And then he breaks down what Heidegger means by being in a way that is more accessible and clarifying than anything you will ever find on the subject, anywhere else. Promise. If you think you have lots to learn from him, or that the world of theory would more generally benefit from freeing him from wage labor, then consider supporting at www.patreon.com The dangerous may be. If you are one of the graduate students or professors in classrooms around the world who have found Michael's posts from the Dangerous Maybe blog helpful, then stop what you are doing and give a little back. He should have leisure time too. It will only help all of us. Pound sign for he might be every dollar gets him closer to having his time dash energy again. Thank you for listening to this message from our sponsors, by whom we of course mean you, once you have helped in the struggle to pound sign for he might be. P.S. When Mikey gets freed he will solve the riddle of history, complete the system of German idealism. Explain the body without organs without dumbing it down. Write the most important book on consumerism in America, and teach courses that are introductory and graduate and level alike. We're back! Welcome everybody to the continuation of this stream but also for people joining in the future as well as the version of this that I aim to re uh, reshare later. Welcome everybody to Theory Underground. I'm your host David McCarricker and for this conversation we are joined by Cadell Last. How are you Cadell? Fantastic. Nice to be here Dave and uh, hope your stream's going well. Happy to be a part of it. Yeah it's really great to have you on board. For anybody who's not familiar with Cadell's work he writes about uh, cybernetic futuristic, you know, uh, <laughs> singular brain shit, and at the same time it comes from a hard science background, but he's super into Hegel and Slavoj Žižek, and more importantly and recently, as far as like how we started collaborating together, he is the founder, director, lead t instructor for Philosophy Portal, which is an organization also doing underground theory in a sense. Um, you, like me, have a big interest in making this stuff available to people, but also doing it in non-suffocating environments. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I definitely vibe with the idea of, of, of underground theory. I mean, in some sense, it's underground in the sense that it's, I, if if we define underground as not being in a traditional academic institution, and it's also deeply committed to to you know to theory, and that theory is worthwhile and theory is valuable, and actually theory is kind of like the um, the water we we swim in <laughs> or the air we breathe, um, and so if we don't pay attention to theory and if we don't make theory accessible um and i'm talking like for me you know thinking about the foundational theoretical texts of the modern world that's sort of how i approach it with with philosophy portal then we're not going to be able to be informed when it comes to contemporary politics contemporary technology contemporary econo economy uh, so yeah incredibly important stuff and 
suppose that's that's literally uh, <laughs> what I that, that's 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 my my day and night basically. Mm-hmm. So that's your day and night. That's your your life struggle in a sense. Yeah. And I wanna that the topic of our conversation today is killing ourselves with texts. Basically, we want to talk about death drive and taking on challenges that are so hard we feel like we're dying, which it's a fitting point in this in this first day of li- li- uh, marathon live streaming because we're over halfway complete, but uh, we were supposed to start like 15 minutes ago, but I had to. I had to eat and... Thankfully, Anne was a step ahead of Fair me. Enough. She'd actually prepared me something, and then she she even like popped my back. Like I really needed that, and it's like, you know, in, in taking on the challenge of like a twelve to fourteen hour live stream, uh, in itself, not uh, apart from the two day part of it. The the main thing I think I forgot about was like, oh yeah, eating. I can run <laughs> to the ba- I can run to the bathroom, but eating's actually like. It, it takes a certain amount of time. Like that oatmeal I had earlier, I tried to eat it between the Daniel Tut, Nina Power, and Christine Louis de Soli. I wasn't able to. I, I tried to eat it, but I just had to do so many things. And then, uh, so my, my oatmeal from that I was supposed to eat at like 7 a.m. is something I didn't eat until like almost noon. And oatmeal is not a very good lunch, first of all. Um, and so, anyway, I'm very happy that I had some tacos. Um, but what are you doing in your life right now? What have you been doing with Philosophy Portal that is a, a serious challenge and that is, in a sense, killing you? Oh, well, okay. So, I mean, I think there's, <laughs> there's, 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 there's one main thing. I mean, I think it's, for me in my life, is like from up till five minutes ago till about, say, the beginning of August of last year, I'm basically day and night into the science of logic. And, you know, I think I've read it like four or five times uh, since last August. And just day and night trying to understand the ins and outs of the arguments, trying to understand the overall structure of the book, and most importantly, trying to teach it and trying to bring it to life. And that's just basically been one of the biggest challenges I've ever taken on, to be honest. I mean, I remember when I launched the Science of Logic course, like announced it, I was just like, how am I going to teach this thing? <laughs> it's like, this is, in, this, is an in, this is an insane project. And it's like even more challenging, I think, and more daunting in some sense than the phenomenology of spirit, because oh, at yeah. least with the phenomenology of spirit, you're engaged with, um, say, concrete objects. Like you're dealing with spirits objects as it's moving through the phenomenological journey. And there's like almost like an intuitive way to, to, to teach that, to approach that. But with the science of logic, it's it's so so abstract. And some of the aspects of the book are just incredibly dense and you can get lost so easily. Um, that it was, it, it's been one of the biggest challenges of my life, but at the same time now, almost approaching the very end of the project, um, I'm going to be giving the last lecture on it, um, May 1st in terms of the actual contents of the book. It's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. And, and really what I conceptualize these projects as is, is, is my subjectivity dying into the object. And at the same time, that process of subjectivity dying into the object, in some sense, forgetting about myself into the object, almost like I don't exist anymore because I'm just with the object, <clears throat> in the drive of the object. Damn. Um, like, it's almost, it's, it's almost like that process. You know, you, on the one hand, you might say, like, why would you do that to yourself? Or, yeah, like, what, you might what are you thinking? Or you might feel bad for... But on the other hand, to me, it's that very motion which uh, saves me from, like, hedonistic loops, to be honest. Like, if I didn't didn't have a project that I could die into, like, like, it's not like I'm being forced. Like, it's not like I'm in a 
concentration camp. I'm being forced into a certain labor. I'm totally taking this on board myself. I'm positing that as my own necessity. And in some sense, like creating an impossible, it's kind of like the Facebook post you made yesterday where you're like, absolutely nobody, just crickets. And then two day marathon. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> absolute, like, it's like absolutely nobody is asking for me to do the science of logic course, but here it is. I'm just <laughs> positing that as an absolute necessity. <laughs> And I'm just going to die into this. And would you like to die into this with me? Well, come along. Come along and die into theory. And it, and it's like, again, without that process, um, without doing that, um, yeah, I mean, like what? Like video games, cheap, cheap pleasure, like, you know, just, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I just think that in terms of understanding myself, in terms of understanding why I do what I do, I feel like a very helpful model to understand my my notion, my development, is positing impossible projects, positing impossible tasks, and throwing myself into them, and failing along the way, and... Hmm. You know that's 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 it. <laughs> this this is this is the kind of conversation that we were having in a in a smaller form uh, because we're both in the midst of like crazy projects. We're both about to co-teach Alenka Zupanchich, which is what is sex, um, that which begins uh, what in May uh, in the ver in early May. What is it like the the seventh? Is the seventh going to be the first lecture? Yeah, yeah. So we'll have four mini intensives, which first one's going to be May 7th. They're going to be bi-weekly. And that book is really special. I mean, I think that book is, 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 was, well, one, Alenka is just, um, I don't know if she's underrated at this point, because I think a lot of people do know about her. Yeah, but certainly she doesn't have sort of the name brand recognition as someone like Slavoj Žižek, or certainly doesn't have the same readership as someone like Slavoj Žižek. But to me, Alenka is just as rewarding. Like she's just as sharp in terms of, you know, her her theoretical capacities, and um, I think I think what is sex is is. I say if I could summarize why it's an important text, I think it's it's because there's a tendency in, and we brought this up in our first live stream, but there's a tendency in philosophy to overlook the importance of sexuality. And there's a tendency in psychoanalysis to feel like philosophy is in some sense uh, un made, rendered unnecessary by psychoanalysis. And I think Alenka as a philosopher is trying to really bring Lacan uh, and think about Lacan on a philosophical level, as opposed to thinking Lacan, the anti-philosopher, we don't need philosophy anymore. We can just use psychoanalysis. And I think, right. you know, the history of the Lacanian psychoanalytic organization is proof that we, you know, we still need to have this higher order dialogue between philosophy and psychoanalysis. Right. Right. And so Alenka is, awesome for that uh, she's also uh this work in particular is one that we have a couple of videos about i'm not going to exhaust this one because the psa that i've been playing in between um all of the segments in the in the marathon goes into it uh, in depth enough i think and it shows everybody how to sign up for it it gives everybody a promo code and everything like that and so i'm just going to leave that there um this is something that you have taught in the past that you wanted you you were like well this is a cool way that we could collab uh, but also it's a way that some people can get, can prime themselves for tackling Lacan's decree in the summer you're teaching yeah. Lacan's decree in the summer I'm teaching Heidegger's being in time in the summer people yeah. I, I remember like uh, after I'd I, I mean, after I've read it, being a time a couple times and just and, some light reading, just some light summer reading, right? some light summer reading after I got to the point where I was able to at least, you know, write about it and I, it got published somewhere uh, and I shared that I, you know, a piece had been published somewhere. Um, and I remember, I'll never forget uh, somebody, he was an older guy and he said, 
he said, you know, congrats on getting published in an academic journal, but uh, really just the fact that you were able to to read being in time in the first place is an achievement on its own, like that, that will forever change you, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, you know, I hadn't thought about it at that point about how this is a work like that, but what Lenka, uh, uh, Peter Sloterdijk has an anecdote from his childhood that was very formative for him when he was a kid. He said his mother, who was never really into intellectual things, she didn't really take on difficult books or anything like that, multiple times as when he was a kid, she would pull the Critique of Pure Reason off of the bookshelf and hold it and just say that she's so happy to know that something like this exists uh, because even though it's not a challenge she wants to, she wants to take on she's just she's she's grateful to live in a world where there are basically mountains that can be scaled in the mind um, where you can actually develop yourself by taking on seemingly impossible challenges and theory underground has had uh, ever since day one I'm gonna pull it up here on the screen um, on the home page of the website, uh, a, a category called essential texts. And it's not all of the essential texts at Theory Underground. It's not like these are not, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, it's basically, I've got four, they don't know what they do, critique of pure reason, phenomenology of spirit, uh, Das Kapital, being in time, totality and infinity, simulacra and simulation. And that's all I have on there, even though Obviously, you can't really talk theory today without having a basis in Deleuze and Guattari and understanding how they relate to all of these other thinkers. You also probably have to pass through people like Badu and Laruelle. Um, there's Derrida and Foucault, and you know there's also philosophers who aren't in the continental tradition that we still have to engage with. And there's the the yeah. history of philosophy, but then there's also like these current people. And so basically, what I want to say though is. Three of the ones that aren't on the list are the science of logic, the logic of sense, and otherwise than being. And those are three that I see as mountains that are above the mountains here on the screen. Like those are ones that I feel like I'm just working towards. Like I already know the science of logic is on this other level than um, uh, Phenomenology of Spirit, which I have read. But it's like when I say I've read it, I've read it once. To say I've properly read it, I have to reread it and reread it. And right now I'm doing uh, Slavoj Zizek's before they don't know what they do in the course that Mikey's teaching. Shout out to Michael Downs. Shout out to Michael Downs. And this is killing me. It's 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 like this is this is this is Hegel light, right? Mm -hmm. But the section on the four judgments just broke me. Because uh, here's the thing: I was underprepared. And I wasn't taking it as seriously as I needed to. And I was prioritizing other courses that I'm developing and blah, blah, blah. To be fair, you're doing a lot. <laughs> I, I, a little bit, I'll you know. Cut, cut, cut you some slack there. You know, like, you know just, just trying to run an online educational platform here. <laughs> is it, it, it is its own thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. Yeah. But, but, you know, that's what we're signing up for, you know. And... Yeah. So I guess what I want to talk about a little bit is drive and uh, yeah. what it means to, to, to be the person who's like saying, hey, friends, you want to kill yourself with me? Come on. <laughs> Let's say, I, 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 first of all, I probably ruined any chances we ever had at algorithmic su success on YouTube by saying KYS in the first place. But, you know. It kind of reminds me, kind of, kind of reminds me a little bit about Plato's cave and motivating people to leave the cave. It's like, like people are watching, sort of. Let let's say, like people are like watching. Uh, I mean, say people are on theory gram or right. something like that, right? That's kind of like looking at the uh, screen images on the wall, right? You're like, hey, you know, these screen images come from this place over here. <laughs> yeah. You like listening to people talk about books. You, you would actually enjoy listening to yourself think about books if you read them. And people would want to have conversations with you if you read them with any diligence or repetition. right? And so that was for me the big realization was uh, 
I can't get these things secondhand. Like I actually, there's, there's ideas and ideas are great, but then there's actually going the distance with a singular thinker, right? Like a singular thinker who gave their whole life to a set of questions, going the distance in a primary work is the most valuable experience that has been almost disappeared in a lot of, in a lot of academic institutions. For the most part, I think so. I I haven't seen it. I yeah. haven't, I haven't seen deep engage. I haven't seen an academia. And I, I've been through academia, but I haven't seen deep in. This is what I haven't seen in academia, and that's why this is why I'm building philosophy part of the way I am. Is I haven't seen prolonged deep engagement with foundational text. I haven't seen it. Like, like, if, let me give the example of like, I was in evolutionary anthropology, I was in evolutionary biology. No one, there's no class introducing you to, to for example, Charles Darwin. Mm. Like, and like, I'm convinced, I'm convinced that there's a lot of evolutionary biologists who simply haven't read Darwin. And you, and that's the thing is you can become an evolutionary biologist in terms of, in a neoliberal paradigm to, to have a specialized field where you for example study i don't know like macaques mating behavior during the spring you know but like <laughs> like and you could build a right. career doing that but you actually haven't read the foundational text which allow which is basically again the theoretical background or the water or the air we're breathing you know the water we're we're metaphorically swimming in right you know what I mean? And, yeah. and so if you don't understand the very axiomatic presuppositional ground upon which you're building your career, then you don't understand how it's connected to everything else. You don't understand how and you don't even under, you don't even understand deeply the 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 the, the backbone or the, 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 the cornerstone of, 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 of what it is you've dedicated your life towards. No. And there are a lot of people who don't care about that, which is fine. But there also, I think, does need to be a space for people who are interested in, in the foundations. Secret Asian Dan says, how do we get to the point where everyone doesn't have to read Darwin? Well, I mean, I'm sorry, but like, it's kind of like this, this to how me many is... people have read Darwin? Yeah. For, uh, first of all, we already are at the point where you don't have to read Darwin. That's the problem. The issue is that, like, I mean, people read Dawkins or some shit. Like, they don't read Darwin. Darwin's not hard to read. There's no excuses here. It's so, I'm just, if, fundamentally, if you want to have a life of the mind, you have to cultivate fields like a farmer cultivates a pasture. You have to sometimes rototill that shit. And there's no better way to do it than with engagement with singular primary texts. There's just not a substitute. And so it's like, oh, everybody. Well, not everybody needs to do it. But if you want to have a basis in the field of biology, you have to do it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. I just want to make a point about that is that if you want a basis in the field of biology, there should, and this is where the, the, the divide between the sciences and the humanities is ridiculous because I could imagine if you had the humanities ethos in biology, for example, you would have deep literature studies of the evolutionary biologists, right? Like you would have deep literature studies on, you know, not, not only Darwin, but Spencer and, 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 uh, and, and, and all of the, the great evolutionary biologists of the 20th century. Right. You would have deep liter literary engagements and, and see that as an important aspect of the field, you know, kind of like in the same way that, you know, like when Lacan was teaching, he would like not only emphasize, you better reread the actual text that Freud wrote, like you better actually read the foundational text, but he also said the same thing for like, for example, you should be rereading the symposium by Plato every year. Like he said, you should you should be rereading the foundations of Plato every year. It's it's kind of similar to, you know, how I feel like 
people who are really engaged in, for example, the their um, religious tradition, hmm. like you don't like I like the people who are religious, but they never actually read the foundational text right. of the religion, like. Like people who are actually engaged in the religious tradition, they reread the text throughout their entire life. Yeah, and that's because there's a, a field of the of the mind that they are cultivating. And we could say it's really their soul that they're cultivating or something like that. There's a lot of ways of talking about it. And these things mean different things to different people approaching it different ways. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that um, this this oh well well we, we shouldn't have to read it. Well, you know, first of all, you shouldn't have to climb mountains either. And you shouldn't have to be a violin virtuoso either. And you shouldn't have to be the best Tetris player I've ever met. No one's fucking saying that the value framework or the, 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 the hierarchy of recognition uh, that arises around these various fields is one that has to appeal to you or that you have to play by the rules of. Um, but insofar as you think, and insofar as you might be an obsessive thinker, um, and you like to run all over the place and think about all kinds of things, most of those things have a basis in some field somewhere. And that field has been kept out of reach of regular working people. And now, even people who aren't regular working people but are salary track professionals, they even don't come within reach of it. They just know how to cite things that, oh, well, you know, I'll cite Bordeaux because he. I'll talk about Habitus to kind of pull off this part of my essay about whiteness. Oh, I'll talk about Foucault so I can talk about di disciplinary measures and I'll mention the Panopticon because that will show people that I've read shit. Oh, I'll talk about Levi-Strauss and say that structuralism's so passe. I'll, I'll uh, talk about Latour and say that, you know, I'm, I'm basically a nominalist now, so I don't really have to read all these thinkers who use abstraction. Oh, I'm going to just say I don't have to really read you know, Durkheim or, or Weber or Marx or Hegel is another one that in the chat there, um, Secret Agent Dan said, I have a similar line of questions for Hegel. Like, well, how do we get to the point where we don't have to read Hegel? Well, that's kind of like saying, how do we get to the point where we don't have to watch the greatest films ever made? How do we get to the point where we don't have to... See, I don't want to... How do we get to the point where I don't have to see the Great Pyramid? It's like, well, we're at that point. Welcome to base camp. You don't have to do anything. You can put your thumb in your butt and watch TV for the rest of your life, and no one's going to stop you. Everyone's going to say, congratulations, you're doing what you desire. But you're going to die that way, right? You're going to hate your life that way, especially if you're a thinker. Yeah. Well, it's, it's yeah, I mean, to me, my experience of, of climbing up the academic hierarchy is actually that reading the foundational text is actually, in some sense, det detrimental. Because you start asking too many qu foundational questions. Mm. Like, like... The best way to climb an academic hierarchy, at least how academia is set up today, is to just follow the secondary literature in the field, in the specialized field, which your supervisor uh, focuses on and gets funding from. Like, that's the best. Like, if you're just interested in moving up a hierarchy, then that's the best way to do it. Mm hmm but if you start reading foundational texts, you're going to be too difficult to contain. Mm -hmm. You're going to start asking too many questions and you're not going to be easily categorizable. Like, let me give an example again with Darwin is like, cause I read Richard Dawkins and I got influenced by the whole idea of the separation between science and religion. But then I read Charles Darwin and it seemed to me like Darwin's own ideas did not fit easily in that separate categorization scheme, right? Like you start reading the foundational text and you find so many rich nuances that are just lost in the pop translation where it's like, it's not as simple as that. But again, the thing is, is that if you're just reading the pop translations of the foundational texts, you know, your your or or the secondary literature, which is not even in touch with the foundational theoretical ground, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then you're gonna have you know you're gonna have functional simplifications 
which actually um, they might be more uh, amenable to developing a, a specialized research program but they're much less uh, capable of actually sense making in 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 the way that you know the Plato's of the world thought we should to live a a, a life in search of the the good the true and the beautiful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to this, I want to be fair to to Dan in the chat because um, he has said that it feels like he's being misread. And I kind of suspected, you know, I wanted, to, here's the thing. You said it in such a way that it's easy to interpret it as a, the way that people tend to, to bring up an objection to everything that we do. And so that's how we've responded to it. But giving you your due and, and the fact that, uh, what you said is that you feel the current line of discussion is a misreading of the question because you said, at some point, we want everyone to understand some fundamental issues, and the original exploration of them is not the most accessible. And so, I mean, look, uh, Basecamp, it's, a, it's an argument about what Basecamp should be like. Should there be standards at Basecamp? Should people have some basic familiarity with the basic concepts of their life world? Um, and you're probably for saying, yes, everyone should be able to have some basic orientation to all the various fields uh, as a function of a general education without having to do this. But I do like that idea that you get, that the, that you get an orientation with all the fields and you, you pick one to dive into. And if that means that it's engineering, then you actually go and you read like physis, f f uh, physicists. You actually read them. You feed, you read physicists who are also inventors, and you uh, and and you read them in the primary text. Yeah, I, I think that I don't care what it is. I think that you should get a basis in a field, and that an education system that doesn't say, "Hey, are you ready to dive into something?" and then show you a bunch of doorways for wh for where places where you can dive into the deep end is an education system that has failed us. And bringing it back to kind of like us, it's like, it's not really like, oh, we're moralizing because we think everyone should do this. It's that we went for a specific kind of experience, or at least I, at, at university, at some point, I got turned on to a specific kind of experience that I then couldn't find much more of. Like my freshman year, a professor had me basically forced us to read primary texts because I got an F my first week in political and social philosophy because I, did, I just read the Sparks notes and did a quick little summary and uh, focused on my math homework, right? And then he said, you cannot do that because I, I went to his office hours with the F and was like, what is this? Like, what do you expect from me? And he was like, philosophy is not something that you can do at the beach. It's not something that you do in a half hour. It's something that you have to commit as much time as you're giving to math. Right? Like, you really I have guess, to... I guess that's what... Like, for me, I'm not saying that everyone should do this, either. I don't think I don't think we need everyone to read Being in Time. I don't think we need everyone to read The Origin of Species. I don't think we need everyone to read Phenomenology of Spirit. But I certainly think that if our education system and our university system is not is not dedicated towards having contact with the foundational ground, mm -hmm. then that's problematic. Right. And so Dan said it could be that the original texts are very accessible, just not with our current educational baseline. And to that point, I would there was agree a, with that. there was a time like Mark said he was trying to write in a way where workers could understand him in almost everything he wrote. And then if you go read that shit today, that is not easy to understand. And so there has been a dumbing down effect. And uh, Neil Postman in Amusing Ourselves to Death talks about how uh, the citizenry of the settlers coming to the United States, um, the the pilgrims and such. The, the literacy rate was like 98% for men, 97% for women, and this was a literacy rate that meant that they could read uh, 
I don't think Kierkegaard was around just yet, was he? Um, but they could definitely read the King James Bible. They could read the Iliad. They could read they could any you know, Homer in general. And so it's like uh, that's and Shakespeare. That's a level that uh, people are not really obtaining anymore. And obviously, digitalization, you know, is to blame. There's a new. There's I've, we've we're in a new media time, and so books are a little anachronistic in a lot of people's minds. But no amount of listening yeah. to podcasts or, or, or watching YouTube videos uh, or while you're multitasking is ever going to suffice. And that's kind of what our role is. Our role is to say, look, if you're having fun doing that, great. It's entertainment. But if you're just looking to, 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 to find some confirmation bias and some things to pad out your worldview and some rhetorical tricks so that you can convince other people that you're not stupid and that you're not evil. Like, f for sure, like th this, 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 this thing that we're appearing on in front of you today is going to serve up a lot of options. But it's very rare that you will find somebody, even on BookTube, who's going to say, I can't do it for you. And the reason for this, it's not just that the educational baseline is too low, Dan. It's more importantly, I think this is like the, the more serious issue, is that our expectations have been lowered, that our goals have been lowered, and that the, the issue with this is that we're never going to get to a point where the working class, much less anybody, wants to have its time energy if we don't have higher aspirations. So the thing is, is like every time somebody has the fear of missing out and gets frustrated or feels the time energy fragility of being like, I can't keep up with you guys, Cadell, you're just going too hard, man. Phenomenology is spirit. And now it's the science of logic. And now it's the accrue. Slow down. Like, what are you doing? Like, we can't keep up with you. This is not right. Or, or to me, like being in time in the summer, are you fucking crazy? No, absolutely not. Uh, yeah, well, get, just wait until the, the winter. We're going to do Totality and Infinity. And then in the spring, we're going to do Das Kapital. And I, no shame, no regrets. And it's going to be over and over again because it is the most rewarding thing a person can do. And it's been we've been sold a fake bill of goods. We've been sold the idea that Netflix and marijuana is a, is a suitable uh, uh, exchange for having a life of the mind. And I love, I love Netflix, I love marijuana. That has nothing to do with it. The fact is, is like we need challenges. We need mountains. And if we don't take them on, and this is where I kind of want to turn to, then we just get caught in the, we just get caught in the, what were you calling it? The hedonistic spiral. You get a hedonistic loop. The loop. Yeah. And so. Yeah, I mean, and, and it, I mean, did you, want to, did you want to say something else there? I can also... I want to hear about the hedonistic loop and death drive and how you concept, how you think about this. Well, I was just going to say, you know, like, I was going to make comment on, on you know, the project that's unfolding uh, there with you in the with Theory Underground. And, uh, you know, I've got my own sort of project, which, which has a certain intellectual backbone. And it's like, you know... What what are what are these what are these pro what is the the higher order meaning or purpose of, of of this drive which I think is 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 worth worth reflecting on and for me I'll I'll reflect on it in in two contexts the first context is what I would say is the decay and the erosion of the academic institutions where I feel like a lot of people are not sort of um, um, not only not engaged, but not convinced that we're really within a uh, meritocratic uh, society anymore. That, that, that this is that this is this is the, the place of higher lo learning has itself become eroded. The other context would be at least what I've engaged with, which is like the broadly speaking, what's called the liminal web, which is basically people who are recognizing that the institutions have failed and they're trying to organize with other like-minded people online in terms of we need to build a new world but a lot of the times it's very naive when it comes to the, to the foundational theoretical texts 
So I feel like on the one hand, we've got decayed institutions, rotting institutions. On the other hand, we've got a lot of energy from engaged people on the liminal web who want to do something real. They want to, they want to change. They, they want to build something. They want to build an alternative way, an alternative way of learning, an alternative way of living, an alternative way of thinking about life. And I think what, at least the way I conceptualize philosophy portal and the way I conceptualize theory underground is that we're not going to be able to build something that in some sense outcompetes the institutions or is better than the institutions or that, you know, engages some higher order network dynamic unless we're in touch with foundational theory. We need the foundational theory in order to build in some sense the new world, I think. And, right. and at least that's, that's what, I mean, that's where my sort of drive is going is that we're in the void. We're in the void between two systems. We're in the void between, on the one hand, the legacy institutions of the industrial era of modern capitalism. Mm -hmm. And we're in the void between that and something which is, seems impossible to define. If we're just paying attention to the way our networks are actually acting, it's something related to digital network dynamics, but we don't know how to connect that and ground that to family dynamics. We don't know how to connect that and ground that to building a sustainable life and career and, and identity. And, and that's all very fragmented. Mm. And I think that you know, engaging like a project on your side, like being in time and does capital. Well, that is very interesting. That's very intriguing. You know, how far can you take that combo? How far can you take that project? Right. For, for me and in, in, in my drive, you know, trying to work with phenomenology of spirit and logic is basically, we need to have, we need to understand how phenomenological journeys unfold. That's my idea here. We need to understand how phenomenological journeys unfold. We need to understand the foundation of modern logic. And then, you know, with psychoanalysis, we need to understand the bare bones of, of, of the discovery of the unconscious. And what can you do with that? I think that if you, if you have a deep understanding of phenomenology, if you have a deep understanding of logic, if you have a deep understanding of the unconscious, that's going to help us avoid silly mistakes when it comes to building out new networks and building out a new world. I hope so. That's what it's about. You know, so it's not just everyone read these books. I don't think that I think that there's a certain number of people who are attracted to philosophy portal. There are probably a certain number of people attracted to theory underground who are just theory nerds. <laughs> yeah, you know, like they go hard, like they go hard into the theory and they love it. And it's their jouissance and it's their death drop. Right. And it's their excess. It's their excess enjoyment is they want to do that. Like they're paying to do that. Right. And I'm trying to facilitate the best possible education I can in that direction. But what I hope is, is that the consequence of our work. And I think there's many overlaps and synergies. I hope the consequence of our work is that that has ripple effects in the liminal web. Because if it has ripple effects in the liminal web, what it means is that the philosophical discourse is, is higher. Meaning, for example, is that can we improve the discourse around sexual difference? Well, that's why we're doing what is sex. That's a right. big topic, right? Is that important? It seems like it's absolutely central. Because what's the ground of civilization? The, the ground, the mo motor of civilization is sexual difference and the family structures and the community structures which, which emerge around sexual difference. Can you have a community? Can you have a society? Can you reproduce a community in a society without understanding sexual difference? Literally impossible. So we're, uh, well, we're not just, you know, I'll just end there. It was possible because because people just lived well, in traditional people had religious societies. Structures. Right, exactly. They just had religious well, structures. Had religious just, structures, which right. was let's say the unconscious externalized. Right. And and socialized and ritualized and mythologized. Right. And and you know and and that's and but the thing is is that 
we're at a place in our evolution where we have this collision between primal drives and a virtual global web, which has, in some sense, revealed our unconscious to us. And we cannot, you know, we cannot, uh, at least the majority of us, cannot go back to a pre-modern mythological understanding of the world. That doesn't hold things together. That doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't, so, and, and I understand, I understand people who want to go back to something like that. It, again, provides comfort for the identity, stability. It provides a, a, a global whole. It provides a coherence. But I, I just, I just don't think that that's going to cut it for, for the majority of people and I just think there are so many challenges and so many paradoxes which the modern mind confronts, which you're not going to be able to confront without philosophy. And in some sense, that's the revenge of philosophy. I've called it the revenge of philosophy because I grew up at a time where philosophy was, in some sense, perceived as dead. You know, like you have physicists like Stephen Hawking who say philosophy is dead. You'll have the emergence of a lot of science popularizers who would give you the, the, the point of view, which all we need is science now and philosophy is over. You know, all you need is some evolutionary biology and some cosmology and, and, and you know, you can patch up the rest of the things with some liberal democracy. Exactly. You know, but, but that, but that, 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 I think we're, we're reaching the end of that point of view. Yeah. And we're having the reemergence of philosophy. And I think that this reemergence of philosophy, and I call the revenge of philosophy, mm. is coming at the same time. It's coinciding with the reemergence of geopolitics as a serious question. Because after the end of the Cold War, we have, for example, the divide between the capitalist and the communist world and that falling. And you have the emergence of a sort of general global liberalism. And there's this idea that the world is open now. There are no more major geopolitical problems anymore. That, you know, <laughs> we're all going to be one sort of, you know, liberalist international community. And I think that that image, I think that fantasy is, is, is over now. And I think that we're having the reemergence of geopolitics. We're having the reemergence of serious... Uh, let's say multipolar conflict yes and the world and and the world is not the world is not as open as we presumed under a sort of neoliberal idea right it's it and and i think the other and i think difference and i think cultural differences and i think just the other the neighbor mm -hmm. is becoming more like to maybe bring up something that might be relevant to think about in a levinasian uh, way Right. Uh, is, 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 is in need of deep reflection because yeah, we, we have our little tribes, we have our little communities, we have our little niche groupings to survive yeah. in, in, in the yeah. world. And we always have, humans always have. The, well, that's our the, spontaneous tribal mind. Right. But in a society where you are, Deal with the real on a daily basis where you might not get clean water and you might die. Where people you know, like babies are dying, women are dying in childbirth, where death is ever present, right? Negation is a lot more present. The real is something that people are kind of forced to tarry with, uh, especially in places that are inhospitable, like uh, especially places like desert dwelling people or rural people who are out in the thick of it in the sticks. Uh, the tendency is, obviously you look out for your own first, but there is always this sort of, uh, no, I can't say always, but this tradition to be hospitable to the neighbor, which does not mean you better believe everything I believe if I'm going to let you into my house and you get to break bread with me. No, no, try to fucking see if that will fly in the desert. No, 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 no. You see some other people and, and you break bread together it's not about like, oh, 
What do you believe? Obviously, if there's like a religious crusade underway or if the U.S. is propping up fascists in Saudi Arabia, then obviously there might be something like that going on. But the tendency is hospitality. And Levinas is fundamentally like the thinker of ethics and hospitality. And this means not collapsing radically other singular entities, cultures, etc., into your frame, into your value constructs, into, no, we can try to be empathetic, but we shouldn't let empathy or, or, or inability to connect uh, reduce the other in a way that makes them easy to discard. You might not want to have, have someone be a part of your everyday existence, right? But we live on a really big, big planet. And the, the, the fact is, is like right now, this sort of, oh, philosophy's dead, science has it figured out, progressivism correlates with technology, and we're all just better every day, uh, except for the people who are going to die out, and they're the ones obstructing progress. It's pure colonialism. It's pure imperialism. It's pure uh, reductionism of all otherness into sameness, right? And so that's where Levinas really provides the language for thinking about this. He's thought about it more than anyone else um, ever. I mean, I know that other thinkers have a lot to contribute on this end, but no, Levinas is the thinker of this. And it's sad that he gets co-opted by naive progressivism, right? He gets co-opted as, uh, like, he, he's almost cited in a religious way by someone like Judith Butler, right? Like, she, she thinks that she can found a politics on him when he's fundamentally an anti-political thinker. I have to I have to actually say what that means. Like Game of Thrones. Who's the good guys in Game of Thrones? The Hunter Rentian, Emmanuel Levinasian positions. They're two positions, but they both have the same basic agreement, which is that there's not a correct side. It's no there's there's good people, right? So if you watch Game of Thrones, Tyrion is a good person. He's flawed, but he's a good person. There are other people who are way more flawed, but they have their good moments that get cultivated and crushed. Um and then you've got people who completely opt out of the entire war and they just try to be good people and have a good life uh, and take care of their own. And Levinas is, go is thinking, you know what, look, not everyone has to be a political totalitarian like war communism is forever. The, we, we, we have to remember that humans need to be human still. And if we're fighting for a future where humans don't get to be humans, then fuck off. Right, and so what he's for when I say he's a he's a political he's an anti political thinker, the first pages of Totality and Infinity are basically saying, thinking that war creates the conditions for peace, is the presupposition of all statecraft. It's the it's also the presupposition of most philosophers, and he says no, the peace is peace, and war as the presupposition for peace. That's not. Morality. If he says he says that the, you know, you get this cynical sneer from people who say, "Oh, morality, right?" Because they're the realists. They're the hard realists. They're the Churchills and Trotskys of the world, and they just go, "No, we're the real deal. We see through all this morality bullshit." And obviously, I'm a, a sort of Nietzschean Marxist a, a, in a sense, so I can understand and appreciate the critique of moralism that you'll see by someone like Jonas Cheka in his How to Philosophize with a Hammer and Sickle. Um, but <laughs> no, I, do you know about that book? No, but I think it's a funny saying. It's great. Yeah, it, it, he just put that out pretty recently. Jonas Cheka used to be Cuck Philosophy, you know. Um, that's his first book. Oh, okay, book. okay, okay. Yeah, I know Cuck Philosophy. Yeah, How to, how to Philosophize with a Hammer and Sickle, where he kind of teases out similarities between Nietzsche <laughs> and Marx. Yeah. And I'm all about that because we hate moralizing, but that doesn't make, make it so that we just give up on trying to figure out what's right and how to live a good life and how to you know, live in a world with other people where they get to have a dignified life. And if we give up on that project, then I don't care. Anyone who's given up on that project, your politics is shit. I don't care about it. I hope you lose. And uh, you know, I, I've, I've brought up the word anti-politics a couple times on stream because really like I, I think – um, I, I, at this point, my position is anti-political in a sense. It, I, I'm for radical politics, but I think the conditions for radical politics come from a period of moratorium spent doing anti-politics, which is theory that critiques all existing ideology and gets to the heart of every 
fundamental human question philosophically. And if we don't, if we can't give ourselves the, the questions in the chat, well, like, oh, well, how do we raise the baseline for civilization? How do you raise the baseline for yourself? Why don't you think about yourself before you think about the big other? The big other doesn't care about you. Why don't you think about how do you raise the baseline for yourself? The easy answer is right now, you're watching this. Right now, you're interested in these things. You might not be later. So give it everything you've got right now. Don't fuck around and waste your life. Someday, you know, these people, they exist. You, see, you meet them. Oh, I used to study philosophy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I really liked Nietzsche. Oh, yeah, I liked Plato. And they're drinking and they've not studied it for like 30 or 40 years. They had a time, right? And it's like, yeah, you're fucking hanging out, bullshitting, and most of what you're doing was talking without a basis and actually reading and reflecting rigorously. And now you, you say you've had, you gave it its due. No, you didn't give it its due. Anything that's worth doing seriously, if you're going to talk about how you did it, do it seriously. And so like for me, I'm not signed up necessarily to be a philosopher for the rest of my life. Maybe after I write the books that I know I need to write, it's over, right? But all I can say is while I'm doing it, I'm going to give it everything I've got. And that comes with a sacrifice in a sort of sense. But it's not one that makes me virtuous. It's one that just means you should just – when you see me – doing a two-day marathon, give me a high five, give me a drink of water, you know, but don't, don't do this all, oh my Maybe God. Maybe a couple of tacos. A couple of tacos, please. Maybe a uh, couple of tacos. Donate to the street, <laughs> donate to the tour fund, you know, but it's not, it's not like, it's not like, like, oh, this is, this is amazing. No, no, no. This is just a different way of giving myself a hard time. And it's a way that's better than what it could have been. And so I like, I like what you're doing. On the one side, practically, this is – some people need this, right, in the way that we're talking about. They just need it. On the other side, hopefully something good could come of it, right? Well, I think if, if you're reading philosophy properly, it's going to have a, a self-transformative effect, right? Like and, and, and also, you know, like – well, the thing is, is you can read – well, I guess my view is is if you're reading philosophy in a sort of detached, passive way, in such you can just pick it up and put it down, and if nothing has fundamentally changed in 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 moving through in moving through philosophy, then it's it's not like it, it's not it hasn't been engaged with by like it depends on how you're engaging with it. It's almost like how you engage with philosophy is, to my mind, more important even... Like, it requ the text requires your engagement with it. Right. The books... The, it, there is the objective book. There's the object, there, there's the object, there's the subject. And what's really important is the dynamic between the two. And, and you being, in some sense... There has to almost... I would almost say, like, there has to be... Like, don't engage with philosophy unless there's almost, in some sense, the a priori decision that you need to read philosophy. <laughs> you know, you I know, agree. like, and yeah. then go into it. Like, for example, for me, I didn't read science before there was an a priori necessity within me to to read science and be transformed by it. And the same thing with philosophy. I didn't start reading philosophy until there was an a priori necessity inside of me. Say, so I need this now. And I need to be transformed by this. And I think that, you know, in in both those cases, you know, there, there's something that I'll never look at the world the same way again. I'll never look at the self the same way again. Right. And and that changes the way it changes. It changes the way that I uh, experiment, engage with other people, build life projects. Think about my relationship to family and 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 old age and 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 you know the minutia of day to day life. I'm excited to grow old, right? Like in a sort of sense. Like obviously, my back hurts quicker and all of these other kinds of issues that develop over time. But no, I've I, philosophy is investing in having a good final thirty years. Right. Philosophy, philosophy for on that specific issue, philosophy has matured my idea of immortality and eternity and infinity 
to the point where I no longer think of those things as um, detached or disconnected from my day-to-day -day life process. Hmm. Like, uh, you know, like, I mean, that's like Hegel 101 is that like infinity and infinitude are not disconnected. Mm -hmm. infinity and finitude are, are are deeply connected and it you know in some sense your finite life process is infinity <laughs> you know that is that is infinity and so I, I, if, if, I, you, if you really if you really let that sink in like if you, I mean if you yeah. really let that idea consume the shit out of you I mean that that changes my whole view on evolution that changes my whole idea of religion that changes my that changes the whole way i conceive of myself and my participation in spirit right i would just throw in there like i don't i i'm guessing we probably have we, had, we would have to like sit here and actually flesh out like what is your metaphysics where are you coming from what are you what are you getting at how are you using these words and it's a conversation I want to have, but really I don't – I also just want to read your books. But um, the main thing I wanted to say is just that – yeah, some – I think it was just a couple of years of philosophy broke me of the idea that it's like this evangelical creationist you know, picture of heaven and hell versus nothingness as this like – no, actually nothing. Um, and that – what I mean is, this is like you can't go with the greatest minds from the history of ideas for very long without realizing how little we actually know. Without, you know, part of what you learn is you, you flesh out the, the structure or the limits, the parameters on what can be known. And in doing so, like really get, gaining a more robust sense for it, you realize like the preachers selling us eternal life or eternal nothingness, they're, they're salesmen selling comfort food. And there are <laughs> way bigger, you know, it's like a, a little bit of theory of time shows us that they're like the main competing theories, which are all things that work within a physicist's sort of worldview, um, allows for more possibilities than the ones that are on the table. And so it's just like, I just think that these dogmatic, ideological, oh, it's this way. Oh, it's that way. Oh, the other way is stupid. It's just like, it shuts off from like the, re the richer possibilities and close it forecloses the most important questions. Oh, those have been figured out. Go back to sleep. Go back to just YouTubing. Don't worry about it. You know, just go play Elder Scrolls and listen to Chapo Trap House. You don't have to fucking do anything, right? Like, just go listen to Joe Rogan and, and, and go fishing. Like, and, and both of those activities, by the way, are valid. I'm 100% a fan of a game that's as difficult as, say, Elder Scrolls that is like a genuine thing that you can take on for like a couple weeks and just give your life over to it. In the same way that I am like a huge fan of fishing, in the same way that I'm a fan of, or I'm not a fan of, but you know, I totally see the appeal of Rogan and Chapo. Well, I'm just saying. Well, it depends on it depends on your it depends on the way you're subjectively approaching it. Like if you subjectively if you subjectively approach Netflix in the right way, it's actually a gold mine. Absolutely. Like you can like you can learn a lot from like the, there's certain documentaries I'll watch or certain TV like even watching like I've I've gotten a lot of philosophical ideas from watching Game of Thrones. One hundred percent. Like yeah. even for example, like a, a political analysis or like a psychological analysis of our of our culture right now. Like for example, with Game of Thrones, the idea I had was that isn't it like really interesting that the most popular TV show in the world has totally annihilated the boundary between um, typical storytelling and cinema and pornographic violence and sexuality. Like there's no like. I'm almost like my senses were a, like my senses were disoriented watching Game of Thrones precisely because they'll show you sexual and sexual scenes and violent scenes which most movies and cinema traditionally speaking do not show and cut away from. 
Right. And I'm like, they're not cutting away from this. They're not cutting away from this. They're showing me this. Like, and I'm affronted by my, it's almost like the line gets blurred, you know, but like, what's going on? Like, but there's, I have a philosophical question. What's going on there? Because in a typical story, you know, in a typical, again, typical movies, typical TV shows, you know, there's again, this clear cut difference between pornography, the real, which is just too much, too unbearable to, which basically break the story and and traditional storytelling where you say everything except that it's kind of like not there you know so and, and at the same time that's the most popular tv show like it's the most watched so you know what does that say about our culture right now what does that say about us right now you know that that line has been obliterated we're just gonna show I, I, you someone getting like boiling hot Oh my Lava god. Lava poured gold? on their skull. Yeah, melted gold. Yeah. Melted Pour- gold. I'm, I'm like, oh my god, I'm seeing this. <laughs> they, I, with that said, though, it's not glorified like a movie like 300, where the, 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 the fighting is perfor- like slow motion and, and sexy. It's not it, like that. It's, yeah. it's much more. It's much more. Um, it's much more visceral and real. Like it's not like you know, like like a typical, like a, like a, in like typical, like almost ridiculous, ridiculous caricatures of violent scenes. Right. Like where it's almost like you're. It's so ridiculous. It's so unreal that it doesn't affect you. With right. Game of Thrones, there are certain scenes which are so difficult to watch. I have to get up and leave the room. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, so Anne and I, am I the only one who feels that way? (laughs) No, no, Anne, Anne is watching it for the first time with me. Um, She never thought she would get into it. I, I made her promise. I said I would watch like a season of Glee if she would watch the first season of Game of Thrones. And so I watched a few seasons of Glee uh, because it's something that's, you're a saint. Yeah, it's a way for her to de-stress because it's like comfort food or whatever. And, you know, for me, it is actually stressful. It actually stresses me out. But the – but in, in, a, in, in a way, it's worse than Game of Thrones in a sense. But anyway, so when we finally, when we finally started watching Game of Thrones – I'm not going to use any spoilers here because we're still watching it and she's not through it yet. Uh, but basically, you know, I, I said, look, there's only a couple seasons that I really want you to see so that you can get a couple – shared reference points with me and actually care about a couple of basic characters. And after that, you don't have to commit to finishing it. And besides, there's only five seasons anyway. I don't count the rest of the seasons because, look, the books aren't finished being written yet and the director just went off the rails. So uh, she got really hooked, though, right? She, she got really hooked. And so for me, it's like one of the best shows with stakes, and a, and a lot of different plot developments all going on in a, in a, in a way that's like character development in an overarching plot. It's just like there's nothing really better. And, I mean, if they would do a proper Dune TV show, maybe, right? But for now, there's no, comp- no competitor. And so the – but mainly it's about politics. People think, oh, it's about swords and knights or whatever. No, it's about politics and it's about the real. And so you're saying, you know, bringing up the yeah, the yeah. fundamental. Yeah. No, it, it 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 shows you the real. It's 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 trying to force you to tarry with the negative, and you watch it as entertainment, but then it takes you out of entertainment, and you're not in entertainment anymore, and it makes you just sit there, no, and you you don't sit there, you get up and walk out. It's there no, are no, scenes. It 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 assaults you. Yeah. Like I, that's how I feel while watching. I, I feel I, I, I feel I feel uh, I feel assaulted but I, but it's also again this I just to bring it back to like the main the main point I think of this this talk is that depending on how you are subjectively oriented you can find deep philosophy everywhere you can find deep philosophy on Netflix like and that's the thing and that's one of the things actually that Slavoj Žižek taught me is that is is that this traditional divide between a ivory tower philosopher and watching Netflix is a false divide. Uh, that that actually Netflix could be a source. You could find your next book. You could find an, your next book idea 
uh watching watching netflix and of course zizek is famous for like for my my first introduction to zizek was watching pervert's guide to ideology where he's all the time making interesting observations using cinema and you know like like one of my favorite like one of my favorite like examples from pervert's guide to ideology is like his his commentary on titanic like what if titan what if the boat didn't hit the iceberg right and his, you know, his analysis that, that Jack, like his, his analysis that Jack and Rose totally would have fallen apart within two weeks. Like Jack going to, <laughs> Jack going to New York with Rose and like Rose leaves her rich family and, you know, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then she would have basically, it would, she would have ended up like Rockefeller's mom, right? Married to uh, some you know, basically guy who can't get serious, who's probably off scamming people while she's trying, while she's living D class A, like trying to, yeah. Yeah. No, it wouldn't have, it would have been miserable. Wouldn't have helped. But just that, just like that. I think like what I want to say is like methodologically speaking, the important thing there is that if you really let philosophy transform you or also psychoanalysis transform you or anything that you're really passionate about transform you in that intellectual sense, the whole way you're going to see the world, the whole way you're going to engage the world is going to be different. I know for me, it's, it's to the point where I find rich material in conversations with my partner, conversations with my friends, com you know, just going about my daily life it it it's in some sense by the by my very self transformation my entire life has become philosophically enriched mm -hmm. and 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 there's something very liberating about that there's something you know i don't i don't see the world the same way it's not that the world changes but the way i see it has changed and the way i engage with it has changed and 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 that is, I think, the the I want to say the gift of philosophy. It's also, in some sense, the curse of philosophy because you can also feel very alienated in that process. You can also feel very, you know, you can also feel like you you've lost something and and a certain naive relationship to the world, which is true. And 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 in some sense, philosophy is is very disturbing. Um. And, and well, that's, I think, why, like, that's why also I'm doing Philosophy Portal is because you can be disturbed with others. <laughs> yes. and it, You're not totally alone. Yeah, and so, like, I just want to, like, say as a sort of point, like, here, if you don't feel the challenge, because th there's, there's on the one side, people bring up objections to everything we're saying just to see what we'll say to them because they know that if they were to take on this line – then they themselves would have to deal with uh, these kinds of objections, um, which is fair. Uh, but there's also just the fact that like you might not be sold on something and you're perusing a lot of different things and you've not dived in deep on any of them yet. And if you're torn between learning how to DJ versus play the violin versus bike ride marathon or you know or whatever the fuck, like, and then philosophy is like something else that you're interested in, my bit, my main thing I'm advocating for is, don't don't feel like oh I'm judging you if you haven't dived in yet. Uh, no, but be a, be a, just be a, just know that there is such a thing as diving in, and that committing to something is even if it's just for a few months or a couple years, um, inherently worthwhile. It will forever be rewarding at the, in the subjective sense that Cadell is bringing up. But I would say it also changes the fundamental reality of existence itself and that there is an actual ripple effect oh, yeah. and that um, the, the main thing is that – look, the, the book, you said you know, you're talking about the subject that re, you know, engages with this object. But it also has to be like this reciprocally determining sort of unfolding dialectical uh, thing. And, you know, you, you brought it to it's good enough if it keeps you out of trouble in other ways, <laughs> right? If, if it's good enough. If, uh, but also, like, there's hope that it is also doing good for the world. Um, and then uh, my, my main contention is there's just There's certainly this. an orientation towards the good. There's an the, the, orientation the, towards the good? 
Are we having a, we're having a, b a bunch of people come in? We just got two people to join. I know one of them. I don't know the other one, but I think the other one is probably just using a different name. Um, if we're getting raided by trolls, we'll find out soon if we get pornography plastered all over everything. Um, right. Uh, Someone's, Hillary's name just changed to Todd McGowan. Oh, okay. So Todd's here early. Perfect. Uh, is it early or are we over time? Let's double check really quick. I'm a little early, Dave. Ah, uh, welcome, Hi, Todd. Todd. <laughs> hey, hey. How you doing? Welcome to the party. <laughs> welcome to the party. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So we, how early are you? Um, let's see. Double check. Uh, four I think minutes. five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So actually, you know, with that, I'm going to roll the the PSA that we play, and then we'll come back uh, for the conversation with Todd. So. Um, uh, Cadell, would you like to say any closing uh, words here? I thought for some reason I, I got a half hour off. I thought that it was in a half hour. Uh, my timer was even wrong. So sorry about that, Todd. But well, I mean, I so like we we titled we titled it "Killing Ourselves with Text," and right. and I think that the like like at least for me, like it's certainly not saying everyone should do this. <laughs> certainly not. However, what it what it is saying, what I or what I am what I would say, is that if you think like if, if you're sort of peripherally interested in philosophy and you think that you can just get by with memes and theorygram and like social media postings, like if you think that is uh, a philosophical education, and if you think that you don't need to engage in the actual texts and develop your own writing capacities. Like I was talking with Master Signified Bodies, Andrew, about this, which is that he recognizes that the memeing and, and the theorygram stuff, that's very creative. And there's something incredibly skilled in being able to make those connections and make those memes. But we're talking, it does not replace developing your own writing and developing your own relationship to the actual text. Right. And in fact, we need to have a, a deeper relationship between these two because they're both important. And, 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 and I think like what I always saw in Theory Underground and what I try to do with Philosophy Portal is to, is to, bri is to bridge that divide because I think philosophy is spontaneously in, in a lot of people's intuitions coming up as, 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 as important for the cultural moment. And if, and if you're a part of that, I think that the way you should view Theory Underground and Philosophy Portal and organizations like that is that these are new openings and, 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 and avenues for you to really enrich and deepen your understanding and your engagement in philosophy beyond just a meme, beyond just, a, beyond just an image. And um, that's, that's really what I think these initiatives are for. And But on, in a general sense, we could say that if you want to escape a hedonistic neoliberal loop in a personal sense, I do think you have to find some higher object to die into or to forget yourself into. You know, that, that doesn't have to be philosophy. You know, like for me, before becoming an academic, it was a athletics. Like, and I, I in some sense, died and, and sacrificed myself into athletics. It, it, could be many, it could be many different things. But at least for, you know, our purposes and what we're aiming towards it, it it is you know philosophy and and i do think in some sense there is a revenge of philosophy and philosophy is no longer going to be just a a peripheral activity with the sciences in the mainstream i think actually it's the reverse that we're going back to the foundational text because we realize we really need this stuff perfect you know, that's a All right. fantastic close for now. Thank you so much for joining us, Cadell. Everybody, I'm going to roll the PSA, and then we'll be right back with Todd McGowan. Take care. See you on the other side. And now a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. 
Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important yet neglected for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 tier is too much, consider donating towards meals and gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the U.S., where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events, not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash US hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being and Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory, a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at Tier 3, you also get access to the Recovery Group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? One of the most succinct and cutting edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. 
Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, people tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah, and seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye. We interrupt this conversation for a quick message from our sponsors. All of Theory Plebe's content has been demonetized and self-funded for over a year. Plebe and Mikey work in warehouses while using what little time with energy that remains to do what they love, Theory. Part of Plebe's goals for 2022 is to focus on getting Mikey free from wage labor. To free his time-energy from its reduction to labor power. Why? Because Plebe has learned more from Mikey than almost any professor or book, and if Mikey can get his time energy, then he would be able to teach real online courses and publish video essays and that backlog of books he is always being obstructed from finishing. If you were unaware, Michael had a special kind of working living arrangement that made it possible for him to focus on nothing but the study of philosophy for six hours per day. Not just leisure reading, but struggling to articulate the hardest and most revolutionary concepts in the life of the mind. Mikey's standard was this, if he could not explain it to a guy on a bar stool at the pub, then he did not understand it. But by the time Michael was ready to begin making his wealth of knowledge accessible through courses and books, tragedy struck. Now he has to work full time and support his mother. That is why we must pound sign for E Mikey before we can free ourselves. Towards the end of this video, when Todd McGowan and Andrew of Master Signified Bodies both leave to go to bed, Michael Downs explains why Deleuze is an absolute genius. And then he breaks down what Heidegger means by being in a way that is more accessible and clarifying than anything you will ever find on the subject, anywhere else. Promise. If you think you have lots to learn from him, or that the world of theory would more generally benefit from freeing him from wage labor, then consider supporting at www.patreon.com The dangerous may be.
If you are one of the graduate students or professors in classrooms around the world who have found Michael's posts from the Dangerous Maybe blog helpful, then stop what you are doing and give a little back. He should have leisure time too. It will only help all of us. Pound sign for E. Mikey every dollar gets him closer to having his time dash energy again. Thank you for listening to this message from our sponsors, by whom we of course mean you, once you have helped in the struggle to pound sign for E. Mikey. P.S. When Mikey gets freed he will solve the riddle of history, complete a system of German idealism. Explain the body without organs without dumbing it down. Write the most important book on consumerism in America, and teach courses that are introductory and graduate level alike. All right, everybody, and welcome to welcome back to the stream. Um, today, I'm about to introduce Todd. Everyone knows who he is, but I'm, before I introduce him, I just wanted to say, I just got back and I see that we received a $50 donation. It's the first donation for the Theory Underground Tour Fund. Um, we've been streaming for nine hours, and we finally got $50, so thank you. You know, I should just go work in Amazon again. I'd be making better money than this. But, um, hey, uh, I guess the thing I want to say before uh, I officially do the introduction thing, because I kind of re record that separate so that I can always uh, re, you know, present it in, in its own isolated video later, um, is that uh, on the stream side, I absolutely love that you're all here. I think that you're all amazing. But I also just realized that after a stream with Cadell where we're talking about going hard, some of you might get the idea that um, you should go as hard as I am right now and actually try to do this whole thing without breaks. Nance, you should go skateboarding. For real. If, if any, everybody should go do something. Don't just do this all day. Make sure to drink water. Make sure to eat food. Don't just do this all day. Um, I, I, I need to, I, I'm doing push-ups between this, like, come on, get, don't forget about your body. That's, that's the main thing I just wanted to say. And now I'm going to click the record button here and we're off. So welcome everybody to Theory Underground. I am the host, David McCarricker, and today we are now joined by Todd McGowan. Welcome to the stream. Oh, uh, Dave, thanks for having me. I actually, you know, I, not only is it an honor, as always, and I'm just delighted to be able to have a conversation with you again. Um, but you're in the middle of so much stuff right now with the LAC conference. And so... Right. That's was, coming up in a day. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you instrumental in organizing it or do you just have to prepare? No, no. I am the... Hillary, my spouse, and I are the organizers. We're the only organizers. So, you know, so somebody has to cancel or arrange their thing. Like... Can I speak on Thursday night? I want to be on a panel with this person. So that we have to handle all that kind of stuff. So it's amazing the amount of, uh, I don't mean to complain because it's great, but the amount of like individual attention everyone seems to require. Not everyone, like three quarters of the people are just put me wherever, that's fine. And then there's a quarter who seem like they're everyone. So, uh, <laughs> that's, but it's, it's, it's great. So I, I would, but it, I, it's great, but it's the last time I'm ever going to do it. So uh, this is going to be the last lack that I am that's here at Vermont for sure. So for if real? someone else wants to do it somewhere else, that's fine. But that's fine. You want to do it wherever you are. That is totally no, good, no, I want to I want to organize it in Raytown, Missouri to make all of these people come to Mikey because oh, <laughs> he be can't great. he can't attend he when he can't it's go to them. Right. He can't go to them. Yeah. Right. And so for the folks uh, who are kind of just coming into the call, maybe you don't know about the marathon stream that's been going on, um, or any of it, I just want to welcome everybody. Um, Todd McGowan is the author of a lot of very important books on psychoanalysis, desire, capitalism, identity politics, etc., etc. You can find a lot of conversations that he has had on the internet. He's talked to a lot of people. Um, and today is, is kind of a weird weird situation. Basically, this was going to be a conversation with Michael Downs of The Dangerous Maybe, who is one of the most, if not most, devoted students of Todd and his work. And, uh, you know, I, I get, basically, I get the benefit of Mikey having put in 
decades of work into theory, then having it kind of gel thanks to you and your Y Theory podcast, as well as your lectures and your books, which he's been just binging while working for the last several years, where a lot of it came together for him. And Mikey's been my sort of uh, tutor in all things Lacanian and Zizekian. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to, it's not his fault that I'm just slow sometimes. And so I don't want him to take the full brunt of responsibility for the fact that I get it wrong. But, you know, I just, uh, I, I, we both have Mikey as a shared reference uh, in this way. You know, he, he's learning from Miguel and I'm learning from him. And we've never had a conversation on this channel just one on one. And I thought that this would be a really cool opportunity to, to talk about Mikey, actually, yeah. because, because yeah. he wants to be at LAC more than anything. And today, he was supposed to be in this slot to talk about the hashtag free Mikey thing that I've been pushing for at least two years now. And, but he can't. He has to drive long distance. He's doing like a delivery route to a different state. Um, and it's, it's outside of his normal hours of operation. And so, um, it's really, it's debilitating and, and it's exasperating and it's really sad because he's got books in him that need to come out. Right. Yeah. 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 And yeah. So it's I terrible. And I, I even tried to, I'm like, look, we can waive the conference fee. We can find you, you know, you can stay with us or we can find you a place to stay. So you don't have a hotel fee. But it was the time off of work, right, and the and the travel. So he still couldn't he still couldn't make it. So, you know, it's it yeah, it's just it's debilitating. It's tragic. And uh, you know, I I I remember uh, I went straight through from undergrad to graduate school. But I I had to work and you know I worked even through college. But uh, in the summers in graduate school, so I have TA in the, in the during school and then the summer I had to work and I just remember working eight to five and then trying to trying to even read it was just mm -hmm. it was just almost impossible right like mm -hmm. there's something just mind numbing about so about that schedule so I find it so impressive that he was able to not only read an immense amount of theory while working that schedule but even to read it while working two different jobs right like like I remember he told me he's like this is my favorite story about him that he read basically Slavoj's collected works on a, his phone while working as a as a checking the IDs at a bar and so he's he said a lot of people got in that were underage because I was just scrolling through <laughs> like sublime object of ideology or looking awry or whatever and I just I I told Slavoj that and he was like that's the way my book should be read <laughs> you know, so I think he really he really liked that and I, I just think it's so impressive just because I've experienced how mind numbing it is. And you just don't really feel like reading something that's intellectually demanding. And so right. it's really, it's that, it, I mean, that's part of how not to be conspiratorial about it, but that's how, how, how part about how capitalism functions, right? Like it keeps going because it, it, it sucks the life out of you to make it, the energy to make an alternative, right? Or to do something else. And that's why you're doing what you're doing right now. Yeah, your time and energy thing. Yes, yes, yeah, very good. Yeah, I got the, <laughs> I was, I got the tattoo and then I, Anne was getting her tattoo while I was on the phone with Todd and I had to go into this tattoo artist's bathroom and turn the lights off because the lights were attached to a fan that was too loud for the laptop that I was calling you off of. I, we're in Mexico. Yeah. So it was like, there was no place for me to go in this and there was no office. And so, yeah, I was in this bathroom in the dark having a conversation with you on the phone when I told you yeah. about the tattoo and yeah. you were like, what's a tattoo for? And I was like, Oh, time and energy, you know about that? And then like, I had to explain it. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, but exactly. So people are left with energy, with a, a time without energy and time without energy is garbage right. time, right. right? Garbage time right. is. And then the people, and the, well, as you explained, I'll just tell you your own theory back to you. Yeah. Uh, the, the, whereas the wealthy, they have plenty of time, but they have no energy to do anything theoretically interesting or, or do anything with their, their lives. So, so it's interesting. I talked to this woman, Helen Rollins. I wonder if you, had, you probably don't know who that is, but she's a, she's a psychoanalytic theorist and filmmaker actually. And she mm -hmm. worked as a nanny for a lot of different wealthy people. And she said it was great material for 
a future film, although it was so extreme you couldn't even make a film. And there, and every single one of them, they just they had no energy to even do anything, right? Like to do anything with their lives, even though they had oodles and oodles of time. All they had was time, and they had no way to fill it up. So it is interesting how that, like, you could even imagine that the rich would like create some kind of new make some changes or, or make some genuine contributions but once you pass a certain threshold of income then i think you're the, the, i think according to your theory i think it, which i really like then you lack the energy to to actually do something when you exactly. have the time so it is an inter- that that dialectical relation between the two is really fascinating yeah it, so yeah that's why mikey's latched on to it so much is because it's you know he, didn't, he wasn't always like this. You know, there was a time when he was able to just study philosophy. He had his time energy in a way that no one else does. In Waypoint, I make the distinction between communal time energy where everybody has it versus like you have it, but no one else really does. Uh, which, yeah. you know, if you, if, you, if you have worthy goals, at like, like you want to be a violin virtuoso or like you want to know all theory, um, no one's going to be able to appreciate it the same way. So the potential recognition to be duped by the idea that we could even get recognition is undermined because nobody else can actually go the distance to even get a sense for where we're coming from. Like right. at least at least Peter right. Sloterdijk's mom, I mentioned this earlier today, at least Peter Sloterdijk's mom tried to read Critique of Pure Reason at one point, which was enough for her yeah. to have a respect for it. Like she did, she couldn't read it, but she would pull it off the shelf and say... I am happy to exist in a world where a book like this exists. It just makes me happy to know that it's there because even if I can't climb that mountain, at least someone is and I can look at them doing it and go, in some other world. But but you can't even have that respect if you haven't struggled with it, right? And so the the time energy thing is like, yeah, that's why there's still like this emancipatory aspect to it for me, which is like, yeah, do I want it for myself? Absolutely. But also I want to live in a world where people have it for one another to, to be able to do it. Absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. And I think it's a, it's a really good point that it wouldn't be that everyone is doing the same thing. It would actually be a world in which everybody can do their own thing and they have the time and the, and the drive to be able to do that. I think that's, that's a crucial part of it. But I, I really like that. I, I, I didn't know that Slaughter Dyke story. That's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to yeah. find you the, uh, the citation. I think it might have been at the beginning of You Must Change Your Life. I'm not sure, though. But uh, Okay, that's cool. Yeah. So, so I have up on the screen, Wage, Labor, and Jouissance, Why the Left Needs Zizek to Understand Workers. And that's the... That's the article, everybody, from the Dangerous Maybe blog, where Mikey goes sort of – he does – it's the first time that he actually does theory narrative this seriously. Like he did it in that paper that won first place graduate prize at the Zizek conference back in Georgia in 2018. Um, yeah. he, did, he, he did a little narrative then, and that, that's, that has evolved into the book that he's first publishing at Theory Underground, which is going to be called The Final Commodity. Uh, but this is – way more narrative, but also way more theoretical. And so if jouissance is a term that you've heard getting thrown around everybody, it's really one of the ways to, like, look, Todd's books are going to be the, the place to go if you really want to think about it in this larger societal context and how it is, ne- is, 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 is how capitalism relies on our desire and our jouissance. But uh, this piece is essential for everybody who goes, well, what's the point of this for workers? Why does the left need this, though? Well, this is the response coming from somebody who got, who had his relative time energy and then was forced into blue collar work and he knows what he's lost. He knows what he's given up in a way where other people have like this hollow sense of, I could have been something. No, he's like, I was on my way to being something for a long time and I, and it was great. And now here I am. Right. Right. No, it's really, I think it's like, he has a real sense of that loss in a way that other people don't. And I, I think that he also sees that the, the jouissance or enjoyment isn't in, like he doesn't have an imaginary sense of this thing that I've lost, but he, he sees that it's really in the, like the, the labor itself, like the certain kind of labor itself, right? Like there's not a divorce between a kind of like a, a labor that's, that you're, that you're committed to and that, that like really 
you, you feel driven about, mm-hmm. but there's a kind, there's an enjoyment in that versus a kind that just sucks a labor that just sucks out all of your enjoyment. And I think that's a, I think Mikey really has a good sense of the difference between those two kinds of work or labor. Yeah. And is part of it also that like with especially physically taxing work, there's like, you almost like, like what agitation builds up in the body and needs release somehow. But yeah. it's not getting yeah. to release in, in any productive ways and almost the only ways that are on offer for working class people are self destructive. Right? I think that's right. And I think that the but I, I think that the it's like your I would just say this, that I think your self destructiveness is also what emancipates you. But if you're but I think the the primary modes of self destruction that are offered to us are not emancipatory, right? Like they're I think that, the, you know, it's funny because I think a lot of theories do a good job with this, like, how can self-destruction be emancipatory? I think Better Call Saul may be the best one of all about this. But I think that one of the great things about Mad Men is that we see uh, the way that that self-destruction gets mobilized by the advertising agency to sell products. And and then it then then it, rather than being this thing that like. I would just say that when Freud discovers in 1920 death drive and this idea that there's something primordially self-destructive about us, he also sees like what can emancipate us from our situation, right? Like, it, like in order to emancipate yourself from your situation or to emancipate co- us collectively, there has to be something that's self-destructive. That has to be like, you have to be willing, use the term recognition before, you have to be willing to put your recognition at stake for something else, right? So so one of the things that you are destroying about yourself is your symbolic identity or the recognition that comes with that. And so your passions are always going to come against what gives you recognition. I think and that's a I think that dynamic is a really fascinating one. That the that that it's almost like recognition is the way that our uh, it's a it's a it's a way that our potential emancipation is held back and, and constrained both again, both individually and collectively. Damn. So that's basically what I have to think through for the time energy book. Like that's, but that's that right there is like the essential kind of thing that I'm stuck on. Cause it's, it's not just like we have time and energy in this like void, right. Or, and, and it's not just that it's caught up in, fractured into capitalism, but also like if the constraints are lifted on us, if we're suddenly unemployed, if we're suddenly, you know, home because of COVID and we're like, oh, I'm going to do all these things that I always fantasize about doing when I'm at work or at school, you quickly realize, uh, uh-uh, I'm not doing these things. Right. 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 And so like there's it's really good, Dave. Here. Right. Right. I think that the, and that's why I think the importance of self constraint is really crucial right like in order to even write something you have to find a either you have certain external limits that you that you're dealing with and you come up against and you you're pressing against you're fighting against or you find a way to constrain yourself right like you say like oh i've got to have this done you don't have to have it done but you're like i've got to have this done in a month like i just have i can't i can't let it go right or i have to get this thing in within 150 pages or I have to get this thing I have to I have to really work out for myself what uh, time energy is in a certain <laughs> amount of space or time right like I yeah. can't I can't just I can't just let it I just knew that like it, it, one of the things that really killed the people that I, I went to school with in, in the doctoral program was that they many people didn't finish like half maybe even three quarters never finished and it's because they had such grandiose ideas of what they were going to, they were going to have a field defining project that was going to just, you know, change to find a new field or change the field or, and they never finished because it was just too daunt. There was just no limit on what they were trying to do. And I think like having that, having the limit in, is, is really, really productive. And I think that's one of the ideas of, to me, that's a crucial, I mean, it's a Hegelian idea. It's a psychoanalytic idea. I think it's really crucial. And can you give it to your, I mean, can you give it to yourself? That seems to me to be the crucial thing. 
That's right. kind of the, the big question raised by the last conversation, the one with Cadell last. It was about um, killing ourselves with texts. And like if your drive can hook on to taking on a serious challenge, like uh, you know the science of logic or being in time. Right. Um, and – but well, we didn't really raise the question explicitly. But it is the question in the background, which is can you choose it? Can you – it, what degree of choice is there in the matter? Where because obviously your unconscious is the main organizer of your right. libidinal economy, right? But I think we're I think we make an error to think that uh, freedom is conscious, right? Like I think that freedom is in the unconscious, not in consciousness. And so because if you think about it, it's the unconscious where like what we decide consciously is more or less determined by our whatever situation, like social situation or psychic situation. But the unconscious is always, it's always, it never, it never just goes along, right? Like it always disrupts. Like I was with, I was with, uh, a, we were walking with a couple today and we just had a little meal with them for lunch. And the one person said to me, Oh, when we were doing, I was doing this and, and my partner, and she said the name of her former partner instead of the current partner. And I, I'm intentionally not saying, cause <laughs> people might know who these people are. For uh, sure. So, and, and I, I was, and she quickly corrected herself. was like, Oh, I must've said that because X, Y, and Z, but all those were kind of nice things about the new one. And I'm like, uh, I don't think that could possibly be it. Right. Like it's like unconsciously, she was reacting against this nice situation. You know, so the, the new partner, it's going well, it's kind of nice, but, but she was, re like, <laughs> clearly there was some part of her that was revolting against this, like, nice situation, right? And so I think that, to me, that's a perfect indicator of the way the unconscious is, 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 is it, it's not just going along, right? It doesn't just go along with the flow. So I think it's actually the index of our freedom, not our conscious choice. So I think the, ironically, it's the text that we feel like, oh, that's the one I have to read. Not the one I'm going to sit around and go, okay, I'd really like to read that. But instead, it's the one I feel like I have to read the, this one. That's the one, that's the one we're freely deciding on, right? Like in the sense of the unconscious freedom, right? Like that's, that's the one that we, like I'm, I'm right now, I, this is embarrassing to admit, but I, I was just talking to people earlier about this. I'm reading, uh, uh, Count of Monte Cristo in, in by Dumas in French, and I, I was, I, I'm like I have Proust, I have like all these things that I, I feel like I should read, and I consciously want to read, but I'm like I don't know, I feel like I have to read it. I, I didn't read it when I was a kid, and all these people, and I, I, I was yeah. giving a talk somewhere, and I was in a French department, and I'm like, oh, have any of you? And like none of them have read it. They're like, and I can tell they're like, really, you're really asking us if we've read. Counted Monte Cristo. And so I think that that, but I feel like that's the, like that is the free choice, right? Like, cause I felt like I have to read it. So I almost think you should like go on your shelf and put your hand on something and like whatever you feel hate drawn to, that's where you should, that's what you should, that's your free choice, right? Like that's what I would say. And I think that's a really, I don't know. I mean, it's a kind of crazy idea of freedom, right? To say that the unconscious, because Freud didn't think that. Freud thought the unconscious is just necessity. Right. And I think it's really freedom. I think that's that's what he's getting at. I, I wonder if I can work with that and tie it back into something I had said in the last conversation. Um, I was saying, you know, it's easy to be kind of dabbling in this and that and the other seeing pe and, and, and kind of like watching people go hard, you know, so like, you know, you, you, you do a little bit of athletic things, but you don't do marathons. You, you know, go on hikes, but you don't climb mountains. You watch some, watch some YouTube conversations about philosophy, but you don't read primary texts. And, uh, you know, maybe you even like mess around with like a keyboard every once in a while, but you don't really learn music. And so it's like, and what, what I was saying is like, I'm not judging anyone for standing on the sidelines and dabbling with everything because you're getting a sense for what matters, right? 
Right. But I but I am saying that you're missing out in life if you don't ever commit and dive into something. And so what I was thinking though is like a way of tying this in is like the libidinal economy is able – like you kind of have a sense for some of your libidinal economy because you feel pulled in multiple directions all the time. Right. So right. Right. I think right. that the ego – the ego side, the conscious side is able to make – uh, what a re- take a de- uh, what what Heidegger would call it a resolute stand on your historicity, right? right? You're taking a resolute right. stand on one yes. of these options pulling you, and you say, "No, I'm going to commit to that. And I'm going to dive in," right? Yeah. Um, and I think the ethics of psychoanalysis is also about choosing one of these as well, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. I think that's right. I mean, I think that I really, really, really like that. I think that that idea of you know, I always like that in Heidegger, this notion of like of resolute, the, like resoluteness, right? I think I think that's a really important idea, and I think that that, like, and again, I don't, I'm not even sure that it matters. I mean, obviously, if you're if you're resolute about your white nationalism, <laughs> it's probably not great. But but maybe you can't even be right. Like maybe you can't even be like maybe there's something about that that already is itself a kind of like. Uh, a secondary position, right? And an avoidance of a certain kind of primary resoluteness. So I'm right. not even sure that that is even a, a danger. But I, I, but I would say I, I completely agree with that because I think that that is a way to follow your unconscious. Like that is a way to say, I feel compelled to do this thing and I'm going to not just, I think dabbling is a way to not follow your, what your drive is, right? Like what your passion whatever term you want to use, like the psycho in psychoanalytic jargon, it would be drive, but it could be passion or whatever you want to call it. And I think that it, like following, I think there's everything in capital is about trying to diffuse that because it, there's something threatening about that. Right. And I think one of the things that you're trying to do for Mikey is to allow him to, to be able to do that. And I think, and I think you're, you know, I mean, even your own, the, the very thing you're trying to set up is to facilitate that for people. So I, I, I mean, I'm totally in favor. I, it's interesting how in, in academia right now, there's a complete turn away from theory and philosophy in the sense that we understand it and uh, thinking in those kind of terms for, in favor of historicizing and, and like textual analysis, whatever. Uh, like if you like, I, I my Y theory co-host Ryan Engley was just at the film studies conference, and there was exactly one panel devoted to theory out of thousand panels. I don't know something like not thousand, but four hundred, three hundred panels. Oh my god! And the panel was the panel was his, and there were like ten people <laughs> in the audience. No one, no one cared. But it's interesting. Like on like for our podcast, there's like thirty thousand people listening to it. So it's an interesting kind of split where there's these people like either outside the academy or on the margins of it that are very interested in theory and plot like Cadell was saying this whole like philosophy becoming even primary relative to science like everybody has to be a philosopher today in a sense and yet in the academy there's a complete abandonment of it you know in philosophy departments obviously it's it's just analytic basically in America it's just analytic philosophy there's no the kind of what we consider philosophy uh, and, and, and in other, even in English departments is marginalized film, it's completely marginalized. So it's like our, here at the University of Vermont, where I am and where we have, I don't know, like three, four, I think really important theorists, our graduate MA is just, just, they're about ready to vote to make the theory class optional rather than required. It was right now it's the only required class and that they're going, they're like, let's make it optional. And instead, let's make a class on the theory of pedagogy or pedagogical practice. Mm. Let's make that an option for people. So it's just a fascinating, you know, you can see how the, how the thing is just from that, I think. And so this is like, this I, is I like, find it fascinating. Yeah, go ahead. This is like business ethics fulfilling or medical ethics fulfilling your philosophy elective, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. That's exactly it, Dave. It's exactly it. And I, I think... So in academia, I think it's terrible, but there's this whole place where you are and where Mikey is that there that there's this kind of flowering of interest and commitment and just it's it's amazing. So I think that 
you know, the number of people that are reading Hegel now is probably higher than it, like, not, I mean, adjusting for percentage population growth. It's probably higher than it's ever been since Hegel wrote the phenomenology in 1807. So it's a fascinating kind of uh, time to be living, I think. It's a totally fascinating time. And I, I the, you know, my hope is, is just to, that by, 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 by saying you know that you, that committing to things and going deep, going in the deep end is inherently worthwhile. What will what what is triggered and frustrated in people as what I call time energy fragility will create a, a will bring about a, a a raising of consciousness about how we need to restructure society so that we can pursue these things. Because right now, when people say I don't have time for that, let's you don't. It's true. You're right. right. There are there's there's a gold mine next door and you're poor and you're not allowed to put your grubby hands on it and you're supposed to get back to work but the fact is is it's right there and you're getting older and you're gonna die right like that this right. is uh, right. earlier earlier uh, uh, that the book this life by by Haugland I think I forget how to say his name Martin Haglund yeah yes. Haglund yeah I uh, who who brought this up. It was Daniel Tut had brought this up, and I was saying, you know, I can I kind of see it as the the theology of time energy, and he he was like he problematized that because I think he didn't he doesn't like the word theology in this context, right? But my yeah. basic point is like it's a, it's an atheist response to people who believe in eternity, saying my time is finite. I can respect that you believe that you have eternity. I can respect that you believe X, Y, and Z things. But you should be able to respect the fact that I only know I have this life and this is it. And so right. the finitude of my life is the absolute value on it. And so when people are like, oh, no, we should leave the economics alone and just focus on politics of representation and redistribution, no fundamental restructuring of society. What you're telling me is that I need to be a slave. Right, like the, the the quote I keep pulling from from the Grand Risa today uh, is when he says, "I will just read it again." He says, "Over the over the somewhat longer term, specifically during the upward phase." I actually sent you this in a in a in an email. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Over the somewhat longer term, specifically during the upward phase of the economic cycle. However, both wages and profits may show an absolute increase at the same time, and during such periods, the worker may either take the risk of accumulating a small fund of savings for the next crisis, or may broaden the sphere of his consumption to take a small part in higher, even cultural satisfactions. For instance, agitation for his own interests, newspaper subscriptions, attending lectures, educating his children, developing his tastes, constituting the worker's only share of civilization, and this is a quilting point, the only share of civilization which distinguishes him from the slave. And for me, it's just like that is the most important thing is, is like if we've abolished slavery, but at the same time universalized work in such a way that we're not able to do those things, we've yeah. universalized slavery. That's all that we've achieved. Right. 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 No, it's really good. I think that, that uh, that's such a great passage from Marx, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that the the um, the – I like that idea of the gold mine next to you that you can't access, right? Like, and I think that the one of the things that YouTube and internet makes evident is to people, I think more and more, is the way that there are these things that are available, right? And and that you just don't have the time to give that they would require, right? Like, like I don't even know how. I mean, people do it, but I don't even know how working eight to five you could read the logic. Right. Like it's a like it's just such a it's such a don I mean, I, I read it, you know, I read it a few times, but all the time when I had I had, you know, plenty of free time to read it. So I don't you know, that that would be a great example. And one thing I want to speak about this eternity thing, you know, OK, even if you believe in eternity, you don't know that you're going to be able to read Hegel in eternity. Right. Like, like <laughs> I don't know if that's I don't know if you have a a copy of the science of logic in heaven. So uh, you might as well do it. I think you have to do it now, right? Yeah, you, yeah. you really, and, and also eternity might be one of those things that benefits from what you do here. 
on earth. I know, right, right. When you really have to, yeah, yeah. Or, or heaven is a place where nothing really happens. Right? Yeah, ex- yeah. Well, you know, and I, I know people in my personal life who think that throwing crowns for eternity saying glory, glory would be a wonderful afterlife, but I, uh, you know, I hope that we get to that doesn't do... doesn't sound so great, I know. If, if I we know. can't do philosophy, I'm not really interested personally. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah. Um, I want to turn this over to a quick Q&A and then let you get back to lack because that is I, – I actually did not know and I apologize for my ignorance. I had no idea that you're the key organizer for it besides Hillary. And no, you wouldn't have known. I mean, never, never a reason you should know. I, well, it's amazing. First of all, like that's I, – I, I've known about lack since I studied under Gautam Basutakur. Uh, because he, oh, yeah. he goes to lack, you know? And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, but he's not going to be here this year. He had some kind of other thing he had to cancel. So too bad. Dang. Yeah. Well, um, quick anecdote. Uh, my fiance and I were getting married in July and, uh, the actual, the PSA I've been rolling between the segments, t- uh, for this marathon for like the last 10 hours. Um, it's about, uh, 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 we decided to just add some footage at one point because we were reading off the narration of the PSA and we were taking turns reading paragraphs, right, for the initial audio file. Yep. And uh, yep. at the point that I said something about like tr- tr- hoping that Theory Underground becomes sustainable enough that I'm able to have a family, uh, I said something about my soon-to-be wife. And so she laughs because she didn't know that that was there. And then I, you know, we, so yeah. we, la- we laugh. Um but we, we decided what, you know, we'd put an image over that. And so we actually put the image of the proposal. Uh, so this wasn't, this wasn't, uh-huh. like, this wasn't premeditated, but you know, I just got me proposing in front of like this waterfall in Oregon. It's beautiful. And then, um, yeah. it's got like her showing it off, her showing off her ring laughing and it's like a precious moment. And so now everybody is in love with us, of course, but the, uh, why am I bringing this up? We met because of, um, just organizing on campus, right? And uh, with the when we, we, we first bonded um, over the fact that of all the volunteers for the conference that I organized, she was like the one person who was like showing up early, like doing everything, all no standing around with her. She's always figuring out what needs to be done, taking on charge for things. Um, at one point, I was just totally decimated. This was the conference with Richard Wolf and uh, Michael Brooks and Peter Rollins and a bunch of other people. It was, it was, it was responding, okay. responding to Jordan Peterson. Uh, it was uh, something that I initially organized because Jordan Peterson had dodged a debate with Doug Lane on uh, the Zero Squared podcast. And, and, and I like proved to be like this, this power couple before, before I had even noticed her in any other way, like physically yeah. or something. It was just like we connected on that basis. And so um, the fact that you and your, you know, your significant other, that you are both like co-organizers for a conference. Yeah. I get it. I get like, the, I know the kind of stuff involved. And yeah. so it just makes me like really happy here to know that oh, you good. have, that you have yeah. that with yeah. her. Yeah. So yeah. congratulations on that. Yeah. Um, right. as far as the, the, before we go to Q and A though, I just want to, you know, like, let's, let's say a few th- more things about Mikey. Um, I'd like to yeah. hear a couple, like maybe anecdotes of how you met him. Like, what was the first thing you read of his that impressed you? Um, if people are going to read his blog, what's something you would recommend? Stuff like that. Yeah. So I met. How do I meet him? That's a good question. I think he contacted me. Just. Um, oh no 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 no! He was he took a. He took a class that I was doing uh, either by from GCAS or some like uh, impact fest or something like that. And, and, and I got, I knew him that way. And then he did a, I did a, uh, I did an end some guy wanted to do an online. This was during COVID or first year of COVID. Some guy wanted to do an independent study with me, or maybe it was before COVID, but he wanted to do an independent study online reading phenomenology of spirit. And so I invited Mikey to, and and somebody else wanted somebody at UVM wanted to do it too, and then I invited Mike. I'm like, maybe you want to do it, and so I I got him. I mean, I just let him on it, and so I like 
Uh, the other two guys were paying tuition, but he just he was just doing it. I mean, they didn't know that he wasn't paying tuition, <laughs> but I just but, but I was just I just let him do it for free. Uh, and so that's how I really got to know him. And then we have kept in contact uh, over the everything in the years since close contact. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know several uh, psychoanalytic theorists that that actually teaches have his blog assigned to their classes so several it's really several yeah so it's really um a thing that people use as a reference point so i think that's pretty it's pretty great i think his it's interesting i my i have to say my favorite he'll appreciate this so i uh i on my on on why theory i once referred to jean baudrillard as a philosophical pipsqueak and he really like <laughs> let me <laughs> and I felt very badly about that because I hate that kind of like pot shot cheap shot kind of because I'm usually the recipient of it uh even though Baudrillard is dead and he doesn't care uh but I I you know what I meant was like he's not he doesn't he's not versed in German idealism and 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 things like that but but it was nonetheless and Mikey really likes it but I think his engagement with Baudrillard is what's to me the most interesting part of his thinking, just because it's the thing that I'm most against. So I find it, you know, I find Baudrillard a little bit of a, a kind of nostalgic thinker. Like he thinks that there used to be some kind of moment before this, we got lost in virtuality. And I don't really think that, but I think Mikey has shown me little ways in which he actually provides a diagnosis of our situation that's that's pretty good and so that i i would just say his stuff on bodiar would be what i would like best again just because it goes against what i'm most committed to that's you know he, i i was on the the other side of all of that he you know i think he was playing offended he's used to hearing people dunk on bodiar or use him in a sort yeah. of superficial way and so it's like he wasn't it, 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 he wasn't really shook by it, but I think he actually told me about his email he sent you where he was like, called you out on it. It's so funny. But yeah, he actually know, said, I'm happy now because I have a point at which I can say, I really disagree with him on this, on this issue. So that, yeah, that yeah, is yeah, good. Fine. Yeah. And it's funny yeah. because, you know, you're, you're such a good, you know, teacher of, of all things Zizek. But when Mikey approached Zizek, when we were at that conference in Georgia in 2018, um, Mikey, uh, and I know that he's told you this story, but I'm going to tell everybody else because basically the thing that M Mikey goes to him and says, look, I found so many things between your work and Baudrillard's that like I, I see so much richness here for dialogue and like in a lot of ways there's similarities and things, but there's also like really important differences, blah, 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 blah. It needs to be fleshed out. Basically, Slavoj was like, oh, absolutely. It's true. And, and then um, Slavoj uh, basically gave him the symbolic mandate of writing the book. And yeah. that's what he's been doing for the last five years. When he's, not yeah. at, uh, when he's not at work, he goes to the coffee shop. And he can't do the full six-hour sessions he used to, but he goes for three hours. And uh, you know, when he's not – but the thing is, is he's productively procrastinating from the main book by doing all this research into all things – like that kind of relate. And so like everything on his blog is a form of production, a productive procrastination. Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and so basically, uh, the, the newest form of productive procrastination before he really signs off and actually writes the book this fall is for they know not what they do, which is going to be our pivot point here into the Q and a. So Mikey's been teaching for they don't know what they do. I have some prize, enrollees. I don't want to call them students. I mean, they are students. We're all students. Um, and uh, a, a few of them are in the chat right now. And so what I'll ask of them in a moment, in a moment, is to turn on their cameras. Not just yet. Um, I want to give you a second to respond to anything else before we turn it over to basically before they don't know what they do Q&A time. Because we've got a couple of... No, let's turn it over. Let's turn, it over. turn it over? All right. Yeah. Cameras, yeah. cameras on, folks. If you're there, pop out. Matin, it's good to see you. Jordan, Lukash, good to see you. Joining from Poland, my God, you must be very likewise. late. You must be very what? Where? Oh, I said likewise. Oh, likewise for sure. Yeah, I'm from California, a very boring place. 
Okay. <laughs> okay, because we can turn on the mics. I thought that we are quiet now. <laughs> what, Lukash? What time is it there? At one a.m., my man. Oh. Okay, I'm okay. like pretty sleepy, but it's like so good to watch you guys that I'm alive, so it's fine. Fantastic. Well, guys, uh, what I guess I'll do is um, ask that everybody simply use the the hand raising thing, and we'll take turns. I'll call on people if it gets confusing, but for now, yeah, just raise your hand if you've got a question. Um, my my thing is going to be like if we if we have time, I'm I'm curious about what Todd thinks about the four judgments section of the science of logic that Slavoj is using in chapter three or four. They don't know what they do, which was the hardest section so far. It broke me, humbled me. I'm still sad uh, and 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 humiliated about how hard it is actually. Um, but I th but I think I'm getting it. And Mikey did an extra lecture on the topic because I was having such a hard time and it really quilted a lot of things. And so I think I'm getting a lot out of it, but would you agree that the, that that's the fundamental point where uh, Slavoj is showing that the notion doesn't override material reality in the science of logic or just in Hegel's dialectics, that actually material reality is the excessive kernel that changes the notion and that we get that from the section on the four judgments. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that that, I mean, that's why I think that it's interesting because I think that section of where they know not what they do leads into the very title of or subtitle of less than nothing like Hegel in the shadow of dialectical materialism, right? Like, I think, I don't know that he is as committed early on to the notion of Hegel as materialist, but then I think he kind of is coming to that idea in that section. And then from that point, then later on, that becomes much more prominent. The idea that Hegel is really, that, that it's a materialist. Hey, but, and he, he loves to say this, that Hegel's the materialist and Marx is actually the idealist, right? Like it's this flip, he likes to perversely flip things around. Uh, but I, I do think you're right about that. I think that, that he's trying to show that there's, that, that, that there's an encounter with some excess that can't be reduced right in the, in that section that then changes the concept. I also like that there he's, is that the section where he says why you have to count to four in Hegel or something like that, that, that his point is that there, that it's not just this triplic this constant triplicity, right. That there's this fourth moment. And I think that's, and it, and it, it, it even gets, at the end of Sublime Object, he does a similar kind of thing where he goes like substance is subject, and then the final thing is subject is substance, like which is again a way I think of saying the same thing, like that there's some material kernel that is responsible for even the emergence of subjectivity. So I think that that's he's I think he's even anticipating that in, as early as Sublime Object, which is his first book on Hague. Hey, yeah, I mean. His first book in English on Hegel. I guess uh, the, the, his thesis in French was on Hegel too, but cool. most sublime of his character. Yeah. So we'll go Matin Lukash. All right, okay. I'm going to try to go quickly because uh, Dave last night actually messaged me saying that uh, I'll get the chance to uh, ask you a question. And I was very pleased because of that. I'm already procrastinating, but uh, because the... Uh, your essay in the uh, Zizek response book uh, was a, a sort of fundamental way I was trying to uh, view this book uh, for they know not what they do, was trying to hope to connect Zizek's ontology to his notion of the act. Um, yeah. Please feel free to cut me off at any point because this is kind of a doozy. Okay, I'm just going to get right okay. into it. Perhaps yeah. Zizek's outline of the dialectic of law in for they know not what they do and Zupanchich's staging of Antigone as a figure of consciousness embodying the blind spot of the symbolic law and family can give us a clue of how the very act itself can presupposit a universal ground for such emancipatory governments, governance, which uh, in your essay you uh, say Zizek does not quite go far enough in uh, producing. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying this is implicit in, in, in his dialectic of law. Yeah. And Zupanchich takes the extra step of kind of making it more explicit. Um, yeah. Uh, within the failing sites of uh, initiations which have been foreclosed under newer forms of fetishist disavowals, uh, contemporary disavowal, things like that. Um, so can we not take your description of the uh, 
violent act a step further to have it address not only the death drive of the revolutionary subject, but also uh, the repeated shameless violations of even the unwritten dimension of the symbolic laws themselves. Um, not only do invocations of humanitarian concerns point out subjective violence while ignoring the objective violence inherent in capitalist production, but this distinction is in itself toyed with by those uh, in an obscene way who call their subjective act of violence objective. Uh, so the revolutionary act of violence doesn't free the subject from the, uh, or does not break from the symbolic structure in which it occurs, which, which you, or uh, that's what I'm proposing, because that's, mm -hmm. a, that's what you say in the uh, essay. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it doesn't break them from the literal attachments to the existing order, but paradoxically, or it does, but paradoxically, it also pushes past these limits, which prevented the full identification with the ethical core at the heart of uh, that order's troubled symbolic law in the first place. I hope that wasn't too confusing. I was trying to go very quickly. Not no, no, that's good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I am confused. So I just wonder if Todd, if you could kind of restate it from your, yeah, yeah. So I think the so the so the, I'll just quickly summarize the essay in two seconds. So the, the essay, I think it's called like Slavoj Žižek is not violent enough, and so it was just kind of I was like playing with his own perverse uh, tendencies, and and my point is that he doesn't ever. He says, like, I would sell my mother into slavery if if someone would make a V for Vendetta part two and tell me what the what what happens the day after, you know, after the revolution. And I said, well, why doesn't Slavoj himself ever tell us what happened? And so I say, well. The violent like the violence of the Revolutionary Act has to be in some so, and the self-destructive violence of the Revolution Act has to be in some way written into the idea of governance or, or how and 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 he really i give an example of this and he doesn't like it at all he really takes issue with it uh which is probably it's probably a bad example so i probably shouldn't even included it uh but and the, i think the idea is like that that Natan is asking is it doesn't isn't there something in slavoy's own work and also in alenka's recent book on antigone about the way in which uh the there's a there's a fault in the there's this uh we just say the last cannibal. cannibal right right that's yeah. Olenka lo loves this joke like there are mm -hmm. no more cannibals because we just ate the last one that, that the the book basically is an elaboration of that joke so there's this obscene dimension of the of the symbolic structure right and that and that's the i mean what it's what Slavoj in his I don't know when he started talking about it, maybe in Metastases of Enjoyment, calls the obscene underside of the law. And the point is that, like, the attack on that is the way in which self-destruction can be written into governance. I think that's your point, right? Is that right? Yes. Uh, may, may I quote Zupancic very quickly? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, Zupancic puts in her recent Antigone book, the revolutionary subject, uh, I'm, I'm replacing Antigone with revolutionary subject, yeah. responds to the master's pushing of the limit by establishing her own way of pushing the limit or of making the master push the limit all the way through until the symbolic law, the limit of which he pushes, crashes on him and the rest of the city. So there is a, a, a sort of principle to, to this justice rather than uh, what I take you to... Uh, say in in the essay which is a sort of complete uh cutting off from, from the libidinal attachments to family and things like that unless i misread you it's in kevin spacey as an example oh yeah 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 uh i just use that because that's slavoy's example right like that's slavoy's example of this uh self-destructive act that is revolutionary mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's in Fragile Absolute that he talks about that. He uses usual suspects and ransom and speed, maybe as as his three examples. So I, I was that wasn't necessarily my example, uh, but I think that the like the I think the, I really like what you're saying. I think that there is something to this that the and to Alenka's point that the there's that the that the danger of the, the like the The danger of the of, of the symbolic authority structure is the is precisely this underside of it, and so 
if the that the revolutionary act pushes at it by forcing it to take to to eliminate this underside or to 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 target it and i think that so i i do think i really like the question as a way to think about how the the act itself the revolutionary act can be written into governance and that seems to be like a way although i don't i'm not sure that antigone herself writes that into governance right like she's still she still react she's still a she's still a, she's still a figure of rebellion right this would be a i think this is how lacan reads her and i think it's either like seminar seven or eleven it is seminar seven yeah uh, yeah and i think uh i think actually um Zupanjic may have she she kind of uh she she takes this reading from seminar seven but kind of like updates it a little bit uh via seminar eleven and things like that and I think she uh I I won't eat up, in, up into everyone else's time but uh I I'm really interested okay. in the way she kind of uh okay, okay. Uh, has her own reading of it good yeah okay now it'll be Lukash then Jordan okay uh, my question will be. And you guys can bash me with me because maybe it's a little bit disconnected. But I think it's also connected to the course because we are talking all the time about retroactivity and the notion has changed retroactively. And I wanted to ask, because we are talking about master signifiers, but the interesting stuff for me would be the quilting point. And last year I was writing my bachelor's on retroactivity and Lacan's structure of signification and Zizek's ontology in connection with this, prompted by your thought, a video on Lacan's structure of signification. And I wanted to ask, because when I was doing research, I was like puzzled, because you, uh, and in your podcast with Ryan Angry, you insist on this distinction between master signifier and quilting point, quilting point, and all the time you like stress it that they are separate and you shouldn't mix them. But then I went to Zizek and I was baffled because like he just doesn't do it. And no, I know, I... I know, I know, I know. It's true. It's 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 a fascinating point, and and I mean Lacan does not distinguish, so he absolutely doesn't. Right? They're 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 totally intermixed, and Slavoj bring holds them together too, like Lacan does. So it's 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 a minority report by me. So I I don't know. I mean I don't know what to say about that. It's just, I think there's something really productive about thinking about the signifier that provides the basis for signification is a master signifier and then distinguishing that from what quilts and then and retroactively determines the way signification functions so the master signifier as i agree with lacan that it's a signifier without a signified right but i think the quilting point is not a signifier without a signified because i think it's a signifier that actually structures all signification like it, it, it has it has it has a in a certain way it has a universal signifier right like it's not it it is not it is not absent a signified in the same way that the master signifier is so that's the that's the initial brief way that i would make that distinction and i'm gonna i i have a i have a new book on hegel that's working out this thing and i i hope to write a book on that structure of signification <laughs> a uh, little video because i really think it's an important distinction and i politically because i think to me like the the difference between marx and hegel is that hegel thinks we intervene politically by adding a quilting point and marx thinks we intervene politically by adding a master signifier and i think that's the entire difference between marx and hegel and if you don't think those two things are different then you know that distinction doesn't make any sense so that's that's what I would say about that. So, but you're absolutely right. For Lacan and for Slavoj, that there's no distinction. Like there's no distinction. So, and for everyone else. So it's just my own idiosyncratic thing. Sorry. Yeah. yeah thanks. Sure. Thanks. Thank, yeah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Hey Todd, uh, big fan. Uh, almost done through your done with uh, your uh, book uh, Emancipation After Hegel, which has been immensely helpful in reading uh, for they know not what they do. Um, I wanted to touch upon something Zizek talks about in the preface, where he criticizes the sublime object, um, and I'll read a quote here. Um, Zizek says in the sublime object that it 
uh, quote, it basically endorses a quasi-transcendental reading of Lacan focused on the notion of the real as the impossible thing in itself. In doing so, it opens the way to the celebration of failure, to the idea that every act ultimately misfires and that the proper ethical stance is heroically to accept this failure. So my question is, is the romanticization, romanticization of the failure in the Galian dialectic, whether you're talking about the failure of the object to ever coincide with its notion, or in Lacanian psychoanalysis, when we're talking about the sexual non-relation or enjoyment being dependent on not having, uh, is that is the romanticization a bad thing? Is the romanticization of failure, negation, lack, is that a form of disavow that kind of neutralizes the trauma of these things? Is that what Zizek is trying to, I guess, engage in some self-critique about in the sublime object? I do think that's what he's getting at. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that he, I think this is the ultimately the thing that he hates about sublime object is that it, he said this to me many times that it it's a book about it's basically a book in favor of democracy and he's 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 no longer a democrat in the small d sense of the word so i think that's part of what he's got behind that because he thinks that he he would link that kind of romanticization of failure to this embrace of like the i think he even quotes churchill like democ in sublime object democracy is the the is it the worst of all systems, but it's the best, whatever the line is, but it's the best of all the other ones, right? But it's better than all the other existing ones. Uh, so that that's I would that would be my first impression. But I, I do think that, I think that what he, how, I think a better, another way to think of it is that he would come to think of, he would say that, later he would say we have to think of failure itself as a success right like so and i think that's the that's the hegelian i think he becomes i i, th I think he would accept this i think he becomes over the last i don't know 30 years more hegelian and less lacanian and so i think that that means that for for hegel failure is always a form of success right like the way that we fail is like that's what absolute knowing is for Hegel or the absolute. It's like you get to a point where you see that all these successive failures are themselves my successful way of knowing or of constructing an ontology or, or whatever. Uh, and so I think that's different than, than I think for Lacan, there's always this, not always, it depends on which period of Lacan, but there's this idea of like you're, there's, you're coming up short of something and there's some, there's a, there's a like a possibility that you're coming up short of, and I think that's different than 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 saying no. The limit is actually constitutive, right? Like the the limit, and I think in 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 his reading of Lacan from the beginning in Sublime Object, there isn't that yet that sense. I think that's what he that's the self that's the nature of the self criticism. This different conception of failure, and this you know this idea that that. Um, I mean, you might say it, it might be even the, like it might be the difference between lack and loss, right? Like loss suggests that there's something that's been lost that we can't get back to, whereas lack is constitutive and and there's no it doesn't necessarily point to something that you're missing, right? So I think that that might be another way to think of the difference between the early, like he 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 has this. I think this is actually in the end of for the net what they do. He has this panegyric to the lost cause. And I'm not sure that he would, isn't that right? At the very end, like on the, like the second to last page, like the only something like the only causes worth fighting for are the lost causes, right? Uh and I don't think he would say that anymore. Like I think he wants to say, like, the left shouldn't be afraid to win. And that that's tied to this earlier question, like, uh uh what 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 do we do the day after the revolution? Like that's the important question, not just the revolt itself. And and I think he's become more critical of just this leftism of pure resistance. And I think that's again that's part of what also this this romanticization of failure becomes this allergy to power, right? And he wants to, I think he wants to resist that way of thinking. Rightly, I think rightly. Yeah, it almost makes me think of how the. Um 
uh, thoughts people have or leftists have versus on like the Paris Commune or the Spanish Revolution. They're like, oh, those were the good revolutions. Those were the pure revolutions. Because they failed. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, exactly, oh. exactly. And so whereas French Revolution is a little dicey because it actually yep. succeeded and they came to power. Yeah, I think that's right. Great. Thank you, Todd. Sure. I think at this point, um, look, Todd, you should, first of all, you should have gone in, back to your organizing a while ago. So <laughs> I know I'm going to go back right now. So I actually yeah. have a call I have to make to, to get a, a locale for a certain event. So I, I, I might got to do things. So. Well, well, guys, you all hang tight because I'm going to ask you all if you want to uh, I'm going to ask you all a couple questions about this course, and I just I basically let's let's close out. Like Todd, if you want to give your closing statement, um, maybe while doing it, also uh, you know make maybe make your plug for the Dangerous Maybe blog, uh, and just let let people know about it um, because I'd like a solid soundbite to be able to share out on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I I have such I I I don't really have heroes but i think of mikey as a kind of hero of mine so i think that he again like i find i myself read the dangerous maybe and i think that it's a really valuable uh site for i mean i there aren't many blogs that i ever look at but that's one that i do look at as a way to to i think he does such a good job of dissecting hard texts and bring making them clear and i think he also does a good job of speculating on things that are happening and connecting them to theoretical positions and i i think that his he's just such a, a really a remarkable figure and i i i hope this that is that's come through in our discussion today because i i really think he's like uh yeah he, i find him very heroic and i i, I often talk to my students in class about it as a, as a when, when I find that they're not doing their reading or it's slacking off and like going to bars instead of reading Hegel I'm like really you know I know this guy he's working in a warehouse 40 50 60 hours a week and he still has time to read Hegel so you have no excuse so <laughs> that's what I would say <laughs> thank you so much for dropping by and uh, hey, hopefully... Dave, thanks for having me man Hopefully we'll all be at the next lack you do organize. Okay. Okay. I'll take, take care. See you. <laughs> nice care. to see everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good luck with the conference. Man, to be at lack tomorrow, that would be, that would be epic. Um, so what I was going to ask you all is basically the same kind of thing I just asked him on, you know, to close out. But basically, it's a little bit more about like what you're getting from the course, how the course is going, what you guys think about Mikey as a lecturer. You're allowed to say he's a piece of shit and he, it sucks. It's okay. Do you just, just, I just basically want to hear your honest like feedback with how it's going right now. Not because as the organizer of it, it will make me happy and proud, but because I. I genuinely want uh, people who are tuning into this and thinking about taking on some difficult work this year or next year uh, to think about taking for they know not what they do after the fact because people are able to take this course on demand. One person, uh, Georgie from India, actually just got on with the scholarship and then he binged the whole backlog of lectures like in a week's time, I think. And he's just like an yeah. English teacher. Like, so he's just, I, the idea that people can take it on demand is, is crucial here because I think people think, oh, I'm not part of the cohort. I missed out. Then what's the point? So I kind of first is talking about like the lecture itself, but also I am interested in the cohort experience and all of that. So whatever you all have to add, uh, definitely curious to hear. May I start? Yeah, go for it. And is it by the way, is it is it Matin? Have I been saying your name correctly? It's it's Matan, but as a as a true Zhejeki and I allowed you to uh, mispronounce it over and over again that as a source of pleasure for me. But um Okay, okay. Yeah, anyways, you mentioned uh you mentioned Georgie. Not only uh did he binge watch all that stuff, but he, uh in a live stream that you were doing of an exegetical reading, he mentioned that he, he was keeping along with the exegetical readings without even being a part of the course. Um you know, and it's that sort of like, uh, I don't know, renegade mentality that, that really drew me to uh, 
not just Mikey, but uh, who else was it? Andrew, Nick, um, you Vanishing when we mediators. were at the uh, Fliss Fetter course. Um, I was really impressed with the ability of just like regular youngish people to be able to, uh, you know, you know, really have conversations with, with uh, professors and things like that. Um, I, I really wasn't expecting to ever have that ability. I, I was just kind of uh, tagging along and, and seeing that really, uh, really lit a fire under me. Yeah. Nance, I know you're thinking about it. Nance, I know you're thinking about it, so. <laughs> How's the course going? Come on, have you gotten anything out of it? Oh, Adam's here. Go, Nance, go. I'm, I'm here to push Nance off the bench. <laughs> I want to hear from Nance. You know what? One of the best things about this, about this course is that this isn't in this cohort is that this isn't just the smartest guy in the room always trying to be the smartest guy in the room dealing with that guy this is a bunch of this is a bunch of people um i like to think of myself among them nance inclusive i loved hanging with luke uh lucas the other night uh where it's it's not about trying to be in so many cases you end up in these conversations with people who are just trying to prove how freaking smart they are which is cool and i'm glad that everybody's so smart but it's actually wonderful to be in community with folks who are recognizing where their deficits are and down to be vulnerable and show that and help someone like me who would normally be just uh, just straight up on the bench uh feel like you know what yeah i can be in this conversation and i might not have all the definitions correct uh, I'm pretty cool with with Lucas, you know, fixing my definitions or, you know, Nance grinning at my ass, making a making a fool of myself or something, you know. Um, and I, you uh, imagine that in a in an academic like a true whatever academic environment. Uh, you, you were talking about earlier. This is a place where you can where you can go and, uh, you know, I guess make some mistakes you know, verbally and not have it be life ruining. It's not the end of your career, your college career. Yeah. Uh, I like that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all I got. Nance, go, go, go. Yeah. I, I really do appreciate the ability to learn in concert. Um, I, <clears throat> I get really, <clears throat> I go down like rabbit holes. I, I climb into my own belly button a lot. Um, but also, engaging with this seriously because there's it, like i can sit at home in my bathtub and and try to read this and, and read this and feel good about thinking that i'm getting it but then coming in and doing this stuff in concert with other um demonstrably intelligent people who like have uh who can walk the walk the walk um it's it's really good to to I mean some of the stuff I'm I'm really encountering for the first time like some some of the the thoughts that I I've recognized myself having I'm recognizing them for the first time and I'm like almost 40 years old I've been I've thought I'm a smart guy my whole life and, and it's cool to, to be able to be confronted with the fact that I'm an idiot and it's awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Idiots unite. Cool. It's also actually really cool to see someone like, like Mikey who as uh, uh as uh, Todd had just mentioned, is is such a actually a heroic figure, but not not by way of like a single grand gesture. It's actually by way of a of practically a lifetime of tough fucking work, which you know our our uh, our upbringing tells us that it's almost the opposite. You're supposed to, uh, as Nance was saying, you're supposed to make it look easy, right? supposed to if if you didn't make it look easy you're you're not uh you you know 
you're not naturally talented or whatever. I like being in the presence of people who aren't naturally talented, but otherwise just doing the doing the fucking work. Dude, I, I think, Nance, you brought that up in one of your reflections for one of the other courses. I think it was like the idea of the university or the PMC course. You're talking about skateboarders. That's the, my, yeah, my the idea of the university final about how like it's it's uh, unacceptable to do something to it's it's society rejects when you show you're trying hard like it, it has to appear as if you're naturally talented because we don't like to be confronted with our own lack of mastery and our own lack of time and energy mm. requisite to master new things based um any closing remarks, everybody, before I turn it over to PSA? Thank you for bringing this on. I may say something about like joining about after the fact, if anyone would end, have any doubts. Like, man, I wasn't even in any of the live lectures because I just can do it on the weekend because it's in the middle of the night and I, I'm working. And it's, you know what? It doesn't matter because uh, reading and writing on the forum, doing ex exegetical readings with you, and and then uh, watching the recordings, and I I listen to them in work. And you know what? It, like listening to Mikey talking and Dave being like puzzled by everything. It's it's perfect, you know. And just you don't have to be here. Uh, life lecture. It's it's. The only time I was actually at the lecture was when I was hitchhiking at the night and I was like pretty dead in the middle of the night. I, I remembered, oh my God, oh, there is this lecture. And I turned <laughs> in and, it, I, and I just stood like an idiot in the middle of the road with a sign and I was listening to Mikey talking about Hegel. It was pretty surreal. <laughs> yeah. Our new cool. mascot. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone, as you know, you can join in 20... 43 or something, it's fine. <laughs> well, I hope everyone has a sense that it could perish before then, so you take advantage of it while it's here and do your best to make it something that c can exist, right? Like, uh, because, I don't know, what, who knows what could happen. Hopefully 100 more flowers will bloom uh, once Theory Underground fails. But the, the main thing is just like, for now, it's here. And if you get excited about four, they don't know what they do after the fact, and it's still around, take advantage of it while it's still around, right? And I recommend everyone download and record everything, have a backlog of your own files, because when my YouTube got terminated a few years ago, um, there were a couple of people who had actually downloaded like all my content, <laughs> and I didn't even have all my content, so they, they sent it to me. Um, and you better believe I'm not backing up all this shit. So I really do expect that if you if you want to have bootleg copies of this shit, uh, I'm more power to you because uh, I I don't have the hard drives, like I just don't. Um, but uh, the last thing is you just mentioned the exegetical reading component. It's something that we should probably talk about more, maybe at the after party or something like that tomorrow. You're all invited to the after party. Um, but basically, most of you all have been involved with the exegetical readings portions, so you're doing reflections on the forum, but then also a way of kind of forcing yourself to focus on the text is to read it aloud and then talk about it. And we encourage that you only do that after having given the text a first pass, which is why Adam just fucking Iron Maned through like reading the entire thing and then coming back over it again. So awesome work, Adam. That's superhuman, and we... We respect it. Um, but yeah, anybody want to say a closing thing about exegetical readings as a new form? It's not new. It was around in the medieval times. But does anybody want to say something about, has that changed anything for any of you? Like how you think about texts, maybe? Yeah, I'll say something. Um, you know, you know, it's strange. Uh, I'll listen to the exegetical readings, and for some reason, like the way that they mess up the reading, there'll there'll be like slips of the tongue, where they'll get kind of stuck on a place. And for some reason, just watching someone do that uh, through this like uh, reflection or something, it, it's a much different experience than uh, than just reading or even talking about it. That I think is a, a very useful supplement. Hell yeah! Watching people get confused, right? <laughs> 
And it, for me, what it does is it changes the reading itself. Because when I do the reading on the first pass, I'm thinking, shit, I got to talk about this on a second pass. What am I going to say about it? So it makes it harder for it to come in one ear and go out the other, right? Because I'm like, suddenly I'm like, I got to actually talk about this shit. Well, what were you going to say, Adam? You know, I, I was actually, it's interesting what you just said there because I was, uh, I was talking with Nance about this the other day. Doing the, the first pass reading on, on a recording, I'm absolutely getting my like announcer mind going where I am not able to, cog- I cannot actually understand what I'm reading as I'm saying it. I'm, it's coming in my eyes and going out my mouth. It's total announcer brain. And anytime I find myself starting to think about the text, first of all, it messes up my reading. Um, I start having those slips like Matan was 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 speaking about. And uh, I'm what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep it a purely first pass where I'm trying to just get it into my head so that when I come back to it next time, I'm coming to it not clean per se, but at least at least as clear as possible from any kind of ill-formed judgments because dude reading zizek if you start thinking you understand something on paragraph 17 of 95 you you're 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 gonna be you're gonna be fucked it's like Candyland, dude you're all over the place sometimes and so i really love that first pass but that second pass i really appreciate it i think you you commented on on one of my slips somewhere maybe it wasn't you maybe it was someone else um but i really appreciated that because i didn't even notice necessarily how i made that that slip and and then coming back to it later uh it's like wow other people are seeing this and instead of feeling self-conscious like i normally would i'm realizing wow this this might actually be helpful for someone else to see you know what you can make these mistakes publicly and it's not going to bury you and as a mistake it's not even really even a mistake it's part of the process it's part of the the burn you know when you're lifting you know you you got it the tingling that lets you know it's working and it's i'm loving that that's i'm loving that about the exegetical reading. yes that tingle excellent yeah and i love the fact that it it's like afterwards you go i did that and then you can always revisit it and hear yourself and go oh i've already learned since the last time that i read this and so it's like in the you know it's a the algorithmic stage i talk about how you know, if, if, if it's not seen, it doesn't exist. And that's stupid. It's not true. But also it functions in our head a little bit. We think, oh, I better do something. So it's a way of doing something that actually forces you to do something real, right? And so it's like, for me, it's like a way of like hacking this shit. But um, with that, I'm going to roll the PSA, everybody. And then uh, before having the, the scheduled conversation with Nick Castellucci from The Vanishing Mediators, a.k.a. Kvoy, aka one fourth of the young Jijikians, uh, about why we're reading Being in Time, and I hope you will all be able to come to the Q and A portion of that as well. But before that, um, Anne is going to come on the channel, and she's actually going to run the show for a little bit. And what you all get a dose of is Anne splaining, which is one of her coinages, right? So she likes to Anne splain. And so she's going to come on and talk about digital literacy and some of the books that she will be drawing off of in the digital literacy and critical media theory course that is beginning in freaking May. It's coming up quickly here. It'll be the second Sunday of every month for six months. And there's only one lecture or one lecture session per month because the whole point is a structure that forces us to pace ourselves to think about something, our relationship to our devices and our media and one another and ourselves. And then... Obviously, you can't sustain that. You'll fall off and you'll get distracted. You won't be doing the journaling. You won't be doing the readings. You won't, you won't maintain that mindfulness, but then you'll be back for another lecture, right? And so the whole point is to kind of – this one is actually one of the ones where, yeah, it will be useful to people to, for people to take it after the fact, on demand or whatever. But also in a sense, the structure for this cohort and that time is crucial. And so – I just wanted to say that before I roll the PSA. Um, thanks for hanging out, all of you, and I hope that I'll see you in more Q&As for this marathon, which is currently going on 10 and a half hours. Um, fuck yeah, let's do another couple.
And now a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important yet neglected for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 tier is too much, consider donating towards meals and gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the U.S., where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events, not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being and Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out the capitalization I just make it that way so it's more readable it's not case sensitive if you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others then check out digital literacy and critical media theory a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at tier three, you also get access to the recovery group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? One of the most succinct and cutting edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. 
And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in time is one of the most notorious this profound and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, People tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know, know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah, and seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye. What's up, everyone? It's Theory Plebe. Ah, just kidding. Theory Plebe's got some really bright Theory Plebe. Dave, you don't go by Theory Plebe anymore. Got some bright orange swim trunks on because he's going to go jump in the pool. I need to go touch grass. Because he's been sitting inside since awake, since 6 a.m. Uh, so I'm taking over. What's up, everyone? <laughs> yeah, so for those who don't know who I am, uh, you've probably seen me now like what seven times in this ad that's run and heard my voice a bunch of times in that ad But I am Ann Snellgrove. I am a fellow traveler, but I'm also Dave's uh, Current fiance soon to be wife in July. We're pretty excited and Along with that I am also going to be co-teaching uh, the upcoming course that begins in May called 
digital literacy and critical media theory, or it's critical media theory and digital literacy. It's one of the two ways. Um, and this course is going to be really cool. It's going to be really exciting because Dave is going to be kind of focusing on the theory side. So we're going to be reading some Marshall McLuhan, some Baudrillard, who else? A little bit of Heidegger, talking about technology. You know, McLuhan is like really influential in talking about and theorizing about technology, Heidegger on technology, lots of, you know, Baudrillard on like the spectacle and duopoly, I believe. And so I'm excited for that just to kind of dive into some of the more difficult theory that I don't always get a chance to explore uh, because my interest lies a little bit more in the social science side of things. I still really enjoy the theory, but I'm just excited to learn that and kind of be in the role that Dave has been in for like for they know not what they do kind of the student trying to learn doing some hystericizing some question asking but then I will be kind of in charge of that more like social science slash practical side of the course and maybe you're wondering oh why are they teaching like self-help books in a theory underground course first of all it's not all just self-help books some of them I'm going to kind of introduce some of the books that I'm excited to talk about that I'll be excited to teach during this course. Um, but I think, you know, with with theory, not only is like doing theory and philosophy just important for like our own minds, our, our souls, kind of building our humanity and self-actualizing to be able to think about the world in complex ways and have meaningful conversations with others. But I would hope that when we're doing theory, we'd want to be able to apply some of those things that we're discovering, those realizations we're having, the connections that we're making, and apply them to our own life. And so by incorporating some more of the practical texts that do talk, you know, specifically about our day-to-day -day cell phone use, technology use, and kind of pres helps prescribe us some tools, uh, exercises to try to better our relationship, I think that'll just be like an extra added helpful step along with the theory. And then one thing that these books lack on their own is some of that like actual philosophy and actual theory. And so I think they're going to pair really well together. And I just think it's going to be like a cool ex experience to really talk about this like new technology of social media, cell phones, computers, the internet, television, the media that I think we're all kind of like critical of at this point you know we all know oh I shouldn't be on it that much oh it's not good for us oh the media lies to us but then have a basis in why and really understand like what it's doing to us as human beings you know I've never read Heidegger I'm excited to read Being in Time Division 1 this summer sign up on theoryunderground.com uh, theory-underground.com excuse me um, but I do know you know Tackling, oh, you're still here. Oh, dear God. Sorry. I don't know. That's scary. Uh, threw me off my groove. No, I'm just kidding. I got um, it. Oh, last yeah. question for you. Where's the live chat if I want to look yeah, at it? Yeah, let me show you. There's Sorry you for the you interruption, use, folks. You want to use this. Where, it was, oh. where was that? Oh, it's just, I had it hidden behind things. All you need is this and this window. This is the one people oh, okay. see, and that's the one people Cool, so I don't see. need. Okay, gotcha. Be good to her and chat, everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, anyways... I've never read Heidegger, but I do know that in Being in Time especially, he tackles this idea of, like, being, of Dasein, kind of, of, like, humanity. And so this technology, this social media, this phone that, like, literally lives in our pocket all the time, which I'm going to throw back there, I don't need it, um, is, a, like, a fundamentally affects our being, I think, and, and who we are and how we are living in this world I mean you know kids growing up with with screens like in front of their faces rather than playing outside is my like biggest fear in life is seeing families out at dinner and rather than sitting and drawing on the kids venue and playing tic-tac-toe or playing games or talking about the week or hell fighting they're all like sitting on the parents are sitting on their phones the kids have a tablet and are like watching some youtube like video and that 
I'm like, oh, we're doomed. We're doomed as humanity. And so that really does change our being in the world and how we're relating to other people. It's it's so different. And it's it's not just a matter of, oh, well, just don't do it. Like, it has radically shaped how we just interact with the world, how we perceive the world, how we're able to get information in this world, how we, I mean, even just with social media accounts, like, you kind of have this new persona you take on because of what you're trying to show the world, who you're trying to show them that you are versus like who you actually are. I think that's not really something we had before the internet. We, you know, there like chat rooms, which you were kind of like, no, they couldn't, they couldn't really see your face though. Yeah, you were talking and maybe lying, maybe saying one thing about yourself or trying to, you know, Portray, convey this appearance of what you look like or who you are but then once you kind of have social media accounts like myspace and facebook and instagram that's just another you have this whole other like image of yourself and who you are that you have to upkeep and maintain to show people oh i'm this i'm have i have such a happy life such a happy relationship my house is clean i eat really healthy and so all of that is just like it's a lot to think about, and I think it's it's a lot deeper than just the, oh, yeah, Facebook is bad. So, with that being said, I think these two, theory and practice, are going to pair really well together, and I want to introduce you all to some of the practice side books that we are going to be reading during, the, uh, during this course. And one thing to note is that if you sign up for this course, you're going to, like, what, six books in six months? Maybe for some people it's reasonable, maybe it's not. But the books, reading like the entirety of these books is not mandatory. Um, we will be sending out like the PDF version of which chapter or chapters we think are the most important. Now, because they are not super dense theory books, uh, you will you, you might have the time and the energy to read the entire book in the month. Um, that's totally your choice. We will make sure to kind of have a presentation within the lecture that presents kind of what the whole book is talking about if you only read the part that is assigned. Um, and so for this first month in May, our first book is going to be, let's pull it up, Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. And so I'm currently honing in on what, uh, section or chapter of the book will be assigned so stay tuned for that if you're signed up for the course we'll try to get it out within the next week here let's look at images yeah so this book amusing ourselves to death public discourse in the age of show business by neil postman um he is pretty heavily based in or at least influenced by marshall McLuhan. something we also did for these courses is we tried to pair the kind of strategically pair the theory or philosophy text with the practical book and so this first month we will be reading some uh, Marshall McLuhan excerpts and then this book really kind of draws off of Marshall McLuhan in the first half and so those will be going together. Now this book is really interesting because it was written I believe in the 1980s uh, at the time when the television was just kind of the new hot thing. Uh, iPhones, cell phones, social media was not even a thought in the, at this time. Maybe it was for some people who were developing it. But this was really the age of TV, of television. And so the reason we want to read this book is because um, Postman makes some really, really interesting observations about kind of what this new technology was doing to public discourse. Kind of the talking specifically about not the television itself, but the medium of the television and kind of how that changed the information that we were getting, how we were perceiving the information. And so not only do we want to talk about this because it was really the first time that Americans had this, you know, amusing, colorful, bright medium inside their house, like 24 hour access to it, right? But we also want to tie it in to our modern day technologies, mainly being, you know, the internet and social media and our phones. And it's been really fun to read this book because he'll, Postman will say something and I'll go, oh yeah, well in 
this day and age, this happened. Like, for example, he talks about what year is he writing it in? The 1980s, and the president was Reagan, I think? Who was the movie star president? I should know this, guys. I read. I just read this book. Um, okay, whichever president it was at the time, they were a movie star. I, I'm mixing up. There's three presidents, and I can't remember the name of who it was. But he's like, oh, wow, in this day and age, the president of the United States, like, our president used to be able to give a, you know, like, 12-hour-long speeches, and people would listen. Or the president used to be, who is it? Willie uh, Taft, I think, who was, like, pretty big. And his argument was, well, nowadays... Oh, go away. Nowadays, in the age of television, you couldn't have a, an obese, ugly president. Our current president, or our last president, was a, a former movie star. And I go, oh, wow. Like, imagine, you know, what he would say about Donald Trump, who... I'm not trying to body shame or beauty shame anyone right now, but Trump was not the most attractive president. I mean, anyone with a fake orange spray tan is just like, uh-uh. In, in this kind of description of, oh, well, you couldn't imagine a, an obese president in the age of television, Trump was not skinny, like, compared to other presidents. And Trump was definitely not this, like well put together, well spoken, respectable person, no matter what side of the political aisle you are on. I think we can all agree. Trump was very much like saying saying some stuff that most people wouldn't uh, say in the, in that role of the president of, of the United States of America. And so it, things like that, or a part where he talk, he mentions, you know, I'm not trying to argue that the TV is changing our brain chemistry. I don't think it's doing that. I think, just think it's changing our discourse. Whereas nowadays we have like literal scientific studies talking about how social media use and like screen use shortens our attention spans, um, has like negative effects on our sleep cycles and our eyes. And so kind of drawing those comparisons of, oh, wow, some things he really hit on the head and we see that, but just exasperated in this day and age. And then some things postman couldn't have even imagined in this day and age and so this book i think will be really fun to kind of go through really interesting to compare and contrast it to today and then pair it alongside McLuhan. Uh, in the first part of the book he really talks about and unpacks the the kind of history that led up to uh the television as well as like what public discourse used to look like in the age of oral traditions and speaking and then in kind of the typography age and then um, into the television. And then the second half, he really talks about like what the, the TV uh, as the medium of our news and of our entertainment is doing to us. And I think the, the title of the book is almost his main argument, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Everything has just on the on the TV that's presented to us on the TV has just become amusement amusement You know, he said that the city of our day and age, you know, is Las Vegas, Nevada um, Whereas in other times it was, you know, Boston the where the shot heard around the world and the, During the Boston mass court and then it was New York with you know immigrants coming into Ellis Island and then it was Chicago home of the industry and now it's Las Vegas You know flashy amusing gambling girls 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 now this culture And so that's it's a very well written book. He has a good balance of like research and well thought out arguments and even some theory in there with like you can he has a really good writing voice for this book so that one's going to be i think a really fun book to explore the next one that i'm sure dave has mentioned it on the channel many a time reclaiming conversation by sherry turkle reclaiming conversation power of talk in a digital age. And so if any of you have read uh, Waypoint, uh, Dave's 
uh, first book published at Theory Underground, or it was published with NSP previously. Uh, you probably are familiar with the concepts of solitude and solicitude, and I believe it's the virtuous circle. And basically, the, the kind of parts that we're going to be pulling out of Reclaiming Conversation is that analysis of solitude versus solicitude. So what is solitude? Solitude is time with oneself, true time without any outside thoughts or ideas, you know, influencing your own thoughts or ideas. It is just like true alone time. And I think in this day and age, I'm 100% guilty of this. I don't know the last time I have had like true, true solitude out in nature, away from everything. Because nowadays it's, oh, I need to take some me time. And you're, maybe you're scrolling on your phone, watching a movie, watching Netflix, even reading. Reading is not considered solitude. Uh, it's, it's good. It's something that you should do and incorporate into your day. But it's because your, your thoughts are being influenced by someone else's. It's, you're not just having time to sit with yourself and think your own thoughts and, and reflect. And so she argues that. You know, in order to have true solicitude, you have to have true solitude. And in order to have true solitude, you have to have true solicitude. Solicitude, on the other hand, is going to be, you know, our interactions with other people. And again, that's kind of been co-opted by having our smartphones and our media all around us because it's very rare to see, you know, people my age or Dave's age or even older at this point and obviously younger than all of us, um, without their phones at any sort of social event, a dinner, even a date. Um, and so really we want to kind of theorize and talk about what does real solitude look like? What does real solicitude look like? How is the digital age kind of co-opting that? And then some strategies for what we can do to reclaim conversation and reclaim our solitude. So that's gonna be a really good book. I can't remember right off the top of my head which that will be paired with um and one thing to note about this course is along with having monthly reading assignments i think we probably talked about this in our in a course announcement stream that happened a couple weeks ago is that every month after we've kind of talked about our theory and philosophy we've talked about the practical side of things we will leave you with an assignment or an experiment for every month. Uh, so for example, one conversation or one assignment or, or practice that you might have in this month after we read Reclaiming Conversation is you'll be challenged to one, call a friend on the phone that you haven't talked to in a long time and just have like an undistracted conversation with them or maybe someone who you live in the same city as go meet up with them for coffee phones away and just talk to someone and then we'll also challenge you to you know try to achieve some true solitude in that month by maybe taking a notebook with you and going out uh, preferably into nature where it's just you if you have to have your phone with you for like emergencies keep that in your backpack you no know, music and just go out and so things like that the next book that I'm going to talk about uh, has actually built into the book a sort of practice or a challenge that we're going to, uh, I don't want to use the word assign because none of this stuff is mandatory. It's your life. You're paying for this course. You can get out of it whatever you want to put into it. But this will be something that we will be encouraging people to, to try as we finish this book. And that book is Digital minimalism by Cal Newport choosing a focused life in a noisy world and so Newport's book is about exactly that this concept of digital minimalism and basically he starts out by by talking saying you know I'm not really a person who's on my phone that often so I, but he started to realize just culturally what was going on, his friends feeling like they can never get off of their phones. He even started having some problems with it, I believe. And so he was trying to theorize some sort of way, some sort of life philosophy to have while living with technology and living with 
phones in our pockets and, and laptops on us. And he was thinking, you know, well, these this group, you know, tries to do this. They turn off their notifications, but that doesn't seem to work. And this group, oh, what else? Like, they... I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but they do this thing with their technology to try to limit it, and I don't think that's enough, too. And so he, he advocates for a philosophy called digital minimalism. So, like, you think of a minimalist in kind of the traditional sense, and they've got just the absolute bare minimum in, the, in their house, like, very small wardrobe selection, only one of each thing, and we can, you know, agree or disagree with that, but the reasoning behind minimalism is that you really only want to own things or possess things that have true value to you, that genuinely make you happy, and that really support your life's values. And everything else is, like, not important. It's just an object, and you don't need it in your life. And so he applies that to the digital world and our technologies, and saying, basically, all this extra junk on our phone, you don't need it if it's not truly supporting the values that you have in your life. And so, for example, with, say, Instagram, if, you, if, you're, if you're just on Instagram to scroll and see other people's posts and compare yourself to others... Maybe that's not an app that you need to be on because maybe it's not supporting your best life and the values that you hold near and dear. Uh, but for someone who is value is like connection and connecting with family and, and keeping family and friends up to date, then maybe having an Instagram account does support that mission in your life and that value of, of connection and like seeing what's going on with everyone's life. But then you need to really understand th that value first and foremost. So you know how to use the technology or the app or the social media or whatever technology to best support that value. And so in order to do that, he argues, you have to first withdraw from it completely. And so the challenge that Newport puts forward in this book is to do a 30-day digital detox. And so that means that all optional media or entertainment, media for entertainment in your life, cut like cold turkey for 30 days, completely cut it out. But not only is it just cut it out, but then it's try to replace it with something else. So rather than scrolling, it's reading. Rather than watching Netflix with your partner at night, it's playing a game with them or just talking to them or going on a walk or cooking dinner. Um, and what that does, what removing these things does is it really gets you to reflect on the values in your life, on what you like to spend your time doing without having the technology and the social media on hand. Um, and then once the 30 days are over and you've really had that time away from it, you've had time to reflect on it, then you reintegrate into your life the, the media and the technology that you believe supports the life that you want to live, that supports your values, and maybe you make some changes to how you were formerly using it. I really like this book. I really like the Digital Detox Challenge. It's actually something I did almost a year ago, and it was like pretty successful for me. For a few months, actually, I got off of, I've been, I'm not on Twitter or TikTok. I real, I was kind of on TikTok when like everyone was on it during COVID, COVID, but I soon just figured out like TikTok is an actual, is actual poison, is an actual virus. I, I don't want to be a part of it. So I got off of TikTok. I got off of Twitter a couple of years ago because I was like, uh, too much too much politics, too much drama. I don't want to be part of it. But my real weaknesses are like Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat. Um, and so I did this detox and I was completely off of Instagram. I used my Facebook only like once every few days to check in on a Facebook group that I was a part of for a play that I was in that they relayed like important information in this Facebook group that I needed to stay up to date on. And that's something that 
Cal Newport talks about in the book is, you know, if there are technologies that are not optional in your life, for example, a Facebook group that updates you on this group that you're in or like a play that you're a part of or maybe you communicate with peop- a certain person on Instagram and they have no other way of communicating with you. He talks about methods to still have those things, like maybe you schedule it, you set up a shortcut on your browser to just go like straight to the Facebook group and then you check it for a couple minutes and then leave and you know only do that once a week or whenever. Um, but I, I did do a, the digital detox and it was, like I said, it was successful for a while. Um, I felt I was spending a lot more time reading and being outside. I was completely off of Instagram. I only use Facebook for that group. I was off Snapchat for like months and months. And I think it was really when I was like getting ready to travel again. I was like, okay, I need to re-get my Instagram because people want to see pictures. I want to, uh, you know, re-download Facebook because Dave and I have a Facebook group that updates people on our travels. I want to have Snapchat so I can communicate with my siblings and friends over Wi-Fi. And so it's like I came up with these reasons, but I'm like, no, 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 but that's all I'm going to use it for. But then just having it on my phone it's so easy. It's just like habitual at this point. Oh, I checked this too. I'll check this too. Oh, no, I've spent way too long scrolling and watching YouTube videos and looking at things that are not necessary or important or not making my life the best it can be. And so I think this book is especially going to pair well with the philosophy and the theory side because not only will you have this this uh, philosophy of digital minimalism, digital minimalism, but you'll also have like an actual grounding in why, like philosophy of technology, critical media theory, digital literacy to help support this digital minimalism, hopefully years after. Like I'm really excited to do this challenge again with kind of a better philosophical basis. Let's see here. So that, those are three books. The last couple that I will talk about um, that I'm excited about is one book is called How to Break Up with Your Boyfriend. Don't Google that. Maybe, maybe Google has good advice. I don't know. How to Break Up with Your Cell Phone? Is that what it's called? How to Break Up with Your Phone by Katherine Price. This is also a book that I read like during 2020, I think. And it also, the first half of the book is kind of setting you up with some of the like social science and the psychology behind our technologies, specifically social media. Uh, For example, she talks about how these technologies were designed by like in kind of with the same philosophy and in psychological knowledge of the development of uh, like gambling and kind of so she kind of exposes this technology and what it's doing to our brains what it's doing to our relationships why it's addicting so the first half of that book is really useful but then the second half of the book is another kind of experiment or practice that she prescribes it's another 30-day challenge and hers is a little bit less like cold turkey 30 days digital detox nothing and it's every day there's a different kind of task and the first week it just starts off with you don't even really make any changes it's just you're observing how you feel you're documenting you know the the way like how many times you're composed to check your phone keeping track of your uh daily usage and then it starts to become okay this day you're going to you know challenge yourself to keep your phone on do not disturb or be away from your phone for this amount of hours and then I think by the end of this um, book it's been a while since I've read it and I need to revisit it for this class but then by the end it's like you're gonna have a full weekend without your technology and so it is a little bit more gradual and I don't know if we will actually be assigning or kind of all trying to do her um, prescription or her challenge in the same way that we're going to encourage the digital detox from digital minimalism Uh, but there will be another uh, 
assignment or something paired with this book. And so this one, it's either going to be this one, I think, also paired with a book that I actually just recently discovered a couple weeks ago that I've been reading through, trying to figure out if it will be useful for this class. And it is, what, 10 Reasons to Delete Your Social Media Right Now. There we go. 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. Jaren Lanier? Lanier? I don't know. Um, so this book, I think, will pair really nicely with How to Break Up with Your iPhone because I think it's maybe the most... These two books are almost the most mainstream, self helpy like, easy-to-read books out of all of them. Um, but Lanier makes... Yeah, he gives you 10 reasons, and I think this one will also pair really well with the philosophy because his arguments are very in-depth, and he talks a lot about, like, not just, oh, because it's bad for your brain, because it's bad for your relationships, but he talks about what, ha like, social media and just having access to this does to your soul, and it kind of makes you, like, a zombie or a slave to it. And so that, in thinking about being and what does it mean to be human and what does it mean to be human in a time of having this technology it will be a really good kind of practical partner to that conversation and so those are just some of the books that we're going to be talking about during our critical media theory crit yeah critical media theory and digital literacy course which you can sign up for Dot com. Oh, I should probably click slash courses. There's probably a shortcut for it. I don't know what it is, but let's check it out. If we go in here to courses, and we go down here to, oh, you're logged in. Maybe it won't work. Digital literacy and CMT. Well, if you're not logged in, Let's see, can I, maybe, http colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com. I don't want to log in. I want to go to courses. Digital literacy and critical media theory. Looks like we've got three or four people enrolled already, which is pretty exciting. Nan says, I'm stoked for this course. Me too. I think it'll be a good one. I think it'll be kind of like a multi-generational talk about, hey, Check in. yeah, you can. I'm just showing them the website and where to sign up for this course. So if you go to take this course, you're going to see some tier options. Tier one, you get access to the lecture and Zoom calls and six months of access to the lecture. Uh, readings and the forum pretty basic tier tier two you get long-term buy-in and so this includes having access to the course for the rest of your life or for as long as theory-underground.com exists I suppose um, that is a good tier if you know that you're going to want to revisit if you're the type of person who will be thinking about this course months after the fact and want to go back and read something or drop a thought in revisit the lectures um that is that tier tier three is pretty cool because it's everything from tiers one and two plus there will be an extra monthly meeting that will be kind of like a digital recovery group monthly discussion meeting to reflect on the practical experiments so i guess kind of like aa maybe not as serious we're not trying to compare our struggles to like people who struggle with 
substance addictions, but it'll just be a group to talk more about the ways that this impacts us in our everyday life, a bit more discussion forum than lectures, maybe some more reflections on how we've been thinking about the theory side in our everyday lives. Um, and then the last tier, tier four, is the assessment and accountability tier. So you'll get everything from tiers one and three, so access to that extra uh, meeting, plus direct constructive critical feedback from Dave via voice messages and or marked up reviews of your assessments, plus access to any of the live and recorded exegetical reading sessions of this text that Dave or Anne will do, plus the two one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls with Dave going over your theory reflections, um, the first is to be scheduled while the course is ongoing, the second afterwards. And so this one, if you just really want to take this course seriously like it is a course and have that accountability and, and dive, dive into this one pretty heavily, then this is a great tier for you to sign up for because you will get that one-on-one -on -one time to ask questions, dig deeper into something. Uh, that we've talked about in the course that maybe doesn't make sense or that got you really excited and got you thinking. And then there's always tier five, which is the patron tier. So for this tier, if you are already a patron of theoryunderground.com, you will use your special code and it will reduce itself to $50 and you will get access to tier one. Now, if you're not already a patron, what tier five does, and this is for all of the courses, it will give you, it will cost $600, but then for the entire year, you'll basically get that patron uh, privilege, I suppose, by your, every course, you will get that special access code that will give you tier one for $50, and you'll get, you'll always get tiers two, three, and four on any course for 35% off, which is also what our patrons get. And yeah, this is a really good deal uh, if you just wanna like pay that one-time fee and then for an entire calendar year, you get that $50 access and the coupon code to at the tier one level. And then don't forget that there is always a scholarship option if, the, if you wanna participate in this course or any course, but your funds are a little low, finances are a little rough right now, I believe you can go up to where? It's somewhere on here. It's probably in that ad where to go for the scholarship. Um, clearly, I did not do my homework on being Dave to promote it's the scholarship. It's so hot in here. It's hot in it's here. It's so hot in this room. This computer is cooking up a storm. Woo. Um, we're also, there's just like a giant window right here, and it's like hot here, and so the sun just whoosh, comes in. Yeah, there you have an underground.com slash scholarship. You can fill out this financial aid form because we want everyone to be able to access the course if money is an obstacle but we also want to be compensated for our time and energy because this time and energy that we are using to prepare for the course teach the course read the books for the course write the lectures for the course is time that we are not working a wage labor job so we can't we can't live on your love and adoration alone sadly if we could we would not that there's that much of it anyway. Hey! <laughs> uh, should we roll the PSA? Do you want to say Let's some closing? Let's roll the PSA, yeah. Do you have any closing things uh, to say? Thanks for hanging out with me, everyone. Uh, I hope this was enlightening. I hope you enjoyed this session of Anne-splaining this course to you. And sign up for the course. Do it. I think this one's really, really important because... There are probably very few of you who don't think you need a better relationship with technology. Just saying. I'm guilty too. I'm like, I'm the I'm the Gen Z of this group. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm a I'm an addict. And so I think it'll be good for everyone, regardless of where you're at in your life, how old you are, what generation you're a part of. I think it'll be a good one. With that, click the add three courses. Peace, people. Click the what? Add three. Mm -hmm. And now, a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. 
What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important yet neglected for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 tier is too much, consider donating towards meals and gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the U.S., where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events, not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The th three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being in Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory, a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at Tier 3, you also get access to the Recovery Group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? One of the most succinct and cutting edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June. Your sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in Time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, 
being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, people tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah. And seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye. Boom, and we're back, and I'm revived, I'm rejuvenated. What's up, everybody? Oh. Welcome, Nick. How's it going, man? Doing good. Drinking some chamomile tea, ready to uh, dive into the convo. Hell yeah. Um, looks like we've lost half the people who are watching because they all got tired and they took my advice to go touch grass, but... Um, a lot of people are also catching up, and I think that when you're catching up on the stream, it doesn't log you. And if you just keep the live chat open, but you don't have the actual YouTube video playing, it doesn't log you. And so, um, you know, like for instance, people who just have eyes on live chat while they're in the Zoom call, it doesn't count them either. Not that it matters. It does, actually. Partially it does, but also it doesn't that much. Because guess what, everybody? I think 12 people... Uh, being here right now is really fucking cool, and uh, it's an honor. I appreciate it, and uh, I'm about to say a couple of things about the stream before we click the record button and actually kind of dive into this conversation, and which will include me kind of formally introducing you, Nick. Uh, but before doing that, I just want to say thank you to Dan, the one person who has donated to Theory Underground today, fifty dollars. That makes that makes it you know what that you know what that is that's enough gasoline to drive somewhere and the tour it requires gasoline to drive places um we're gonna go to visit nick 
in uh, Philly. October? Yeah, we're going to visit Sean in Pittsburgh, and we're going to visit you in Philly. We're going to visit Swole and Andrew McLuhan in uh, Ontario, Canada. We're going to visit Mikey and Philip in, Raytown, in, in Kansas City, Missouri, and in Raytown, which is right beside it. Um, Andrew will be in L.A., so we're going to go to L.A. to see Andrew. Hopefully we'll get to see Catherine and Lou, McGowan, a bunch of other people who are submitting to Underground Theory Volume 1. So um, basically what I wanted to say is the people who are funding this, you're funding not only a tour, not only a book promotional event, not only uh, sort of igniting of the intellectual planes of the United States, but more importantly, you are funding uh, – well, I, I can't make promises, but like – the stuff that's going to come from that tour, um, it's, it's going to be epic, and I hope it'll turn into some documentary stuff as well. So with that all said, I'm going to click the record button here and say, welcome to the stream, everybody. Uh, this is Theory Underground. I am your host, David McCarricker, and um, this some people will be watching this in the future out of context, and that's totally okay because this conversation is a standalone conversation, but the, the context of it uh, our being in the world, in a sense, is one of uh, what I've been doing a live stream here for 11 hours and 28 minutes. And uh, we're about to go for another hour and a half. So that's good because honestly, this is easier for me than other ways of doing things like the editing hole that I was in making those Zizek 101 and Lacan 101 things for the Theory Underground launch, the, the original launch, before the course site launch. So the course site launch, we haven't talked too much about it, but basically Theory Underground is not just like a social media app. It's, it's specifically a course-gated social media app, meaning that the forums uh, are kind of exist under the presupposition that the people involved have a commitment to tackling certain texts to being engaged with certain thinkers, to trying to understand and see the world through certain concepts. And the person I'm bringing on for this conversation is Nick Casalucci. Is that right? Did I say it right? Yes. Okay. Nick Casalucci is one half of the Vanishing Mediators, formerly known as K Voy. Uh, he also goes by Free Beer Tomorrow on Instagram and other places where you might have seen his memes. But he's most well known for the work he has done with his friend and fellow traveler, my friend and fellow traveler as well, Andrew Flores, a.k.a. Master Signified Bodies, a.k.a. The Big Signorelli, a.k.a. each of you being one-fourth of the... Young Zizekians, or I guess the two of you compose one half of the Young Zizekians. I can even math right now. Um, so I just wanted to like ask you, where where are you coming from? Your being in the world, you've been up since six a.m. What are you What, what are you doing? <laughs> in general, in the abstract, right now, the whole thing. Yeah, today. Like, what kind of a day are you having? Today, um, it's been something of a whirlwind very um pinocchio focused i've been teaching pinocchio all day that's For not real? a joke um yeah i read pinocchio condensed version to uh first grade uh kindergarten we had a test for second grade, it was not about Pinocchio. Um, it was about animals in Italian, and um, and then for third and fourth grade, we watched the latest Pinocchio, but not the Guillermo del Toro version because I'm not sure that they're ready for that. So uh. that's been my day. So this is quite a, you know, shift in focus from Pinocchio. To Heidegger, but maybe there's some through lines there. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure Jordan Peterson could find it. Right, he has a lot to say about <laughs> Pinocchio, doesn't he? Okay. Uh, all unions do, yeah. No, like uh, any great myth, they're gonna they're gonna fanboy for it, you know. Which is great. It's true, you know. Like it's good to think about these things from philosophical lenses. I'm not trying to dunk on that, but anyway. So, 
the other kind of where you're coming from right now is, yeah, what, so you've been doing stuff with, uh, with Andrew. What have you been working on recently? Do you want to say anything about your channel before we really dive into what we're doing? Because obviously you're not, your background is not being in time. Your background is not Martin Heidegger. Um, part of the question is like, why the fuck are you wanting to read it? Why do you want to be sort of like the, the pupil supposed to be confused, but actually doing the readings all summer in this dynamic? Like wh why, why, what's wrong with you? Yeah. What is wrong with me? Indeed. I mean, to what is wrong with anyone who wants to take a deep dive into Lacan and Zizek to begin with, but then to add Heidegger to the mix, you really have to be uh far gone but a little bit about uh me and andrew's channel we are of two weeks ago i think maybe three the vanishing mediators as you said formerly known as kvoy we are steadily working through uh the seminars i don't think it's our plan to do every seminar sorry the seminars of jacques lacan i should say the psychoanalytic thinker <laughs> And uh, we've also um, taken on some exegetical readings to help uh, supplement the Mikey's or they know not what they do course. And we're really into it as a concept. Um, we want to do some other exegetical readings. We, we've been thinking about doing some chapters of Ethics of the Real by Zupancic, Alenka. Um, because that that book isn't isn't talked as about as much as uh, what is sex. So you, we're gonna do a chapter of that related to the optical schema sometime in the future. That's ah. just a little bit about the channel. It's called the Vanishing Mediator or the yes the Vanishing Mediators. I should know the name of my own channel. You can check it out. Please subscribe. Um, why Heidegger? Why take this on? Well. I feel that at this point, the vanishing mediator, let's say, of many of the concepts that I've been working with, Zizekian, Lacanian, would be Heidegger. Is Heidegger's, if we want to call it this, phenomenology, his unique approach to the question of being? Um, I've dabbled. I have watched some videos. Uh, I've benefited the most from watching um, Brian Becker's series on Heidegger. I believe he's going to be on tomorrow. Is that right? You're going to be talking about intentionality? Oh, yeah. Not only oh, yeah. is Brian Becker joining us tomorrow to talk about who's surreal and intentionality and the, the relevance of that for philosophy in general, but specifically its influence on Heidegger and Lacan. But after that, like a little bit later, I'll be like, uh, we will be joined by, uh, let me actually show it here on the screen for people. Um, Samuel Loncar, he's not very well known. Um, he's a professor at Yale. Uh, he's, he's a younger professor at Yale who's doing stuff online. And uh, he will be on right after Brian Becker. So it's going to be Ashley Frowley to talk about the family, Brian Becker to talk about intentionality, and then Samuel Loncar to talk about being in time and philosophy as a form of psychotherapy. So it's going to be like phenomenology heavy these first few hours. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm actually excited to be approaching someone as monumental as Heidegger from a, a the stance of a novice, not that I'm not a novice when it comes to Lacan, but now that like I've been talking Lacan for a while, I want to once again be 100% confused, disoriented. Uh, I think it was uh, maybe Adam or Nance earlier just talking about kind of the humbling and also like equally thrilling experience of just like not quite being able to gain your bearings when it comes to a text, but also jumping right in at the same time and like being uncomfortable, being comfortable with being uncomfortable basically with a text. Mm. And um, I think with 
with Heidegger, as I said before, it's sort of like his concepts are the vanishing mediator here in that we know that Lacan was early in his career, or at least in the early seminars, very influenced by Heidegger. He famously says in seminar two in one of the lectures, eat your design. Um, and Declare. I think there are a lot of homologies, maybe, or just parallels between phenomenology and what's going on in psychoanalysis. But I'm more interested to learn about how, um, where, where the crucial distinctions lie. Although on the surface, there might seem to be many, many different um, significant parallels between these two forms of thinking, but they're operating very differently. There's a, they're kindred, but operating very differently. And I'm interested to figure out exactly how. For us, by us, I mean Lacanians, me and Andrew, uh, I think Mikey would agree with this. The, the register of the imaginary, the Bromian knot of the imaginary, symbolic and the real, a lot of what pertains to phenomenology happens within the imaginary. And I feel like maybe without deep, going too deep into what the imaginary is, basically just immediate experience. Um, I feel like I have been confusing at times what Lacan does for a kind of phenomenology, which although he's influenced by Heidegger, we can't say that his, his theory is phenomenology. It's very different. So that just begs the question, all right, so then what is phenomenology? I don't have the clearest definition. I just have some notions, some inklings, and I'm really looking forward to testing those notions, developing them. Yeah, I'm going to want to ask Brian tomorrow if he agrees with that statement that um, Lacan is, one, not doing phenomenology, and two, that um, phenomenology is primarily dealing with the imaginary. Because I, I think the... I th my, my gut here, and it's not just like off the cuff, like my gut from having wondered about this for a while, is that the phenomenological approach um, is taken into the clinic by Lacan and that there's just certain things that you cannot see if you merely do phenomenology from the first person standpoint and that you actually need the other person. You, you have to be doing analysis on a lot of other people and it's really it's, 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 it's phenomenology of the dynamic that is occurring between you and these others. And so now maybe that's wrong but um, I think that also this is not my own idea. I know Mikey's going to be like, that's my idea. It's true. It's Mikey's idea. Mikey has said something along those lines. Um, I hope that uh, someone doesn't steal his idea and then Mikey blames me for letting it out the cage there. But that I can't think about it like different than that. And so hopefully we'll, we'll get to hear from him on this and maybe I'm doing him an injustice. Maybe, maybe that's not actually his position. We need clarity now. But um, not only is, is that my hunch, but also uh, the phenomenology is like, it's the term that throws people off. Oh, it's dealing with appearances. I think when you get into chapter two of History of the Concept of Time, which is this text right here, which we will be hopefully talking about a couple of times in the month of May in preparation for the launch of the Being in Time course in June. Husserl is... His starting point is appearances, but also like everybody's starting point is appearances. But the point is to get beyond appearances and to deduce from appearances structures, like general structures. And some of these, and the, 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 the phenomenological attitude or spirit or goal is to you know, it's famous that, you know, he always said, back to the things themselves, right? Like this is the, the motto of phenomenology from Husserl. 
Um, but where that comes from is his uh, mentor, Brentano, who was also a, uh, a teacher to Freud. And so both Freud and Husserl learned from Brentano that psychology up until their time had been borrowing its concepts willy-nilly and heavy-handedly from other fields. And those are fields that are opened up to consciousness and to various kinds of acts that are, you know, in search of knowledge, right? But those fields are, you know, they only really get underway once they stop borrowing their concepts from other fields and develop concepts that actually do their utmost to map whatever the subject matter is in that field, right? And so if you're borrowing concepts from biology and importing those into psychology, or if you're borrowing concepts from physics and you're importing those into psychology and you're not doing so in a, in a very uh, self-critical manner while doing so, it's not scientific. And this was Brentano's fundamental focus. Now, Aristotle and the scholastics, they knew about intentionality to some degree. Um, they, they, they realized that they're, we don't have an experience of an objective world. We have an experience of experiencing a world, right? This is a fundamental problem for, for philosophy, and you don't get out of it by just saying, well, are we in the matrix, or are we in the dream of the evil demon? I don't know, am I a butterfly? And it's like this whole thing that people do. It's like this script where it's like they don't take it seriously, but it's like, no, 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 we don't know what the world is to bats. We know what the world is to humans, right? More importantly, it, this is kind of to the concept of gaze and Lacan. We don't just go around and see things in like some kind of a neutral manner. We, things are lit up. And really, in a sense, like the things that fascinate us, they're pointing at us in this sense, like our unconscious, we learn about our unconscious and others know about our unconscious too by the things that we're seeing, by the things that we're focusing on, by what gets us excited, by, you know. And so this is, um, this is sort of the, the bedrock idea behind intentionality. Um, and there's other, you know, essential ideas like categorical intuition, the original sense of the a priori, bracketing, these other kinds of fundamental things for phenomenology. Um, but the point is, is to not stay at the level of appearances. If people, contemporary academia has interpreted phenomenology as let's just try not to think, let's try not to be biased. Let's try to look at the things and just interpret them to the best of our ability. But obviously if you're doing that without a rigorous sort of uh, approach that does its utmost to to say, well, what are we bracketing? What should we be bracketing? Why should we be bracketing it? With, and bracketing means like uh, taking t taking certain presuppositions or things that you've assumed and like taking those out of the picture, right? Like uh, for instance, subject, object, dualism, um, thinking of consciousness as uh, fundamentally opposed to objects in the world, like that Husserl does this to some degree, Heidegger's gonna say he never went far enough, but the basic point is, is like you're importing epistemological and metaphysical baggage into the analysis when you're doing that. And so um, there is no such thing as a pure encounter with the things themselves, right? Now, one of the things I've, I've, I think Mikey has said on stream before is that uh, one of the detriments of phenomenology is if you bracket out too many concepts eventually, like you're not having an unmediated experience with the things themselves. And I would say Husserl is very aware of that. Heidegger is also aware of that. The, the point is never to, oh, now I've had this genuine f brush up with the things themselves and now I can, you know, describe them and then we can encode that into a new doctrine. It's, the point is not a doctrine. Like the point is a series of, I almost want to call them thought experiments, but they're more like ways of seeing. And they're ways of seeing that very methodically take certain things that we've taken for granted and put those on ice, right? And so I do think that uh, Lacan would never, I, this is my own at this point, I don't know if Brian will agree with me because this is part of why I want to bring him on is to talk about this, but I don't think that Lacan would have had the richness of insight that he did when going 
to the to bringing Freud into the 21st century um, without phenomenological ways of looking. And it's not just ways of looking, but it's specifically like taking what has made itself manifest and then saying, okay, instead of fixating on that and just describing that, what can we deduce from that in a generalizing way? Are there laws that we can come to? And these are laws, can, are there laws that we can come to and through these concepts that are from the actual phenomenon and the mechanisms that we perceive in conscious interactions and experience itself? That's the question. It, when we say back to the things themselves, the point is, can we get not get an original insight of the actual authentic real original experience um though of course like that's a great goal like why not try um but specifically are the can we develop concepts that aren't just hand-me-downs from the thrift right. store of science right and so this is why the history of the concept of time starts out with the distinction between the sciences of nature and the sciences of the humanities uh, or social science versus um, what nowadays we'd call hard science. He says, uh, I think it's called, yeah, nature and history as domains of objects for the sciences, right? And so the tendency with Dilth Dilthi and with um, uh, Husserl and Brentano as, re as well as Scheller, Scheller, Scheller um, all of these people who were aware that uh, the humanities were making themselves the little handmaidens of hand-me-down clothes to the sciences and not developing their own discipline, right? Um, they were aware of this, but what Heidegger's going to say is what they, what they failed to do was to get back before the split between natural science and, hum and, and social sciences because there are things in common between the two and the concepts we should be using to think about them are not the concepts of physics. They're not the concepts of biology. They're not the concepts of astros. No, it, th the concepts for making sense of the split are going to be not just merely ones relegated to the sphere of the humanities either, but instead you go back, for Heidegger, you go back to the who's asking the question. Who's asking the question in the first place? Who's made the split in the first place? Who perceives and thinks through and projects this split onto everything all of the time, all day, every day? Humans are doing it. But specifically, Dasein is doing it. We have to bracket out human because human comes with the baggage of spirit, rational animal, soul, made in the image of God. All of these things that he's going to, at the beginning of being in time, but also towards the end of the first section of History of the Concept of Time, he's going to say, no, no. There's something to this idea of spirit. Like they're getting at something. Theologians who talk about this, they're getting at something. Right. Something's perceivable there, right? Like when someone dies, um, something perceivable has changed. And it's, and it's not just chemical processes. We can't just reduce that to that. Grandma's gone. It's not just, uh, you know, it's not just, oh, chemical processes changed, right? And so the, the, the question though is, okay, Who's the being that's asking the question? And what are the fundamental horizon of that being? The fundamental horizon of that being is not a bunch of other beings as entities, objects in the world to be understood. But it's also entities manifesting themselves in time, specifically in time. And so that's the one thing that combines the natural sciences and the human sciences is time. That is the horizon that unifies them both. They both operate in time, but capitalism has made it all too easy. Now, Heidegger doesn't use the word capitalism, but Heide capitalism has made it all too easy to see all of time in this calendar grid that is Cartesian in its essence, right? That is nihilistic in its essence, in the sense that it just, oh, well, it's just, you know, eventually we'll be swallowed up by the sun. Time is time. You know, it's just minutes and hours and, you know, weeks and years, and it's just on this infinite grid, and we're just arbitrary points in that, and it's like, you're taking some mathematical tools used to control nature and now you're using that to derive what your sense of meaning in the world it's just backwards it doesn't make any sense and so i guess that i'll start by saying my 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 three big reasons for being in time aside from the ones that i talked about in the last the last 
uh, video where I talked about being in time, it's basically his critique of modernity, scientism, and his influence on everyone who comes after. Um, but I think that the questions being asked are fundamental questions to being a thinker, period. And so, look, I mean, I've, I've got people who came on today who probably don't like being in time. Chris Catron doesn't, he says he was influenced by Heidegger. But the thing is, is like, it's going to force a kind of thinking on kinds of questions and issues you've just never really tarried with. And it's impossible to tarry with those in any way close to as deep through any other means. And that's why we're forced to have to read this is because you're not going to get it more pure. Like this is, this is a, it's notorious for a reason, but it's more importantly profound for a reason beyond its difficulty. Because there is always that mechanism of, oh, it's difficult and now I found clarity in it and now it makes sense to me and I have this pseudo profundity moment. Oh, uh -huh, it's deep. But really it was just putting something normal in complicated language and now you feel proud of having read something difficult. That's the critique of all of continental philosophy. It's true in a lot of cases. There is that element of pleasure that comes after a lot of death drive jouissants trying to read a difficult text. But no, there's something genuinely profound here going on and it, it, it's the, it, it separates the boys from the men, separates the little kids from the adults separates the little girls from the women, however we want to say it, it is a rite of passage into being able to have any kind of sense for where Derrida is coming from, from where Levinas is coming from, where Foucault is coming from, and I do believe Lacan. And so I think you're going to get a lot out of it. And I just like, I, first of all, you got me talking, so thank you. I, I want to hear you talk, though. Yeah, for sure. Oh, wow, I have so much to say. One, I want to just clarify that I don't, think that phenomenology purely confines itself to the register of the imaginary it begins with the imaginary and i think that it begins with the imaginary in the sense that we're beginning with appearances and i think why it would be a great supplement to lacan and the work of many lacanians in general is that i feel like sometimes the imaginary is the the register that's neglected that kind of falls by the wayside over time. Uh, but Heidegger's point of departure is appearances, bracketing out things from appearance. Right. And then from there, we can actually focus on a kind of um, taxonomy of appearances that does get beyond appearances mm. and uh, to a, a kind of symbolic, to the next in quotes, the next register. So uh, I think Lacan would probably criticize Heidegger for collapsing the two at points, but even there, sure. there's even a, a productivity in, in, in the collapsing there, in the fact that Heidegger might not have the same conception of the real that Lacan has. But there are things in Heidegger that maybe Lacan and Zizek gloss over. Uh, although mm -hmm. Zizek, he began as a Heideggerian, so he's more than conversant with the tradition. Okay. Something else I wanted to say, I'm kind of like bouncing all over the place, but here, uh, and I'm also just uh, giving a preview of my three reasons. Um, you were talking about things in themselves, which is, of course, the concept that is most closely associated with Kant and there are there's a fidelity there between phenomenology and Kant's project the Kantian project it's like Kant has his tables of judgment he has his categories he and and his his domain is the transcendentally ideal transcendental idealism what transcends experience uh, 